Pagan Christs. By John M. Robertson. Preface to the Second Edition. Since the first issue of this work in 1903, but especially within the past few years, its main positions have been brought into extensive discussion by other writers, notably in Germany. Where the Christus myth of Professor Arthur Drews has been the theme of many platform debates. The hypothesis of the pre Christian Jesus God, first indicated in Christianity mythology, and further propounded in the first edition of this book, has received highly important and independent development at the hands of Professor W. Benjamin Smith in his Der Vorkristlich Jesus, 1906, and in the later exposition of Professor Drews. For one whose tasks include other busy fields, it is hardly possible to give this the constant attention it deserves. But the present edition has been as fully revised as might be, and some fresh elucidatory material has been embodied, without, however, any pretense of including the results of the other writers named. Criticism of the book, so far as I have seen, has been to a surprising degree limited to subsidiary details. The first part, a discussion of the general principles and main results of hierology as regards the reigning religion, has been generally ignored, under circumstances which suggest rather avoidance than dissidence. But much more surprising is the general evasion of the two theses upon which criticism was specially challenged in the introduction, the theses that the gospel story of the Last Supper, the agony, the betrayal, the crucifixion. And the resurrection is demonstrably not originally a narrative, but a mystery drama, which has been transcribed with a minimum of modification. And that the mystery drama was inferably an evolution from a Palestinian rite of human sacrifice in which the annual victim was, Jesus the Son of the Father. Against this twofold position I have seen not a single detailed argument. Writers who confidently and angrily undertake to expose error in another section of the book pass this with at most a defiant shot. Like the legendary Scottish preacher, they recognize a difficult passage, and, having looked it boldly in the face, pass on. Even Professor Schmiedel, to my surprise, abstains from argument on an issue of which his candor and acumen must reveal to him the gravity. It is but fair to say that even sympathetic readers do not often avow entire acquiescence. Professor Drews leaves this an open question. But I should have expected that such a proposition, put forward as capital, would have been dealt with by critics who showed themselves much concerned to discredit the book in general. They seem to have been chiefly excited about Mithraism, either finding in the account of that ancient cultus a provocation which the other parts of the volume did not yield. Or seeing their openings for hostile criticism which elsewhere were not patent. One Roman Catholic ecclesiastic has represented me as a modern apostle of the bull slaying God. It would seem that a semblance, however illusory, of rivalry in cult propaganda is more evocative of critical conflict than any mere scientific disintegration of the current creed. Of the attacks upon the section Mithraism, as well as of other criticisms of the book, I have given some account in Appendix C. It is to be regretted that it should still be necessary to make replies to criticisms in these matters consist largely of exposures of gross misrepresentation, blundering, bad faith, and bad feeling, as well as bad reasoning. On the part of theological critics. In the case of a hostile critique in the Hibbert Journal, which did not incur these characterizations, I made an amicable appeal for space in which to reply and set forth my own case, but my request was refused. Broadly speaking, the critical situation is one of ferment rather than of decisive conflict. Those devoted Danaides, the professional theologians, continue their labors with the serious assiduity which has always marked them, exhibiting their learned results in dialectic vessels which lack the first elements of retention. The theologians are as much occupied with unrealities today, relatively to the advance of thought, and as sure of their own insight, as were their predecessors of three hundred years ago, expounding the functions of the devil. In Germany they are not yet done discussing the inner significance of the tale of Satan's carrying Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple or to a mountain top. Professor Zahn circumspectly puts it that Jesus felt himself so carried. Friedrich Spitta as circumspectly replies that that is not what the Gospels say, but does not press that point to finality. Professor Harnack pronounces that the story in Matthew is the older. Spitta cogently proves that it is the later, 
and that Mark has minimized Luke. Wellhausen's theory of the priority of Mark he shows to be finally untenable. And his own conclusion he declares to give a decisive result as regards the life of Jesus, namely, that Jesus believed firmly in his messiahship from the moment of his baptism onwards. And that he held by it in terms of his own inner experience of divine and fiendish influences. One and this is history, as written by scholarly theological experts. The fact that the whole temptation story is rationally traceable to a Babylonian sculpture of the goat god beside the sun god, interpreted by Greeks and Romans successively as an education of Apollo or Jupiter by Pan on a mountain top. Or a musical contest between them, has never entered the expert's consciousness. They are writing history in the air. Spitta confidently decides that neither the community nor the disciples nor Paul set up the messianic conception of Jesus. And yet he has not a word to say on the problem of Paul's entire ignorance of the temptation story. Seventy years before, our own experts had ascertained with equal industry and certainty that most probably our Lord was placed, by Satan, not on the sheer descent, from the temple, into the valley, Joss War, v. v. 2, Ant. 15, 11, 5, but on the side next the court where stood the multitude to whom he might thus announce himself from Dan 7, 13, 1 Cron, 21, 16, CBP, Pearson, 7, F and G. Solomon's porch was a cross building to the temple itself, and rose 120 cubits above it. From the term used by both evangelists, it is certain that the tempter stood on no part, tau omicron nu alpha omicron, of the sanctuary. Too thus does that expert elucidation of the impossible go on through the generations. The experts of today are for the most part as far behind the historic science of their time as were their predecessors. And their results are just as nugatory as the older. But they are just as certain as were their predecessors that they are at the true point of view, and have all the historical facts in hand. Orthodox and heterodox alike, in the undertaking to set forth the manner of the rise of Christianity, either wholly disregard the principles of historical proof or apply these principles arbitrarily, at their own convenience. Flyderer, latterly more and more bitterly repugning the interpretations of other scholars, alternately represented the personality of Jesus as a profoundly obscure problem, and offered fallacious elucidations thereof. With perfect confidence in his own selection of certainties. 3. Dr. Heinrichsai, offering a comprehensive view of Das or Christentum, 1902, ignores all historical difficulties on the score that he is discussing not the truth but the influence of Christianity. And so sets forth a copious account of the psychology of the Gospel Jesus which for critical science has no validity whatever. Dr. Schweitzer, in his Vaughan Riemaris zu Reed, ENG Trans, The Quest of the Historical Jesus, 1910, after ably confuting all the current conceptions of the Founder, sets forth one which incurs fatal criticism as soon as it is propounded. 4. The old fashion of manipulating the evidences, on the other hand, is still practiced from time to time even by distinguished experts like Professor Busset, a scholar who has done original and important work in outlying provinces of research. But how little critical validity attaches to Busset's vindication of the main Christian tradition has been crushingly set forth in the brochure of the late Pastor Kalf, was Wiss and were von Jesus. Lehmann, Berlin, 1904, in reply to Busset's discourse under the same title. Professing, for instance, to found on such historical data as the mention of an otherwise unknown, Crestus, by Suetonius, Busset deliberately denaturalizes the passage to suit his purpose. And then makes it vouch for a Christian community at Rome when none such can be shown to have existed. Kalth rightly likens such a handling of documents to the methods of the professed rationalizers denounced by Lessing in his day. Many of the liberal school of today are in fact at the standpoint of the semi rationalist beginnings of biblical criticism among the 18th century deists. On behalf of whom we can but say that they were at least sincere pioneers, and that Lessing, in substituting for their undeveloped critical method the idea of a divine education of mankind through all religious systems alike, retrograde to a standpoint where the rational interpretation of history ceases to be possible, and where the critic stultifies himself by censuring processes of thought which, on his own principles, 
should be envisaged as part of the divine scheme of education. Yet that nugatory formula in turn is pressed into the service of a theology which is consistent only in refusing to submit to scientific and logical tests. Then we have the significant portent of the pseudo-biological school of the Reverend Mr. Crawley, 5 according to which nothing in religion is new and nothing true, but all is more or less productive of vitality, and therefore precious, so that no critical analysis matters. Here the tribunals of historical and moral truth are brazenly closed. And the critical issue is referred to one commission for the instant by the defender of the faith, whose hand-to-mouth interpretations and generalizations of Christian history, worthy of a neophyte's essay, are complacently put forth as the vindication of beliefs and rights that are admittedly developments from mere savagery. And this repudiation of all intellectual morals, this negation of the very instinct of truth, is profusely flavored with a profession of zeal for the morals of sex and the instinct of life. Incidentally, too, an argument which puts all critical tests out of court is from time to time tinted with a suggestion of decent concern for historical research. So, too, among the scholars who reconstruct Christian origins at will, some profess to apply a critical method or set of methods by which they can put down all challenges of the reality of their subject matter. In Appendix C, I have shown what such method is worth in the hands of Professor Carl Clemen. Their general procedure is simply that of scholastics debating in vacuo, assuming what they please, and rejecting what they please. It is the method by which whole generations of their predecessors elucidated the details of the sacerdotal system of the Hebrews in the wilderness. Until Colenso, set doubting about sacred tradition by an intelligent Zulu, established arithmetically the truth of Voltaire's verdict that the whole thing was impossible. Then the experts, under cover of orthodox outcry, changed the venue, avowing no shame for their long aberration. In due time the modern specialists, or their successors, will realize that their main positions as to Christian origins are equally fabulous. But they or their successors will continue to be conscious of their professional perspicacity, and solemnly or angrily contemptuous of all lay criticism of their method. Were Gelatin vom Fock, they still call themselves in Germany, we scholars by profession, thus disposing of all lay criticism. It is not surprising that alongside of this vain demonstration of the historicity of myth there spreads, among determined believers in the historicity, an uneasy disposition to ground faith on the very, to believe. Called by the name of, spiritual experience. With a confidence equal to that of the professional documentists, such believers maintain that their own spiritual autobiographies can establish the historical actuality of what rationalist critics describe as ancient myths. The heart answers, I have felt. Some of these reasoners, proceeding on the lines of the pseudopaul, 1 Cor 2, dispose inexpensively of the historical critic by calling him impercipient. They themselves are the percipients vom Falk. Other apologists, with a little more modesty, reiterate their conviction that the Christian origins must have been what they have been accustomed to think, that no religious movement can have risen without a revered founder. And that the spread and duration of the Christian movement prove its founder to have been a very great personality indeed. Abstractly put, such a theorem logically ends in the bald claim of the theorist to special percipients, and a denial of percipients to all who refuse their assent. It has latterly come to be associated, however, with an appeal to historical analogy in the case of the modern Persian movement of the Bab, the lessons of which in this connection have been pressed upon Orthodox believers by the late Mr. Herbert Ricks. Mr. Ricks, whose personality gave weight and interest to all his views, seems to have set out as a Unitarian preacher with a fixed belief in the historicity of the Gospel Jesus, despite a recognition of the weakness of the historical basis. Noting, with what a childlike mind those ancient Christians came to all questions of external fact, how independent of external fact the truth they lived by really was. 6 He yet assumed that any tale passed on by such believers must have had a basis in a great personality. Those gospel stories, he wrote, come down to us by tradition handed on by the lips of ignorant peasants, so that we can never be quite sure that we have the precise truth about any incident. 7 Here both the positive and the negative assumptions are invalid. We do not know that all the gospel stories were passed on by peasants, 
and we never know whether there was any historical basis whatever for any one tale. But on such assumptions Mr. Ricks founded an unqualified conviction that the gospel Jesus, headed a new spiritual era, altered the whole face of things, gave us a new principle to live by, and, revolutionized the whole world of human affection. 8 And in his posthumous work, Rabbi, Messiah, and Martyr, 1907, he presents one more life of Jesus framed on the principle of excluding the supernatural and taking all the rest of the Gospels as substantially true. Yet towards the close of his life he seems to have realized either that this process was illicit or that it could not claim acceptance on historical grounds. Writing on the Bab movement, he speaks not only of those belated theologians who still think the case of a supernatural Christianity can be historically proved by evidence drawn from the latter part of the first century, but of the utter insecurity of the historical foundation of Christianity. And he avows how hopeless it is to try to base religion upon historical documents. 9 Then comes the exposition of how the Bab movement rose in the devotion evoked by a remarkable personality and how within thirty years the original account of the Founder was so completely superseded by a legendary account, full of miracles, that only one copy of the original document, by a rare chance, has survived. The argument now founded on this case is an attempt to salve the historicity of Jesus in surrendering the records. Renat pointed to the Bab movement as showing how an enthusiastic cult could arise and spread rapidly in our own day by purely natural forces. Accepting that demonstration, the Neo-Unitarians press the corollary that the Bab movement shows how rapidly myth can overgrow history, and that we have now a new analogical ground for believing that Jesus, like the Bab, was an actual person. Of great persuasive and inspiring power. But while the plea is perfectly reasonable, and deserves every consideration, it is clearly inconclusive. Cult beginnings are not limited to one mode. And the fatal fact remains that the beginnings of the Christus cult are wrapped in all the obscurity which surrounds the alleged founder, while we have trustworthy contemporary record of the beginnings of the Bab movement. Place the two cases beside that of the Bakshik cult in Greece, and we have a cult type in which wild devotion is given to a wholly mythical founder. The rationalist critic does not affirm the impossibility of an evolution of the Christus movement on the lines of that of the Bab he leaves such a priori reasoning to the other side. Simply insisting that there is no good historical evidence whatever, while there are strong grounds for inferring a mythical foundation. And those who abstractly insist on the historicity of Jesus must either recede from their position or revert to claims expressive merely of the personal equation, statements of the convincing force of their religious experience. Or claims to a special faculty of percipience. To all such claims the sufficient answer is that, arrogance apart, they are matched and cancelled by similar claims on the part of believers in other creeds. And that they could have been advanced with as much justification by ancient believers in Dionysus and Osiris. Who had no more doubt of the historicity of their founders than either an Orthodox or a Unitarian Christian has today concerning the historicity of Jesus. In short, the closing of historical problems by insistence on the personal equation is no more permissible among intellectual freemen than the settling of scientific questions thereby. Callous posterity, if not contemporary criticism, ruthlessly puts aside the personal equation in such matters, and reverts to the kind of argument which proceeds upon common grounds of credence and universal canons of evidence. And this reversion is now in process. Already the argument for the historicity of the main gospel narrative is being largely grounded even by some experts, on the single datum of the mention of, Brethren of the Lord, and, James the Brother of the Lord, in two of the Pauline epistles. This thesis is embodied in one of the ablest arguments on the historicity question that I have met with. It was put in a letter to me by a lay correspondent, open-mindedly seeking the truth by fair critical tests. He began by arguing that the data of a Paul party, a Cephas party, and an Apollos party, in Corinth, if accepted as evidence for the personalities of the three party leaders named, carry with them the inference of a Christ of whom some logia were current. If then the writer of the epistle, whether Paul or another, ignored such logia, that a silence of Paul is no argument for ignorance of such logia in general. This ingenious argument, I think, fails in respect of its unsupported premise. 
Christists might call themselves, of Christ, simply by way of disavowing all sectarian leadership. On the face of the case, the special converts of Paul were Christists without any logic of Christ to proceed upon. Equally ingenious, but I think equally inconclusive, is the further argument that the challenge, Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? 1 Sr. 9, 1, implies that Paul's status was discredited on the score that he had not seen the Lord, while other apostles had. But the dispute here turns finally on the question of the authenticity of the epistle as a whole, or the chapter or the plea in particular. As coming from Paul, it is a weak plea, multitudes were said to have seen Jesus. The apostle would have claimed, if anything, authorization by Jesus. But as a traditional claim it is intelligible enough. Now, this portion of the epistle is one of those most strongly impugned by the tests of Van Manen as betraying a late authorship and standpoint, that of ecclesiastic standing for their income and their right to marry. The conception of Paul battling against his converts for his salary and the right to lead about a wife, within a few pages of his declaration, 7, 8-9, to the unmarried and to widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they have not continency, let them marry, this is staggering even to believers in the authenticity of, the four, or all of the epistles, and gives the very strongest ground for treating the irreconcilable passage in chapter 9. If not the whole chapter, as a subsequent interpolation. That the same hand penned both passages is incredible. Thus we come to the, brethren of the Lord, with an indestructible presumption against the text. They are mentioned as part of the case for that claim to marry which is utterly excluded by chapter 7. And the claim for salaries and freedom to marry is as obviously likely to be the late interpolation as is the doctrine of asceticism to be the earlier. Given then the clear lateness of the passage, what does the phrase, brethren of the Lord, prove? That at a period presumably long subsequent to that of Paul there was a tradition of a number of church leaders or teachers so named. Who were they? They are never mentioned in the Acts. They are never indicated in the Gospels. Brethren of Jesus are there referred to, MT 12, 46, 13, 55, MK 3, 31, 32, LK 8, 19, 20, JN 7, 3, 5, 10. But, to say nothing of the facts that three of these passages are plainly duplicates, and that only in one are any of the brethren named, there is never the slightest suggestion that any one of them joined the propaganda. On the contrary, it is expressly declared that, even his brethren did not believe on him, JN 7, 5. How then, on that basis, supposing it to have a primary validity, are we to accept the view that the James of Gal? I, 19, was a uterine brother or a half-brother of the founder, who before Paul's advent had come to something like primacy in the church, without leaving even a traditional trace of him as a brother of Jesus in the Acts. Either the Gospel data are historically decisive or they are not. By excluding them from his, pillar texts, 10 Professor Schmiedel admits that they are bound up with the supernatural view of Jesus. The resort to the argument from the epistles is a partial confession that the whole Gospel record is open to doubt, and that the specification of four brothers and several sisters of Jesus in one passage is a perplexity. It has always been so. Several fathers accounted for them as children of Joseph by a former wife, several others made them children of Clopas and, the other, Mary, and so only cousins of Jesus. If the Gospel record is valid evidence, the question is at an end. If it is not, the evidence from the epistles falls. Brethren of the Lord is a late illusion, which may stand for a mere tradition or may tell of a group name. And the mention of James as a brother, with no hint of any others, in the epistle to the Galatians can perfectly well be an interpolation, even supposing the epistle to be genuine. I have here examined the whole argument because it is fully the strongest known to me on the side of the historicity of Jesus, and I am concerned to evade nothing. The candid reader, I think, will admit that even if he holds by the historicity it cannot be established on the grounds in question. He will then, I trust, bring an open mind to bear on the whole reasoning of the second part of the ensuing treatise.
As in the case of the second edition of Christianity and Mythology I am deeply indebted to Mr. Percy Vaughan for carefully reading the proofs of these pages, and revising the index. April, 1911 How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit CompleteAudiobooks.com for more quality content. Introduction My purpose in grouping the four ensuing studies is to complement and complete the undertaking of a previous volume, entitled Christianity and Mythology. That was substantially a mythological analysis of the Christian system, introduced by a discussion of mythological principles in that particular connection and in general. The bulk of the present volume is substantially a synthesis of Christian origins, introduced by a discussion of the principles of hierology. Such discussion is still forced on sociology by the special pleaders of the prevailing religion. But the central matter of the book is its attempt to trace and synthesize the real lines of growth of the Christian cultus. And it challenges criticism above all by its theses, 1, that the gospel story of the Last Supper, Passion, Betrayal, Trial, Crucifixion, and Resurrection, is visibly a transcript of a mystery drama, and not originally a narrative. And 2, that that drama is demonstrably, as historic demonstration goes, a symbolic modification of an original rite of human sacrifice, of which it preserves certain verifiable details. That the exact point of historic connection between the early Eucharistic rite and the late drama story has still to be traced, it is needless to remark. Had direct evidence on this had been forthcoming, the problem could not so long have been ignored. But it is here contended that the lines of evolution are established by the details of the record and the institution, in the light of the data of anthropology, and that we have thus at last a scientific basis for a history of Christianity. As was explained in the Introduction to Christianity and Mythology, these studies originated some 25 years back in an attempt to realize and explain the rise of Christianity sociologically considered. And it is as a beginning of such an exposition that the two books are meant to be taken. In a short history of Christianity the general historic conception is outlined. And the present volume offers the detailed justification of the views there summarily put as to Christian origins, insofar as they were not fully developed in the earlier volume. On one point, the origins of Manichaeism, the present work departs from the ordinary historic view, which was accepted in the short history, the proposed rectification here being a result of the main investigation. In this connection it may be noted that Schwegler had already denied the historicity of Montanus, a thesis which I have not sought to incorporate, though I somewhat inclined to accept it. Whether or not I am able to carry out the original scheme in full, I am fain to hope that these inquiries will be of some small use towards meeting the need which motive them. Mythology has permanently interested me only as throwing light on hierology, and hierology has permanently interested me only as throwing light on sociology. The third and fourth sections of this book, accordingly, are so placed with a view to the comparative elucidation of the growth of Christianity. If it be objected that they are thus, tendency, writings, the answer is that they were independently done, and are as complete as I could make them in the space. Both are revisions and expansions of lectures formerly published in, The Religious Systems of the World, that on Mithraism being now nearly thrice its original length. Undertaken and expanded without the aid of Professor Cumont's great work, Texts et Monuments Figures Relatifs Aux Mysteres de Mitra, 1896-9, it has been revised in the welcome light of that magistral performance. 2M. Cumont I owe much fresh knowledge, and the correction of some errors, as well as the confirmation of several of my conclusions. And if I have ventured here and there to dissent from him, and above all to maintain a thesis not recognized by him, that Mitra in the legend made a descent into hell, I do so only after due hesitation. The non-appearance of any other study of Mithraism in English may serve as my excuse for having carried my paper into some detail, especially by way of showing how much the dead cult had in common with the living. Christian origins cannot be understood without making this comparison. It is significant, however, 
of our British avoidance of comparative hierology wherever it bears on current beliefs that while Germany has contributed to the study of Mithraism, among many others. The learned treatise of Windischmann and that in Rauscher's lexicon, France the zealous researches of Lagert, and Belgium the encyclopedic and decisive work of Professor Cumont, England has produced not a single independent book on the subject. In compensation for such neglect, we have developed a signal devotion to folklore. If some of the favor shown to that expansive study be turned on serious attempts to understand the actual process of growth of world religions, the present line of research may be extended to advantage. The lecture on the religions of ancient America has in turn been carefully revised and much enlarged, not because this subject is equally ignored among us, for there is a sufficiency of information upon it in English. Notably in one of the two little utilized collections of descriptive sociology compiled for Mr. Spencer, but because again the comparative bearing of the study of the dead cults on that of the living has not been duly considered. In particular I have entered into some detail tending to support the theory, not yet to be put otherwise than as a disputed hypothesis, that certain forms and cults of human sacrifice, first evolved anciently in Central Asia. Passed to America on the east, and to the Semitic peoples on the west, resulting in the latter case in the central mystery of Christianity, and in the former in the Mexican system of human sacrifices. But the psychological importance of the study does not, I trust, solely stand or fall with that theory. On the general sociological problem, I may say, a closer study of the Mexican civilization has dissolved an opinion I formerly held, that it might have evolved from within past the stage of human sacrifice had it been left to itself. Whatever view be taken of the scope of religious heredity, there will remain in the established historic facts sufficient justification for the general title of pagan Christs. Which best indicates in one phrase the kinship of all cults of human sacrifice and Theophagus sacrament, as well as of all cults of which the founder figures as an inspired teacher. That principle has already been broadly made good on the first side by the incomparable research of Dr. J. G. Fraser, to whose golden bow I owe both theoretic light and detail knowledge. I ask, therefore, that when I make bold to reject Dr. Fraser's suggested solution, edition 1900, of the historic problem raised by the parallel between certain Christian and non-Christian sacra, I shall not be supposed to undervalue his great treasury of ordered knowledge. On the question of the historicity of founders, I have made answer in the second edition of Christianity and Mythology to certain strictures of his which seem to me very ill-considered. What I claim for my own solution is that it best satisfies the ruling principles of his own hierology. In this connection, however, I feel it a duty to avow that the right direction had previously been pointed out by the late Grant Allen in his Evolution of the Idea of God, 1897. Though at the outset of his work he obscured it for many of us by insisting on the absolute historicity of Jesus, a position which later on he in effect abandons. It is after ostensibly setting out with the actuality of Jesus the son of the carpenter, as an unassailable rock of solid historical fact, page 16, that he incidentally, p. 285, pronounces the Christian legend to have been mainly constructed out of the details of such early God-making sacrifices as that practiced by the Khans. Finally, p. 391, he writes that, at the outset of our inquiry we had to accept crudely the bare fact that the cult arose at a certain period, and that we can now see that it was but one more example of a universal God-making tendency in human nature. Returning to Allen's book after having independently worked out in detail precisely such a derivation and such a theory, I was surprised to find that where he had thus thrown out the clue I had not on a first reading been at all impressed by it. The reason probably was that for me the problem had been primarily one of historical derivation, and that Allen offered no historical solution, being satisfied to indicate analogies. And it was probably the still completer disregard of historical difficulties that brought oblivion upon the essay of her Kulischer, Das Leben Jesu ein Sage von dem Schicksal und Erlebnis in der Bodenfrucht. Insbesondere der Sogenannten Palestinensischen Erstlingsgarb, die im Passafest im Tempel Dargebracht Word, Leipzig, 1876, in which Dr. Fraser's thesis of the vegetal character of the typical slain and rearising deity is put forth without evidence but with entire confidence. 
Kulishur had simply posited the analogy of the vegetation god and the vegetation cult as previous students had done that of the sun god and the sun myth, not only without tracing any process of transmutation. But with a far more arbitrary interpretation of symbols than they had ventured on. His essay thus remains only a remarkable piece of pioneering, which went broadly in the right direction, but missed the true path. It is not indeed to be assumed that if he had made out a clear historical case it would have been listened to by his generation. The generation before him had paid little heed to the massive and learned treatise of Gilani, Die Menschenopfer der Alten Hebräer, 1842, wherein the derivation of the Passover from a rite of human sacrifice is well made out. And that of the Christian Eucharist from a modified Jewish sacrament of theophagy is at least strikingly argued for. Gilani had further noted some of the decisive analogies of sacrificial ritual and gospel narrative which are founded on in the following pages. And was substantially on the right historic track, though he missed some of the archaeological proofs of the prevalence of human sacrifice in pre-exilic Judaism. Daumer, too, went far towards a right historical solution in his work Der Feuer und Malachdienst der Alten Hebräer, which was synchronous with that of his friend Gilani, and again in his treatise Die Geheimnis der Christlichen Altertums, 1847. His later proclamation of mean conversion, 1859, would naturally discredit his earlier theses. But the disregard of the whole argument in the hierology of that day is probably to be explained as due to the fact that the conception of a science of religions, specified by Vinet in 1856 as beginning to grow up alongside of theology, had not then been constituted for educated men. The works of Gillany and Dalmer have been so far forgotten that not till my own research had been independently made and elaborated did I meet with them. Today, the conditions of hierological research are very different. A generation of students is now steeped in the anthropological lore of which Gillany, failing to profit by the lead of Constant, noted only the details preserved in the classics and European histories. And the scientific significance of his and Dalmer's and Cooley Schur's theories is clear in the light of the studies of Tyler, Spencer, and Fraser. Grant Allen, with the ample materials of recent anthropology to draw upon, made a vital advance by connecting the central Christian legend with the whole process of religious evolution, in terms not of a priori theology but of anthropological fact. If, however, the lack of historical demonstration, and the uncorrected premise of a conventional historical view, made his theory at first lack significance for a reader like myself, it has probably caused it to miss its mark with others. That is no deduction from its scientific merit, but it may be that the historical method will assist to its appreciation. It was by way of concrete recognition of structural parallelism that I reached the theory, having entirely forgotten, if I had ever noted. Allen's passing mention of one of the vital details in question, that of the breaking of the legs of victims in primitive human sacrifice. In 1842 Gillany had laid similar stress on the detail of the lance thrust in the fourth gospel, to which he adduced the classic parallel noted hereinafter. And when independent researches thus yield a variety of particular corroborations of a theory reached otherwise by a broad generalization, the reciprocal confirmation is, I think, tolerably strong. The recognition of the gospel mystery play, it is here submitted, is the final historical validation of the whole thesis. Which might otherwise fail to escape the fate of disregard which has thus far befallen the most brilliant speculation of the a priori mythologists in regard to the Christian legend. From the once famous works of Dupuis and Volney down to the little-noticed letter Sopra la Mytologia Vedica of Professor de Gubernatis. However that may be, Grant Allen's service in the matter is now from my point of view unquestionable. Of less importance, but still noteworthy, is Professor Huxley's sketch of The Evolution of Theology, with which, while demurring to some of what I regard as its uncritical assumptions, accepted, I regret to say, by Allen. In his otherwise scientific ninth chapter, I find myself in considerable agreement on Judaic origins. Professor Huxley's essay points to the need for a combination of the studies of hierology and anthropology in the name of sociology. And on that side it would be unpardonable to omit acknowledgement of the great work that has actually been done for sociological synthesis. I am specially bound to make it in view of my occasional dissent on anthropological matters from Spencer. 
such dissent is apt to suggest difference of principle in a disproportionate degree. And Spencer's own iconoclasm has latterly evoked a kind of criticism that is little concerned to avow his services. It is the more fitting that such a treatise as the present should be accompanied by a tribute to them. However his anthropology may have to be modified in detail, it remains clear to some of U.S., whom it has enlightened, that his elucidations are of fundamental importance, all later attempts being related to them. And that his main method is permanently valid. In regard to matters less habitually contested, it is perhaps needless to add that I am as little lacking in gratitude for the great scholarly services rendered to all students of hierology by Professor Rhys Davids. When I venture to withstand his weighty opinion on Buddhist origins, my contrary view would be ill accredited indeed if I were not able to support it with much evidence yielded by his scholarship and his candor. And it is perhaps not unfitting that, by way of final word of preface to a treatise which sets out with a systematic opposition to the general doctrine of Dr. F. B. Jevons, I acknowledge that I have profited by his survey of the field, and even by the suggestiveness of some of his arguments that seem to me to go astray. Part 1. The Rationale of Religion. Chapter 1. The Naturalness of All Belief. 1. Origin of the Gods from Fear. It seems probable, despite theological cavils, that Petronius was right in his signal saying, fear first made the gods. In the words of a recent hierologist, we may be sure that primitive man took to himself the credit of his successful attempts to work the mechanism of nature for his own advantage. But when the machinery did not work he ascribed the fault to some overruling supernatural power. It was the violation of, previously exploited, sequences, and the frustration of his expectations, by which the belief in supernatural power was, not created, but first called forth. 11. The fact that this writer proceeds to repudiate his own doctrine 12 is no reason why we should, save to the extent of noting the temerity of his use of the term, supernatural. There are some very strong reasons, apart from the a priori one cited above, for thinking that the earliest human notions of superhuman beings were framed in terms of fear. Perhaps the strongest of all is the fact that savages and barbarians in nearly all parts of the world appear to regard disease and death as invariably due to purposive hostile action, whether normal, magical, or spiritual. 13. Not even old age is for many of these primitive thinkers a probable natural cause of death. 14. If then the life of early man was not much less troublous than that of contemporary primitives, he is likely to have been moved as much as they to conceive of the unseen powers as malevolent. On the Gold Coast, says a close student, the majority of these spirits are malignant, I believe that originally all were conceived as malignant, 15. And how, indeed, could it be otherwise? Those who will not assent have forgotten, as indeed most anthropologists strangely forget when they are discussing the beginnings of religion, that man as we know him is descended from something less human, more brute. Something nearer the predatory beast life of fear and foray. When in the period of upward movement which we term civilization, as distinct from animal savagery, there could arise thrills of yearning or gratitude towards unknown powers. We are eons off from the stage of subterhuman growth in which the germs of conceptual religion must have stirred. If the argument is to be that there is no religion until man loves his gods, let it be plainly put, and let not a verbal definition become a petitio principi. If, again, no noumena are to be termed gods but those who are loved, let that proposition too be put as a simple definition of term. But if we are to look for the beginnings of the human notion of noumena, of unseen spirits who operate in nature and interfere with man, let it be as plainly put that they presumably occurred when fear of the unknown was normal. And gratitude to an unknown impossible. But in saying that fear first made the gods, or made the first gods, we imply that other god-making forces came into play later. And no dispute arises when this is affirmed of the process of making the gods of the higher religions, in their later forms. Even here, at the outset, the play of gratitude is no such ennobling exercise as to involve much lifting of the moral standpoint. And even in the higher religions gratitude to the god is often correlative with fear of the evil spirits whom he wards off. This factor is constantly present in the Gospels and in the polemic of the early fathers. 
16 and has never disappeared from religious life. The pietist who in our own day pours out thanks to Providence for saving him in the earthquake in which myriads have perished is no more ethically attractive than philosophically persuasive. And the gratitude of savages and barbarians for favors received and expected can hardly have been more refined. It might even be said that a cruder egoism presides over the making of good gods than over the birth of the gods of fear. 17 The former having their probable origin in an individualistic as against a tribal instinct. But it may be granted that the god who ostensibly begins as a private guardian angel or family spirit may become the germ of a more ethical cultus than that of the god generically feared. And the process chronically recurs. There is, indeed, no generic severance between the gods of fear and the gods of love, most deities of the more advanced races having both aspects, nevertheless. Certain specified deities are so largely shaped by men's affections that they might recognizably be termed the beloved gods. It will on the whole be helpful to an understanding of the subject if we name such gods, in terms of current conceptions, the Christs of the world's pantheon. That title, indeed, no less fitly includes figures which do not strictly rank as gods. But in thus widely relating it we shall be rather elucidating than obscuring religious history. Only by some such collocation of ideas can the inquirer surmount his presuppositions and take the decisive step toward seeing the religions of mankind as alike man-made. On the other hand, he is not thereby committed to any one view in the field of history proper, he is left free to argue for a historical Christ as for a historical Buddha. Even on the ground of the concept of evolution, however, scientific agreement is still hindered by persistence in the old classifications. The trouble meets us on one line in arbitrary fundamental separations between mythology and religion, early religion and early ethics, religion and magic, genuine myths and non-genuine myths. 18 On another line it meets us in the shape of a sudden and local reopening of the problem of theistic intervention in a quasi-philosophical form, or a willful repudiation of naturalistic method when the inquiry reaches current beliefs. Thus results which were reached by disinterested scholarship a generation ago are sought to be subverted, not by a more thorough scholarship, but by keeping away from the scholarly problem and suggesting a new standard of values. Open to no rational tests. It may be well, therefore, to clear the ground so far as may be of such dispute at the outset by stating and vindicating the naturalistic position in regard to it. 2. All belief results of reasoning. In the midst of much dispute, moral science approaches agreement on the proposition that all primitive beliefs and usages, however strange or absurd, are to be understood as primarily products of judgment. Representing theories of causation or guesses at the order of things. To such agreement, however, hindrance is set up by the reversion of some inquirers to the old view that certain savage notions are irrational in the strict sense. Thus Dr. F. B. Jevons decides that, there is no rational principle of action in taboo, it is mechanical, arbitrary, because its sole basis is the arbitrary association of ideas, irrational, because its principle is, in the words of Mr. Lang, that causal connection in thought is equivalent to causative connection in fact, 19 again, Dr. Jevons lays it down 20 that, taboo, is the conviction that there are certain things which must, absolutely must, and not on grounds of experience of unconscious utility, be avoided. It is significant that in both of these passages the proposition runs into verbal insignificance or countersense. In the first cited we are told, 1, that a certain association of ideas is arbitrary because its basis is an arbitrary association of ideas, and, 2, that it is all the while a causal, i.e., a non-arbitrary, connection in thought. In the last we are in effect told that the tabooer is conscious that he is not proceeding on an ancestral experience when he is merely not conscious of doing so. When instructed men thus repeatedly lapse into mere nullities of formula, there is presumably something wrong with their theory. Now, the whole subject of taboo is put outside science by the assumption that the practice is in origin, irrational, and absolute, and arbitrary, and independent of all experience of utility. As Dar. Jevons himself declares in another connection, the savage's thought is subject to mental laws as much as is civilized man's. 
How, then, is this dictum to be reconciled with that? What is the law of the savages' arbitrariness? Conceivably part of it lies before us in Dr. Jevons's page of denial. The very illustration first given by him for the proposition last cited from him is that, the mourner is as dangerous as the corpse he has touched, the mourner is as dangerous to those he loves as to those he hates. Here, one would suppose, was a pretty obvious clue to an intelligible causation. Is it to be, arbitrarily, decided that primitive men never observed the phenomena of contagion from corpse to mourners, and from mourners to their families? Or, observing it, never sought to act on the experience? Is it not notorious that among contemporary primitives there is often an intense and vigilant fear of contagious disease? 21. The only fair objection to accepting such a basis for one species of taboo is that for other species no such explanation is available. But what science looks for in such a matter is not a direct explanation for every instance, it suffices that we find an explanation or explanations for such a principle or conception as taboo, and then recognize that, once set up, it may be turned to really arbitrary account by chiefs, priests, and adventurers. Arbitrary has two significations, in two references, it means, illogical, in reference to reason, or, representative of one will as against the general will. In the first sense, it is here irrelevant, for no one pretends that taboo is right. But it may apply in the other in a way not intended by Dr. Jevons. For nothing can be more obvious than the adaptability of the idea of taboo, once crystallized or conventionalized in a code, to purposes of individual malice, and to all such procedure as men indicate by the term, priestcraft. Dar. Jevons, in his concern to prove, what no one ever seriously disputed, that priests did not and could not create the religious or superstitious instinct, leaves entirely out of his exposition, and even by implication denies. The vitally relevant truth that they exploit it. And in overlooking this he sadly burdens, if he does not wreck, his own unduly biased theory of the religious instinct as something relatively deep, and as proceeding in terms of an abnormal consciousness of contact with the divine. For if those relatively arbitrary and irrational forms of taboo do not come from the priest, that is, from the religion maker or monger, whether official or not, they must, on Dr. Jevons's own showing, come from religion. It may be that he would not at once reject such a conclusion, for the apparent motive of much of his treatment of taboo is the sanctification of it as an element in the ancestry of the Christian religion. For this purpose he is ready to go to notable lengths, as when 22 he allows cannibalism to be sometimes religious in intention. But while insisting at one point on the absolute unreasonness and immediate certitude of the notion of taboo, apparently in order to place it on all fours with the direct consciousness, which for him is the mark of a religious belief. He admits in so many words, as we have seen, that it is arbitrary and irrational, which is scarcely a way of accrediting it as a religious phenomenon. Rather the purpose of that aspersion seems to be to open the way for another aggrandizement of religion as having suppressed irrational taboo. On the one hand we are told 23 that the savage's fallacious belief in the transmissibility of taboo was, the sheath which enclosed and protected a conception that was to blossom and bear a priceless fruit, the conception of social obligation. This is an arguable thesis, not framed by Dr. Jevons for the purposes of his theorem, but spontaneously set forth by several missionaries. 24 Here we need but note the implication of the old fallacy that when any good is seen to follow upon an evil we must assume the evil to have been a conditio sine qua non of the good. The missionaries and Dr. Jevons have assumed that but for the device of taboo there could have been no social code, a thesis not to be substantiated either deductively or inductively. But with this problem we need not now concern ourselves, since Dr. Jevons himself turns the tables on it. After the claim has been made for the salvatory action of taboo, we read 25 that, it was only among the minority of mankind, and there only under exceptional circumstances, that the institution bore its best fruit. Indeed, in many respects the evolution of taboo has been fatal to the progress of humanity. And again. In religion the institution also had a baneful effect, the irrational restrictions, touch not, taste not, 
handle not, which constitute formalism, are essentially taboos, essential to the education of man at one period of his development. But a bar to his progress later. But now is introduced 26 the theorem of the process by which taboo has been converted into an element of civilization, it is this. From the fallacy of magic man was delivered by religion, and there are reasons. For believing that it was by the same aid he escaped from the irrational restrictions of taboo. Point 27. In the higher forms of religion, the trivial and absurd restrictions are cast off, and those alone retained which are essential to morality and religion. Point 28. We shall have to deal later with the direct propositions here put. But for the moment it specially concerns us to note that the denouement does not hold scientifically or logically good. The fact remains that irrational taboo as such was, in the terms of the argument, strictly religious. That religion in this aspect had no sense in it, inasmuch as taboo had passed from a primitive precaution to a priest-made convention, 29 and that what religion is alleged to deliver man from is just religion. Thus alternately does religion figure for the apologist as a rational tendency correcting an irrational, and as an irrational tendency doing good which a rational one cannot. And the further we follow his teaching the more frequently does such a contradiction emerge. 3. Dr. Jevons' Theories of Religious Evolution At the close of his work, apparently forgetting the propositions of his first chapter as to the priority of the sense of obstacle in the primitive man's notion of supernatural forces, Dr. Jevons affirms that the earliest attempt towards harmonizing the facts of the external and inner consciousness, by which is meant observation and reflection took the form of ascribing the external prosperity which befell a man to the action of the divine love of which he was conscious within himself, and the misfortunes which befell him to the wrath of the justly offended divine will. 30. Here we have either a contradiction of the thesis before cited, or a resort to the extremely arbitrary assumption that in taking credit to himself for successful management of things, and imputing his miscarriages to a superior power. The primitive man is not trying to harmonize the facts of his experience. Such an argument would be on every ground untenable, but it appears to be all that can stand between Dr. Jevons and self-contradiction. The way to a sound position is by settling impartially the definition of the term religion. How dare. Jevons misses this may be gathered from the continuation of the passage under notice. Man, being by nature religious, began by a religious explanation of nature. To assume, as is often done, that man had no religious consciousness one, begin with, and that the misfortunes which befell him inspired him with fear. And fear led him to propitiate the malignant beings whom he imagined to be the causes of his suffering, fails to account for the very thing it intended to explain, namely, the existence of religion. It might account for superstitious dread of malignant beings, it does not account for the grateful worship of benignant beings, nor for the universal satisfaction which man finds in that worship. As we have seen, Dar. Jevons himself had at the outset plainly posited what he now describes as a fallacious assumption. On his prior showing, man's experience of apparent hostility in nature first called forth his belief in supernatural power. The interposed phrase, was not created but, looks like an after attempt to reconcile the earlier proposition with the later. But there is no real reconciliation, for Dr. Jevons thus sets up only the vain suggestion that the primitive man was from the first conscious of the existence of good supernatural powers but did not think they did him any good, another collapse in countersense, or else the equally unmanageable notion that primitive man recognized helpful supernatural being dash. But was not grateful to them for their help. That the argument has not been scientifically conducted is further clear from the use now of the expression superstitious dread as the equivalent of fear, while grateful worship stands for satisfaction. Why superstitious dread and not superstitious gratitude? A scientific inquiry will treat the phenomena on a moral par, and will at this stage simply put aside the term superstition. It is relevant only as imputing a superior degree of gratuitousness of belief, whether by way of fear or of satisfaction, at a comparatively advanced state of culture. To call a savage superstitious when he fears a god, 
and religious when he thanks one, is not only to warp the science of religion at the start, but to block even the purpose in view, for, as we have seen, Dr. Jevons is constrained by his own motive of edification to assume that the benignant God ought by rights to be sometimes feared. 4. Scientific View of the Religious Evolution Putting aside as unscientific all such prejudgments, and leaving the professed religionist his personal remedy of discriminating finally between true and false religion. Let us begin at the beginning by noting that religious consciousness can intelligibly mean only a given direction of consciousness. And if we are to make any consistent specification of the point at which consciousness begins to be religious, we shall put it impartially in simple animism, the spontaneous surmise, seem to be dimly made or makeable even by animals. That not only animals and plants, but inanimate things, may possess life. Dr. Jevons rightly points out 31 that this primary notion neither proceeds from nor implies nor accounts for belief in the supernatural. And he goes on to show, developing here the doctrine which he ultimately repudiates, how the latter notion would arise through man's connecting with certain agencies or spirits, the frustrative or molestive power, which he had already found to exercise an unexpected and irresistible control over his destiny. In this way, continues Dr. Jevons, suddenly granting much more than he need or ought, the notion of supernatural power, which originally was purely negative and manifested itself merely in suspending or counteracting the uniformity of nature, came to have a positive content. From this point, as might have been divined, the argument becomes confused to the last degree. We have been brought to the supernatural as a primitive product of, a, the recognition of irregular and frustrative forces in nature, and, b, the identification of them as personalities or spirits like man. But immediately, in the interests of another preconception, the theorist proceeds in effect to cancel this by arguing that, when men resort to magic, the idea of the supernatural has disappeared. His proposition is that, the belief in the supernatural was prior to the belief in magic, and that the latter, whenever it sprang up, was a degradation or relapse in the evolution of religion. 32 Inasmuch as it assumed man's power to control the forces of nature by certain stratagems. And as he argues at the same time that religion and magic had different origins, and were always essentially distinct from one another. It is implied that religion began in that belief in a, frustrative, supernatural which is asserted to have preceded magic. That is to say, religion began in the recognition of hostile or dangerous powers. Now, a logically vigilant investigator would either not have said that belief in a supernatural was constituted by the recognition of hostile personal forces in nature, or, having said it, would have granted that magic was an effort to circumvent supernatural as well as other forces. Dar. Jevons first credits the early savage with, among other things, a conception of supernatural power which excluded the idea of man's opposition. And then with the power so to transform his first notion as to see in the so-called supernatural merely forms of nature. An intellectual process achieved in the civilized world only as a long and arduous upward evolution on scientific lines is thus supposed to have been more or less sudden, effected as a mere matter either of ignorant downward drift or of perverse experiment by primeval man. Or at least by savage man. It is not easy to be more arbitrary in the way of hypothesis. Combating the contrary view, which makes magic prior to religion, Yar. Jevons writes. To read some writers, who derive the powers of priests, and even of the gods, from those of the magician, and who consider apparently that magic requires no explanation, one would imagine that the savage, surrounded by supernatural powers and a prey to supernatural terrors, one day conceived the happy idea that he too would himself exercise supernatural power, and the thing was done, sorcery was invented. And the rest of the evolution of religion follows without difficulty. 33. It is difficult to estimate the relevance of this criticism without knowing the precise expressions which provoked it, but as regards any prevailing view of evolution it is somewhat pointless. One day, is not the formula of evolutionary conceptions. But Dr. Jevons's own doctrine, 
which is to the effect that magical rites arose by way of parody of worship rites after the latter had for ages been in undisputed possession, suggests just such a catastrophic conception as he imputes. Rejecting the obvious evolutionary hypothesis that explicit magic and explicit religion so-called arose confusedly together, that magic employs early religious machinery because it is but a contemporary expression of the state of mind in which religion rises and roots, he insists that magic cannot have been tried save by way of late parody. In an intellectual atmosphere which, nevertheless, he declares to be extremely conservative, 34 and which is therefore extremely unlikely to develop such parodies. 35. Dr. Jevons's doctrinal motive, it is pretty clear, is his wish to relieve religion of the discredit of magic, even as he finally and remorsefully seeks to relieve it of the discredit of originating in fear. Having no such axe to grind, the scientific inquirer might here offer to let religion mean anything Dr. Jevons likes, if he will only stick to one definition. But science must stipulate for some term to designate a series of psychological processes which originate in the same order of cognitions and conceptions, on the same plane of knowledge, and have strictly correlative results in action. And as such a term would certainly have to be applied sooner or later to much of what Dr. Jevons wants to call religion, we may just as well thrash out the issue over that long-established name. 5. Dr. Fraser's Definition the need for an understanding becomes pressing when we compare with the conceptions of Dr. Jevons those of Dr. J. G. Fraser, as set forth in the revised edition of his great work, The Golden Bough. Having before the issue of his first edition, failed, perhaps inexcusably, he modestly avows, to define even to myself my notion of religion, he was then disposed to class magic loosely under it as one of its lower forms. Now he has come to agree with Sir A. C. Lyle and Mr. F. B. Jevons in recognizing a fundamental distinction and even opposition of principle between magic and religion. 36 On this view he defines religion as a propitiation or conciliation of powers superior to man which are believed to direct and control the course of nature and of human life. In this sense, he adds, it will readily be perceived that religion is opposed in principle both to magic and to science. 37. The first comment on such a proposition is that it all depends on what you mean by principle. If religion means only the act of propitiation and conciliation of certain alleged powers, its principle may be placed either in the hope that such propitiation will succeed or in the feeling that it ought to be tried. In either case, the accuracy of the proposition is far from clear. But we must widen the issue. It will be seen that Dr. Fraser's formal definition of religion is as inadequate as that implied in the argument of Dr. Jevons, though his practical handling of the case is finally the more scientific. On the above definition, belief is no part of religion, 38 and neither is gratitude, though fear may be held to be implied in propitiation. Further, religion has by this definition nothing to do with ethics and even conduct shaped by way of simple obedience to a god's alleged commands is barely recognized under the head of propitiation. Finally, a theist who has ever so reverently arrived at the idea of an all-wise omnipotence which needs not to be propitiated or conciliated, has on Dr. Fraser's definition ceased to be religious. It will really not do. I am not here pressing for a wider definition, as do some professed rationalists, by way of securing for my own philosophy or ethic the prestige of a highly respectable name, nor do I even endorse their claim as for themselves. I simply urge that as a matter of scientific convenience and consistency the word must be allowed to cover at least the bulk of the phenomena to which it has immemorially been applied. Where dar? Fraser by his definition makes religion nearly unknown to the Australian, because the Australian, mainly for lack of the wherewithal, does not sacrifice 39 Mr. Lang ascribes to them a higher or deeper religious feeling on that very account. 40 Such chaos of definition must be averted by a more comprehensive theory. Whether or not we oppose magic to religion, we cannot exclude from the latter term the whole process of non-propitiatory religious ethic, of thanksgiving ritual, and of cosmological doctrine. Later we shall have to deal with Dr. Jevons's attempt to withdraw the term from theistic philosophy and from mythology, 
but we may provisionally insist that emotional resignation to the divine will is in terms of all usage whatsoever a religious phenomenon. It remains to consider the alleged severance between religion and magic. It is interesting to find Dr. Jevons and Dr. Fraser here partially at one, as against the general opinion of anthropologists. That may be cited from a theologian, Professor T. W. Davies, in whose doctoral thesis on magic, divination, and demonology, a performance both learned and judicious, it is argued that all magic is a sort of religion, 41 Dr. Fraser, while agreeing with Dr. Jevons that they are opposed, differs from him in holding that magic preceded religion, and by an odd fatality Dr. Fraser contradicts himself as explicitly as does Dr. Jevons. After avowing the belief that in the evolution of thought, magic, as representing a lower intellectual stratum, has probably everywhere preceded religion. 42 He also avows that the antagonism between the two seems to have made its appearance comparatively late in the history of religion. At an earlier stage the functions of priest and sorcerer were often combined, or, to speak perhaps more correctly, were not yet differentiated from each other. To serve his purpose, man wooed the goodwill of gods or spirits by prayer and sacrifice. While at the same time he had recourse to ceremonies and forms of words which he hoped would of themselves bring about the desired result without the help of God or devil. In short, he performed religious and magical rites simultaneously. He uttered prayers and incantations almost in the same breath, knowing or reeking little of the theoretical inconsistency of his behavior, so long as by hook or crook he contrived to get what he wanted. 43. Proceeding with his ostensible support of the thesis that magic preceded religion, Dr. Fraser, in his admirably learned way, gives us fresh illustrations of the same confusion of magic and religion in civilized and uncivilized peoples. 44. From Drive. Oldenburg he cites the observation that the ritual of the very sacrifices for which the metrical prayers were composed is described in the older Vedic texts as saturated from beginning to end with magical practices which were to be carried out by the sacrificial priests, and that the Brahmanic rites of marriage initiation and king anointing are complete models of magic of every kind, and in every case the form of magic employed bears the stamp of the highest antiquity. 45. From Sir Gaston Maspero he accepts the weighty reminder that in regard to ancient Egypt we ought not to attach to the word magic the degrading idea which it almost inevitably calls up in the mind of a modern. Ancient magic was the very foundation of religion. The faithful who desired to obtain some favor from a god had no chance of succeeding except by laying hands on the deity. And this arrest could only be effected by means of a certain number of rites, sacrifices, prayers, and chants, which the God himself had revealed, and which obliged him to do what was demanded of him. 46. A closely similar state of things is seen in the practice of the Maoris, who, when using coercive spells, to compel the gods to yield to their wishes. Added sacrifices and offerings at the same time to appease as it were their anger for being thus constrained. And the missionary who on these data represents the Maoris as rather coercing their gods than praying to them, puts their usage on all fours with that of many French Catholics. 47. To all this, obviously, Dr. Jevons may reply that it does not prove the priority of magic to religion. 48. Neither, however, does it give any basis for Dr. Jevons's thesis of the secondariness of magic. It simply sets forth that in the earliest available records, as in the practice of contemporary savages, magic so-called and propitiatory religion so-called coexist and cohere. In Dyar. Fraser's own words, they were not yet differentiated from each other, differentiated, that is, in the moral estimate of priest and worshipper. But in the terms of the proposition, the practice of propitiation was there. And there is nothing to show that it was a late variation on confident magic. On the other hand, the documentary evidence, so far as it goes, is in favor of the priority of magic so-called. The magical texts form the earliest sacred literature of Chaldea. This fact remains unshaken. 49. What, then, becomes of the argument that magic and religion so-called are opposed because they are logically inconsistent with each other? 
Like Dr. Jevons, Dr. Fraser makes a good deal of the theoretic analogy of magic with science, both being alleged to rest upon the assumption of the uniformity of nature, and the operation of immutable laws acting mechanically. 50 Now, while we need not hesitate to see in magic in particular, even as in religion in general, man's early gropings toward science, we must not let ourselves be by a mere verbalism confused as to what magic is. Obviously it does not assume the uniformity of nature, inasmuch as it assumes to control nature by different devices, framing new procedures where the old fail. It does not even invariably assume strict uniformity in the magical processes itself. But that is the one sort of uniformity of cause and effect that the magician as approaches to conceiving. Now, this conception connects much less with that of what we may term the normal relation of man to nature than with that of his relation to the sets of forces apprehended by late thought as spiritual, but by early thought merely as unseen. Early man, presumably, had a normal notion of the process of breaking a stone or killing a foe, and there if anywhere lay the beginnings of his science. As Adam Smith put it, fire burns and water refreshes, heavy bodies descend, and lighter substances fly upwards, by the necessity of their own nature, nor was the invisible hand of Jupiter ever apprehended to be employed in those matters. 51 As Kant put it, primitive man never made a god of weight.52 But even as he thought the invisible or inferable personalities could do many kinds of great things, so he thought that, by taking pains, he could. Inasmuch as he never clearly differentiated them from himself in nature and capacity. Thus his magic was part of his way of thinking about what was for him the occult or inferred side of things, which way of thinking as a whole was his religion. To speak in terms of Dr. Jevons's primary position, he was as magician interfering with the sequences of nature as he supposed the occult personalities did. On yet another ground, we are disallowed from charging inconsistency on primitive or ancient religious thought in respect of divergences from later conceptions. One of the more notable of those divergences is the idea that the gods themselves are subject to the course of nature, or the law of fate, it is reached by modern Native Americans 53 as it was by some ancient Egyptians. 54 and it stands out from the religious speculation of ancient Greece. 55 In both stages it is compatible with propitiation, and yet it gives a quasi-logical basis for the resort to magic, regarded as a temporary circumvention of the law of things. So with the belief in opposed deities, even if none be regarded as evil, like Araman, there is nothing specially inconsistent in a magic that seeks to employ a power of which, in the terms of the case, no deity has a monopoly. On this basis polytheism offers an easy way out of the indictment for inconsistency. When Porphyry asked Abamon, does not he who says he will burst the heavens, or reveal the secrets of Isis, or expose the arcanum in the Adidam, or scatter the members of Osiris to Typhon, does not he who says this. By thus threatening what he knows not and cannot do, prove himself grossly foolish. The sage answers with confidence that such threats are used against not any of the celestial gods but a lower order of powers, and that the theurgist commands these as existing superior to them in the order of the gods. And possessing power through a union with the gods, in virtue of his magic. 56. That is, of course, a late and sophisticated account of the matter the earlier theologian simply did not realize that any charge of inconsistency could arise. In any case, the Old Testament abounds in cases of sympathetic magic, the sprinkling of the blood of the hallowed sacrifice upon the ears and thumbs and toes of the priests. 57 The holding up of the arms of Moses, 58 In the attitude of the sun god and war god Mitra, 59 To sway the battle, the sending forth of the scapegoat, 60 The blowing of the trumpets before the walls of Jericho. 61 The raising of the widow's son by Elijah, stretching himself upon the child three times, 62, all these are acts neither of prayer nor of propitiation, but of sympathetic magic, which is the germ of all magic. And the theorist may be defied to show that they stood for a degradation or relapse in the evolution of religion. 63 If, indeed, he could show it, he would be putting a rod in pickle for his theory of the super-excellence of Hebrew monotheism, which evolved itself with these accompaniments. 
The early priest, then, is to be called inconsistent in his resort to magic only on the view that he had the definite modern conception of the omnipotence of a supernatural power, and this he simply had not. It is, then, quite beside the case to argue, as does even Dr. Fraser, 64 that, the fatal flaw of magic lies in its total misconception of the particular laws which govern natural sequences. That is not a differentiation between magic and religion. For the religious conception that nature is to be affected by propitiating unseen powers is just as fatally wrong, and it arose in the same fashion by association of ideas, men assuming that nature was ruled by a personality like themselves. Why, then, is the flaw dwelt upon? If it be to prepare for the view that at a certain stage a portion of mankind began to abandon magic as a principle of faith and practice and to betake themselves to religion instead, 65 the answer is that on Dr. Fraser's own showing men for whole ages practiced both concurrently, 66 and that in the terms of the case they are as likely to have taken to magic because prayer failed as vice versa. Dr. Fraser, indeed only diffidently suggests that the tardy recognition of the inherent falsehood and barrenness of magic set the more thoughtful part of mankind to cast about for a truer theory of nature and a more fruitful method of turning her resources to account. But by his own showing he has no right to this hypothesis even on an avowal of diffidence. As well might the contrary theory of Dr. Jevons be supported by the suggestion that the inherent falsehood and barrenness of the theory of prayer and propitiation set the more resourceful part of mankind on a more effectual control of nature by way of magic. 67 had not men all along been trying both. Equally untenable, surely, is the distinction drawn by Dr. Fraser 68 between the haughty self-sufficiency of the magician, his arrogant demeanor towards the higher powers, and his unabashed claim to exercise a sway like theirs. And the attitude of the priest, with his awful sense of the divine majesty and his humble prostration in presence of it. Dr. Fraser can hardly mean to be ironical, but his words may very well serve to convey such a sense when applied to the attitude of the priesthoods of all ages, Brahmanical 69 or Papal, Semitic or Arian. It would be difficult to distinguish in the matter of modesty between Moses 70 and the magicians of Pharaoh, or Samuel and the witch of Ender, or Elijah and the priests of Baal. Or an excommunicating and flag-blessing bishop and an incantating wizard. All the while we have Dr. Fraser's own assurance that for long ages the priest was the magician. If, seeking to form a just judgment, we turn to actual evidence for the attitude of the primitive magician, it lies to our hand in Livingstone's account of the Negro rain doctors of Bechuanaland. Here we have a typical dialogue between the missionary and the magician. The latter complained in friendly fashion to the missionary, you see we never get rain, while those tribes who never pray as we do, i.e., Christian fashion, obtain abundance. This, the missionary confesses, was a fact, and we often saw it raining on the hills ten miles off, while it would not look at us even with one eye. When the rain doctor set to work, on the score that, the whole country needs the rain I am making, there ensues the argument. M.D., i.e., Livingstone. So you really believe that you can command the clouds? I think that can be done by God alone. Rain doctor. We both believe the very same thing. It is God that makes the rain, but I pray to Him by means of these medicines, and, the rain coming, of course it is then mine. M.D. But we are distinctly told in the parting words of our Saviour that we can pray to God acceptably in His name alone, and not by means of medicines. R.D. Truly. But God told us differently. He made black men first, and did not love us as He did the white men. Other tribes place medicines about our country to prevent the rain, so that we may be dispersed by hunger and go to them and augment their power. We must dissolve their charms by our medicines. God has given us one little thing which you know nothing of. He has given us the knowledge of certain medicines by which we can make rain. We do not despise those things which you possess, though we are ignorant of them. You ought not to despise our little knowledge, though you are ignorant of it. This, adds Livingstone, is a brief specimen of their mode of reasoning, which is often remarkably acute. 
I never succeeded in convincing a single individual of the fallacy of his belief. And the usual effect of discussion is to produce the impression that you yourself are not anxious for rain, 71. Quite so. How could the missionary hope to convince the rain needy? Delusion for delusion, which was the more religious? And which was the plainer fallacy of the two fashions of prayer? The true solution of the problem is that set forth in the essay Sur le totemism of M. Durkheim, 72 who may be supposed to speak for scientific sociology if anyone does. In that essay he deals incidentally with the view of Dr. Fraser that the Australian Aruntas 73 are at the stage of pure magic, not having yet reached religion. Dar. Jevons, on the contrary, would regard them as truly religious in respect of their totem sacrament. M. Durkheim, applying the inductive method, notes indeed 74 that the life of the Aruntas is stamped with religiosity, and that this religiosity is in origin essentially totemic. But he adds, the territory is covered with sacred trees, and groves, and mysterious grottoes, where are piously preserved the objects of the cult. None of those sacred places is approached without a religious terror. And he concludes, what is essential is that the rites of the Aruntas are at all points comparable to those which are found in systems incontestably religious, then they proceed from the same ideas and the same sentiments. And it is arbitrary to refuse them the same title. The final condemnation of Dr. Fraser's definition, however, is, as we shall see cause later to say of that of Dr. Jevons, that in strictness it ignores the bulk of the religious life of mankind. He himself avows that only a part of mankind has ever abandoned magic and taken to religion instead. In his own words, magic is a universal faith, a truly Catholic creed. 75 And he might, without extending his ample anthropological learning, further establish this fact by reference to current religion. If religion is to mean only the ideas of the more thoughtful part of mankind, we shall simply be committed to a new inquiry as to who are the more thoughtful, and the agnostic will have something to say on that head. Are they the believers in the efficacy of prayer? Insofar as such believers profess belief in an omnipotent and unchanging providence, they stultify their theistic creed as vitally as ever did the magician. Prayer presupposes the changeableness of a divine will declared to be unchangeable. Then prayer, like magic, is fundamentally opposed to belief in an omnipotent deity. Where shall we stop? Dar. Fraser 76 opposes the reader to ask, how was it that intelligent men did not sooner detect the fallacy of magic? And he thoughtfully and rightly answers that before the age of science it was really not easy to detect. But he could hardly say as much of prayer. Whereof the fallacy was detected among Hebrews and heathens thousands of years ago. Yet by his definition the contemporary believer in prayer is religious and the ancient worshipper of Isis was not. On such principles there can be no science of religion whatever. Any more than there is a science of orthodoxy. In order to classify the very phenomena with which Dr. Fraser mainly occupies himself, we should have to create a new set of terms for nine tenths of them. Recognizing religion only as a certain procedure that chronically obtruded itself among them. And then would come Dr. Jevons to explain that this religion was not a religion at all, inasmuch as it resulted from a process of reasoning. Science, then, is driven to reject both a priorisms alike, and to proceed to find a definition by way of a loyal induction. 6. The Scientific Induction. As thus. In terms of many observations, and of some of Dr. Jevons's admissions, we are led to realize that the idea of what we term, the supernatural, not only does not mean for primitive man a consistent distinction, it does not mean it for civilized man. Yet the logical burden of Dr. Jevons's as of Dr. Fraser's indictment against magic is simply that it is inconsistent 77 with the admission of the superiority, the super-ness, of the divine to the human. For the purpose of his plea, he necessarily ignores the salient historical fact made clear by Dr. Fraser, that men have abundantly practiced magic towards the very gods to whom they prayed, and whose supernaturalness they not only avowed but believed in to the extent of holding them immortal. 
Assyrian, Egyptian, and Indian religious literatures alike are full of cases of such practice. It may be argued that that is still an imperfect conception of the supernatural, that the consistent conception requires the ascription of eternity, of omnipotence, of uncreatedness, of never having begun. But then men have also humbly prayed, without thought of magic, to gods to whom they were grateful and whom they believed to be suffering sons of older gods, and these attitudes of mind Dr. Jevons has fully certificated as religious. But, again, men have similarly prayed to mere saints. What degree, then, of recognition of superiority is to be regarded as constituting recognition of the supernatural? One is moved to ask. What is the theorist's own conception of the supernatural? And, what does he mean by the term when he speaks of supernatural terrors? When the critic is himself so far from a clear definition, it is very obviously a mere rhetorical device to say that for the magic monger the conception of the supernatural, by definition, is inconsistent with his practice. He had never given any definition, 78 neither had the religious man, who is alleged to have preceded him, and it was simply impossible that they should. The a priori argument against him is thus irrelevant from the start, no less than the a posteriori and both are further negligible as being inferably motived by a non-scientific purpose. The right view is to be reached on another line. Proceeding on the clear lines of human psychology, we can be absolutely certain of this, that a savage may alternately seek to propitiate and seek to coerce or circumvent a human enemy whom he regards as normally stronger than himself. As Dar. Jevons notes, savage hunters on killing a bear will use a ritual to propitiate the bear clan. As he is well aware, Brahmins and other priests have taught that an ascetic or a ritualist can by his practices gain power to coerce or command the highest gods, 79 to whom ordinary men can but pray. Such a notion, he argues, is a negation of a supernatural in that it assumes the gods to be subject to an order of causation which man can control. But, once more, is it not equally a negation of a supernatural to assume, as the highest religions have done and do, that man can persuade the god by prayer, or propitiate him by confession and sacrifices? Or keep him friendly by professing esteem and gratitude? Is not every one of these acts an assumption that the god's moral and mental processes are on a par with those of men, and that he is merely stronger than they? So considered, in what sense is he supernatural? And is not the inconsistency gross when men at once practice prayer and ascribe to their deity foreordination of all things? It is not too much to say that the procedure by which Dr. Jevons classifies magic as anti-religious must logically end in so classing every historic religion, and leaving the title to the name vested solely in professed agnostics and atheists. Some reasoners have actually so allotted the term. But that conclusion will scarcely suit Dr. Jevons's book, so to speak. In view of the whole facts, the terms, belief in the supernatural, must be recognized as signifying for practical purposes merely belief in a personal power that is superhuman, or rather extrahuman, yet quasi-human. And such powers are the gods alike of the earliest savage and the contemporary Christian, the humble offerer of prayer and the practicer of magic. The offerer of prayer, it is true, remain substantially the original type, loyally prostrate before power, civilization having developed the original docility of the cowed savage through the deadly discipline of great despotisms. On the other hand, the magician of the past has either succumbed to that discipline or developed into the man of science, a function which he finds the worshipper of power often sharing with him. But just as they can so coincide now in practice, they coincided at the start in psychology. This view of the case finally follows from another of Dr. Jevons's most definite positions. For he repeatedly describes the primitive, sacramental meal as truly religious, in that it is a higher form of sacrifice than the mere gift sacrifice, being a means of communion with the God, who actually joined in the meal. He does not deny it the title of religion, even when it involves the conception that in the sacramental meal the God is actually eaten. 80 In each of these cases the worshipper certainly believed he had acquired a force not previously his own, even as does the practicer of magic, while the eating of the god is the reductio ad absurdum of his superiority. Here, 
then, is even a more complete stultification of the logical idea of the supernatural than is committed by the magician, and it is actually made to validate the religion of the sacrificer as against the anti-religion of the magic monger. 7. Dr. Jevon's Series of Self-Contradictions This contradiction naturally reiterates itself in Dr. Jevons's treatise at a hundred points, being fundamental, it strikes through the entire argument. While premising that religion is universally human, and finally contending that man is, by nature religious, and therefore, began by a religious explanation of nature, 81 he pronounces 82 that four-fifths of mankind, probably, believe in sympathetic magic, which, he declares, not only, does not involve in itself the idea of the supernatural, 83 but is, hostile from the beginning, 84 to religion, and is the, negation, thereof. 85 While affirming that the belief in the supernatural, equals religion, was prior to magic, he explains 86 that it was man's, intellectual helplessness in grappling with the forces of nature which led him into the way of religion, i.e. the way in which he began, before he had tried his intellect, and, again, that religion led certain men out of magic, though at the same time they were converted by simply seeing that magic is inefficacious. Again, reverting for one purpose to his original doctrine of the primacy of fear, Dr. Jevons writes 87. Magic is, in fact, a direct relapse into the state of things in which man found himself when he was surrounded by supernatural beings, none of which was bound to him by any tie of goodwill. With none of which had he any stated relations, but all were uncertain, capricious, and caused in him unreasoning terror. This reign of terror magic tends to re-establish, and does re-establish, wherever the belief in magic prevails. 88. A few chapters further on, discussing fire festivals and water rites, without asking wherein they psychologically differ from sacramental meals, he writes 89. If we regard those fire festivals and water rites as pieces of sympathetic magic, they are clear instances in which man imagines himself able to constrain the gods, in this case the god of vegetation, to subserve his own ends. Now, this vain imagination is not merely non-religious, but anti-religious, and it is difficult to see how religion could have been developed out of it. It is inconsistent with the abject fear which the savage feels of the supernatural, and which is sometimes supposed to be the origin of religion. And it is inconsistent with that sense of man's dependence on a superior being which is a real element in religion. The contradiction is absolute. For one purpose, magic is declared to restore the primary reign of terror. For another purpose it is declared to be incompatible with a reign of terror, which is now at once implied and denied to be the primary state. We are in fine told that the savage does and does not fear a supernatural. Another series of contradictions is set up by the theorist's determination at certain points so to define religion as to secure a unique status for Judaism and Christianity, a breach of scientific method on all fours with his dichotomy of religion. And magic. Dealing with the Egyptian conception of a future state, and noting how the first chapter of the Book of the Dead promises a future life which simply repeats the earthly. He declares that, no higher or more spiritual ideal entered or could enter into the composition of the Egyptian abode of bliss, because its origin was essentially non-religious. Ninety such being, however, the nature of the conception of the future life entertained by at least nine-tenths of the human race, savage and civilized. We are here again asked to associate the universally human influence with only a fraction of ostensible religious doctrine on one of the most specifically religious topics. In the same fashion every modification of religious doctrine under the influence of political and religious thought is classed as non-religious. Thus, we are told 91 that, the eschatology of the Egyptian and Indian religions was not generated by the religious spirit, but was due to the incorporation of early philosophical speculations into those religions. Further, in flat defiance of Mr. Lang's doctrine as to the primary and pious character of savage supreme gods, Dr. Jevons lays it down that the idea of a supreme god, at the head of a pantheon, is scarcely a religious idea at all. It is not drawn from the spiritual depths of man's nature, it is a conception borrowed from politics, 92 and pantheism in turn, is a metaphysical speculation, 
not a fact of which the religious consciousness has direct intuition. 93 The upshot is that only that idea is religious which proceeds from an inner consciousness of connection with or perception of deity, there must be no process of reasoning, no philosophy, no criticism. Dar. Fraser's view of religion as beginning in criticism of magic is ruled out as Dr. Fraser ruled out magic itself. And if it should be supposed that on this definition primary animism is clearly religious, Dr. Jevons has his veto ready, in animism man projects his own personality onto external nature, in religion he is increasingly, why only increasingly, impressed by the divine personality. 94. Now, postponing for the moment the scientific answer, the answer of elementary and ultimate psychology, to Dr. Jevons, we have only to turn to the next chapter of his own treatise to find him nullifying this stage of his definition as he has nullified every other. First we are asked 95 to note that faith is not something peculiar or confined to religion, but is interwoven with every act of reason. And that, the period of faith does not terminate when the pupil has come to have immediate consciousness of the facts which he could not see. Next, we are assured 96 that, the religious mind believes that all facts of which we have immediate consciousness can be reconciled with one another. And that, the religious faith which looks forward to the synthesis of all facts in a manner satisfying to the reason, covers a much larger area than either science or moral philosophy. Either, then, the religious person becomes utterly irreligious when he thus reasons beyond the immediate facts, so-called, of his consciousness, or dr. Jevons's definition of religion is once more cancelled by himself. If, again, we return to the chapter on taboo, morality, and religion, where it is argued that religion rationalized taboo, we read that when the taboos which receive the sanction of religion are regarded as reasonable, as being the commands of a being possessing reason, then the other taboos also may be brought to the test of reason. 97 On the later view, this is an essentially irreligious process. It is true that Dr. Jevons hastens to say, 98, taboo has indeed been rationalized, but not in all cases by reason. And to urge 99 that the prophets and other religious reformers who discriminate between taboos have usually considered themselves in so doing to be speaking, not their own words or thoughts, but those of their God, that is, have spoken as do cannibal priests among Polynesians and the impostor priests of the slave coast. 100 This, however, does not save his thesis from the fatal reproach of having explicitly admitted the element of reason for a moment into the religious process. And the lapse recurs, again with a contradiction. In the closing chapter we have from Dr. Jevons successively these three propositions. A belief is an inference, and as such is the work of the reason. The reason endeavors to anticipate the movement of facts. 101. It is an established fact of psychology that every act, mental or physical, requires the concurrence, not only of the reason and the will, but of emotion. 102. Indeed, the reason of primitive man was ex hypothesi undeveloped. And, in any case, religious belief is not an inference reached by reason, but is the immediate consciousness of certain facts. 103. These internecine dicta are offered without apology or apparent misgiving as steps in a continuous process of argument. And just such another series occurs in the chapter in which Dr. Jevons undertakes to make out the characteristic thesis that mythology is not religion. In passing, and apart from the scientific rebuttal, it may be well to note that what Dr. Jevons calls the extraordinary notion that mythology is religion, 104 has never been propounded by any writer in the only sense in which it would be either false or extraordinary, that is, that mythology is the whole of religion. That it is an element in religion and an aspect or function of the religious consciousness is affirmed by Dr. Jevons himself in the very act of denying it. As thus, mythology was primitive man's romance, as well as his history his science, his philosophy. Point 105. The narratives in which primitive speculations, i.e. myths, were embodied were not merely intellectual exercises, nor the work of the abstract imagination, they reflect or express the mind of the author in its totality, 
for they are the work of a human being. Not of a creature possessing reason and no morality, or imagination and no feeling. In the same way, then, as the moral tone and temper of the author in his age makes itself felt in these primitive speculations, so will the religious spirit of the time. Mythology is one of the spheres of human activity in which religion may manifest itself, one of the departments of human reason which religion may penetrate, suffuse, and inspire. 106. Mythology is primitive science, etc., but it is not primitive religion. It is not necessarily or usually even religious. It is not the proper, exclamation point. Or even the ordinary vehicle for the religious spirit. Prayer, meditation, devotional poetry, are the chosen vehicles in thought and word, ritual in outward deed and act. Myths originate in a totally different psychological quarter, they are the work of the human reason, acting in accordance with the laws of primitive logic, or are the outcome of the imagination, playing with the freedom of the poetic fancy. In neither case are they primarily the product of religious feeling, it is not the function of feeling to draw inferences. 107. It is here categorically asserted, first, that myths are not the work of any one side of the human personality, neither of reason without moral feeling nor of imagination without feeling. Finally, it is asserted that they are the work either of reason without feeling or of imagination without feeling. After the express denial that any human being can mythologize with one faculty only, and the necessary implication that religious feeling may penetrate the other faculties in the act of myth-making or myth-believing. We are told that myths originate in a totally different psychological quarter from the religious spirit. As to the other italicized propositions, it may suffice at this point to note, 1, that it is plainly wrong to say mythology is primitive science, history, etc., in the sense in which it is not, i.e., is not the whole of, primitive religion. 2, that prayer and devotional poetry are normally full of myths, 3, that ritual is in many cases conceived, though clearly not originated, by the worshipper as an imitation of an episode in the history of the god, i.e., a myth. And, 4, that by explicitly reducing religion to feeling, Dr. Jevons, like Dr. Fraser, has eliminated every belief as such from religious consciousness. Tantum religio. 8. His contradictory doctrine of the conditions of the survival of religion. One sample more may suffice to complete the justification of our criticism that Dr. Jevons's interesting and suggestive treatise is flawed throughout by fatal contradiction. In discussing totemism, he certifies, first, the primitive belief of men in their descent from a totem animal as established or verified for them in their inner experience, i.e. in the filial reverence and affection which they felt towards him, 108 thus salving as truly religious the grossest possible projection of man's own personality on nature. While the spontaneous animism which early man shared with animals is denied the status of direct consciousness. Then, taking the totemist's experience, thus highly classed, he writes. Doubtless it was not all or most men who had this experience, or rather it was but few who attended to the feeling. But the best must have paid heed to it and have found satisfaction in dwelling on it, else the conception of the deity would never have followed on the line on which as a matter of fact it was developed. 109. Turning to the chapter on The Evolution of Belief. We have this almost flatly contrary deliverance. The perpetuation of any variety, of belief, depends solely on the conditions under which it occurs, whatever varieties of belief are not favored by the conditions, by their environment. Will perish, the rest will survive, the surviving belief will not necessarily be that of the keenest sighted man, but that which accords with what the average sight can see of the facts. 110. In another chapter, yet again, we have still a third view of the process of survival, and one which excludes both of the preceding. In order to credit to the truly religious principle the rationalization of taboo, dr. Jevons, as we said, claimed that the rationalizers considered themselves to be propounding, not their own words or thoughts, but those of their God. And he thereupon notes that, this belief has been shared by the community they addressed, otherwise the common man would not have gained the courage to break an ancient taboo. 
certainly no mere appeal to reason would counterbalance that inveterate terror, 111 On this view any dictum of any accredited priest would be decisive, irrespective of the average sight, and this despite of Dr. Jevons's refusal to recognize priestcraft as a factor in the creation of taboo in particular or religion in general. A theory of religion which lands its framer in such a conjuries of contradictions as these, I submit, is fully convicted of vital fallacy. And certainly the fallacy is not the result either of imperfect knowledge of the ground or of speculative incompetence, it stands visibly for the misguiding force of a false preconception or prejudice. On much of Dyar. Jevons's book Every Student, I think, will put a very high estimate, it is studious, well-informed, original, independent in method and in doctrine, and, though deeply prejudiced, nearly always temperate even when most fallacious. In places it reaches a really high level of scholarly and critical efficiency, notably in the chapter on The Mysteries, where the tracing of the adoption and adaptation of the primary Eleusinian cult to the purposes of Athens and the cults of Demeter and Persephone is as satisfying as it is ingenious. Dr. Jevons is there thus successful, to my thinking, because he is on ground which he has surveyed dispassionately and scientifically, unaffected by his occultist predilections. It is when he has his eye on current religion and its line of descent that, omitting much of the due scholarly research and staking all on the vindication of his sympathies, he yields us a series of logical miscarriages fully as striking as his measure of success in his disinterested inquiry. Howsoever this may be, his series of contradictions leaps to the eyes. And unless consistency is to be a burden only for the naturalists, unless the supernaturalist is to be let dogmatize in hierology as in religion on the basis of his mere inner consciousness, his main argument must simply be removed from the scientific field. 9. The Continuity of Religious Phenomena The clear solution, as distinguished from the rebuttal, of all such contradictions is to recognize that, however we may grade religious conceptions and systems, they are all parts of one process. Even as are political conceptions and systems. To say that magic is hostile to religion is like saying that either republicanism or monarchism is hostile to politics. For primitive man there are no conceptual divisions between religion and science, worship and art. And the distinction between art magic and sympathetic magic, made after the express declaration that mere sympathetic magic was the germ of all magic, is an arbitrary stroke of pro-Christian classification, which, nonetheless, logically defeats its purpose. For the primitive sacramental meal was demonstrably on the plane of sympathetic magic inasmuch as, even when it did not kill the victim in a mimetic fashion, it was a making friends with the God in the way of human fraternization. And it is to this sacrament that Dr. Jevons, for obvious reasons, accords the special religious rank. It is worse than idle to seek to keep it on a plane apart by framing a formula of direct consciousness on the part of the worshippers that they were descended from an animal progenitor on the score that they felt filially towards him. The professed magic mongers' consciousness was rather more direct than theirs. But the definitions themselves give up the case. Applied science is just art, and art magic is thus just a form of what Dr. Jevons calls sympathetic magic. Moreover, the ritual of supplication and gratitude, which he declares to be strictly religious, is visibly framed in the same spirit of expectation of profit as is seen in the magic ritual. A study of the human sacrifice ritual of the Khans, cited here and after, will make clear both the congruity and the conjunction. It is certainly true that the one ritual becomes hostile to the other when magic is practiced by the sorcerer as an outsider, secretly competing with or undermining the priest. 112 But in that sense any one religious system is hostile to any other in the same field, and in the same sense heresy is hostile to orthodoxy, and dissent to the official cult, without ceasing to be a form of religion. Such a distinction is on all fours with that between religion and superstition, disposed of by Hobbes as a mere marking off of the allowed belief from that not allowed. If the alleged hostility between religion and magic is reducible to a mere distinction between quasi-communal and individualistic sorcery, the whole dispute passes from the plane of psychological theory to that of simple sociological classification. 
We pass from a debate over a fallacy to a debate over a mere plea for a particular terminology. Point 113 But now there arises a fresh fallacy of ethical discrimination. The communal sorcery, called religion, is falsely certificated as moral and humanitarian. It is no more so than the other. In Africa the private or amateur sorcerer, usually a victim of the professional witch doctor, is regarded as the enemy of mankind. But it is precisely by the public magician, witch doctor, rain doctor, sorcerer, that the alleged amateur is nefariously smelt out and given up to slaughter. 114 If it be argued that religious magic aims at the public good and mere magic at private harm, the answer is that the public magician is often notoriously a murdering scoundrel, and the alleged private sorcerer an innocent man done to death. And that is not all. On the separatist theory, the legend of Elijah's calling down fire from heaven makes him an irreligious magician, in that he was not only acting irregularly and unofficially, but going through the procedure of a sorcerer with absolute confidence in his power to control the will of his god. His machinery of supererogatory watering of his sacrifice, which, as regards the coming rain, was sympathetic magic, was, religiously, gratuitous presumption. And he was staking the whole fortunes of his cult on the chance that his prayer would be miraculously answered. He was, in fact, coercing his god by making the god's credit with his people depend upon the god's obedience to his wishes. 115 It will not avail to acquit Elijah on the score of faith when the faith of the magician in his means of controlling the gods is made precisely his offense. Among native tribes of the Victoria Nyanza region, the people, in fact, hold that rulers must have power over nature and her phenomena. 116 Here that antitheistic magic is the main element in the communal religion. And once more the separatist theory breaks down. That priests in many ages and stages of culture have been hostile to magic is true just in the sense in which it is true that, with deeper cause, they have been hostile to science. In the early and dark ages of Christendom the priests of the Christian Church, primed by a magical medical doctrine of the curing of sickness by the laying on of hands, denounced as atheistic the view of disease passed on by pagan science. 117 Those priests were all the while practicers of exorcisms, 118 and were nonetheless, for Dr. Jevons, highly religious. In the same way the intensely religious Ainu of Segalian, who practice magic for the cure of disease and resort to professional wizards for the same purpose, 119 resent as irreligious the attempt to promote the earth's fertility by manure. When Mr. Bachelor, the missionary, proposed to dig and manure his garden, and explained his wish to his Ainu gardener, that religious personage, strong in his inner consciousness, thus rebuked him, What, will you, a clergyman and preacher of religion? So dishonor and insult the gods. Will not the gods give due increase without your attempting to force their hand or endeavoring to drive nature? 120 Here we have the very doctrine of Dr. Jevons and Dr. Fraser, the manuring missionary was an arrogant magician, seeking to control the unseen powers in a way which was not the Ainu way. That, it appears, was usually expectoration. Considerably surprised, says Mr. Bachelor, I looked at him to see if he were joking. But he was quite serious. Poor Mr. Bachelor was being treated as his cloth had treated the doctors in the days of unflawed faith. Happily the Ainu did not possess an inquisition. True it may be, again, that magic is at some points a lowering of the religious sentiment, though much of the quasi-scientific reflection on this head appears to be a mere echo of ecclesiastical declamation. If we were seriously to inquire which has done the more harm in the way of hindering civilization, strangling science, obscuring the facts of nature, and prompting human cruelty, it would soon be found that the organized cults which curse the magician have been by far the more pernicious. 121 The barbarization wrought by the attempts of the courageously, superstitious, few to practice witchcraft is trifling beside that compassed by the no less superstitious many in putting supposed witches to death. This holds good of the general life of Africa through whole millenniums, in which countless millions of human beings have been slain as sorcerers and witches on the accusation of professional witch doctors. And again of the inferable life of the Hebrews and the recorded witchcraft manias of Christendom. 
And if this side of the problem be waived, the fact remains that the Christian religion, which Dr. Jevons and the rest rank as the highest and purest of religious systems, historically took its rise in the reversion from theistic faith to a form of sympathetic magic, the Eucharist and was practically rooted as a state cult throughout Europe by the assumption of magical functions on the part of the priest, not only in the administration of the Eucharist itself, but in the claim to exercise supernatural powers of exorcism and to wield supernatural instruments in the form of holy relics. Such practices certainly represent an intellectual and moral declension from the ethic of all the leading Greek schools and of the nobler rabbins. In other cases a differentiation between magician and priest may have been in origin economic and political, apart from any ethical motive. Among the Bataks of Sumatra, while ancestors are imaged, and the images, as being made potent by soul stuff, have places in the temples where ancestors are worshipped, the higher gods are without images or temples, and are prayed to only in conjunction with ancestors or spirits. And here it is noted that the magician has nothing to do with the worship of the gods, but operates on the relations with spirits and souls, while the priest attends to the matters relating to the higher gods. 122 The explanation appears to lie in the fact that, as among the Romans, every Batak house father is priest as regards ancestors, souls, and spirits. The priest-managed cult is either the survival of one imposed on the populace by conquerors and specially provided for, as probably was the case in Rome, or a result of priestly enterprise in imitation of foreign systems. 123 Its ethical content is a matter of other chances. Granted, yet again, that dissenting magic, whether beneficent or maleficent in intention, is logically inconsistent with the conceptions of deity normally professed by the magic munder himself. It is here on all fours with the total structure of the official creed, whichsoever it be. The conception of sacrifice in all its forms is morally irreconcilable with the doctrine of divine justice and goodness, and was on that very ground repudiated by the greater Hebrew and pagan moralists. And with the doctrine of salvation by sacrifice falls the doctrine of salvation by faith. Press that one ethical principle, and the whole apparatus of official Christian ethic collapses, even as the apparatus of prayer and providentialism falls by the test of the principles of divine omniscience, beneficence, and forward nation. Dar. Jevons's principle of exclusion, in fact, finally makes tabula rasa of the whole field of religious institutions and religious life. And leaves us recognizing only a factor which he has expressly excluded from his definition of the religious consciousness, to wit, philosophy. Here, again, the theoretic separation is spurious. In terms of many parts of Dr. Jevons's exposition, early religion is just the effort to unify the cosmos through a conception of deity, and early philosophy was nothing else. To stamp as religious only those forms of thought in which the believer has direct consciousness of the divine, excluding every process of meditation and inference as such is to include in religion the phenomena of hallucination and even of insanity, to say nothing of the liberal expansion of the formula to include men's belief in their personal descent from an animal, and to bar out as non-religious the theism which stands on the thesis that this scheme of things cannot be without a mind. On the other hand, ordinary animism, which Dr. Jevons rules out, is certainly a belief in terms of almost though not quite unreflecting consciousness and to proceed to disqualify it on the ground that it is a projection of man's personality into nature is to evoke a fatal challenge, for if this is to be said of animism, it will certainly have to be said much more emphatically of theism. The impression of the divine personality, of which Dr. Jevon speaks is precisely the projection of the subject's personality into the unknown, and this by Dr. Jevons's own showing. To judge from his later argument, while he at times professes to waive the question of the veracity of the religious consciousness, he is much disposed to let it be its own verification. 124 This, however, he can scarcely venture on in the case of the primitive man's belief that he descended from a fox, a bear, or a serpent. It is one thing to pronounce such a belief truly religious, by way of securing in advance the true heredity of the Christian Eucharist. It is another to put such a fact of consciousness beside the Christian consciousness of direct divine intercourse and inner answer to prayer. 
On the latter step must follow the admission that the so-called religious form of consciousness is by far the more self-projecting, the less truly receptive, of the two, save indeed where it is merely the mouthpiece of the other. Otherwise dear. Jevons's undertaking ends in the edifying decree that the company of the truly religious includes every Mahdi, every Fakir, every Sibyl, every savage seer, every spiritualist, every epileptic salvationist. Every carabantic worshipper of Sibylle or Cali, and repels not only a Thomas Aquinas, a Pascal, a Hegel, a Spinoza, a Martineau. But every similar thinker who in antiquity prepared the very doctrines which the feelers demonstrably took as the theme of their alleged consciousness. 125. It can hardly be that in thus shaping his definition Dr. Jevons aimed at demonstrating subtly the subrationality of religion. He has, indeed, by his theorem of direct consciousness, brought religion to precisely the position he assigned to taboo, that of an irrational and arbitrary association of ideas. He accepted from Mr. Lang, as we saw, the verdict that taboo is thus irrational because its principle is that causal connection in thought is equivalent to causative connection in fact. Yet this is exactly the principle which he vindicates on behalf of the religious consciousness. Its notion of causal connection is to be in very truth equivalent to causative connection in fact. It is not to reason. It is not to seek evidence or submit to tests, it is to bring all experience in submission to itself. And it is not only the belief in a good male god that is thus assured of its superiority in virtue of its arbitrariness. It is every hallucination of every savage, every vision of the virgin by a neurasthenic Catholic, every epiphany of Isis or Aphrodite or Cotido in the past, nay more, every dream of a devil. It seems a sinister service to latter-day religion thus to demonstrate that it is on all fours not with purified philosophy, but with the most unintelligible forms of taboo and the darkest forms of superstition. Once more, however, the scientific course consists not in taking advantage of the logical suicide of those who conduct the other, but in setting forth the fundamental analogy of the psychological processes thus arbitrarily differentiated. The direct consciousness of the theist, sheer hallucination apart, is simply a reversion to the earlier man's confidence in his animistic conceptions. Doubled with the conscious resistance to skeptical criticism seen in every dream interpreter and ghost seer of the countryside. The persistence is simply a matter of temperament and degree of enlightenment, there are men who can transcend this like other testimonies of their direct consciousness. In learning to see it as a kind of hallucination which may be predicted to arise in some cases in regard to any theistic conception which any thinker may contrive to set up. Where there are images of the Virgin, men and women will have visions of the Virgin, where there are images of animal gods, there will be visions of animal gods. Between impressions and projections, there is no such psychological gulf as DR. Jevons assumes. If there were, the political influence on doctrine which he classes as non-religious would still be in terms of his other theorem truly religious. For the act of thinking of rule in heaven in terms of rule on earth is a sufficiently docile surrender to an impression on consciousness, and would be made by multitudes with the possible minimum of reflection. But, in truth, a minimum of reflection their needs must be in every process of belief, and what they are. Jevons at times describes as pure processes of direct consciousness are demonstrably not so, or are so only in the sense in which the same thing may be predicated of the thinking of the primitive magician. The man who says he is conscious of an inward answer to prayer is not conscious of it as he is of the sound of a voice. What he experiences is a sense of satisfaction, which, albeit only the result of a release of nervous tension, he infers to come as a direct communication from deity. 126 and such inference is merely a more casual and less meditated process of reasoning than those which Dr. Jevons dismisses as non-religious. It is thus less rational as being less reasonable. But it is not irrational save in the loose sense of fallacious. It is more arbitrary, but only in the sense that it is less mindful of reason and more egotistic, more self-willed, than the process which appeals fraternally to other men's judgments. Arbitrary in Dr. Jevons's implied sense of having no basis it cannot be, so to define the term is to reduce it to insignificance. 
however vicious religious reasoning may be, it remains reasoning. 10. Dr. Fraser's Sociological Vindication of the Sorcerer To say this, however, is certainly not to endorse the surprising thesis latterly put forth by D.R. Fraser, to the effect that magic mongering, after all, has been a great factor in human progress. 127 His first suggestion was, as we have seen, that a recognition of the inherent falsehood and barrenness of magic set the saner men seeking for a truer insight into nature. But after suggesting this, with all due diffidence, he has latterly come to hold with confidence that it was the clever impostors who, by obtaining monarchic power, were the means of breaking up savage conservatism. And so of making progress possible. It is a singular argument. The public sorcerer may readily acquire the rank and authority of a chief or king, and the ablest and most ambitious men of the tribe accordingly follow the profession. The most sagacious are the most likely to see through its fallacies, and, becoming conscious deceivers, will as such, generally come to the top. 128 Only the cleverest can survive, all sorcerers run a constant risk of being killed for their failures, and the honest men are likely to be soonest knocked on the head. The general result is that at this stage of social evolution the supreme power tends to fall into the hands of men of the keenest intelligence and the most unscrupulous character. 129 One supreme, the clever rogue, may, and often does, turn his talents, his experience, his resources, to the service of the public. 130 Being a knave, he is not likely to miscarry, witness the contrasted careers of Augustus and George III. Thus magic makes the monarch, it shifted the balance of power from the many to the one, it substituted a monarchy for a democracy, or rather for an oligarchy of old men. The custom-ruled savage in the free tribal state is utterly unprogressive, and the ablest man is dragged down by the weakest and dullest. But the rise of one man to supreme power breaks the spell. And the tribe enters on a career of aggrandizement, which at an early stage of history is often highly favorable to social, industrial, and intellectual progress. The great conquering races of the world have commonly done most to advance and spread civilization, the Assyrians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs, are our witnesses in the past. All the first great strides toward civilization have been made under despotic and theocratic governments. 131 Great, therefore, was the service of the sorcerer. Oddly enough, Dar. Fraser, whose outstanding merit is the fullness of his proofs for his theses, offers us no evidence whatever in support of this thesis beyond the perfunctory allusions to ancient civilization just cited, which are wholly beside the case. He is severe on a priori theories of kingly origins, but his own argument here is almost wholly a priori. True, some savage kings are magicians equals priests, but many are not, and the wide learning of Dr. Fraser evidently does not suggest to him a single case in which the clever knave who has achieved kingship performs the services he is supposed to be able to render. 132 On the contrary, we have the testimony 133 that, where the chieftaincy and priesthood meet in the same person, both are of a low order, among the Fijians. There is really no reason to think that early progress was made as Dr. Fraser suggests, his philosophic antinomianism is gratuitous. And it is not persisted in. For once more we find him reverting 134 to the view that, as the fallacy of magic becomes more and more apparent, it is, slowly displaced by religion, in other words, the magician gives way to the priest. The two propositions refuse to quadrate. First, the great merit of the magician king was to break up custom, now he does but pave the way for the priest, who is custom incarnate, who, in point of fact, pursues the very researches which Dr. Fraser credits to the magician. And who, when the chief or king insists upon a humane innovation, makes it his business to poison the innovator. 135 It is time that the a priori method were abandoned, in this as in other fields of science. It can but yield us a crop of contradictions. Looking in anthropology and history for the main factors of progress, we find them in very different directions from those indicated by Dr. Fraser. Our first traces of civilization, strictly speaking, are in towns, civitates, and their civilization consists largely in the development of the useful arts by division of labor. The primary determinants are physical, 
conditions of regular food supply, as in the valleys of the Nile, the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Yangtze Kiang. And the widening of knowledge was a matter of manifold development in which men of all classes must have taken part. To say, as does Dar. Fraser, 136 that the magicians, were the direct predecessors, not merely of our physicians and surgeons, but of our investigators and discoverers in every branch of natural science, is to impose a false symmetry on a vast, irregular process. And is an unwarrantable negation of faculty in all but one fraction of the human race. There is positively no ground for supposing that it was professed magicians or magician chiefs who invented plows and bows and arrows, or tamed cattle, or developed agriculture, or began spinning and weaving in metallurgy. Neither is there reason to think that it was the rainmakers who developed irrigation, or the medicine men who oftenest discovered the uses of herbs, whether or not they were the first regular observers of the stars. Neither positively nor negatively can they be shown to be the leaders in vital innovation. 137. The spell of custom, where broken at all, has been dissolved by the compulsions of need or the lure of gain, hunters and shepherds are turned into agriculturists by the bait of food or the goad of hunger. The masterful savage knave who breaks through primitive convention and gives a free run to genius is a creature of Dr. Fraser's speculative faculty, suddenly permitted to expatiate in an unwanted vacancy. Masterful primitive chiefs and kings we do indeed find at times breaking down evil usages, 138 but this very service is by way of fighting the priest who, we are told, has supervened on the magician. And in no case, I think, can such a reforming chief or king be shown to have won his power as a sorcerer. As we have seen, the superseding of so-called magic by so-called religion is immeasurably slow. And the idea of taboo subsists in the historic religions to this day. The things wherein men validly change in the savage state, if we can draw any conclusions from their remains, are the ways and means of living and fighting. Conditions of food supply determine implements and methods. Weapons are slowly perfected, and if we may reason from the instance of the Romans, the primitive savage was most open to new ideas on that side. There, at least, fas erat abhast dossary. But the lift of the race is secular, not a matter of sudden impulsions and emancipations by clever chiefs, rascally or otherwise. Dar. Fraser appears to think concerning the rise of culture as so many theologians still think concerning moral progress. He seeks a founder as they seek a Moses, a Buddha, a Zoroaster, a Jesus, for the instauration of morals and of creeds. Whatever magicians might do, only with a vast inertia did the Stone Ages lapse on, from Paleolithic to Neolithic, from Neolithic to Bronze and to Iron. And in savage Africa, pollulating with sorcerers, the trivial tribal cultures have exhibited but a feudal fluctuation in five thousand years. Nanka said quid. The question of the political conditions of the spread of civilization is another issue, and the conjoining of it with the first is a fresh proof of the fallacy of Dr. Fraser's new method. These a priori arguments for despotism are products not of induction but of presupposition. If we apply the inductive method which dr. Fraser professes to follow, we find, for one case in which despotism evokes genius or progress, ten in which it paralyzes the first and stifles the second. Under the imperialisms and theocracies of Mesopotamia and Egypt, mayhap, there were laid or retained the foundations of astronomy and mathematics and the beginnings of philosophy, and Greece came into the heritage. The mathematics and the philosophy were developed in democratic Greece as they never had been under the empires. And one of the few cases in which despotism did anything for science was at the later stage when the Ptolemies simply gave astronomy an economic endowment. On the other hand, great literature and great art, great poetry and drama, medicine and biology, were the creations of pre-Alexandrian Greece. And in every one of those fields the human achievement sinks and dwindles after free Greece falls before organized militarism. As to religious literature, Dr. Fraser is not wont to represent the Bible of Little Jewry as inferior to those of Assyria and Egypt. The whole Roman Empire, finally, stands for one brief fluorescence of the secondary Roman genius, followed by the ruin of the whole antique civilization which it absorbed. 
And the later cultures of the Saracens and the Renaissance were growths from the found seeds of Greek science, and from the assimilation of the remains of Roman culture in a turbulent world of free Italian cities, akin to that of dead Greece. This digression, forced upon us by Dr. Fraser's resort to apriorism in sociology, may not be useless if it serves to put us on our guard against the risks of reactionary method within the proper limits of our problem. Away from induction there is no safety, and Dr. Fraser miscarries even as does Dr. Jevons when he neglects observation and gives the rein to presupposition. It is by reason of this swerving from his own principles that he finally fails to solve the problem of Christian origins, and remains stranded in a compromise between tradition and criticism. Vindications of despotism and primitive charlatanism are psychologically and logically on all fours with vindications of incredible creeds, cruel churches, and the sentimentalism of reaction. The business and the duty of the anthropologist as of the sociologist is to note determinants and trace sequences, neither letting his ethic obscure for him the natural processes, nor letting the recognition of that obscure his ethic. Which is an act of discrimination in judgment, or nothing. 11. The Beginning of the End of Religion Returning to our immediate problem, the evolution of religious ideas, we note that, all error being but incomplete or illicit induction. Irrational and relatively rational ideas are alike products of the general mental process. The recoil from adventurous magic to precatory ritual is no more a renunciation of reason than the contrary progression. And all changes in religion are but better or worse applications of judgment under varying conditions of psychic suggestion and economic pressure. It is indeed true, and be the truth clearly envisaged, that with the conscious resort to critical reason there begins potentially a process which may end in the negation of all the primary religious conceptions and propositions. Even in their most purified philosophical form. When that end is reached, we may well say that philosophy and religion are differentiated, even as science is differentiated at once from magical and from precatory religion, at the point at which it either repudiates or abandons their premises and consciously proceeds on tested induction. But even this reaction is never instantaneously complete, witness the sociology of many physicists, and the meteorology of some sociologizing historians. And, on the other hand, there is an aspect or function of religion in respect of which it is structurally continuous with systems of doctrine which either abandon or repudiate its premises. From the first, it belonged to his nature that man should connect his ethic with his cosmology, since the one like the other grew out of his instincts and perceptions and his effort to harmonize them. Precisely as he anemised nature, so did he moralize it, that is, he conceived of it in terms of what moral ideas he had. Thus it was that he could alternately resort to propitiation and to magic, and alternately feel fear and gratitude. Granting that his religious conceptions first crystallized on the lines of his fears, it was inevitable that they should in time crystallize also in terms of his satisfactions, the one involved the other. And made it not only possible but probable that he should at times thank the very power he feared. Fear would involve propitiation, and propitiation was the door to gratitude. And thus it was that his gods were in the long run ethically like unto himself, neither wholly beneficent nor wholly maleficent. Such an evolution would seem inevitable, even if we do not posit as part of the process his direct deification of his own image in that of his ancestors. But that ancestor worship is a main factor in the growth of religion is proved both a priori and a posteriori. Once the ancestor was recognized as subsisting spirit-wise, he was only in degree, not in kind, distinguishable from the gods. And there is evidence that in some cases he was conceived as the god par excellence. See the evidence, of which Dr. Jevons makes no account, collected by Spencer, Principles of Sociology, Volume 1, Chaps. XX and 25, and Op. F. W. Christian, The Caroline Islands, 1899, page 75, Rev. D. MacDonald, Oceania, 1889, page 161, Basil Thompson, The Fijians, 1908, pages 5, 57, 111, Glenn Leonard, The Lower Niger and Its Tribes, 1906, pages 67, 89, 98 square, 104-9, etc. C. 
Partridge, Cross River Natives, 1905, pages 283-4, W. Crook, Religion and Folklore of Northern India, edition 1895, volume 1, ch4, Sir H. Johnston, The Uganda Protectorate, 1902, 2, 553, 555, 587, 588, 589, 631, 752. The essence of true Negro religion, says the writer last named, is ancestor worship, Liberia, 1906, 2, 1062. It is true that some observers, C.P. Mary Kingsley, West African Studies, 2nd edition 1901, pages 111 to 114, Sir B. Ellis, The You Speaking Peoples of the Slave Coast, 1890, page 24 square, deny that certain West Africans worship their ancestors, but this, as Miss Kingsley admits, is a matter of culture stage or variation. African religion is notably impermanent by reason of the peculiar stresses of life conditions, and no one can trace far the history even of the highest gods of the indigenes. C. P. Partridge, as cited, pages 271-3. The higher gods of a given moment may be ancestors whose ancestorhood has been lost sight of. Dr. Fraser, Golden Bough, I, 72, note, cites the testimony of Dr. Fison in Australia, the more I learn about savage tribes, the more I am convinced that among them the ancestors grow into gods. The same witness, again, tells of a great Fijian chief who really believed himself to be a god, i.e. a reincarnation of an ancestor who had grown into a god, idi, 141, note. The godhood of chiefs is a familiar phenomenon. The gods being no more than deceased chiefs, the Arikis, chiefs, were regarded as living ones, Taylor, Te Ika Amaui, or, New Zealand and its inhabitants, page 173. C. P. Hazelwood's testimony, Fraser, last sit. Also Mariner, Tonga Islands, edition 1827, 2, 99-100, W. Ellis, Polynesian Researches, I, 111 Square, T. Williams, Fiji and the Fijians, edition 1870, pages 19, 197, Com V. L. Cameron, Across Africa, 1885, page 336, and Fraser. Lectures on the History of the Early Kingship, 1905, page 132 sq. Among the early Aryan Hindus, the first man who died became Yama, the god of the shades, 139 and on another view he and his wife were the first human pair, 140 though sprung from deities of the atmosphere. 141 but here, still, we are dealing with late developments, it is still an open question how the first gods originated and it is impossible to determine exactly the primary psychic processes. The limitary theorem that all God-worship originated in ancestor-worship has evoked the counter-theorem that God-worship must in origin have preceded ancestor-worship, and Dr. Jevons so reasons. But again his predilection recoils on one of his own theses, for the ancestor is obviously likely to have been early regarded as the friendly spirit, 142 and we are thus led back to Dr. Jevons's repudiated premise that the religion of fear had preceded that of gratitude. 143. His final view of ancestor worship is that it was assimilated to that of the gods, but can never have preceded it. It may be true, he grants, that certain ancestors are somehow raised to the ranks of gods, but it cannot be proved that they were originally ghosts. Then follows this singular theorem. What then of these gods? If they are believed to be the ancestors of their worshippers, then they are not believed to have been human, the worshipper's pride is that his ancestor was a god and no mere mortal. If, on the other hand, a god is not believed to be the ancestor of any of his worshippers, then to assert that he was really a deified ancestor is to make a statement for which there is no evidence. It is an inference from an assumption, namely, that the only spirits which the savage originally knew were ghosts. That assumption, however, is not true. The savage believes the forces and phenomena of nature to be personalities like himself, he does not believe that they are ghosts or worked by ghosts. The fact is that ancestors known to be human were not worshipped as gods, 
and that ancestors worshipped as gods were not believed to have been human. 144. We might add, using Dyar. Jevons's own words concerning the theory he rejects, which is simplicity itself. But though in a sense simple, it is unhappily not consistent. For if the savage believed the forces of nature to be personalities like himself, if, as Dr. Jevons insists, the magic monger believed himself on a par with the supernatural in his power to control nature, and if, as Dr. Jevons has previously argued, 145 it was precisely out of the notion of such personalities or spirits that he framed his idea of supernatural forces or gods. Then either there is in the terms of the case no contradiction whatever between his counting his ancestors human and counting them gods, or there is no meaning whatever in the phrase personalities like himself. Dr. Jevons really cannot have it both ways, even for the purpose of confuting the theory of Spencer. All the while he is but modifying Spencer's special theory that all God ideas began in the idea of quasi-human spirits, merely refusing to accept ghosts as the first form of spirit idea. Of course, if they are. Jevons means that by definition the savage must be held to regard a God ancestor as not merely human, that the savage cannot conceptually mean exactly the same thing by God and man. Else there would be no double significance in the terms he may claim our assent. For in that case he is asserting a mere truism. But by his own showing the question is whether or not in the opinion of the savage the man could become a god. And so far is this from being doubtful that we have many instances of savages regarding some of their contemporaries, and priests regarding themselves, as gods. 146 To say nothing of the fact that for the early Hebrews the title, gods, was certainly applicable to judges or chiefs. 147 In Sumatra, the human species, called the gods of the middle world, are conceived as a true copy of the god world. In heaven the same life goes on as on earth. Only gradually are gods and men distinguished. The gods stand over men very much as a powerful chief over the crowd. Therefore were such princes named gods, Debata, and the gods in turn, Grandfather, with which title eminent men are greeted. 148 For the people of Mangaya in the Hervey Islands the three gods Rengi, Mokwaro, and Akatura, grandsons of the great god Rongo, 149 were the first inhabitants of the islands, and the ancestors of all the tribes. 150 And the idea is common. In the same island, Vadia, father of Rongo, is the father of gods and men 151 the people of Ephata in the New Hebrides, down till the time of their conversion, habitually applied to all their gods the name of spirits of the dead. 152 and their first man is practically identified with Maui, the creator. 153 so, among the Bushmen, Kang or Kagn is at once supreme god, the man or master of all things, and the first being, with Cody his wife. 154 And among the Australian Aborigines, the conception of a supreme being oscillated between a hero and a deity. 155 Concerning the ancestor spirits in general, a very studious missionary declares that they are regarded as clothed with all the divine powers in existence. 156 Nay, the Japanese at this moment regard themselves as universally descended from gods, and every dead relation becomes a god relatively to the particular household. 157 Thus Dr. Jevons is contradicted by the evidence as well as by his own earlier argument. As before, he has fallen into contradiction by reason of having an illicit doctrinal end to gain, this time, the discrediting of the ghost theory of religion. In order to destroy that, he has in effect committed himself to the proposition that the primitive savage clearly discriminated between ghosts and spirits. Now there is neither a priori nor a posteriori ground for this view. Since all the evidence goes to show that the dead ancestor was originally believed to eat and drink, hunt and ride, like the living, and the same things were certainly believed of the gods. It is one of Dr. Jevons's own reproaches against the creed of the Egyptians that it regarded the Ka or soul in the next world as eating and drinking exactly like the living man. There is really no pretext for believing that the early man ever thought that spirits were not ghosts or vice versa, it is Dr. Jevons who is here making an unproved assumption. 
This use of the word, ghost, as representing to early man exactly what it means to us is not only unwarrantable in itself, it is a misrepresentation of the so-called, ghost theory. For that has regard, among other things, to visions and dreams of the dead as living. If the early savage did see a subjective, apparition, he would doubtless hold it for a, person. But as regards dreams, peoples comparatively civilized have constantly taken the vision for an objective reality. Of such cases there are several in the Bible. On the other hand, we have Dyar. Jevons's express assurance first 158 that the totem animal becomes the totem ancestor, who is universally conceived to have been animal, not human, yet quasi-human, yet is made a god. 159 next, that, in virtue of the kinship between the god and his worshippers, the killing of a fellow clansman comes to be regarded in a totem clan as the same thing as killing the totem god. 160 and, further, that when totemism is no longer a living force, the mere altar stone comes to be identified with the god, who is, conceived as the ancestor of the race. 161 If, then, a whole community can be conceived as descending from one deified animal or from a stone, it surely might be conceived as descending from one man. As to his possible deification, we have Dyar. Jevons's own admission that, eventually, the dead were, on a level with the gods. 162 That is to say, he credits men with superiority to such anthropomorphism at a time when they anemised everything, and when, later, they could believe in divine animal ancestors or stone ancestors. And he dates ancestor worship proper as a still later practice arising in a state of comparatively advanced civilization 163 on the ground that, the family is a comparatively late institution in the history of society. Now, however, arises a fresh contradiction. The family, surely, was a tolerably old institution among the Romans at the beginning of their written history, but Dr. Jevons had previously committed himself to the proposition that the Romans, down to the time of their assimilation of Greek cults and deities, had not even attained to the stage of polytheism, being at that of simple animism. 164 That is, they had no gods, though they had long been wont to sacrifice to the manes of their ancestors. The mere statement of that thesis, in turn, involves new contradictions. In denying that the deities of the early Romans were properly describable as gods until they had adopted Greek gods or identified their own with some of these, he speaks of the genuine and great Italian gods, Janus, Jupiter, Mars, Diana, Venus, Hercules, etc. Then he proceeds to show that the great and genuine Janus was indistinguishable in origin and function from the inferior, animistic powers to whom the title of spirit is the highest that can be assigned. The general run of those spirits, he contends, following Ein, Schwegler, and others, were rather noumena or forces than beings, 165 and he represents the early Italians as not conceiving them in human form. Yet he admits that Janus was figured as a human head with two faces. The whole theorem is indefensible. To say that an ancient Italian peasant thought of the forces of nature as abstractions before he had attained to the conception of personal gods, when all the while he thought of Mars and Diana, Jupiter and Juno, as males and females, is to affirm a countersense. The sole defense offered is the impossible set of definitions by which Chantepie de la Sauce undertakes to draw a line between God's proper and nature powers. 166 By that definition gods are not evolved till they have been sculptured, a countersense which at this stage of hierology we might have been spared. The superposition of so many Greek myths upon those of the Romans 167 gives considerable range for mystification. But no process of that kind can save the theorem that the gods were not anthropomorphized by imagination before they were objectively imaged. The thesis, finally, that the Romans before the period of Greek influence were mere polydaemonists, and that at the same time they thought even of their daimons as impersonal forces, destroys itself, even apart from Dr. Jevons's admission that all the while they had great gods. An inferior spirit is cognizable as such only by contrast with a superior. And the contention that Janus was evolved from a simple spirit of doorways, and remains such, is merely one more rebuttal of Dr. Jevons's own division of species. If the spirit of doorways was anthropomorphized, 
it is idle to contend that the other spirits were not. In the very act of maintaining this untenable thesis dr. Jevons recognizes in the attitude of the Romans towards their manies, the good, a, worship of deceased ancestors and of spirits which, like genita mana, are best explained as spirits of the departed. 168 And he decides, further, that the Lara's prestites were conceived under the form of dogs. 169 In the face of all this, his further account of the Italian gods as fetishes reduces the theory to chaos. We are now asked to combine the three conceptions 1. That ancestor worship is late, 2. That the Romans had not even reached polytheism long after they had practiced ancestor worship, 3. That they did not anthropomorphize their spirits while they did their ancestors and their great gods, whom, all the while, they had not attained to conceiving as such. And, as if this were not confusion enough, Dyar. Jevons pronounces that, at this pre-polytheistic stage, in Rome, as in China, Assyria, and Babylonia, the cult was nothing but organized magic, 170, that organized magic which elsewhere he puts as a late degeneration. Even as he does here by associating it with the stage of full polytheism in Assyria and Babylonia. And still we have to note the crowning temerity of the assertion that an imported polytheism was forced by the state on a people not yet prepared for anything higher than animism and ancestor worship, 171, that very ancestor worship which in his larger treatise he describes as a late evolution. Possible only after gods have been worshipped. The conception of a state forcing polytheism on a people incapable of it, that is, forcing a belief in gods on a people who had never thought of gods, and still less of God, is really fatal to the theorists' differentiation between belief in gods and belief in spirits. Of this dialectical ruin we can but brush the debris aside. 12. Historic View of Ancestor Worship it is necessary to clear up the historic problem of ancestor worship in order to reach a sound definition of religion. And to begin with, we find the historical evidence is all against Dr. Jevons's later thesis. Not only have we the many cases in which contemporary savages, like ancient Gnostics, think of a god as an ancestor or of the first man as a god 172 and the record in ancient Egypt of the process by which a deceased king became a god. 173 But we have the relatively late doctrine in Hesiod 174 according to which the men of the first age became just and beneficent daimons, passing invisibly over the earth, dispensing rewards and retributions and good fortune. There is a risk of confusion over this last conception, which, with others of a similar kind, is taken by Mr. Lang as a proof that early men, contrary to Mr. Fraser's account, supposed themselves to be naturally immortal. 175 dr. Fraser's words were that, lacking the idea of eternal duration, primitive man naturally supposes the gods to be mortal like himself. 176 Here the verbal confusion is complete. In the very act of claiming that, far from lacking the idea of eternal duration of life, primitive man has no other idea, Mr. Lang admits, not that he formulates his ideas in such a term as eternal. 177 But neither does he formulate it in such a phrase as naturally immortal. He has, in fact, no clear idea to formulate, 178 and Dr. Fraser of all men should have remembered as much. As we have seen, 179 the savage commonly believes that he would never die save for the acts of hostile spirits, sorcerers, or enemies, yet he knows that all his race die. What has happened is that men at a certain stage became capable of conceptually noting at once death and the apparent survival in dreams, of men in some different fashion after death, without framing any theory. But chronic crises in their political or tribal history had the effect of singling out from the vague crowd of ancestral memories those of a particular group or generation who made or led some migration or conquest. And these became for a time, that ancestors par excellence, early man being unable to construct the human past save by way of some definite beginning. At some point in the long vista he needed a, first man, or beast, or plant, or stone, or pear. And he had to make such out of some of his ancestral material, with whatever fanciful embellishments. In virtue of the same state of mind, we find tribes and even nations convinced of their special descent from one later man, 
who at one stage definitely ranks as a god 180 though another religious concept may ultimately undeify him. As in the cases of Abraham and Jacob. As a result of all these tendencies, at a stage in which the primordial belief in the spiritual or occult survival of ancestors in general has begun to be definitely contradicted 181 by the conceptual recognition of death. And by disbelief in the land beyond the grave, there emerges a vague compromise in the notion that either the first pair or the men of the first age were of a different order as regarded their liability to death. And this belief holds the ground until haply a general doctrine of resurrection or ghostly immortality pushes it in turn to the background. But though the notion of the survival of ancestors has thus in a succession of forms subsisted from a very remote period, it clearly does not follow that early men conceived themselves to be immortal in the sense in which they were later held to be so by their descendants. The definite or conceptual belief is retrospective. It is, however, sufficiently general to dispose of Mr. Lang's argument that among the Australians gods cannot be developed from ancestors. No ghost of a man, he insists, can grow into a god if his name is tabooed and therefore forgotten. 182 And again, in Australia, where even the recent ghosts are unadored is it likely that some remote ghost is remembered as founder of the ancient mysteries? 183 It is after this contention that, apparently without realizing the bearing of the statement upon the argument under notice, Mr. Lang triumphantly tells us that there is Australian as well as other evidence of the nearly universal vogue of the belief that the first men, i.e., ancestors, were deathless. Obviously the very habit of tabooing proper names might conduce to the deifying of ancestors under special epithets, since that resort is always open under tabooism. 184 The tabooing of ancestors' names, which is one of the most widespread of savage practices, 185 can no more destroy the notion that those ancestors have existed than the tabooing of god names among Egyptians, Babylonians, Hebrews, and Romans put the gods in question out of recollection. 186 Was not Yahweh scrupulously specified in many Hebrew rituals as Adonai, the Lord, and by Samaritans as Shema, the name, 187 It is well to ask why savages taboo the names of the dead before we deduce views as to the consequences. The reasons doubtless vary, but some instances may illuminate the practice. Among the Badaks, where a man on becoming a father of a boy, NN, is henceforth known only as father of NN. Children must not utter the names of their parents, and spouses call each other father of NN and daughter of the, naming her family. Here the idea is that to know a man's name is to have some power over his various souls. 188 Among the Naranyeri of South Australia, the name of the dead must not be mentioned until his body has decayed, lest a want of sorrow should seem to be indicated by a common and flippant use of his name. A native would have the deceased believe that he cannot hear or speak his name without weeping, 189 There is no tendency to oblivion here. In other cases, again, it is clear that when at death a man's name is buried, he is simply renamed. Among the Maasai, should there be anything which is called by that, the deceased's, name, it is given another name which is not like that of the deceased. For instance, if an unimportant person called Oelonana, he who is soft or weak or gentle, were to die, gentleness would not be called Onanai in that crawl, as it is the name of a corpse, but it would be called by another name. Such as Epopal, it is smooth. 190 If then Oelonana were an important person, is it to be supposed that his personality would be forgotten? Would not he too be relabeled? 191 All dead men's names are tabooed, is it to be supposed that the personalities, or even the old names, of all are forgotten? Renaming would be a necessity, for men as for things. Among the Naranyeri, apparently, this would be only temporary the original name being reverted to after the decay of the body. And even if it were not, the reminiscence would be unbroken, so that a notable man could as well be deified among name tabooers as among tribes who had not the practice. Nor is there any force in the argument from recent disuse of such deification. Even if we admit the probability that Australian tribes have latterly 192 ceased to deify ancestors, the fact remains that, as Mr. Lang admits, they think of remote ancestors as undying, even as they do of gods. 
Recognizing, however, that the definite conception of ancestors as abnormal in point of deathlessness is retrospective, we must not on the other hand fall into the error of supposing that only in late ages, and by way of poetic retrospect. Did men conceive of their deceased predecessors as exercising powers of the kind credited to whatever beings for the time answered to our general notion of gods? 193 The true solution is that in men's vague ideas the early gods approximated much more to themselves. And that gradually, the gods, as such were relatively raised, the change proceeding for ages without involving the absolute negation of ancestral spirits 194 and fortiori. Without necessarily removing from the order of fully established gods all who might have been ancestors to start with. Indeed, there is evidence, as we have seen, that in early stages of religion the gods were actually conceived as destructible. 195 And in the Vedas and Brahmanas the gods actually acquire immortality in different ways, by the help of Agni, by drinking the Soma, by continence and austerity, thus gradually raising themselves above the Asuras. With whom they were originally equal. 196 So in the Babylonian deluge epic Parnapishtim 197 and his wife, who had been mortal, are raised to immortality. 198 This conception may be a reflex of the same doctrine as first framed for mortals. But there the fact stands that the gods were not definitely conceived as necessarily immortal, to start with. To see in the Hesiodic or modern savage theory only a late or eventual raising of ancestors to a divine status would be to do violence to all anthropology. Rather, it stands for a theological process of discrimination by which the priesthoods of the gods carefully reduced deified ancestors as such to a lower level of divinity, while still recognizing their immortality and supernatural power. Such a process had demonstrably occurred in the Hebrew system, where the patriarchs and heroes of the sacred books have been actually identified as ancient Semitic deities. 199 And it was just as likely to occur in those other developments of Semitic theology which can be shown to underlie the cosmology of Homer and Hesiod. 200 Reasoning a priori, again. We have not the faintest ground for supposing that primeval man discriminated between orders of spirits to the extent of conceiving his ancestors as dispensing supernatural favors and yet at the same time ranking far below gods who did the same thing. How should men conceivably begin to deify confessed mortals as beside great gods, having never ventured to deify them before the gods had been so magnified? On that line there is no solution. In the words of Professor Robertson Smith, the origins of all religion go back to a stage of human thought in which the question of the nature of the gods, as distinguished from other beings, did not even arise in any precise form. Because no one series of existences was strictly differentiated from another. 201 In the light of all the facts, in fine, we realize that the common process, seen among the historic Greeks 202 of demideifying a hero, was merely prevented by the presence of fully established cults from developing just as those cults had done earlier. It of course does not follow that they had all originated in that fashion, but that the ancestor cults as it were played into the solar and vegetal cults from time immemorial is on all grounds probable. On the other line of reasoning under notice we end in a mere countersense as to the definition of ancestor. You cannot have ancestor worship, says Dr. Jevons at one point, till you have the family. Yet he himself has just been describing the totem of the early community as an ancestor worshipped as a god before the family was recognized. We seem to be left with the puzzle, when is an ancestor not an ancestor? As the sole fruit of a chapter of investigation. If by a sudden petitio principi ancestor worship is to be defined as strictly a private or family cult of the kind seen in historic times, then indeed the denial of the priority of ancestor worship is justified. And it is justified again if it be meant that hostile gods preceded friendly ones. But in terms of Dr. Jevons's own theory of the totemistic sacrament, the ancestor god is the type of the first friendly god, who on this view is later than the unfriendly gods. And the friendly god is ancestral precisely because friendliness was apt to be associated with ancestors 203 who were certainly regarded as were spirits. The warranted inference, however, is merely that the ancestor spirit was one of the types of friendly god. 
just as myths so-called can be seen, on a fair induction, to have originated in a dozen different modes of natural fallacy, inference from phenomena, misinterpretation of names and objects of art, constructions from analogy. Misinterpretation of ritual, conjunctions of worships, and so forth 204, so other religious beliefs so-called are to be inferred as originating in many lines of the animistic and explanatory instinct. The God idea is simply the most typical myth. Adapting the popular rhyme, we may reasonably say that, there are nine and twenty modes of making tribal gods, and every single one of them is, natural. There is really no conceptual limit to the primeval faculty of godmaking. The Roman pantheon alone, wherein are gods of diseases, of drains, of sneezing, of every bodily act, and of a hundred verbal abstractions, might have warned any theorist against denying that early man might deify his ancestors. And the record of the fortunes of many cults might equally warn us against denying that any one deity might attain the highest status. Osiris, on one theory, is like Hades a god made out of the abstraction of the abode of the departed. 205 Dionysus, like Soma, is plausibly held to be the deified abstraction of mere wine 206 sacramentally regarded, as Agni is certainly the deified abstraction of the sacrificial fire. And Hathor, who ran Isis hard in divine honors in Egypt, is in origin simply Hathor, the dwelling of Horus, to wit, the dawn and the sunset. 207 As Venus is possibly a Roman deification of the term Benoth in the Carthaginian phrase Succus Benoth 208 The tense of prostitution. The gods and goddesses, in fact, are made out of man's needs and passions, his fancies and his blunders, his fears and his hopes. And it would be strange if he never made them, even the highest of them, from the nucleus of his reverent and affectionate retrospect on his own kind. Round his elders and his ancestors were formed his first and fundamental notions of right and duty and obedience. How then should he fail to bring at times his religious and his primary ethical ideals into combination? Von I hearing indeed has argued that the offerings at the graves of the dead, at least among Aryans, are the products not of love, as commonly supposed, but of fear. 209 It is characteristic of the mode of progression of the sciences that nobody appears to suppose they might be both, some people fearing the dead, some loving them. 210 But even supposing them to have originated in fear of the importunities of the neglected ghost, it would not be unnatural that from the propitiated ghost there should be expected special favor. Doubtless the principle operated differently in different stages. The thesis of Fustel de Colanges, that, what unites the members of the ancient family is the religion of the hearth and of ancestors, and that, the ancient family is a religious rather than a natural association, 211 may be perfectly true, under his own reservation that religion of course did not create the family. And it would follow that ancestor worship took on special features from the time that the family dwelt by or over the family tomb. But this does not dispose of the problem as to the religion of the nomads who have no fixed hearth and tomb, 212 and of the peoples who either burned or exposed their dead. Taking the nomadic period in general, and assuming 213 that the horde preceded the family in order of evolution, we must admit that there were ideas of ghosts and other quasi-human spirits before the strict family ancestor was evolved. But there is nothing to show that the idea of a general ancestor or ancestors was not elaborated in the Horde period, out of the normal idea of the ancestor ghost as well as out of the idea of the non-ancestral spirit. Those ideas being easily able to coalesce. A Horde was likely to have a Horde ancestor god, else why should the Greeks be found speaking of their family gods, gods of their blood, paternal gods, gentile gods? 214 If the Theos were previously conceived solely as a stupendous cosmocrator, how, once more, came men to make Theoi of the household? If on the other hand the family and the tribe were roughly coeval, and the notion of a family ancestor be about as old as the notion of a tribe ancestor or first man. We are still left facing ancestor worship as one of the norms of the cult of a friendly god. Even in the Aryan horde elders would make themselves respected, and lost fathers and mothers would be missed. And there was no way in which early man could conceive of a providential or punitive deity save in terms of the punitive and providential practices of elders towards juniors, or of chiefs or patriarchs towards groups. 
or in terms of the action of hostile groups or persons. That the abstraction of divine judges and lawgivers and avengers, thus reached, should be employed to sanction the codes or customs of the seniors or the patriarchs, was psychologically a matter of course. But that does not affect the fact of the a posteriori origination. 13. The authoritarian element a mark of religion. Tribal ethic, then, would progressively mold tribal religion and be molded by it, that is to say, a moral step enforced by political circumstances would be reflected more or less clearly in religion. As in the case of the blood covenant with the god, or in the reduction of the pantheon to monarchic or familial order. While on the other hand the established ethical view of the god would prime the ethical view of the political system. It was not that man was primarily, as it were, incapable of moral ideas as such, or that his notion of mutual duty could arise only, as Dr. Jevons seems to suppose, in the sheath of the idea of taboo. Thus to credit men's ethic wholly to their religion, while claiming for their religion a separate root in a separate order of consciousness, is merely to beg the question in the interests of occultism. What happened was a habitual interaction of the norms of conduct. Theism would help the king, and monarchy would help theism. The outcome was that the entire ethic of the community had as it were a religious shape, 2.15 from which rational criticism could only gradually deliver it. When, then, religious reformers arose whose end and aim was the moral life, they would carry into their ethic the psychology of their religion, were it only because that had been the matrix, so to speak. Of the most serious reflection, this even if they did not state their moral doctrine in terms of a recasting of the current religious belief. For Dr. Jevons, such a recasting would be irreligious unless the reformer professed to have direct intercourse with deity. 216 But we have seen that line of distinction to be untenable, and we cannot consistently deny either religious spirit or religious form to the argument, God must be good, how then could he have ordained a cruelty or an injustice? Inasmuch, however, as all such reforms of morals took effect in modifying the current code for action, the very conception of such a code is historically a religious growth. 217 And while the concept of public law would quite early differentiate from that of morality as standing for what is compared with what ought to be, the idea of a code which had a superior moral authority as coming from a god through a good teacher remains so nearly homogeneous with that of a code framed by a new teaching god or a good teacher that they have far more in common than of incompatible. The essential structural continuity rests on the conception of spiritual authority, of religious obedience. Where that is present, the religious temper is substantially conserved even if the cosmological premises of religion are disregarded or dismissed. Thus it is that such a system as that of Buddhism is not merely a posteriori but a priori to be regarded as a religion. To refuse so to regard it is once more to embrace the anomaly of the decision that what serves for religion to half the human race is non-religion. Where ethics decisively diverges from the religious norm is the point at which it is freed from the concept of external authority. This point, indeed, is slow to become clear. And Kant, who is definitely anti-religious in his repudiation of all forms of ritual of propitiation, but finds his moral authority in a transcendental imperative, is still partly on the religious plane. Fichte, who brushed aside Kant's identification of religion with ethic, and insisted that religion is knowledge in the sense of philosophy, Fichte will be pronounced by others than Dr. Jevons to be non-religious as regards his ethic, though he is still religious in respect of his pantheism. It is only when both are divested of a priorism that religion is done with. Then, though some may still claim to apply to their independent philosophy of life the name of religion, on the score that it is at least as seriously framed and held as ever a religion was. The anthropologist may reasonably grant that a real force of differentiation has emerged. When every man consciously shapes his own religion out of his conceptions of social utility, the term is of no descriptive value. And when many do so and many more still cleave to religious cosmology and to the ethic of specified authority, the description as applied to the former is misleading. In any case, it is a historical fact that only slowly do ethical schools lose the religious caste. Jurari in Verba Magistri is their note in all save vigorously progressive periods, 
and the philosophical schools of the Middle Ages all strike it. That those of today have wholly abandoned it, perhaps few would considerately assert. But it is at least obvious that it belongs as essentially to Buddhism as to Christianity, whether or not the individual Buddhist accepts, as most do, a mass of religious beliefs alien to the alleged doctrine of the Master. 14. Definition of Religion We may now circumspectly sum up the constructive argument, and in so doing we arrive at an inductive definition of religion. 1. Religion consists primarily in a surmise or conception, reached by way of simple animism, of the causation and control of nature, including human life, in terms of inferred quasi-human personalities, whether or not defined as extranatural. On the belief proceed certain practices. Beginning on the side of fear, it necessarily expands in time, with the rise of culture, to the side of gratitude, and it expresses itself accordingly. But its magical or strategical and its simply precatory or propitiatory forms proceed on the same premises, and are in origin contemporary and correlative. Being respectively the expression of the more and the less self-confident sides of men's nature 218 in the state of ignorance. 2. The primary surmise or conception involves itself in a multitude of beliefs, of which one of the most significant is that of kinship between animal and man, making possible a religious development of totemism, and the animal descent of the latter. From animism in general and this belief in particular comes an endless diversity of mythic narratives, all of which must be regarded as part of religion. 3. On the basis of animism, and of primitive inference of causation in all coincidence, arise a multitude of special practices, as taboo, which are first and last religious, being invariably bound up with the religious ideas aforesaid. 4. In virtue of the inevitable correlation of moral with cosmological thought in early man through animism, religion thus becomes secondarily a rule for the human control of human life. And it remains structurally recognizable on this side when the primary aspect has partly faded away. 5. Alike when such a rule for life is ascribed to a mythical founder, whether god or demigod or supernormal man, or to a historical personage credited only with moral genius. The special sanctity or authority ascribed to his code partakes of the nature of religion. Thus the religious element in positivism consists as much in the reverence given to the founder as in the elements of his teaching. There is a varying measure of a common religious element in the kind of honor paid to Zoroaster, Buddha, Moses, Jesus, the Hebrew prophets, Apollonius of Tyana, Paul, St. Augustine, St. Francis, Luther, Calvin, Arminius, Jansen, Glass. Sandman, Muggleton, Auguste Comte, Mrs. Eddy, and Madame Blavatsky. 6. Philosophic, scientific, and ethical thought may be defined as specifically non-religious when, but not before, they have abandoned who repudiated the cosmological premises of religion, found their guiding principle in tested induction, and in the case of ethics, ceased to found the rule of life on either alleged supernatural revelation or the authority of an alleged supernormal or specially gifted teacher. 7. Even after conceptual thought has thus repudiated religion, however, what is termed, cosmic emotion, remains in the psychic line of religion. In fine, religion is the sum, a, of men's ideas of their relation to the imagined forces of the cosmos, b, of their relation to each other as determined by their views of that, or by teachers who authoritatively recast those views. And, c, of the practices set up by those ideas. Under this definition there is room for every religion ever historically so-called, 219 from fetishism to pantheism, and from Buddhism to Kantism, without implicit negation of any claim made for any one religion to any moral attribute. Save of course that of objective truth or credibility. Chapter 2. Comparison and Appraisement of Religions. 1. Early Forces of Reform. The main obstacle to a science of religion, naturally, is the survival either of simple belief in a given religion or of sociological predilections set up by such a belief. And we have seen how a scholarly treatise may still be affected by one or the other. 
that a learned and thoughtful introduction to the history of religion should treat the whole vast drama of religious development up till the period of the Roman Empire as the propedeutic of the world to Christ, 220 is perhaps not to be wondered. At in view of English culture conditions in general. But it is none the less unfortunate. A view of the history of religion which merely ignores or discredits on the one hand the entire religious life of the non-Christian world, and on the other the entire monotheistic or Unitarian evolution in the Christian world. Cannot meet the needs of scientific thought. The pure rational statement that, of all the great religions of the world it is the Christian Church alone which is so far heir of all the ages as to fulfill the dumb, dim expectation of mankind, is but a sectarian shibboleth. And the claim, in it alone the sacramental meal commemorates by ordinance of its founder the divine sacrifice which is a propitiation for the sins of all mankind, is an all too simple solution of the historic problem. We are being treated merely to a new adjustment of Christian evidence. On the side of science, again, there is certainly a danger that the necessary effort to eliminate partisanship and predilection may somewhat sway the balances. Dar. Jevons justly argues 221 that religion is no more to be conceived or classified in terms of primeval superstition than science is to be classified in terms of primeval animism and magic. But the very tactic of his own treatise, aiming as it does at certificating one set of developments on behalf of the special apparatus of the Christian Church, is a hindrance to the recognition of religion as an aspect of the process of civilization. In terms of the analogy with science, Religion ought to be today at a far higher level than it was in ancient Syria, or in the Greco-Roman decadence. But here the special pleader reverts to the Numenian thesis of special genius, arbitrarily placing the highest genius for religion in antiquity, and implying, apparently, that whatever genius there has been since is joyfully subservient to that. Now, genius is certainly a factor in every line of mental evolution, in the sense that all marked mental capacity is a variation. And insofar as religions have been moralist or rationalized, genius for righteousness or for reason has clearly been at work. But just as certain as the fact of genius is the fact that it is in large part wasted. And we shall utterly misread the history of mankind if we conceive the religious consciousness as readily susceptible of impulses from the moral or rational genius of the gifted few. 222 On the contrary, Nothing is harder than even the partial imposition of the higher view on the religious multitude, and this precisely because the crowd supposes, with the countenance of Dr. Jevons, that it has inner consciousness of the veracity of its congenital beliefs. King Acunatan of Egypt, presumably, had such consciousness of the truth of his monotheism. But even his autocratic power failed to annul the inner consciousness of the polytheists around him, or, for that matter, the direct consciousness of the priests that their bread was buttered on the polytheistic side. 223. There is, I think, no known case in history of a going priesthood reforming its own cult, in the sense of willingly making an important change on moral lines. There is indeed abundant reason to credit priesthoods with the alteration of the rule under which the priest himself was the primary subject for sacrifice, 224 but the change consisted solely in laying the burden upon others. Apart from the presumptive changes of view set up in Israel during the exile, it seems to have been always by kings, or queens or heroes 225, that human sacrifices were suppressed in antiquity, never by the choice of priesthoods. 226 Thus King Europolis is associated with the abolition of the human sacrifice to Artemis Triclaria, 227 Cecrops with the substitution of cakes for living victims to Zeus Lycaeus. 228 Iphocrates 229 and Gelan 230 with the attempted stoppage of human sacrifices at Carthage, King Diphilus with its cessation at Cyprus, Amosis with its abrogation at Heliopolis in Egypt. 231 In the ancient history of Japan, it is an emperor who, about the beginning of the Christian era, recoils from the practice of burying servitors alive at the funeral of a prince. And it is on his appeal that one of his ministers hits on the device of substituting clay images. 232 Among the Samoans one legend ran that the human sacrifices to the sun, which were destroying the race, were put an end to by the Lady Ui giving herself up and being accepted by the pacified sun as his bride. 
while another version makes Ui the daughter of the king of Manue, who gave up his daughter as a final sacrifice, and then abolished the practice. 233 In another case a Tongan queen, named Manu, saved alive a number of those destined for her husband's cannibal feasts. And in yet another a cannibal god, presumably the priest or incarnation of a higher deity, is destroyed by the action of a daring youth. 234 The powerful king Finno of Tonga, again, showed a disposition to check some forms of human sacrifice. 235 And King Gizo of Dahome is credited with materially reducing the number of human sacrifices throughout his kingdom, 236 during his lifetime. King Jalil, again, promising that, by and by, little by little, much may be done, in the way of curtailing the sacrifices, declared, if I were to give up this custom at once, my head would be taken off tomorrow. 237 Such was the power of the priests. Similarly the abolition of human sacrifices in ancient China was effected only by the action of humane princes, and the attempt in earlier times seems to have involved insurrection and desperate war. 238. Elsewhere such attempts are known to have failed, and the work of King Gizo of Dahom was undone after him. The Fetishir is all-powerful in Dahom. The last monarch was notably desirous of modifying the horrors and the expenses of the national worship, his son has been compelled to walk in the old path of blood. 239 The strongest characteristic of priesthoods is their conservatism. And though moral and religious innovators have arisen among them, practical moral reforms have always to be forced on them from the outside. 240 Where a powerful king resists them from humane motives, even if he put them down by force for the time, he is not unlikely to be the victim in the end. 241 Where substitutes have been made for human sacrifices among nature folk, without governmental pressure, as apparently among the Malays and some tribes in India, there is no priesthood to speak of. And these simple people have silently attained what passes for a great reform where religious history is concerned. 242. For every man of moral genius, probably, who has been able to modify for the better the form or course of an organized religion, there have been ten who were slain or silenced by its organization. Indeed, if we reckon solely the ostensible historical cases of fortunate innovation on the direct appeal of genius, the balance is immeasurably the other way. What is more, the economic and social conditions in antiquity were such that the man who succeeded even indirectly in modifying a cult or creed for the better did so by some measure of fraud. Dar. Jevons, as we have seen, lightly decides that such reformers have usually considered themselves, to be speaking, not their own words or thoughts, but those of their God. If they did, be it said once more, they would only be feeling as did the common run of early priests in their normal procedure. The full significance of the case will come out much better if we say that reformers found they stood the best chance of a hearing when they professed to be speaking the words of the God. What this meant in the way of demoralization it is depressing to surmise. It is indeed customary of late to substitute for the exaggerated notion of pagan priestcraft that used to be held by most Christians and by some free thinkers the much more arbitrary notion of an absolute rectitude in the pristine religious consciousness. But critical science can accept no such fantasy. There are evidences of conscious fraud on the surface of the most primitive looking cults known to us. 243 The majority of travelers unhesitatingly impute fraud to the magicians and priests of savage tribes. And while there is reason to believe that early man and savage man have a less clear sense than we of the difference between truth and falsehood, in this respect partly approximating to the child mind, there is really no reason for supposing them less capable of resort to willful deception. On the contrary, they seem in religious matters to have been more prompt at fabrication, in the ratio of the greater credulity they met with. Unless, then, we proceed with Dr. Jevons to make gratuitous exceptions in favor of all cases on the line of evolution of our own creed, we must conclude that the ancient conditions often, if not always, drove reformers to make believe. 2. Reform as a religious process. The case may become clearer if we look for illustration to the phenomena of fictitious literature. 
It will hardly be suggested that the Semites and Greeks who wrote religious treatises or hymns and ascribed them to famous men of centuries before, were under a hallucination as to the source of their thoughts. They did but seek for them the passport of a name that challenged respect. Precisely, then, as the prophetic writer put his words in the mouth of a dead prophet, a common way of aiming at reforms, making him say, Thus said the Lord. So in many cases at least the living prophet must have been perfectly conscious that his spoken words were not the Lord's, but his own. In fact, the saner the prophet, and the saner his counsel, the more likely was he to know how he came by it, though his feeling that he was on the side of the God would greatly relieve his scruples about professing to be the God's mouthpiece. The man who, on the other hand, was so far beside himself as to suppose that omnipotence was speaking through him, was much less likely to have wise counsels to give. In any case, crazed or prudent, right or wrong, all alike ran the risk of being denounced by the others as false prophets, 244 and stoned accordingly. Thus reform was a matter either of persuading kings or of managing fellow priests and fellow worshippers, and genius for management would be fully as important as genius for righteousness. In the case, for instance, of a substitution of animal for human sacrifices, or of dodals for sacrificial animals or men or children. The reformer of a priest-ruled cult had to play at once upon the credulity and the self-interest of the worshippers. It is clear from the Hebrew books that for the early Hebrews as for the Phoenicians the firstborn of man as well as of animals was at one time a customary sacrifice. 245 And the myth of Abraham and Isaac confesses the fact in the act of supplying a pretext for a change. In the story of the sacrifice of Jephthah's daughter, again, it is evident that human sacrifice must once have been normal to permit of the idea of the application of the vow to a human being. And the declaration that a special annual mourning was set up for the alleged tragedy of mischance is an ethical fiction. In all likelihood the ground of it was an annual sacrifice of a maiden, which was transmuted into an act of lamentation for one traditionally sacrificed. So with the obvious fiction of Joshua's imprecating on the rebuilder of Jericho the curse of slaying his sons for the foundations, 246 the practice had clearly been normal, and the representing of it as a foredoomed horror is a late invention. And no less clear is it, from the story of the sacrifice of a virgin imposed by the Delphic oracle on the Messenians in their war with the Spartans 247 that the practice, wherever it originated, was religiously established among the early Greeks. Such storytelling as that of the Isaac myth, and that of the suicide of the despairing Aristodemus, convinced that he had slain his daughter in vain 248 was the natural device 249 of the humane reformer who was much more likely to be relatively a rationalist than to be abnormally subject to religious ecstasies or trances. Muhammad is indeed a case to the contrary, he being credited with opposing the practice of female infanticide, but the very fact that in the Quran no tale is framed to carry the point is a confirmation of our view. In an old cult, a bald command to forego or reverse an established rite would be bewildering to the worshippers. Whereas a myth describing a process of commutation would find easy acceptance where such a commutation was already agreeable to normal feeling. Normal feeling, on the other hand, was often the matrix of the reformative idea. There was a natural tendency to relax human sacrifices in times of prosperity unless a zealous priesthood insisted on them. 250 and a long period of prosperity would make men loath to shed the blood of their own children. Thus either the political accident of a prolonged peace or the opening of a new era of government was the probable condition of the effectual arrest of child sacrifice among the Hebrews. And the myth of Abraham and Isaac and the ram was in all likelihood framed at such a time. Its inclusion in a sacred book was some security against such a reversion to child sacrifice as we know to have occurred among the Carthaginians in times of great distress or danger, after periods in which it was disused. 251 The same tendency is implied in the story, whether true or false, of a cannibal sacrament among the members of the conspiracy of Catalan. 252 Nations, like men, are apt to be driven to worse courses by terror and disaster. 253 And it is not only conceivable but probable that the Hebrews made their main steps towards religious betterment when they were temporarily raised from the list of the nations and set to cultivate their religious consciousness in a captivity. 
which withheld them from political vicissitude without reducing them to slavery. 254. For the explanation of religious evolution, then, we must look not so much to genius for right thought as to genius for hitting the common taste or for outmaneuvering rival cults. By far the clearest case of cult or creed shaping by a single genius is that of Muhammad. 255 And here, to the historical eye, it is the political expansion of Islam at a critical moment that makes the fortunes of the faith, not the rise of the faith that makes the fortune of the Muslims. Had not the Saracens at the moment of the successful emergence of Muhammad's movement found their chance to overrun great territories of the enfeebled Christian empire, that movement might never have been aught but an obscure tribal worship. Or might indeed have been speedily overlaid by the surrounding polytheism. It was the sense of triumphant opposition to Christian tritheism and Mary worship and to Persian fire worship that sharply defined the Muslim dogma. And once a religion has its sacred book, its tradition of triumph, and its established worship, the conservatism of the religious instinct counts for much more in preserving it than the measure of genius that went to the making of its doctrine. Every religion, in fact, sees supreme genius, both literary and religious, in its own Bible simply because it is such. No Christian can have a devouter conviction of the splendor of his sacred books than the Moslem enjoys concerning the Quran, the Brahman over the Vedas, or the Buddhist in respect of the large literature of his system. 3. Polytheism and Monotheism Broadly speaking, religious evolution is far from being a steady progress, and, such as it is, is determined in great measure by political and social change. It was certainly a political process, for instance, that established a nominal monotheism among the Hebrews in Palestine, even as it was a political process that established a systematic polytheism in other states. 256 Primarily, all tribes and cities probably tended to worship specially a god, ancestral or otherwise, who was the luck of the community and was at first nameless, or only generically named. Later comparison and competition evolved names. And any association of tribes meant as a matter of course a pantheon, the women of each taking their deities with them when they married into another clan. Ferocious myths and theological historiography in the Hebrew books tell amply of the anxiety of the priests of Yahweh at a comparatively late stage to resist this natural drift of things. And the history, down to the captivity, avows their utter failure. Neither in the attempt nor in its failure is there anything out of the ordinary way of religious evolution. While some theorists, with Rana, credit Israel with a unique bias to monotheism, others, unable to see how Israel could be thus unique, infer either an early debt to the higher monotheistic thought of Egypt or, with Ewald, an original reaction on the part of Moses against Egyptian polytheism. All three inferences are gratuitous. Renaz's thesis that a special bias to monotheism was set up in the early Semites by their environment is contradicted by all their ancient history, and is now abandoned by theologians. 257 The story of Moses in Egypt is a flagrant fiction. And, Moab, Ammon, and Edom, Israel's nearest kinsfolk and neighbors, were monotheists in precisely the same sense in which Israel itself was, 258, that is to say, they too had special tribal gods whom their priests sought to aggrandize. There is no reason to doubt that such priests fought for their Baals as Yahwists did for Yahweh. The point of differentiation in Israel is not any specialty of consciousness, but the specialty of evolution ultimately set up in their case through the conquest of Babylon by Cyrus. All the earlier Palestinian groups tended to be monotheistic and polytheistic in the same way. When tribes formally coalesced in a city or made a chief, a chief god was likely to be provided by the paramount tribe or cult 259 unless he were framed out of the local fact of the city, or the mere principle of alliance. 260 In the case of the Hebrews, the cult of Yah, or Yahu, or Yahweh, was simply a local worship sometimes aggrandized by the king, and documentally imposed on the fictitious history of the nation long afterwards. 261 In the miscellaneous so-called prophecies ascribed to Jeremiah there is overwhelming testimony to the boundless polytheism of the people even in Jerusalem, the special seat of Yahweh, just before the captivity. Either these documents preserve the historic facts or they were composed by Yahwists to terrorize yet a later generation of Hebrew polytheists. 
not till a long series of political pressures and convulsions had eliminated the variant stocks and forces, and built up a special fanaticism for one cult, did an ostensible monotheism really hold the ground in the sacred city. 262. That this monotheism was religious, in the arbitrary and unscientific sense of being neither ethical nor philosophical it might seem needless to deny, but the truth is that it represents the ethic of a priesthood seeking its own ends. The main thesis of the prophetic and historical books is simply the barbaric doctrine that Yahweh is the God of Israel, whom he sought to make a people unto him, that Israel's sufferings are a punishment for worshipping the gods of other peoples. And that Yahweh affects the punishment by employing as his instruments those other peoples, who, if Yahweh be the one true God, are just as guilty as Israel. There is here, obviously, no monotheism properly so called, even when the rival gods are called non gods. 263 Such an expression does not occur in the reputedly early writings. And when first employed, it is but a form of bluster natural to warring communities at a certain stage of zealotry, it is known to have been employed by the Assyrians and Egyptians as spontaneously as by the Hebrews. 264 And it stands merely for the stress of cultivated fanaticism in priest taught communities. The idea that Yahweh used other nations as the rod of his anger against Israel and Judah, without desiring to be worshipped by those other nations, is a mere verbal semblance of holding him for the only God. And arises by simple extension of the habit of seeing a chastisement from the tribe's God in any trouble that came upon it. Here we are listening to a lesson given by priests. On the other hand, the politic course of conciliating the gods of the foe, practiced by the Senate-ruled Romans, tells of the grafting of the principle of sheer worldly or military prudence on that of general religious credulity in a community where priesthood as such was but slightly developed. Morally and rationally speaking, however, there is no difference of plane between the Roman and the Hebrew conceptions. 265 Jeremiah proclaiming that, the showers have been withheld, by, the Lord that giveth rain, 266 is on that side, indeed, at the intellectual level of any tribal medicine man. And if the writers of such doctrine could really have believed what their words at times implied, that the alleged one sole God desired the devotion of Israel alone, leaving all other peoples to the worship of chimeras. They would have been not above but below the intellectual and moral level of the professed polytheists around them. On any view, indeed, they were morally lower in that they were potentially less sympathetic. So far as can be historically gathered, the early monotheistic idea, so-called, arose by way of an angry refusal to say, what the earlier Yahwists had constantly said and believed, that other nations had their gods like Israel. There is thus only a quibbling truth in the thesis that monotheism does not grow out of polytheism, but out of an inchoate monotheism, which is the germ of polytheism and monotheism alike. 267 The inchoate monotheism, in question being simply the worship of one special tribal god, is itself actually evolved from a prior polytheism, for the conception of a single national god is relatively late. And even that of a tribal god emerges while men believe in many ungraded gods. It is quite true that later polytheism arises by the collocation of tribal gods, but there is absolutely no known case of a monotheism which did not emerge in a people who normally admitted the existence of a multitude of gods. Even, then, if the first asserters of a sole god were so in virtue of a special intuition, that intuition was certainly developed in a polytheistic life. And there is absolutely no reason to doubt, on the other hand, that in Israel as elsewhere there were men who reached monotheism by philosophic progression from polytheism. The historic evolution of Jewish monotheism, however, was certainly not of this order. It was not even, as Robertson Smith with much candor of intention implied, nothing more than a consequence of the alliance of religion with monarchy. 268 Monarchy in Mesopotamia and Egypt never induced monotheism, and most of the Jewish kings were on the face of the record polytheists. The development, as we shall see, was post-monarchic and hierocratic. And the immediate question is whether the spirit which promoted it was either morally or intellectually superior. The judicial answer must be that it was not. Insofar as it was a sincere fanaticism, a fixed idea that one God alone was to be recognized, 
though he devoted himself to one small group of men, it partook of the nature of monomania. Since it utterly excluded any deep or scrupulous reflection on human problems. And insofar as it was not fanatical it was simply the sinister self-assertion of priests bent on establishing their monopoly. The contrary view, that a belief in the existence of the gods of other tribes than one's own is, obviously, lower form of faith than that of the man who worships only one god and believes that as for the gods of the heathen, they are but idols. 269 must just be left to the strengthening moral sense of men. Such an assumption necessarily leads, in consistency, to the thesis that the man who believes his tribe has the one God all to itself does so in virtue of a unique revelation. And this is implied in the further description of true monotheism as proceeding on an inner consciousness that the object of man's worship is one and indivisible, one and the same God always. On this basis, sheer stress of egoism is the measure of religiosity. And as the mere scientific reason cannot suppose such egoism to have been a monopoly of the Hebrews, it would follow, for ordinary minds, that revelation occurred in every separate cult in the world. It is indeed certain that even among polytheists a special absorption in the thought of one God is a common phenomenon. 270 Thus there are as many revelations as there are gods and goddesses, all alike being vouched for by the spiritual depths of man's nature. Unless rational thought is once more to be bridled by absolutism, such a line of reasoning must be classed with the pretensions of the medieval papacy. Men not already committed to dogma cannot conceive that a religion is to be appraised in utter disregard of its relation to universal morals. On a mere a priori principle as to the nobility of monotheism, especially when the principle is set up for one monotheism alone. It is merely a conventional result of the actual course of the evolution of the Christian system that quasi-monotheism as such should be assumed to be an advance on other forms of creed, with or without exception of the case of Islam. A certain intellectual gain may indeed arise where a cult dispenses with and denounces images. This, even if the variation arose, as is likely, not by way of positive reasoning on the subject, but by the simple chance of conservatism in a local cult which had subsisted long without images for sheer lack of handicraftsmen to make them. 271 But the gain is slight indeed and the anthropomorphic idea of the god's local residence is stressed exactly as his imaged presence is stressed elsewhere. And when in every other respect his worship and ethic are on the common anthropomorphic level. 272 In any case it is clear that such monotheism could not be made by mere asseveration, with or without genius, to prevail against the polytheism of a population not politically selected on a monotheistic basis. Even if it were, however, it would depend on further and special causes or circumstances whether the worshippers underwent any new moral development. 273 The conventional view unfortunately excludes the recognition of this. Hence we have the spectacle of a prolonged dispute 274 as to whether savage races can ever have the notion of a supreme being, or creator, or high god, or all-father. With the assumption on both sides that if the affirmative can be formally made out the savages in question are at once invested with a higher intellectual and spiritual character, as if a man who chanced to call his god high and good thereby became good and high-thinking. 275 All the while Mr. Lang, the chief champion of the affirmative, avows that his supreme being worshipping savages in Australia would kill their wives if the latter overheard the high, theistic and ethical doctrine of the mysteries. 276 Even apart from such an avowal, it ought to be unnecessary to point out that terms of moral description translated from the language of savages to that of civilized men have a merely classifying force. And in themselves can justify no moral conclusion in terms of our own doctrines, any more than their use of terms like, creator, can be held to imply a philosophical argument as to a, first cause. 277. Two moral and intellectual tests at least must be applied to any doctrine or cult of, monotheism, before it can be graded above any form of polytheism, we must know whether it involves a common ethic for the community of the worshipper and other communities, and whether it sets up a common ethic of humanity within the community. Either test may in a given case be partially satisfied while the other is wholly unsatisfied. 
Thus we have the pre-exilic Hebrews and, perhaps, some modern Australian Aborigines 278 affirming a, one God, who is, creator, of all, and yet treating all strangers as outside of the God's providence or law. While on the other hand we had till recently the Khans, with their human sacrifices to the goddess Tari and their doctrine of a supreme God. Proclaiming that the victim whom they liturgically tortured or tore to pieces was sacrificed for, the whole world, the responsibility for its welfare having been laid on their sect. 279 To set such, monotheism, or such soterism above late Greek or Roman polytheism or Hindu pantheism is possible only under an uncritical convention. 280 We must try Hebrew religion by moral tests if we are to grade it in a moral scale with others, and by such tests it is found to be anti-moral in its very monotheism. As for its records, we find its most impressive myths, to say nothing of the others, duplicated among some of the primitive tribes in India in our own day. One such tribe ascribes to a sacred bull the miracle of Joshua, the turning back of the sun in its course. Another has a legend that is a close counterpart of that of the Exodus, the dividing of the waters by the god to enable the tribe to escape a pursuing king. 281. Genius, no doubt, did arise in the shape of an occasional monotheist with both literary gift and higher ethical and cosmical ideals than those of the majority. And though there is reason to surmise lateness as regards the prophetic teachings of that order, 282 it is not to be disputed that such thinkers, whom Dr. Jevons would deny to be thinkers, may have existed early. But the broad historic fact remains that by the ostensibly latest prophet in the canon Yahweh is represented as complaining bitterly of the frauds committed on him in the matter of tithes and sacrifices. Offer it now unto thy governor, will he be pleased with thee, he is made to say concerning the damaged victims brought to his altar. 283 In the very prophet of the restoration lays down, or is made to lay down. The old doctrine of the tribal medicine man very much in the language of a modern company promoter. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year. To worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, more correctly booths. And it shall be that whoso of all the families of the earth goeth not up unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them there shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not, neither shall it be upon them, there shall be the plague, or upon them shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the nations that go not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. 284. If this were the whole or the principal historical clue to the motives of the return, we should be moved to decide that that movement was simply a sacro-commercial venture. Undertaken by men who had seen how much treasure was to be made by any shrine of fair repute for antiquity and sanctity. The other records, of course, enable us to realize that there entered into it the zeal of a zealous remnant, devoted to the nominal cult of their fathers' city and the memories of their race. But with such a document before us we are forced to recognize, what we might know from other details in sacerdotal history to be likely, that with the zealots there went the exploiters of zealotry. It is certain that the men of the return were for the most part poor, a Talmudic saying preserves the fact that those who had done well in Babylon remained there. 285 And, on the other hand, it holds to reason that among the less prosperous there would be some adventurers, certainly not unbelievers, but believers in mammon as well as in another god. Such men had abundant reason to believe in Yahweh as a source of revenue. The prophetic and historic references to him as a rain-giver are so numerous as to give a broad support to Goldzire's theory that the God of the Hebrews had been a rain, God first and a sun God only latterly. And in sun-scorched Syria a God of rain was as sure an attraction as the Syrian goddess herself, who in Lucian's day had such treasure-yielding prestige. But even if we ignore the economic motive, obvious as it is, the teaching of Zechariah remains undeniably tribalist and crassly unedifying. To such doctrine as this can be attributed neither the intellectual or the moral advantages theoretically associated with monotheism in culture history. It is historically certain that science never made in jury any such progress as the monotheistic conception has been supposed to promote. 
and whatever general elevation of moral thought may have taken place among the teachers of later Jewry is clearly to be ascribed not to a fortuitous upcrop of genius, though that was not absent, but to the chastening effect of disaster and frustration. Forcing men to deep reverie and the gathering of the wisdom of sadness. And to this they may have been in a measure helped by the higher ethical teachings current among their polytheistic conquerors and neighbors. There emerges the not discomforting thought that it is from suffering and the endurance of wrong, not from triumph and prosperity, that men have reached an ideal in religion which renounces all the egoisms of race and cult. Such an experience could have come to other victims of Babylon, brought within the Babylonian world before the Jews. But the trouble was that only there could a wisdom of self-renunciation subsist in any communal shape, in the Hebrew books, however introduced, it was forever doubled with the lore of savagery and tribalism. The worst religious ethic always jostling the best. 4. Hebrews and Babylonians. We must indeed guard against throwing on the side of Assyria and Babylon the balance of prejudice which has so long been cast on the side of Jewry. There can have been no more of general ethical or rational elevation in the great polytheistic states than in the small. But it lies on the face of the history of religion alike in India, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. That in great and rich polytheistic priesthoods there arose naturally a habit of pantheistic speculation 286 which at least laid the basis for a higher philosophy, science, and ethic. And it would be precisely the men of such enlarged views in the great Mesopotamian capitals who would most readily hold intercourse with the conquered or traveling Israelites. Certain it is that the cosmogony of Genesis is adapted directly from that preserved and partly developed in Mesopotamia from pre-Semitic times. Thus the so-called genius of the Hebrews for religion founded itself on the common Asiatic tradition of many thousands of years. 287. That the Hebrews should have learned anything worth learning from the Babylonians is a notion for which most people are still unprepared by education. 288 As it was put in the last generation by one apologist, the moral chasm which separates us from heathens is so great that we can hardly realize their feelings. 289 But when it is realized that the Hebrews adopted the mythic cosmology of their neighbors 290 it should be easier to conceive that they got from them ideas of a more advanced order. 291 And if the ethical tone of the inchoate monotheism of the Hebrew books be thoughtfully noted, it will be realized that only in the larger community was there any appreciable chance for the development of a relatively enlightened creed. There had there arisen perforce a measure of tolerance in virtue of the very compulsion to polytheism. Early Assyria was as primitively tribal as early Israel, Assur was at least as loudly vaunted and as devotedly trusted as Yahweh. And his worshippers were presumptively not more but less ready to accept other gods, precisely because they were so much more successful in their wars. Yet when by conquest city was added to city, and kingdom to kingdom, a systematic polytheism was as inevitable in Mesopotamia as in Egypt. There we see kings specially devoted to one god. 292 But when one king's zeal leads him to impose his cult on all, the outcome is the raising of his own name, as well as his gods, from the monuments 293 after his death. Whole populations could not be driven out of one worship into another. And as the sense of national unity arose, the priesthoods of the capitals would more and more readily accept the gods of the outlying communities. The mere vicissitudes of warfare were always a reason, in military eyes, for desiring to widen the field of divine assistance. And no mere soldier or soldier king could conceivably doubt the existence of the gods of his enemies, however he might in battle affect to deride them. It was among the priests or other thoughtful men of leisure, that there would arise the inference that all the god names were but varying labels for one great non-tribal spirit. 294 Who might be conceived either, as among the Brahmins and Egyptians, pantheistically, or on the lines of the relation of the earthly autocrat to the states he ruled. And it was only through some such theorizing as this that any moral or intellectual progress could be made, for only on this line could monotheism become international. 295. It is part of the convention aforesaid to treat the preservation of the Hebrew creed as a gain to civilization equal with that of the Greek victory over the invading Persians, the heritage of Jewish monotheism, it is assumed. 
is as precious as the heritage of Hellene literature, philosophy, and art. 296 If, however, there is to be any rational comparative appraisement of cults, it must be in terms of their service either to ethics or to science, including philosophy. And the service to ethics must finally be gauged in terms of human happiness and freedom. Now, we have seen that in the last pages of the Old Testament canon the religion of the Jews is tribal, trivial, narrow. 297 And it is the historic fact that to the day of the final fall of Jerusalem it remained tribalist and localist, a gospel of racial privilege and a practice of barbaric sacrifice. A law of taboo and punctilio, proclaiming a god of ritual and ceremonial, dwelling unseen in a chosen house, with much concern about its furniture and its commissariat. There is no ethical principle in its whole literature that is not to be found in the sacerdotal literatures of Egypt, Persia, India, or in the non-sacerdotal literature of China and Greece. And with the Hebrew ethic there is almost constantly bound up the ethic-destroying concept of the one God as the patron of one people, who only through them consents to recognize the rest of the human race. It matters little whether, on the other hand, we think of the pantheistic or monotheistic element in the Egyptian and other systems as effective, 298 The question is whether either polytheism or monotheism lifted morals and promoted science and civilization. Now, the polytheistic empires and the Hebrew state alike failed to reach any principle of international reciprocity, so that on that score they availed nothing against the fatal egoism of race. And as regards moral reciprocity within the state, any discoverable difference of code is rather in favor of the polytheists. 299 The everyday code of the Egyptian funerary ritual 300 supplies the main practical ethic of the Gospels, and is closely echoed in the probably non-Hebraic book of Job. 301 But while a similar social spirit is incidentally met within the Psalms and the Prophets. The outstanding and emphasized ethic of the Hebrew historical and prophetic books is really that national and regal righteousness consist in worshipping the Hebrew God and renouncing the others, while to worship them is to commit the sin of sins. The abstractly pietistic sentiment of the Hebrew books, of which the most important element is the sense of contrition, belongs to the Psalmodic literature of the Babylonians and the Egyptians alike. 302 And all that is called by pietists, cold, and hard, and materialistic, in other religious lore is abundantly paralleled within the covers of the Bible. In one respect, indeed, the Hebrew ethic is distinctly more refined than that of the other creeds, that is to say, in its relation to the principle of sex. But here, it is quite clear, the general elevation is post-exilic, seeing that every form of sexual vice is constantly asserted to have prevailed in and around the cult of Yahweh before the captivity. It thus appears that the Israelites either acquired their purer ethic among the Babylonians, where an ideal of purity certainly coexisted with a practice of sanctified license. 303 or developed such an ethic as the result of the post-exilic struggle against the seductions and competition of the neighboring cults. And from this doctrinal evolution, Finally, there resulted, apart from the abolition of licentious worship as such, no betterment of the position of women 304 or the practice of men in Jewry as compared with Greece and Rome. Not only did normal sexual vice subsist as elsewhere, 305 but the Hebrew code of divorce was iniquitous, and the law for the special punishment of women offenders remained at least formally barbarous down to the Christian era. 306. 5. Forces of Religious Evolution the true judgment on the comparative merits of religions is to be reached by noting the manner of their evolution. And when this is impartially done the student is led, not to any racial palm giving on the score of religious genius, but to a new sense of the significance of social and political factors. And a compassionate realization of the ill fortune of all high aspirations among men. Genius for moral and philosophical thought as distinguished from literary expression is to be recognized here and there in all the old religious literatures. And even as regards literary genius there is little weight in estimates which appreciate the Hebrew books on the one hand in an enthusiastically eloquent rendering and on the other dimly divine the Gentile literatures through the cerecloths of dead scripts. Whereof the scrupulous interpreters convey the very deadness as assiduously as the Elizabethans sought for transfigurement in translation. 
What is common to all the ancient literatures is the fatality by which the general deed of man determines the general thought. In ancient Babylonia, the scholars are now agreed, there was a highly evolved yet not highly imperialized state, ruled by an enlightened Akkado Babylonian king named Hammurabi 307-2300 years before our era. And long ages before historic Hellas was so named. This polity failed and fell, and on its ruins there rose successively the terrible and tyrannous empires of Assyria and later Babylon, wherein no doctrine of civil freedom could survive, though the code of Hammurabi remained the code of his people. Under such rule, whatever flower of moral genius might bloom in high or cloistered places, men in the mass could not be aught but fixedly superstitious, morally short-sighted. Good only in virtue of their temperaments and the varying pressure of crude law and cruder custom. Whether they worshipped one god or many, a most high or a mediator, a mother goddess or a trinity, their ethic was unalterably narrow and their usage stamped with primeval grossness. For wherever the life of fortuitous peace bred a gentler humanity and a higher civilization, the nemesis of empire and conquest hurled a new barbarism on its prey, only to adopt anew the old cults, the old lore, the old delusions. So, on the basis of civilization laid by the old Sumer Akkadians, the Babylonian and the Assyrian wrestled and overthrew each other time and again till the Persian overthrew the Babylonian. And all the while the nameless mass from generation to generation dreamed the old dreams, with some changes of god names and usages, but no transformation of life, and no transfiguration of its sinister battlefield. In no ancient state, certainly not in pre-exilic Jewry, did men think and brood more over religion, in theory and practice, than they did in Babylon, 308 and in such a hotbed religious genius must be presumed to have arisen. But while it could leave its traces in higher doctrine, and join hands fruitfully with nascent science, it could never restore the freer polity of Sumer Akkadia, though it could humbly cherish the Akkadian dream that Hammurabi would come again. 309 As Messiah, to begin a new age. On the broad fields of sword-ruled ignorance there could thrive only such vain hopes and the rank growths of superstition. Better gods were not to be set up, save in unseen shrines, on a worsening earth. As in Egypt and in Hindustan, religion was of necessity determined in the main by the life conditions of the mass, and to the mass, or to powerful classes, priesthoods must always minister. What Mesopotamian civilization finally yielded to the common stream of human betterment was the impulse of its cosmogony and its esoteric pantheism to science and philosophy in the new life of unlit perialized Greece. And the concrete store of its astronomical knowledge, alloyed with its astrology. Its current ethic was doubtless abreast of the Ten Commandments and the Egyptian ritual of the Judgment Day, and its commerce seems to have evolved an adequate working system of law, besides a notable system of banking. But a civilization which itself failed to reach popular well-being and international equity could pass on no important moral ideal to posterity. On the contrary, it bequeathed the fatal lust of empire, so that on the new imperial growth of Persia there followed, by way of emulation, that of Macedonia, to be followed by that of Rome. Which ended in the paralysis and prostration of the whole civilization of the Mediterranean world. And in the last stages of that decadence we find arising a nominally new religion which is but a fresh adaptation of practices and principles as old as Acadia, and which is beset by heresies of the same derivation. 6. The Hebrew Evolution At this point the Mesopotamian succession is seen to mingle with that of Dudea, which in turn falls to be conceived and appraised, as a total evolution, in terms of the conditions. As has been briefly noted above, Judaic monotheism was equally with Mesopotamian polytheism a result of political circumstances. The Jewish national history as contained in the sacred books is demonstrably a vast fiction to one half of its extent, as tested by the admissions of the other. And the fiction was a gradual construction of its priests and prophets in the interest of the cult which finally triumphed. From the more ancient memories or documents which are preserved among the priestly fictions, records such as are included in the closing chapters of the Book of Judges, we realize that after the alleged deliverance from Egypt and the fabulous Mosaic legislation in the wilderness the religion of Israel in Canaan was one of local cults. With no priesthood apart from the local functioning of single, Levites, 
presumably members of a previous race of inhabitants who knew the manner of the god of the land. 310 These functionaries can best be realized as belonging to the lower types of Indian fakirs and Moslem dervishes. 311 And even in this primitive stage, when the only general political organization was an occasional confederation of tribes for a given purpose, 312 some had already developed the abnormal vices associated with corrupt civilizations. 313 It is not unlikely that the beginnings of a centralized system occurred at a shrine answering to the description of that of Shiloh in the Book of Samuel. But the legend of that prophet is more likely to be an ephemerized version of the fact that the god of the shrine was Samuel, a form of the Sem or Samos of the Samaritans and other Semites. Who is further ephemerized as Samson in the Book of Judges. 314 At this stage we find the priests of the shrine notoriously licentious, and their methods primitively barbaric. 315 And the only semblance of a national or even tribal religion is the institution of the movable ark, a kind of palladium, containing amulets or a sacred stone which might be kept by any chief or group strong enough to retain it 316 and able to keep a Levite for its service. Even on the face of the official and myth-loaded history, it was by a band of ferocious filibusters at this level of religion that an Israelite kingdom or principality was first set up. And a shrine of Yah or Yahweh instituted in the captured Jebusite stronghold of Zion, where a going worship must already have existed. From such a point forward the kingdom, waxing and shrinking by fortune of war, would tend to develop commercially and otherwise on the general lines of Semitic culture, assimilating the higher Syrian civilization wherever it met with it. The art of writing by means of the alphabet, received either from the kindred Phoenicians or direct from Babylon, 317 would be early acquired in the course of the traffic between the coast cities and the inland states. And with such culture would come the religious ideas of the neighboring peoples. It is impossible to construct any save a speculative narrative of the religious evolution out of the mass of late pseudo-history, in which names known to have been those of gods are assigned to patriarchs, 318 heroes, kings, and miracle-working prophets, all in turn made subservient to Yahweh of Israel. But from the long series of invectives against other cults in the pseudo-historical and prophetic books, the contradictory fiats as to local worships in the Pentateuch, 319 and the bare fact of the existence of Yahweh's temple at Jerusalem. We can gather clearly enough that that particular worship at that place was aggrandized by a few kings of Israel or of Judah, and relatively slighted by many others. That its priests did their utmost, but in vain, by vaticination, literary fraud, and malediction, to terrorize kings and people into suppressing the rival shrines and cults, that all the while their own had the degraded features of the rest. 320 And that their monotheism was merely of the kind ascribed by Flaubert to the sun priests at Carthage, who derided their own brethren of the cult of the moon, though rage rather than derision is the normal note of the priests of Yahweh. The main motives of their separatism are visibly their perquisites and their monopoly. There is a certain presumption that the story of the reforms of King Josiah, a movement which compares with that of a Cunitan in Egypt, is founded on fact, seeing that the record confesses Josiah to have died miserably. Where the general burden of the history required him to prosper signally, as a reward for his Yahwism. It may well have been that the hostility he evoked among his subjects wrought his ruin. In any case it may be taken as certain that even had Ho prospered, his effort to abolish the multitude of cults would have failed as Acunitans did. And there is finally no disguise of the fact of its failure. Neither in Israel nor in Judah had even the merely monopolist monotheism of the Yahwist priests made popular headway. And if at this stage there did exist monotheists of a higher type, prophets whose aim was just government, wise policy, and decent living, they stood not a better but a worse chance of converting kings or commoners, rich or poor. The popular religion was determined by the popular culture stage and life conditions. In Babylon, however, while many doubtless went over bodily to the native cults, the stauncher Yahwists would tend to be made more zealous by their very contact with the image-using systems. And the state of critical consciousness thus set up 321 would tend to give a certain new definiteness to the former less reasoned hostility to the rival worships.
The conception of Yahweh as incapable of being imaged would promote a kind of speculation such as had already occurred among the idolatrous priesthoods themselves. And that intercourse took place between the Yahwists and some Babylonian teachers is proved by their now giving a new significance to the Assyro Babylonian institution of the Sabbath. 322 and developing their whole ceremonial and temple law on Mesopotamian lines. 323 Indeed, the simple fact that from this time forward the spoken language of Judea became Aramaic or Chalde, is evidence that their Babylonian sojourn affected their whole culture. With the anti idolatrous Persian conquerors of Babylon, again, a Jewish sympathy would naturally subsist, and the favorable conditions provided for the captives by Cyrus may explain the apparent feebleness of the first return movement. However, that may be, it is probable that to the intervention of Cyrus is due the very existence of the later historic Judaism, and of the bulk of the Hebrew Bible. Had he not conquered Babylon, Hebrew monotheism would in all likelihood have disappeared like the other monotheisms of Palestine, absorbed by the mass of Semitic polytheism in the Semitic Empire. For even when the return began, the monotheistic ideal had no great force. It is true that the commercial success which began to accrue to many of the Jews in Babylon would dispose them afresh to magnify the name of Yahweh as the God of their salvation. 324 But a merely Babylonian Judaism, despite its Talmud, could have had no historic fruit. It is clear that, despite the preliminary refusal to join hands with the Samaritans and other populations around, 325 the immigrants gradually mixed more and more with the surrounding Semitic tribes, whose cults were singly of the same order as the Yahwist. And the old polytheism would thus have re-arisen but for the coming, a century later, of new zealots, whose sense of racial and religious separateness may have been sharpened at Babylon by competition, as well as by concourse, with the Mazdean cult. The alternation of the Persian phrase, God of Heaven, with, God of Jerusalem, 326 in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, with the final predominance of the former title in the latter book, suggests a new process of challenge and definition, which, however, would concern the majority of Yahwists much less than it did their theologians. What all could appreciate was the consideration that if the cult were not kept separate it would lose its revenue-drawing power. When once the laxer elements had been eliminated, or at least sacerdotally discountenanced, the social conditions were vitally different from the pre-exilic. Gathered together on the traditional site for the very purpose of instituting the cult of Yahweh and no other. The recruited and purged remnant gave their priests such an opportunity for building up a hierocracy as had never before been in that region. And the need and the opportunity together wrought the evolution. To speak of the doctrine thus instituted as the product of a unique order of religious consciousness is to substitute occult forces for natural laws. Insofar as it had any philosophic content, any breadth of cosmic conception. It borrowed from the inductive monotheism or pantheism, the conceptions constantly and inevitably shade into each other, of the deeper thinkers of Babylon 327 or its Persian conquerors. And such a content was precisely that element in the creed which counted for least in its institution. What drew or held the votaries together was the concept of a god dwelling in the Temple of Jerusalem, and there only. And conferring special favors in the matters of rainfall and healing on those who brought gifts to his shrine. The worshippers were no more transcendentalist than their priests. They were but hypnotized by the unexampled series of literary fabrications on which the creed was refounded, a body of written sacrosanct lore such as had never before been brought within the reach of any save priestly students. We are in danger, perhaps, of unduly stigmatizing the Hebrew forgers when we consider their work by itself, keeping in mind the enormous burden of delusion and deceit that it has so long laid upon mankind. In their mode of procedure there was really nothing abnormal, they did but exploit the art of writing, first acquired by the race for commercial purposes, on the lines of immemorial priestly invention. And we must not pass upon them a censure that is not laid on the mythologists and scribes of Egypt or the theologers and poets of India and Greece. Our business is to understand, not to blame, save insofar as a sophistic praise still compels demur. And the historical processes may be sufficiently realized in noting, 
without binding ourselves to, the conclusions broadly reached by scholars a generation ago, to the effect that the first collected edition of the pretended Mosaic Law, comprised in the Pentateuch and the Book of Joshua, contained some eighty chapters. And the second, over a century later, a hundred and twenty, ninety more being added afterwards. Point three twenty eight. Such a literary usage, indeed, gave a unique opportunity to literary and religious genius, and it was variously availed of. Lyrics of religious emotion, commonly ascribed to the semi-mythic David, to whose legend apparently accrued the lyric attributes of the god of that name, 329 sententious and proverbial wisdom, similarly fathered on Solomon. Dramatic discussion of the ethical dilemma of all theism, in the singularly isolated and foreign-seeming book of Job. An express argumentation against the fanatical racial separatism of the post-exilic theocracy, in the hardly less isolated romances of Ruth and Jonah, all this goes with the mass of pseudo-history, cosmology, and prophecy. To make up the library which we call the Hebrew Bible. It may be taken as certain that a body of students familiar with the whole range of such a literature had from it an amount of intellectual stimulation not theretofore paralleled in the Semitic world. And from the rabbinical life of centuries we might reasonably expect some fine fruit of ethical and philosophic thought. But again, on close inquiry, we become sadly aware of the fatality of the evolutionary process, in little jury as in the great states that decayed around. 7. Post-exilic phases If we look first to the vogue of biblical Judaism in Palestine, we have to note that from the consummation of the return the cult was jealously closed not only to the people of Samaria, who presumed to worship a Yahweh on their own sacred hill, but to the country people around who had been left behind by the Assyrian conqueror. 330 The sociological conditions were thus such that, when the first force of the new conditions was spent, intellectual ankylosis was bound to set in. The learned class, devotedly absorbed in a literature regarded as divinely inspired, must rapidly become in general incapable of new thought, and their religious philosophy could of itself make no further progress. This is what is seen to take place. But for their traditional rejection of images, a principle in which they had been encouraged by the Mazdeans whom they had met at Babylon, they would even have reverted by that path to normal polytheism. As it was, remaining peculiar in this respect, they did but think of their god as an imageless yet anthropomorphite being who made his home in their temple and either ignored or detested the neighbor nations which had idols. Save for higher speculations which could not appeal to the majority even of the student class, they made no progress towards a consistent and comprehensive monotheism. What extension of speculative thought occurred was rather in the direction of dualism. The doctrine of the adversary, developed either from the Persian Araman or the Babylonian figure of the goat god 331 or else from both, begins to figure in the later writings. And, once dramatically installed in the brilliant book of Job, was sure to figure more and more in the general consciousness. All the while, the normal Eastern ideas of multitudinous angels and evil spirits had never been absent, though they were denounced when associated with other cults. And in point of general superstition there can have been little to choose between Jew and Gentile. 332 On the side of the belief in angels, again, the very desire to spiritualize and elevate the deity of the older traditions led to the imagining of new divine beings. Among the Samaritans, who, setting out with a Pentateuch, developed quite as much zeal as had the Judeans for the God of Israel, the expression, Angel of God, or Angels of God, was frequently substituted for, God, or, Gods, in Genesis. And the Chalde paraphrasts did as much, at times adding further, the Word of the Lord, or, the Shekinah, as a compromise where, Angel, seemed inadequate. 333 Similarly the later Jews read, Angels of God, where their sacred books inconveniently spoke of, Gods. 334 In the book of Nehemiah, yet again, we have the mention of the, Good Spirit, of God, 335 An idea apparently derived from Mazdaism, 336 And sure to set up a special divine concept. Such conceptions in all likelihood grew up by way of analogy from the phenomena of monarchical government 337 in which the word, or hands, or I, of the autocrat became names for his chief functionaries or representatives. It would be hard to show that a monotheism, which really accepted, 
as absolutely as any polytheism, a vast plurality of divine beings. Had any moral or spiritual efficacy in virtue of merely setting forth a tyranny of a supreme god over hosts of angels, with a rebel party included, rather than a kind of feudal family oligarchy like that of Olympus, in which the chief god is partially thwarted by the others. The difference is much more one of political habit and outlook than of either ethic or philosophy. The Jews derived from Babylon the idea of a creator god. 338 And if that be the valuable principle in monotheism their polytheistic kindred are entitled to the credit. So with the idea of a supreme god, 339 The Hebrew specialty lay solely in putting a greater distance between God and angels than did the Mesopotamian, and in rejecting, for the time being, the notions of triads and of a divine family. So little difference was there between the two states of mind that the Christian fathers freely applied the term gods to the angels of the Judeo-Christian system. 340 For the rest, it is significant that the beginnings alike of rational science and of rational ethics were made, not among the Hebrew monotheists, but among Babylonian and Greek polytheists. Who went far in cosmic and moral philosophy while the post-exilic Jews were devotees of a God whose passionate and capricious will took the place of both natural and moral law. A, consistent, remorseless, naked monotheism, in short, never prevailed among the Jews any more than in any other people. Such a concept, save in the case of scattered thinkers, as often Gentiles as Jews, has never doctrinally or conceptually flourished till the rise of modern deism, Islam having in turn capitulated to the notion of inferior good and evil spirits. Some small and isolated communities in antiquity probably approached nearer than the Jews ever did to the bare notion of a single, tribal, God, without sons, or angels, or a chosen one, and without an adversary. And the ancient pantheists, tending as pantheism usually does to repass into theism, at times reached in that way a far purer form of monotheism 341 than that of the Hebrew books. While the creed, despite its rooted traditionalism, was thus of its own nature lapsing into new indirect forms of polytheism, the secular problem of political life was no more being solved in Jewry than elsewhere. In the day of the Restoration we already find the rich taking usury from the poor. 342 And in the last of the canonical prophets we find crudely indicated the pressure of that deep doubt as to the God's good government which makes the theme of the book of Job. That the faithful deceive the deity and each other, and that many despair of Yahweh's rule 343, such are the testimonies of the closing pages of the Old Testament. Only the cohesive power of ceremonialism, the unchanging pressure of popular superstition, and, last, but certainly not least, the economic success of the shrine, maintained the priestly state. There had presumably now begun among the dispersed Jews the rule of sending gifts to the temple, a practice which in a later age made an economic basis for a whole order of rabbins and scribes. And on the same basis there would be partly maintained a considerable population of pauper devotees. Under such circumstances the high priest, another Babylonian adaptation, was practically what the king had been in the past. And the post was intrigued for, and at a pinch murdered for, 344 like any other eastern throne. One indirect result of the priestly policy was the development of the faculty of the Jews for prospering in other lands. Placed as they were, a small community among great states, it behoved them, like the Dutch of today, to be linguists for the sake of their commerce. And when the post-exilic priesthood, like that of post-Reformation Scotland, found their account in teaching their people to read the sacred books. They were at once preparing them to succeed among the less schooled populations around and creating an abnormal tie between the dispersed ones and the sacred city. But, on the other hand, the surrounding cultures could not but affect the Jewish. On the Persian overlordship followed the Macedonian. And where the similar Persian creed had failed to do more than modify the Jewish, the manifold Greek culture which spread under the Seleucids and the Ptolemies penetrated Syrian life in all directions. In that world of chronic strife and deteriorating character, where already all men had attained the fatal temper, seen later at large in decadent Rome, of acquiescence in the rule of the most successful commander as such. The tranquil cynicism of Greek cosmopolitan culture was as appropriate in Jewry as elsewhere. 
So far did the assimilation go that the hierarchy at length was definitely faced by a Hellenizing party, convinced of the futility of the tribal religion, even as the pre-exilic Yahwists had been. And high priests were found to take the bribes and do the work of heathenism. There was, as we have seen, no moral or philosophic elevation in the Judaic cult to countervail intellectually such a movement. And had not Antiochus Epiphanes, in a spirit of fanaticism wholly alien to the general policy of the Diadochi, proceeded to coerce and outrage the zealots of Jerusalem, their worship would have dwindled very much as it did in the old time. But that act elicited the singular genius of the Maccabean family, under whom the desperate tenacity of the most devoted part of the race at length triumphed over its foes to the point of re-establishing a state in which the king was priest. As previously the priest had been king. In the face of such a consummation, all the promises and pretensions of the old cult seemed newly justified, and a newly exultant faith emerged. 8. Revival and Disintegration Thus for a second time was a Yahwist remnant selected, the bulk of the educated class passing over to the neighboring polities, and their place being taken by new popular material of a more zealous order. Judaism was in fact the product not of a racial bias but of a socio-political selection, such as might have taken place under similar conditions in any race whatever. And ever since the dispersion the same selective process has continued, the unzealous Jews always tending to be absorbed in the populations among whom they live. Something similar has actually occurred among the Parsas. Even, however, if the Jewish evolution were as unique as it is conventionally represented to have been, the special case would no more be an exception to universal sociological law than is the phenomenon of marsupials to biological law. There has simply been survival in the Judaic case, chiefly in virtue of the fact of sacred books, where similar creed tendencies were usually annihilated under the ancient regimen of tyrannous violence. One result of the desperate frequency of bloodshed and massacre in the Jewish sphere was a passion for fecundity, as against the need for restraint of numbers that was felt in the city-states of Greece in their progressive period. And the Jews thus abounded, and carried their religion with them, where other creeds died out. Irresistible, however, is the law of strife among unenlightened men, and no less so the law of change among all. In the stress of the Maccabean struggle we find the doctrine of the Messiah already so far developed that a secondary God is the due result. The Christ of the Book of Enoch is substantially a deity, before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of heaven were made, his name was called before the Lord of the Spirits, 345 he is at once chosen one, Son of God and Son of Man. He is judge at the day of judgment, 346 and as, son of the woman, 347 he clearly relates to the Babylonian myth in the book of Revelation. And seeing that, in him dwells the spirit of wisdom, he is in effect at once the Sophia and the Logos of the Apocrypha and of the Platonising Philo Judeus. But the evolution did not end there. Under the new Asmonian dynasty there broke out in due course all the violences native to the hereditary monarchy of the ancient world. And once again the play of outside influences, which the feuds of competitors for the throne brought to bear, affected the hereditary creed within its central sphere. The Greek translation of the sacred books became the normal version. And to that version were added books not admitted into the Hebrew canon, some of them elaborating new theological conceptions. As the Jewish state came more and more into the whirl of the battling empires of Seleucids and Ptolemies, soon to be crushed by Rome, the dynasty of king priests passed away before the energy of new competitors. And once more kings, not even Jewish by descent, subsisted beside high priests of their own choosing. At length, under the Idumean Herod the Great, a man born to rule amid plots and feuds, to drown rebellions in blood and to outweep enemies by outgoing them in audacity. Eastern craft exploited at once Greek culture and Roman power with such address that Hellenism gained ground against the utmost stress of organized conservatism. While among the common people, conscious of an evil fate, movements of quietism and asceticism and modism undermined the ancient prestige of the temple cult. Once again the tribal faith was being disintegrated. One of the movements emerging though not originating at this time is the cult associated with the quasi-historic name of Jesus. 
As organized Yahwism had been retrospectively fathered on the fictitious legislation of Moses, so the Jesuit cult is in turn fathered on Jesus in a set of narratives stamped with myth. And incapable of historical corroboration even when stripped of their supernaturalism. To the eye of comparative science the central feature in the cult as it appears in the oldest documents is the Eucharist, an institution common to many surrounding religions. And known to have been in ancient and secret usage among sections of the Jews. 348 Descending perhaps from totemistic times, it invariably involves some rite or symbolism of theophagy, or eating of a divine victim, and a sacrificed God-man was the natural mythic complement of the ritual. In the case of the Jesuit cult, an actual historic person may or may not have been connected with the doctrine. And for such a connection there is a quasi-historic basis in an elusive figure of a Jesus who appears to have been put to death by stoning and hanging about a century before the death of Herod. 349 On the other hand the name in its Hebrew and Aramaic forms had probably an ancient divine status, being born by the mythic deliverer Joshua, and again by the quasi-messianic high priest of the Restoration. It was thus in every aspect fitted to be the name of a new demigod who should combine in himself the qualities of the Akkadian deliverer Messiah and the sacrificed god of the most popular cults of the Greco-Roman, Egyptian, and West Asiatic world. In this aspect only is it to be historically understood. But before considering it in its type, we have to consider it in its genetic relation to Judaism, and so complete our estimate of the evolution of that cult to the moment of its definite arrest. That the cult of Jesus the Christ was being pushed in rivalry with that of pure Judaism among the Jews of the dispersion before the destruction of the temple appears from the nature of the oldest documents as well as from the tradition. Such competition was the more easy because the life of the synagogue was largely independent of that of the central temple. And craved both rites and teaching which should make up for the sacrificial usages which were the chief institutions at Jerusalem. But that Jesuism could have successfully dispensed with the main cult among either Jews or Gentiles while the temple remained standing is inconceivable. When it did begin to make substantial progress late in the second century of its own era, its main prestige undoubtedly came from the Jewish sacred books. And had the temple been allowed to remain in active existence, that prestige would have accrued to it as of old. Conceivably, however, there might have happened a development of Jesuism under Judaism, the new cult exploiting the old and being tolerated or adopted by it. In that case there would have occurred yet once more a disintegration of a quasi-monotheism in terms of a virtual polytheism. And toward such disintegration marked progress had been made under the aegis of Judaism. Note has already been taken of the entrance of new and practically polytheistic ideas into the cult at the very moment of its ostensible purgation of polytheistic tendencies, and in the course of four centuries these ideas had been much developed. To the good spirit of Nehemiah and the logos or word of intermediate writers had been added the personified Sophia or wisdom of the books of Proverbs and Ecclesiasticus and Enoch. And while the Samaritans seem to have conceived, on old Semitic lines, of a female Holy Spirit, symbolized like several gods and goddesses by a dove. 350 The Jews proper who came into contact with Greek thought developed with the help of the Platonists the originally Eastern notion of the Logos into a new Jewish deity. 351 In their anxiety to avoid goddess worship, they even represented the deity as generating the sun out of himself, Kappa Gamma Alpha Sigma Tauro. 352 And those who later made Jesus speak of, My Mother the Holy Spirit, 353 were unable to prevail against the old prejudice. It was thus on Judaically laid lines that Jesuism ultimately completed its theology. But had not the temple been overthrown, either the Judaic evolution would have kept the Jewish logos in organic relation to the Yahwist worship and sacred books, or the movement would have been overshadowed. All would have depended on its economic sustenance. Had it promised a useful reinforcement to the Jewish high priest's powers of attracting proselytes and revenue, 354 it would doubtless have been exploited in the name of Judaism, very much as it was by the early Christists. And in view of the historic facts it is reasonable to say that had their system survived, the temple priests would so have exploited it. Inasmuch, finally, as the element of messianism, reduced to a form of purely theological soterism, was actually exploited by the Christists without specially calling forth the wrath of Rome, 
the temple priesthood might have done as much. It was in fact the catastrophe of the destruction of Jerusalem, provoked by the desperate courage of the zealots of the old faith. That alone made possible the separate rise of Christism and its ultimate erection into the state religion of the declining Roman Empire. To say this, however, is to say that Jewish monotheism so-called, in reality a tribal system using a monotheistic terminology, was from first to last an unstable doctrine, always running risk of dissolution into polytheism, avowed or sophisticated. That it was so. Dissolving at the time of the destruction of its temple, and that its offshoot, Christism, is a resultant of the process. If then monotheism is as such intrinsically superior to other forms of religion, Christianity is one of the inferior faiths, representing as it does the dissolvent process in question. To the eye of science, of course, it is neither inferior nor superior save in respect of its ethical and intellectual reactions. And towards an estimate of these we proceed by a comparative study of the religious principles on which Christism is built up. Meantime, while the Hebrew literature obviously plays a large part in the intellectual coloring of the new Christist world, it would be difficult to show that Judaism made for higher life in the post-Roman world. So far as it made proselytes, it was by appealing to normal superstition, to belief in the mysterious potency of a particular god-name, and of the rites of his cult. 355 to scientific and philosophical thought it passed on no moralising in unifying conception of life, for it had none such to give. Moslem monotheism, in furnishing a temporary habitat for scientific thought, 356 did more for civilization both directly and indirectly. But Moslem thought had to be fertilized by the rediscovered philosophy of Greece before it could attain to anything. And insofar as a philosophical and scientific monotheism arose in the medieval period, it inherits far more from Greek thought, which indeed had early undergone Semitic influences, than from Hebrew dogma. As for the direct influence of Judaism on life, the most favorable view is to be reached by noting that the most applauded moral teaching of the Gospels is either Judaic or a Judaic adaptation of other codes. The first Gospel makers did but put in the mouth of the demigod sayings and ideals long current in Jewry. But this again amounts to saying that men with ideals in Jewry were glad to turn to a new movement in which their ideals might have a place, finding the established cult sunk in ceremonialism. And when we contemplate the mass of its ceremonial law, the endless complex of taboo and sacrifice and traditionary custom and superstition, we can but say that if men were good under such a regimen it was in spite of and not in virtue of it. Moral reason is there outraged at every turn, and the anti-sacrificial doctrines of the prophets were steadfastly disregarded to the end. If it be suggested that in such a system religion has got rid of the irrational element in taboo, and left only what is essential to religion and morals. We can but recall the classic case of the Britain's verdict on the folly of the French nation in making the uniforms of its army white, which is absurd, and blue, which is only fit for the artillery and the blue horse. We come within sight of the truth when we listen to Renaud's dictum that of the Jewish race we may say the very best and the very worst without fear of error since it presents both extremes. Therein the Jewish race is simply on all fours with all others, as Rana might easily have realized if he could once have got rid of the racial presupposition in his moral estimates. Judaism, in short, wrought no abnormal development in thought or life, and its very failure was on the lines of the failures of the systems and civilizations around it. The champion of the current creed, though an expert in Greek lore, resorts to the conventional judgment 357 that, the Greek with his joyous nature had no abiding sense of sin. It is the dictum also of Rana, a profound sentiment of human destiny was always lacking to the Greeks, they had, no arrière pensée of social disquietude or melancholy, their childlike serenity was, always satisfied with itself, gaiety has. Always characterized the true Hellene. 358 A closer student of Greek religion than Rana, and one perhaps more sympathetic than Dr. Jevons, declares of this doctrine, it is the absolute contrary of the facts I seek to set forth. 359 And two of the Germans who have studied Greece most closely and most independently have agreed in the verdict that, the Greeks were less happy than most men think. 360 Their verdict is likely to cancel the conventional formula for those who will weigh both in critical balances. 
It was the Greeks, when all is said, who passed on to Christianity its type of torturing fiend. 361 It was the Greek adoption of Christianity, the religion of sorrow, that preserved to the world that growth from a pagan germ on Judaic soil. And it was, the Greek, finally, who constructed the Christian creed. 9. Conclusion There has thus emerged from a survey of the comparative evolution of religions the conclusion that not only do all undergo change in spite of the special religious aversion to change, but all evolve by the same laws. Their differences being invariably reducible to effects of environment. Of this the decisive proof is the fact that, under the very roof of a professed monotheism, there arose as aforesaid a secondary God idea on the lines of a normal process of polytheism. The law of the process is everywhere an interposition of a new God, evolved by later psychosis, between the worshippers and the earlier God, so long as the God idea remains a psychic need. Only the violent rupture with Christism, and the ensuing feud, prevented Judaism from obeying the law in the normal manner, what happened was that on the severance of the new cult from the old, the older deity was himself modified, with, for a time, somewhat grotesque results. 362 But for Christists the new God stands to the old in the convenient relation that was normal in the original environment, that of sun. Even as Apollo, and Athene, and Attis, and Heracles, and Dionysus, had to become children of Zeus, and Meridac the son of Ea, and Khonsu the son of Ammonius at Thebes 363 in Mitra the son of Ahura Mazda. The Judeo-Greek Logos had to be the son of Yahweh, the anti-Judaic animus of the Gnostics failing to oust the already formed myth. 364. Such an evolution stands in all cases alike for the simple need of the worshipper who has ceased to relate fully to the old environment, and is appealed to by a cult coming from an environment like his own or adapts his old god to a new moral climate. In the oldest systems known to us such modifications are seen taking place. Already in the Vedas, Indra, originally a god of thunder and storm, has been, touched with emotion, till he becomes of the order of the beloved gods, giving and receiving the love of men. 365 And still his cult was in its own sphere largely superseded by that of Krishna, 366 who could better be made to play the part. In Egypt, again, Osiris is visibly made to meet the need for a nearer god by assuming new characteristics from age to age. 367 And yet, after millenniums of possession, he seems to have waned before Serapis, who in turn ceded, not without force, to Jesus. 368 All the while, indeed, inferior deities were popular by reason of the same general need for a god near at hand. 369 in the so-called Aryan religions the process is essentially the same. Apollo had to supervene on Zeus, as Zeus had done on Kronos, and, that father lost, lost his, in a sufficiently primitive myth. Where new culture contacts follow each other rapidly, and the rites of one accredited sun god fail to meet the newest psychic needs, another is given him as a brother, and so Dionysus, grouped in another triad, stands alongside of Apollo. This is accomplished in spite of the most furious resistance of kings and men who see in the new cult only evil and madness, till in time the priests of Apollo, who can have been no less resentful, give it a place in their chief temple. 370 In all such developments, the new god partially supersedes the older, 371 whatever formalities be maintained. And no further explanation is needed for the fact, so fallaciously stressed in some modern propaganda, that many savages recognize a supreme god or creator to whom they do not sacrifice or pray. 372 The supreme god, so to speak, has retired from business, in virtue not of any superiority of character but of the law of divine superannuation. Nor is there any limit to the process of substitution save in the cessation of the need. All heresy, all dissent, is but a subsidiary phase of the process which in old time evolved new gods. The early church could live down the manifold imaginations of Gnosticism, because they were framed for the speculative minds, and such minds tended to disappear as the intellectual decadence continued. But only after long convulsions, desperate persecution, and much exhaustion, could it live down its more intimate heresies. And when Arianism and Manichaeism seemed at length destroyed, it was only to rise again in new forms, philosophic on the one side, 
popular on the other. And the gods survive in the ratio of their capacity to meet either order or need, that is to say, in the ratio of the adaptive skill and economic address of their prophets and priests. Without such adaptation they are insolvable. In the Orthodox Christian Trinity, framed under Judaic restrictions, the Holy Spirit has been from first to last, technically speaking, a failure, being for all practical purposes superseded by the Virgin Mother. And for all philosophic purposes merged in the Logos on the one hand and in the Father God on the other. But just as Jesus tended to supersede Yahweh, so Mary in large measure tended to supersede Jesus, who is seen to have become more inaccessible and supernal as his mother was made in her turn to play the part of mediator. There are even traces in later medieval art of a tendency to make Mary's mother, Saint Anna, take the place of the Father in a new trinity. And the similar tendency to create a secondary trinity out of the human father and mother and son, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, is not yet exhausted. 373 It depends upon the total fortunes of civilization whether that tendency shall be realized, or be arrested by the culture forces which are at present disintegrating all theistic thought. In fine, Christ-making is but a form or stage of God-making, the Christ's or sun-gods being but secondary gods. Of necessity they are evolved out of prior material, the material, it may be, of primitive cults to which men reverted in times of distress and despair of help from the gods in nominal power. But when the reversion persists the old material is transformed, and the result is a new god who, Antaeus-like, has fresh vitality through contact with the primary sources of religious emotion, but is turned to the account of new phases of emotion. Moral and Other Thus in the Hellenized cult of the Thracian Bacchus, out of the very riot of savagery, the reek of blood and of living flesh torn by the hands and teeth of wine-maddened monads, there arises the dream of absorption in the god. And of utter devotion to his will, even as we meet it in the suicide-seeking transports of the early Christians. 374 And thus, on the aesthetic side of the evolution, from the rude block of the rustic beer god 375 there is ultimately fashioned, under the hands even of the unbelieving Euripides. The gracious form of the calm god of joy. No grudge hath he of the great. No scorn of the mean estate. But to all that liveth his wine he giveth. Griefless, immaculate. 376. And even such a mystery as Hellenic hands wrought out of the hypostasis of the beer god, Hellenistic hands could shape from that of a man of sorrows, molding from the somber figure of the human sacrifice. Slain a million times through eons of ignorance, a god of another and a more enduring caste. In the understanding of this secondary process lies the comprehension of the history of what may be conveniently termed culture religion, as distinguished from the nature religion, studied under the head of anthropology. In terms of this distinction we may say that hierology proper begins with the typically secondary gods, where anthropology in the ordinary sense ends. 377 But it is essential to a scientific view that we remember there has been no break in the evolution, no supernatural or enigmatic interposition, and this will be sufficiently clear when we study the evolution of the secondary gods in detail. Part 2 Secondary Godmaking Chapter 1 the Sacrificed Savior God. 1. Totemism and Sacraments. There is an arguable case for the theory that the belief in a dying and re-arising Savior God, seen anciently in the cults of Adonis, Attis, Heracles, Osiris, and Dionysus, originated obscurely in the totem sacraments of savages who ate a sacred animal in order to preserve their identity of species with it. 378 There is, however, a much stronger case for the simpler theory that the belief in question originated on another line in the practice of sacrificing by way of sympathetic magic a victim who, as such, became a god. But was not supposed to rise again in his own person. 379 The first of these theories is in the nature of the case incapable of proof. 380 And it is not necessary, for a rational comparison and appreciation of the historic cults, to establish it, any more than to assume that either derivation excludes the other. We should profit little by our knowledge of the manifold God-making powers of early man if we supposed that any given savior cult could originate only in such a line or lines of descent. 
And in point of fact the proposal to hark back to totemism seems to overlook the fact that a sacramental meal ostensibly can originate apart from totemism. It is not plausible to suppose, for instance, that the eating of bread in a primitive Eucharist implied that the partakers originally had the corn for their special totem. 381 Or, supposing the god Dionysus to have been a simple deification of the sacramental Soma or Halma. As Agni was of the sacrificial fire, 382 To conclude that the first Soma drinkers made their ritual beverage on the score that they were of the grape or any analogous totem. Both inductively and deductively we seem rather led to conclude that totems might or might not be sacramentally eaten, and that animals like men might be sacramentally eaten without any reference to totemism. It is apt to be forgotten that at bottom the word, sacred, hieros, equates with, taboo. And that an animal might be made taboo for a variety of reasons, as being too valuable to kill, or as being unwholesome, or as being for occasional killing only. On the difficult subject of totemism, the suggestion may here be incidentally offered that the totem was in origin merely the group's way of naming itself. 383 Such group names were as necessary as individual names. And while a person could readily be labeled from the place of his birth or any family incident at that period, or by a physical or moral peculiarity, clans of the same stock could with difficulty be distinguished in the nomadic state save by arbitrary names which could best be drawn from the list of natural objects. Indeed, it is hard to conceive how otherwise nomadic clans could first name themselves. What other vocables were available? 384 Spencer's suggestion that totemism originated in misinterpretation of nicknames 385 raises the difficulty that nicknames presuppose names. Spencer fully realizes this in the case of individuals, but overlooks it in the case of the group, since he apparently supposes the tribal totem name to come through the nickname of an already named individual. When we realize that for sheer lack of other words the early group could hardly have any name whatever save from a natural object, and when we so recast the explanation. The objection which meets the first form of the nickname theory, that it ascribes too much latitude to verbal misunderstanding 386, falls to the ground. In the primitive state, we must presume, objects and actions were first named by onomatopoeia, or else, sensations and actions being first so named, objects were metaphorically named from sensations and actions, 387 and so with attributes. A definite doctrine as to beginnings is hard to justify, and is not here essential, it suffices to realize that objects would be somehow named before individuals and groups were, whether or not individuals were named before groups. And while persons might readily be named or nicknamed tall or short, straight or crooked, quick or slow, tribes could only in rare instances be so distinguished. While nothing would be more easy than for one family or clan to say to another, you are the wolves, we the bears, you the trees, we the birds, and so on. Point 388. Some such agreement would be necessary. For the mere bestowal of names of whim or derision by groups or clans on each other, sometimes suggested as an explanation of the phenomenon, would yield a multitude of names for each group. 389 The same difficulty meets Spencer's theory that the belief in animal descent came through a nickname, and the totem symbol from that. Spencer, I repeat, had not fully considered the special conditions of the naming of groups. His correction of common assumptions as to the naming of individuals 390 is important, though it is perhaps precarious in respect of the assumption that contemporary savage ways of naming children were primordial. But there is a clear hiatus between his doctrine of individual names and nicknames, and his suggestion as to tribal totem names. He merely rejects other explanations without justifying his own. Why, he asks, 391 did there occur so purely gratuitous an act as that of fixing on a symbol for the tribe? That by one tribe out of multitude so strange a whim might be displayed is credible. But that by tribes unallied in type and scattered throughout the world, there should have been independently adopted so odd a practice, is incredible. Now, the naming of groups is no more gratuitous or strange than the naming of individuals, groups needed to name themselves and each other as such, just as individuals did. And as Spencer admits animal nicknames to be natural, 392 he cannot well deny animal names to be natural in the case of clans or tribes. 
If there is anything certain about early man it is that he regarded animals as on a level with him, and all objects as possibly animate. For tribal purposes, then, these were the natural names. And a formal agreement would be required for their adoption. In no other way could groups speak with each other about each other, at least when they became numerous. And until fixed dwellings or hamlets did away with the need, the expedient would subsist for the reason for which it began. This period, however, would be immensely long, and the memory of the genesis would infallibly be lost. Given the original circumstances, verbal misunderstanding was thus inevitable. 393 When, that is to say, the comparatively early savage learned that he was a bear, and that his father and grandfather and forefathers were so before him, it was really impossible that, after ages in which totem names thus passed current, he should fail to assume that his folk were descended from a bear, which as a matter of course became at a later stage an ancestor god. 394 The belief was inevitable precisely because the totem was not a nickname, but a name antecedent to nicknames, and because descent from an animal was the easiest way of explaining or conceiving a beginning of men. And while some totem names might conceivably have been chosen by way of striking up a helpful alliance with an animal family, 395 The fact that the list of totems includes sand, sparrows, pigeons, bats, and so on is hardly open to that interpretation. While the principle of simply naming from an already named object seems to meet all cases alike. Such a procedure has actually been noted among the contemporary natives of the island of Afadi in the New Hebrides, where the people are all divided into families or clans, each of which has a distinctive name, such as Manui, the coconut. Namkatu. A species of yam, noi, the yam, etc. 396 Similarly the exogamous classes of the Australian tribes are always named from animals, plants, objects, etc. 397 And in most of the tribes of West Africa there are some men with a totem surname who with men of the same surname in other tribes claim a common descent from the original totem. 398 Livingstone noted the same usage among the Bechuanas, whole tribes being known as, they of the monkey, 399 and so on, a state of things in which the cognomen could be carried from any one tribe into others. So among the Naranyeri of South Australia, every tribe has its ngayatai, that is, some animal which they regard as a sort of good genius, which takes an interest in their welfare, something like the North American Indian totem no man or woman will kill her ngayatai, except it happens to be an animal which is good for food, when they have no objection to eating them. 400 Nevertheless, they will be very careful to destroy the remains, from the usual fear of sorcery. 401 Here we have the rationale of the totem. It appears to me, writes the last witness, that the Ngayatai of the Naranyeri is the same as the Atu of the Samoans, but it is not regarded with so much veneration by the former as by the latter. The names are evidently derived from one original, Ngayatai being the same word as Adu, only with the addition of consonants, 402. Now, the Adu of Samoa is simply the primary form of the gods. At his birth a Samoan was supposed to be taken under the care of some god, or Adu, as it was called. The help of several of these gods was probably, sick, invoked in succession on the occasion, and the one who happened to be addressed just as the child was born was fixed on as the child's god for life. 403 Each god was supposed to appear in some visible incarnation, beast, fish, bird, animal, shellfish, or creeping thing. A man would eat freely of what was regarded as the incarnation of the god of another man, but the incarnation of his own particular god he would consider it death to injure or eat. This class of genii, or tutelary deities, they call Ada Fail, or gods of the house. In fine, the family name or tribe name, plant or animal or what not, first becomes an ancestor, who reincarnates himself, and as such is not normally to be eaten. This is the rule in the vast majority of cases. 404 But among the ill-supplied Australians 405 he may be eaten when he is eatable, being regarded all the while as a god-ancestor, 406 whose remains must be safeguarded from sorcery. While among the well-supplied Samoans he is strictly taboo, though any man may eat another man's ancestor god. In neither case is there any sign of the idea of a totem sacrament. 
and Livingstone's Bechuana tribes, like the Samoans, never ate their totem, using the termola, hate or dread, in reference to killing it. And it is difficult to conceive that a sacramental eating of the totem was originally a matter of course. To say nothing of the normal veto on the eating of one's own kin, the people whose totem was the sand, or the thunder, or the evening star, or the moon, or the hot wind, for instance, must have been hard put to it to conform to the principle. And while those of the centipede might contrive to accept it, the folk of the lion totem must have found their sacrament precarious. While, again, in virtue of the primeval logic which regarded interfusion of blood as a creation of kinship, and the eating of lion as a way of becoming brave, the belief in the totemic descent, once set up, might at times lead to the practice of eating the totem, the eating of a lamb sacrament, on the other hand, is not plausibly to be so accounted for. There is, however, no difficulty in understanding how the totem animal might come to be at once revered and shunned, or regarded as, unlucky, when met. For instance, a basudo of the crocodile totem, who did not often see crocodiles, might naturally feel when he met one as, civilized, people have been known to feel when they see an ancestor in a dream, he might take the meeting, that is. As a warning that trouble or death was about to overtake him. On the totem name had followed inevitably the belief in the totem ancestry, and occasionally the prohibition of the totem animal as food, and to both concepts attached all the hallucinations that early clustered around names. When, however, we come to deal with religions as distinguished from religion, we are at a stage far removed from simple totemism, though many of the early hallucinations still remain in possession. As in the animal gods of Egypt and the animal angels of Judaism. For our purpose of comparison and comprehension, then, we may fitly take up the conception of the slain Saviour God as it existed, on the one hand, in the ancient cults amid which Christianity arose, and as it has been found, on the other hand, elsewhere and in later times in cults of primitive caste. 2. Theory and Ritual of Human Sacrifice The sacrifice of a Saviour God is a specialization of the general practice of human sacrifice, which takes many forms. For O7 the most readily intelligible are those in which, a, after a tribal war, captives are richly slain to appease or compensate the spirits of those killed in fighting. b, those in which, in time of pestilence or one danger, or by way of precaution, victims are slain to propitiate the deities supposed to be concerned, c, those by way of thank offerings to the gods after a victory. For O8 and, d, those in which, on the death of a savage chief, slaves and wives, and, it may be, animals, are slain to accompany him in the other life, whatever it may be. The victims in the last case are the analogues of the weapons and the food placed in or on or near the grave in ordinary savage burial. The fourth form of ritual slaying is sometimes differentiated from human sacrifice, in the true sense, as being simply a provision, dictated by filial piety, for the comfort and dignity of a savage aristocrat in the other world. 409 It is well to note the distinction. But it is no less important to realize how completely the conception in this case fuses psychologically with that behind the express sacrifice of a victim to appease a deity, and, further, how the funeral sacrifice leads up to the messenger and scapegoat sacrifices which blend in that of the Savior God-man. All three of the forms specified are common in savage and barbaric life, and it is in the psychic atmosphere of such conventional bloodshedding that there grows up the whole body of the religious doctrine of sacrifice. Human sacrifice, indeed, may be defined as one specialization of ritual slaughter and sacrament. Strictly speaking, the messenger and scapegoat victims are also outside the primary conception of sacrifice inasmuch as they are not, or not necessarily, offered up to any god by way of propitiation. The pharmacos or magic man, literally medicine man, but not in the received sense of that term, who was ritually beaten and put to death in the festival called Thargelia at Athens was strictly a scapegoat, upon whom were put all evils. The people's sins included, he took them away, and was killed to complete the process of riddance, but was not offered up to any god. For ten but in point of fact the Hebrew scapegoat was specifically a sin offering, and of the two goats concerned one was for the Lord and the other for Azazel 
the goat god. For eleven and even in the Greek case the act of ritual slaying is akin to the others inasmuch as all alike are supposed to work either the salvation or benefit of the community or the good of an eminent individual. As we shall see, the slaying which it most concerns us to trace, that of the Saviour God, may in some cases be only in this general sense a sacrifice, being conceivably rather an act of ritual magic, like the slaying of the pharmacos. Then a propitiation of a god, since the victim, even in the case of the scapegoat, is a god. But, as we shall see, the forms of the slaying assimilated, all being alike religious, and the psychic connotations were very much the same. 412. Of the first of the four common forms above specified the typical examples are those furnished by the practice of the North American Indians for thirteen who commonly added cannibalism 414 to their torture sacrifices. Apparently combining the motives which led some savages to eat their dead by way of symbolic, communion, and those which suggested the eating of brave enemies, or animals, in the hope of acquiring their courage. This last is still common in Africa, where, again, we have instances of individual appeasement of the slain. In cases of murder or manslaughter a sacrifice is made to lay the spirit of the victim. For fifteen and among the Nilotic Negroes, when a warrior has killed a man, he must in propitiation shave his head, catch a fowl, hang it round his neck by the beak, and cut away the body, leaving the head hanging. For sixteen here the fowl is a surrogate for the man. In the case of funeral sacrifices also, we shall see, the element of cannibalism enters. And here too the primary principle appears to have been that which underlay, kin eating, though a new sacramental element begins to be involved. In any case the procedure is clearly religious. A contemporary anthropologist tells that among the Anyoro and other tribes of Uganda, before British rule, on the death of a king, a circular pit was dug, not more than five feet in diameter, and about twelve feet deep. The king's bodyguard seized the first nine Anyoro men they met and threw them alive into the pit. Then the dead body of the king was rolled in bark cloth, and the skin of a cow, newly killed, wrapped round it and sewn. This bundle was then lowered in the midst of the nine men in the pit, no clay was filled in, but another cowskin was stretched tightly across the opening and pegged down all round. A covering of grass was then neatly laid over the skin, and the multitude who were present at the funeral set to work at once to build a temple over the grave. For seventeen a headman was appointed as watcher, and very many of the personal servants of the deceased were appointed to live in the temple, and their descendants after them. It was the duty of the surrounding country to see that they were supplied with food. How any beings could hit on this method of honoring a dead king, he concludes, passes the range of the most morbid imagination. For eighteen the really surprising thing is that a professed anthropologist in the twentieth century should have been so perplexed. The cruelly simple usage in question is one of the most familiar types of human sacrifice. For nineteen and even the further development of messenger sacrifices, which we shall have to consider later, proceeds on the same primitive and transparent reasoning. In the still later development of the man-god sacrifice, which partly involves the last mentioned, the psychic causation is more complicated, and, as we shall see, the variations of practice set up a variety of problems. In some forms it is simple enough. At Benin, for instance, hundreds of criminals were sacrificed annually at one festival, at the rate of twenty-three a day. On these occasions the king, regally attired, addressed the victims in a kind voice, telling them he was sending them with a message 420 to his father. They were to salute his father, and tell him that his son was not ready to join him yet, but he sent them, the victims, to be with his father and salute him. For twenty-one in less primitive societies we shall find the office of messenger doubled with that of the sacrificed godman. He in turn appears at times to be doubled with the scapegoat, or remover of sins and evil spirits, and there are yet other variants, e. g. the simple sacrifices of victims slain in treaty-making as, blood of reconciliation. 422 But if each phase be handled in a scientific spirit, it will be found to reveal in turn much if not all of its anthropological significance. The most remarkable of the man-god-slaying cults which have come under what may be termed scientific observation, 
while actually in force, is that which prevailed till fifty or sixty years ago among the mountaineer Khans, 423 or Kuwe, of Orissa. The first observer, Major McPherson, was a man abnormally qualified in his day both for the study of the sacrificial rite and for its peaceful abolition, and science owes him on the former head nearly as much as civilization does on the latter. It would be hard to find an anthropological research before his day more marked by the scientific spirit. On the face of his report, there are various reasons for regarding the Khans as a Dravidian race 424 driven to the hills, where they subjugated other aborigines, by invading Oriyas. And one of several grounds for surmising that their religion derives from ancient Central Asiatic sources is the fact that, like the Chinese, they show great respect for parents and ancestors. One of their boasts is, or was, that they reverence their fathers and mothers, while the Hindus treat theirs with contempt for twenty-five another reason is their rejection alike of temples and images. They regard the making, setting up, and worshipping of images of the gods as the most signal proof of conscious removal to a hopeless distance from communion with them. A confession of utter despair of being permitted to make any direct approach to the deity, a sense of debarment which they themselves have never felt. For twenty-six yet another reason is the fact that they had no official priesthood, the function being open to anyone who felt called to assume it, and went through the normal preliminary symptoms of a state of trance. Politically the hill Khans of Orissa were governed in general by patriarchs, patriarchal councils, and popular assemblies. And there was no trace of Christian influences, the very existence of the tribes having been unknown to the government before 1835. Their religious system was a normal polytheism, with a supreme creator god, known as Bura Penyu or Light God, at the head. Under him were Tari, or Bera, Penyu, for twenty-seven the earth goddess, and certain second-class deities of natural or social forces, as rain, vegetation, increase, hunting, war, and boundaries. Next came the deified sinless men of the first age, who were the tutelary gods of tribes and sects. And under these ranked a multitude of local spirits, all named gods, who presided over villages, houses, hills, fountains, streams, forests, and so forth. With the second order of gods was ranked Dinga, the judge of the dead and allotter of retribution, who has some appearance of being taken over from another cult. It was to Tari, the earth goddess, that human sacrifices were offered. And from the fact that they occurred only among certain tribes, who theoretically admitted the inferiority of Tari to Bura. But gave her their chief devotion and credited her as the Bura worshippers did Bura with raising fallen man from misery and introducing civilization, it may be inferred that the cults were originally independent. In the Malayas, hill districts, of Gumsur, the sacrifice was to Thada Penyu, the earth goddess, symbolized as a peacock. For twenty-eight to the last, the sect of Bura regarded human sacrifice, with the utmost abhorrence as the consummation of human guilt, and believed it to have been adopted under monstrous delusions devised by Tari as the mother of falsehood. With a view solely to the final destruction of her followers. For twenty-nine it is told of Bura, too, that he interfered, through a minor god, according to one myth, to substitute a buffalo for a man as an oblation to Tari. And this miracle is commemorated at an annual great festival of Bura, called the Dijakri, or Dragging, on account of the way in which the buffalo, previously treated as Amariah, is finally handled. According to another account, Bura sent for divine agents to prevent a human sacrifice for which Tari had called. Afterwards, however, her worshippers relapsed. 430. The common relationship of exogamous tribes, who are constantly at war yet habitually intermarry, for thirty-one is the apparent explanation of such a permanent schism. But it seems not impossible that the sacrificial cult was originally that of a conquered race, and that a section of the Khans adopted it from them. As so often happens where a primitive rite or mystery practiced by Aborigines is able to appeal to later comers. For thirty-two it was from an apparently subject race who participated in the cult that the Tari worshipping Khans purchased their human victims. 433. As normally practiced, the rite was not totemistic for thirty-four but of the nature of sympathetic magic, and the purpose was to promote agricultural fertility. 
but it was also resorted to as a special means of propitiation in the case of a pestilence or other sign of divine displeasure, such as a calamity in the family of a chief, and individual families similarly made propitiation for individual disaster. For thirty-five the victim, called the Mariah, or Taki, or Keti, 436 was in all cases either purchased from the procuring caste, who at times kidnapped children from the plains for the purpose, or bred as a hereditary victim. A number of families being set apart and cherished for the purpose, so that he, or she, for it was often a woman, was either personally willing to be slain on religious grounds or was the property of the sacrificers. As it was the universal conviction that the Mariah became a god by the act of sacrifice, there was no difficulty in keeping up the supply. And in times of famine cons would sell their own children as victims, considering the sacrificial death a highly honorable one. And the Mariah, being consecrated from the beginning, had unlimited sexual liberty, his intercourse with the wife or daughter of any tribesman being welcomed as a boon from the deity. Generally, however, he had assigned to him a wife, herself a destined victim, and mother of victims to come. 437. The special religio-ethical feature of the rite was the universally accepted doctrine that the victim, if not a volunteer, must be bought with a price, for thirty-eight and died, for all mankind, not merely for the cons. For thirty-nine and this view was set forth in the ritual, though it also expressed distinctly the local demand for greater wealth. An odd feature of it was that, although the flesh of the slain victim was cut up into shreds so that a piece might be buried in every field. The recited myth told that Tari demanded blood because when the earth was soft mud she made it firm by the blood she dropped when she cut her finger. For forty and there was put in her mouth the injunction, Behold the good change. Cut up my body to complete it, for forty-one it thus appears that originally the victim had represented the earth goddess herself. And in a variant of the Khand legend in which two women, Karabudi and Thardabudi, figure as the only two females on the earth, each with a male son, the former, finding that a drop of her blood hardens the wet earth, tells her son to cut her up. Which he does. Thereafter the god, Bura Panu, comes upon the scene, and the cult of human sacrifice is methodically established, the spirit of Karabudi insisting on its continuance when her descendants offer a monkey as a substitute for a man. For 42 obviously it is an agricultural rite, and it may be that the pretense of drying up the soft mud was a magical device to put the evil spirits of drought on a false scent. The sacrificial rite lasted three or five days. On the first, the Mariah's hair, previously kept long, was shaved off, save in cases where it had been shorn ten or twelve days before, and the people passed the night in a licentious revel. For forty-three on the second, he was carefully bathed and newly clothed, taken in procession to the sacred, or taboo, Mariah Grove, where he was fastened to a stake for forty-four seated, and anointed with ghee, oil, and turmeric four hundred and forty-five, red dye, garlanded with flowers and worshipped during the day by the assembly, who again spent the night in debauchery. On the third day he was given milk to drink, and the final act of ritual and sacrifice began. At this stage we are struck by the importance of the priest, a great and fitly instructed priest alone can officiate. And it is to be gathered from the accounts of the Jani, as well as from the ritual, one, that he was traditionally a celibate and recluse, parading his austerities and securing sanctity by personal uncleanness. 2. That it was primarily his function to brave the curse of the sacrificed and deified victim, and, 3. That it was thus the priestly influence that maintained the sacrifice. For days after the sacrifice of the Mariah there was sacrificed a buffalo, of which the remains were left for the Mariah's spirit 446, a safeguard against blood guiltiness. For 47 the ritual, however, was so framed to begin with as to distribute the responsibility over the village headman or patriarch and the body of the people. On the one hand, the victim reproached his slayers while avowing the belief that he was made a god by the act. On the other hand, the priest and the headman, pleading this, defended themselves by reciting the circumstances under which he was purchased and dedicated, he consenting as a child. The idea seems to have been to set forth thoroughly both points of view, so that there should be no misunderstanding about the religious nature of the act, and the responsibility of the entire community for it. 
But whether by way of sympathetic imagination on the part of some ritual-making priest, or by simple adoption of the actual language of some past sufferer, the victim in one form of the ritual was made to invoke a curse upon the priest. While the latter declared that it was he, as minister of the Creator God, who gave the death its virtue, and threatened to deprive the resisting one of a place among the gods. For forty-eight finally he was either fastened to a cross of which the horizontal bar, pierced by the upright, could be raised or lowered at will, four hundred and forty-nine or placed in the cleft or split made in a long branch of a green tree, which was made to grasp his neck or chest, the open ends being closed and tightly tied so as to imprison him in the wood, and make as it were a cross, of which he was the upright. And it appears to have been at this stage that there occurred one of the most significant acts in the entire ritual. It being essential that the victim should finally not resist, his arms and legs, or, where the arms were sufficiently secured, the legs only, were broken, save in cases where the end was attained by drugging him with opium or detura. For fifty this accomplished, the priest slightly wounded the victim with an axe, and the crowd instantly cut him to pieces, leaving untouched the head and intestines. These, after being carefully watched in the interim, were next day, in some cases, burned to ashes with a whole sheep, and the ashes were spread over the fields, or laid as a paste over the houses and granaries. In the same spirit, the portions of flesh were solemnly carried to the participating villages, religiously divided among the people, and buried in the fields, each man placing his piece in the earth, behind his back without looking. Upon this ritual there were many local variations. Major General Campbell, who had followed Macpherson in the Cond Agency, tells of a form of the rite in which the victim was first drugged, then taken to the place of execution. Where his head and neck were placed in the cleft of a strong split bamboo, the ends of which were secured and held. Whereafter the priest with his axe broke the joints of the legs and arms, and the sacrifice was consummated by the people in the usual frightful way. For fifty-one among the Khans of the Malayas of Gumsur there was much feasting and intoxication for a month prior to the sacrifice. On the day before the rite the victim was intoxicated with toddy, garlanded, bound to a post bearing the peacock effigy of the earth goddess for fifty-two and ritually addressed as a god. On the next day he was again intoxicated and anointed with oil, of which each one present sought to obtain a touch for his own head. Finally a hog was sacrificed, and the victim was stifled in the mud made with its blood, then cut in pieces. A buffalo calf was afterwards maimed in front of the post, and on the third day was killed and eaten for fifty-three visibly as a surrogate. Among the hill tribe called Kodalu, as among the Khans, there were two sects, of which one offered human sacrifices to the god, Jankiri. In this case the purchased victim had absolute sexual liberty and the right to eat and drink whatever he would. From the moment of seizure till the sacrifice he was kept intoxicated. The signal for slaughter was a wound in the stomach, with the blood from which the image of the god was besmeared. Then he was cut to pieces, everyone trying to secure a morsel, to be presented to the god of his own village. 454. In yet other cases, according to M. Ellie Reckless, the two methods of preventing the victim's struggles were combined. She must not die in her bonds, since she dies voluntarily, of her own free will, as they say. He, the priest, loosens her from the stake, stupefies her by making her gulp down a portion of opium and detura, then breaks her elbows and knees with the back of the hatchet. 455 Other variations are noted in the use of the drug. 456 And in different districts the entire sacrifice varied. Thus among the Kotaya hill tribes the victim was taken before the image of the earth goddess, and rice, colored, red, with turmeric, was thrown on his hair, 457 while he was kept under the influence of opium. In this case the victim had enjoyed special privileges for an unspecified period, all his wishes being granted, and every woman in the village being at his command as a concubine. For 58 no quasi-crucifixion is specified, the victim being simply stabbed, in the stomach, and the blood used to bathe the idol, whereafter he was cut to pieces by the crowd. For 59 in yet another case, at Ramgari in Luchampur, the victim was placed in irons, new clothed, made drunk with Eric, and forced into the temple of the goddess, a hole three feet deep. 
There his throat was cut and his head cut off. The remains being covered with earth and with a pile of stones. When the next victim was to be sacrificed, the hole was cleared out afresh for the purpose. In this district occurred yet another variation. Every third year two victims were sacrificed in honor of the goddess. And, whether thus triennially or annually, at Bundar in Jaipur there were sacrificed to the sun god at one festival three victims, one at the east, one at the west, and the third in the center of the village. For sixty in this case each victim was tied by the hair to a post near his grave, over which he was suspended horizontally with the face downwards, his legs and arms being held outstretched by the assistants. For sixty-one he was then beheaded, and the head, stuck on the stake, was there left to decay. A further variation was in the direction of the principle that the infliction of pain made the sacrifice specially efficacious. 462 In some districts the victim, after being exposed on a couch, and led in procession round the place of sacrifice, was put to death by slow burning, or by applying hot brands to the body on a sloping pyre, and tortured as long as possible. It being believed that the favor of the earth goddess, especially in respect of the supply of rain, will be in proportion to the quantity of tears which may be extracted. For 63 it is needless to recapitulate the further variance at any length. Victims were stoned, beaten to death with tomahawks or heavy iron rings, they were strangled, they were crushed between two planks. 464 they were drowned in a pool in the jungle, or in a trough filled with pig's blood, sometimes the victim was slowly roasted. Sometimes he was dispatched by a blow to the heart, and the priest plunged a wooden image into the gaping wound, that the mannequin might be gorged with blood, for sixty-five. All that is constant is the principle of a redemptory bloody sacrifice. But by way of synopsis it may be noted that there prevail certain principles of procedure and symbolism, especially, one, that of, two, stupefying or laming the victim to secure apparent acquiescence. The counter-principle of the need either for suffering as such or for such suffering as shall cause the victim to weep much, a conception belonging to sympathetic magic, three, the anointing, and the consequent sanctification of the oil. Four, the deification of the victim, five, the according to him of remarkable privileges, sexual and social, and, six, a certain propensity to the symbol of the cross. Seeing that the drinking of the soma was primordially a religious act in the East, and that intoxicants play a similar part among modern Polynesians. 466 It seems not impossible that the drugging or intoxicating of the victim was a development from a form of the rite in which he took part in a common banquet. But of this no clear trace had been left, save among the Native Americans of the past. 467 It is to be noted, too, that while the destined child victim among the Khans went about freely, in some cases at least the adult victim was kept fettered, though well fed, in the house of the village patriarch. 468. Very significant, further, is the horrible stratagem employed by the Bataks of the Malay Peninsula to secure acquiescence from the boy victim in their Pangulabalang, a sacrifice of one, to be sent out for the overthrow of enemies. A boy is taken from a stranger tribe, and for a time well fed with titbits, till he has grown quite trustful. Then one day he is taken and blindfolded, a hole is dug, and he is put in it. And the sorcerer comes and asks him, Wilt thou go where we send thee? Wilt thou do only good to us, and evil to our enemies? Wilt thou aid us in war and overthrow our enemies? And so on. To all the questions the trusting boy answers, Yes. Meanwhile lead has been melted on the fire, it is thrown suddenly on his neck, whereof he dies. The corpse is burned, but the ashes and fat are carefully preserved. These remains are now precious magic medicine, for through them the spirit of the dead may be forced to do all he promised in life. For sixty-nine here too the victim is evidently deified, and his ritual, willingness, is an essential element in the efficacy of the sacrifice. It is to be noted, finally, that when, by the persuasions of Macpherson or the menaces of his successors, open human sacrifices were put an end to among the Khans. They treated the henceforth substituted buffalo very much as they had treated the Mariah. The ritual accosts him as a human being, and commiserates him, as it did the Mariah, 
for being sold, he is frequently anointed, he is implored to be a willing sacrifice, cakes are offered to him. He is promised a happy immortality in the paradise of the earth goddess, and he is instantly cut to pieces, and the fragments buried in the fields, as was done with the flesh of the human victim. A song preserves, inaccurately, the memory of the work done by Macpherson and Campbell. 470 Among the Koyis, a Lungur monkey is frequently substituted for the human victim, and called for occasion Ekuromapotu, i.e., a male with small breasts. This name is given in the hope of persuading the goddess, Mamalai or Pele, that she is receiving a human sacrifice. For 71 the sheep or goats offered by the same tribe to the smallpox goddess are given toddy to drink. Their acceptance is regarded as of good omen, and when they are eaten the women are excluded from the repast, 472 as happens in so many cannibal banquets. 473 and, again, there is record that it is or was recently the practice, a few years ago, at every Dasara festival in Jaipur, Visagapatam, to select a specially fine ram, wash it, shave its head. Affix their two red and white batu and naman, sect marks, between the eyes and down the nose, and gird it with a new white cloth after the manner of a human being. The animal being then fastened in a sitting posture, certain puja, worship, was performed by a Brahmin priest and it was decapitated for 74. Here we have the plainest substitution of the animal for the man. And the process entitles us to credit the old record in the Satapatha Brahmana that, in the beginning the sacrifice most acceptable to the gods was man, and that, for the man a horse was substituted, then an ox, then a sheep, then a goat. Until at length it was found that the gods were most pleased with offerings of rice and barley. For 75 what has happened under our own eyes is very likely to have happened in progressive periods of ancient civilization. The progression from man to animals has repeatedly occurred, 476 and it is impossible to explain such cases as either survivals or revivals of totem sacrifices. The victims are the ordinary domestic animals. 477 and they are ceremonially invested with the attributes and the divinity of the human being. It is reasonable to assume that the same evolution as is here traced took place in at least some of the ostensible surrogate sacrifices in Greece 478 and elsewhere. Seeing that there are so many records or traditions of the suppression of human sacrifices in the countries in question. And all this is in keeping with the theory of the present inquiry. 3. The Christian Crucifixion to those who have not realized how all religion has been evolved from savage beginnings, it will seem extravagant to suggest that the story of the Christian crucifixion has been built up from a practice such as those above described. And yet the grounds for inferring such a derivation are extremely strong. Some doubt has been cast, not quite unjustly, upon such inferences in general, as a result of criticism of Dr. Fraser's ingenious guess that the gospel crucifixion incidentally reproduced the features of the sacrifice of a mock king in the Perso-Babylonian feast of the Sasia. The vital difficulty of such a theory is that it takes the gospel episode as historical on the strength of detailed narratives which, save in the episode of Barabbas, whereby the main history is undermined, give no hint of such a coincidence as is surmised, and which, if true narratives, could not conceivably omit to record it had it occurred. But scientific hierology is not held down to that theory, which, in any case, seeks to account only for certain features of the crucifixion story, notably the mock crowning and the scourging. These features are indeed probably to be explained through the analogies to which Dr. Fraser points, though not on his assumption of a historical episode. But there are other features, such as the cross itself, and the resurrection, to which the clues lie, unemphasized, in other sections of Dr. Fraser's survey, and there are yet others which he has not ostensibly studied. Some of these are illuminated by the rite of human sacrifice among the Khans. Their placing of the victim, for instance, either on a cross or in a cleft bough in such a way as to make a living cross for seventy-nine wherein the god is as it were part of the living tree, is a singularly suggestive parallel. But no less so is the detail as to the breaking of the victim's arms and legs, to make him seem unresisting, and the substitution of opium as being less cruel. This last principle is found to have been acted on by the Karhata Brahmins of Bombay. 
In their secret human sacrifice, described by Sir John Malcolm, the unsuspecting victim, often a stranger long hospitably entertained for the purpose, was drugged. And in his drugged state was led three times round the idol of the goddess, whereafter his throat was cut. For eighty yet again, the same principle is found so far away as Mexico, where, in one annual sacrifice to the fire god, the victims were painted red like the Khan Mariah, and a narcotic powder was thrown in their faces. They too were subjected to special suffering, being thrown into the fire before being sacrificed with the knife in the usual way. For 81 and in the Mexican sacrifice, also, the god was expressly represented by a tree, stripped of bark and branches, but covered with painted paper. Let us now take the Christian parallels. In the fourth gospel it is told that after the death of Jesus on the cross, in order that the bodies might not stay on the cross on the Sabbath, the Jews asked of Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. But the soldiers broke only the legs of the two others, these not being yet dead, Jesus they spared, piercing his heart with a lance, that the scripture might be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. The other gospels say nothing on this point, but all foretell of the offering of a drink, and the first two synoptics mention it both before and after the act of crucifying. In Matthew, vinegar mixed with gall is offered beforehand, and refused after tasting, and a sponge of vinegar is offered, apparently in sympathy, after the cry of Eli, Eli. In the first passage the text has evidently been tampered with. For the Vulgate and Ethiopic versions, the Sinaitic, Vatican, and Bezin codices, and many old mizas, red wine for vinegar, while the Arabic version reads myrrh for gall. For 82 in Mark, more significantly, the first drink becomes, wine spiced with myrrh, and is refused without tasting, and here the commentators recognize that the purpose was presumably to cause stupefaction, and so lighten the suffering. For 83 in Luke, this detail entirely disappears, and the vinegar offered on the cross is given in mockery. In John also, only the drink offered on the cross is mentioned. And of this it is said that, when Jesus had received the vinegar he said, It is finished. Then follows the detail as to the breaking of the legs. It is needless here to challenge afresh the historical value of the conflicting records, wherein a slight detail, of no historical importance, enters only to take varying forms for symbolical reasons. What we are concerned with is the source of the symbolism. One compiler clearly knows of a drink offered before the crucifixion, and implies that it was intended to cause euthanasia, for he notes that it was refused. The divine victim must be a conscious sufferer. A later compiler ignores altogether this detail, and notes only that the slayers tormented the victim with a drink of vinegar. Both details alike are unRoman for 84 for the torment was trivial, while the narcotic would be inconsistent with what was meant to be an exemplary punishment. The theologizing fourth gospel, in turn, makes the victim accept the drink of vinegar as the last symbolic act of sufferance. 485 but then suddenly alludes to a detail not specified by the others, a concluding act of limbbreaking, from which the divine victim escapes for dogmatic reasons, the fact of his death being made certain by a lance thrust in the side. We must infer that the limbbreaking was known to occur in certain circumstances, and that the writer or an interpolator of the fourth gospel saw need to make it clear that the bones of the Messiah remained unbroken. He being, according to the fourth gospel, the true paschal sacrifice, it was important that the law as to the Passover should in him be fulfilled. 486. On what data, then, did the different evangelists proceed? What had they under notice? Not an original narrative, their dissidence is almost complete. Not a known official practice in Roman crucifixions, for the third gospel treats as an act of mockery what the first and second do not so regard. And the fourth describes the act of limbbreaking as done to meet a Jewish demand, which in the synoptic narrative could not arise. Mere breaking of the legs, besides, would be at once a laborious and an inadequate way of making sure that the victims were dead, for 87 the spear thrust would be the natural and the sufficient act, yet only one victim is speared. Only one hypothesis will meet the whole case. 
the different narratives testify to the existence of a ritual or rituals of crucifixion or quasi-crucifixion, in variants of which there had figured the two procedures of breaking the legs of the victim and giving him a narcotic. Of these procedures neither is understood by the evangelists, though by some of them the latter is partly comprehended, and they accordingly proceed to turn both, in different fashions, to dogmatic account. Their conflict is thus insoluble, and their testimony alike unhistorical. But we find the psychological clue in the hypothesis of a known ritual of a crucified Savior God, who had for universally recognized reasons to appear to suffer as a willing victim. 488 being crucified, that is, hung by the hands or wrists to a tree or post, and supported not by his feet but by a bar between his thighs, he would tend to struggle, unlike the con victim, whose arms were free, chiefly with his legs. And if he were to be prevented from struggling, it would have to be either by breaking the legs or by stupefying him with a drug. The cons, we have seen, used anciently the former horrible method, but learned to use the latter also. Finally, the detail of the spear thrust in the side, bestowed only on the ostensibly divine victim, suggests that in some similar ritual that may have been the mode of ceremonial slaying. We have but to recognize that among some of the more civilized peoples of the Mediterranean similar processes had been sometimes gone through about 2000 years ago. And we have the conditions which may account for the varying gospel narratives. And if there had occurred in the Mediterranean world such an evolution as we see among the Khans and elsewhere, we have in the story of the betrayal by Judas, incredible and unintelligible as the narratives stand. One more item of sacrificial practice. The Pauline phrase, bought with a price, 1 Cor 6, 20, ostensibly conveys the meaning of, ransomed, and is not applied to Jesus. But the paying of a price to Judas by the high priests would become quite intelligible as one more detail in a mystery drama growing out of a ritual of human sacrifice. Judas, in any case is presumably only a development from Judeos, a Jew. For 89 and the basis of the episode, thus understood, would be the Gentile imputation on the Jews of having sold the Lord as a human sacrifice. And the doctrine put in the mouth of Caiaphas in the fourth gospel, 11, 50-51, is a doctrine of human sacrifice. 4. Vogue of Human Sacrifice Given the prima facie fitness of the hypothesis, however, there at once arises the question, what positive evidence have we for the existence in the Mediterranean world of any such man-sacrificing ritual about the beginning of the Christian era? As to the commonness of the practice among savage or primitive peoples, there is no question. It is frequent to this day in parts of Africa for 90 and in the Malay archipelago, for 91 it is probably not wholly obsolete in India. For 92 and it occurs from time to time in primitive Russia, among ignorant and fanatical peasants. 493 in Polynesia and Maori New Zealand it was normal in the past century. And among Native Americans it occurred, as a religious usage in wartime, as late as 1837. For 94 and the ancient testimonies show the practice at no distant time to have subsisted among nearly all the races then known, especially among the Semites and the Barbarians. Despite some allegations to the contrary, human sacrifices were normal among all branches of the Aryan race. For 95 Lusitanians, for 96 Gauls, for 97 and Teutons, for 98 alike, at the period of their contact with the Romans, normally sacrificed to their gods captives and prisoners, sometimes by burning, for 99 sometimes by hanging, 500 sometimes by crucifying, 501 sometimes by throat cutting or other letting of blood. 502 of the ancient slaves we have equivalent records. 503 among some tribes of the more easterly Galati 504 and the Massagidi 505 and other Scythians 506 similar usages were reported. And while human sacrifices had in the time of Herodotus, by his account, long ceased to be offered in Egypt, 507 the memory of them was, to say the least, sufficiently fresh among the Greeks and Romans. 508 the records of the substitution of a goat for a boy in sacrifice to Dionysus at Potnii, 509 and of a heart in substitution for a virgin at Laodicea. 510 The stories of King Athamas, 
called upon by the Delphic oracle to sacrifice his firstborn son Phrixos, 511 of King Lycaon who sacrificed a child to Zeus. 512 of Aristodemos offering up his child on the call of the oracle when the method of the lot failed 513 and of Menelaos sacrificing two children in Egypt when stayed by contrary winds 514 tell of a once recognized conception and practice. And those of the sacrificing of three Persian boys to Dionysus Omestes at the Battle of Salamis 515 and of seven children by the Persians to the god of the underworld when they were entering Greece 516 are equally significant. Among the Eritreans and Magnesians, again, sacrifices of human firstlings were said to have been anciently offered, 517 in Sparta, in Chios, and in Tenedos, 518 there were similar memories, and the custom was notoriously well established in Thrace. 519 There is reason, too, to infer an act of child sacrifice behind Pausanias's tale of the infant placed in the forefront of an Elian army. 520. Anciently, it would seem, human sacrifice of all kinds was common to the Hellene stock. 521 And the attempts of Mr. Gladstone and others to elevate that race by ascribing their unquestioned acts to the influence of their neighbors, merely substitute a confession of weak imitativeness for one of savage proclivity. The sacrificing of children in particular may or may not have spread from the Semites, among whom it was at one time normal, 522 as it was among the pre-Christian Mexicans and Peruvians. 523 and seems to have been till quite recently among the northern Zulus. 524 female infants were frequently put to death among the Arabs before Muhammad, 525 whether or not by way of sacrifice, as they have been in China and elsewhere in Asia in recent times. 526 and they were sacrificed on special grounds in the South Sea Islands 527 before the arrival of the missionaries. Among the North American Indians propitiatory sacrifices of children are known to have occurred in the 19th century. 528 it was among the Semites, in any case, that they were most common in the Mediterranean world. The standing provision in the Hebrew Code, and the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jephthah's daughter tell of a once regular practice. And the Greek and Latin testimonies as to Carthaginian usage are overwhelming. 529 The association of Carians with Greeks in the sacrifice of the sons of Phans in the Perso-Egyptian War, a rite consummated by the drinking of their blood, mixed with wine and water, suggests the preponderance of Eastern influence. Especially as regards the sacramental conception. 530. Such practices gradually became more and more rare among the civilized peoples, and are held to have subsisted latterly in only one or two places in the civilized parts of the Roman Empire. 531 And there are various traces of the gradual process of mitigation. In the Lucadian sacrifice of a man to Apollo by throwing him from a rock into the sea, of which Strabo preserves the memory. 532 the last stage seems to have been one in which not only was the victim a condemned criminal, but attempts were made to ease his fall by attaching to him wings and even birds, while many men waited below, in boats. To rescue him and carry him beyond the boundaries, such mitigations were likely to be common. 533 But it is on record that only in the time of Hadrian was the annual human sacrifice to Zeus abolished at Salamis in Cyprus. 534 and the possibility of either secret or open survivals in Asia Minor in the first century would thus seem to be considerable. There are, indeed, indications which cannot be put aside, of occasional resort to human sacrifice in the Greek-speaking world in modern times. 535 The stories of its practice by Elagabalus seem not impossible. 536 And the various accounts of the manner of the sacrifice of a slave by the Catalinarian conspirators may point to various forms of survival. 537. To begin with, we have Strabo's account of human sacrifice as being practiced in his time by the primitive Albanians, who lived south of the Caucasian mountains and west of the Caspian Sea, in the land watered by the Cyrus and the Araxes. Under the high priest of the moon goddess were a number of sacred slaves, Hieradoloi. And when one of these became divinely possessed and wandered alone in the woods he was seized, bound with sacred fetters, and maintained sumptuously for a year. 
When the festival day came he was anointed with a fragrant ointment, and slain by being pierced to the heart with a sacred lance through the side. Auguries were then drawn from the manner of his fall, and the body was carried away to a certain spot and ceremonially trampled upon by all as a means of purification. 538 Here we have a sacrifice corresponding in one notable detail to one of the gospel narratives, and having other marked features in common with other well-known rites of human sacrifice. 539 In the annual spring sacrifice at Salamis, again, the victim was led thrice round the altar, as in the rite of the Karhata Brahmins, then pierced by the priest with a lance, and the corpse was finally burned on a pyre. 540 And that this mode of sacrifice in turn had a far eastern origin or precedent may be inferred from the manner of the buffalo sacrifice of the Bataks of Sumatra 541 to the Asambayan, a term expressive of sacrosanctity. In certain cases the buffalo is tied to a stake which has been decked and dedicated, the slayer is robed, and crowned with leaves, and he spears the victim in the side after asking the onlookers, shall I spear? In all likelihood the buffalo is a surrogate for an ancient human sacrifice. Later testimony brings us closer to civilization in the same period. Tertullian is not the best of witnesses. And when he asserts that children are secretly sacrificed by non-Christians in Carthage in his own day, 542 he is but doing what he denounces the pagans for doing as against his own sect, publishing a rumor which had never been investigated. But when he tells that children were publicly sacrificed to Saturn as late as the proconsulship of Tiberius, who therefore, crucified a number of priests on the sacred trees beside their temple. He is saying something that squares with a good deal of testimony as to Semitic practices. Thus we have the explicit record 543 that Hamilcar sacrificed his own son at the siege of Agrigentum, 407 BC, and the many testimonies as to wholesale sacrifices of children among the Carthaginians. There is good evidence that an annual sacrifice of a boy to Kronos had anciently taken place at Tyre, but that it was given up, the citizens refusing to renew it when the city was besieged by Alexander. And the writer who records this also asserts that the Carthaginians maintained the practice of one annual sacrifice till the destruction of their city. 544 To the same effect, Pliny alleges 545 that the victim was annually sacrificed before the image of Hercules, that is, Melkarth. Even the lack of agreement as to dates of cessation is a proof that such usages could subsist without exciting much concern in the more civilized sections of the Roman Empire. The story of the ecclesiastical historian Socrates, 546 to the effect that the Mithraists in Alexandria had habitually offered human sacrifices to Mitra down till somewhere before or after the year 300, is on the face of it worthless. 547 But that there had been such sacrifices at Alexandria at some period is not incredible. Among the Arabs, it seems certain, human sacrifices subsisted in the generation before Muhammad, 548 Among the Japanese, they flourished later still. 549 Among the Hindus, as we have seen, they have lasted down to our own time among the primitives. In view of the importance of this point to our inquiry, it has to be remarked, first, that there is no clear record of the date of cessation of the human sacrifices in the Thargelia at Athens. The historians pass over these matters with no apparent sense of the social and moral significance of such a problem. Grote does not so much as mention the Thargelia in connection with the practice of human sacrifice, and even Dr. Fraser 550 remarks that, the Athenians regularly maintained, a number of possible victims, without suggesting any period for the usage. Professor Mahaffey, on whom as a culture historian the problem pressed, makes a notable admission. I think, he writes, that Aristophanes alludes to this custom as bygone, though the scholiasts do not think so. But its very familiarity to his audience shows a disregard of human life strange enough in so advanced a legal system as that of Athens. 551 The fact seems to have been that where criminals were concerned no notion of humanity or illegality came into play, though in the story of the sacrifice of the daughter of Aristodemus there is an evident prevalence of horror at the act. 552 The horror of Themistocles at the demand that he should sacrifice captives of princely blood at Salamis 553 is really no ground for thinking, as does Professor Mahaffey. 
that he or any other Athenian would wince at putting a criminal to death by religious rites. And such usages, ceasing to be called human sacrifices, may have subsisted long after the Periclean period. 554. Secondly, there is reason to infer from the uneasy language of Pausanias 555 that human sacrifice to Lycaean Zeus was still performed in his time during periods of prolonged drought. And, as we shall see, there are more explicit albeit doubtful assertions as to its continuance at Rome at a still later period. Among the barbarians, too, there were cannibal sacraments. Herodotus tells that his Androphagoi were the only people among the Scythians who ate human flesh, 556 but he also asserts that when a Scythian overthrows his first enemy he drinks his blood. That when the Scythians make solemn covenants they mix their blood with wine and drink thereof, 557 that the Masagidi sacrifice their aged kinsmen and eat their flesh. 558 and that the Isidones eat the flesh of their dead fathers, mingled with animal flesh, at a grand banquet. 559 of the Indian, Calatians and Padeans he gives similar accounts. 560 From such testimony it appears that an anthropophagous sacrament could subsist among a people not generally given to cannibalism, nor does it appear from Herodotus that even the Androphagoi were at all shunned by other tribes. Substantially following Herodotus, Pomponius Mela, in the chapter in which he mentions the Androphagoi in Sacco, tells of some in their region who hold it best to slay nothing, and of some who, when a near relative is growing weak through age or sickness, slay him as a sacrifice and hold it fa's eti maxim piam to eat of their bodies. 561 Pomponius's geography is certainly of the wildest, but it is sufficient to note that he locates these sacramentalists in the region of Nisia, of Mount Miros, sacred to Jove, and of the cave in which was nourished fatherly bear. As there is little doubt that the ancient Akkadians and later Babylonians sacrificed their firstborn children 562 there need be none as to similar practices among later Asiatic barbarians. Returning to the civilized pale, we have the terse testimony of Pliny that among the druidical rites suppressed by Tiberius had been one in which hominum oxidir religiosissimum erat, mandi vero idium salubarum. 563 On this Pliny declaims, in the imperialistic manner, that NEC satis estimary potest, quantum Romani's debiter for ending such horrors. Yet we have not only the record of the early burying alive of four alien men and women in the Forum Boreum of Rome, 216 BC, 564 we have also Pliny's own avowals that only in the year 657 of Rome, 97 BC. Was there passed a senatus consultus forbidding human sacrifices? 565 And that despite this there had been seen in his own time, Idium Nostra Idisvidit, such a sacrifice 566 in the form of the burying alive of two aliens of a nation with which Rome was at war. The law, it appears, referred only to private sacrifices, not to public. 567 It had been even an established rule that before a battle a dictator or consul or praetor was entitled to sacrifice any Roman soldier, quem vilet ex legion romana script at civum devavir. 568 We have also the innuendos of Horace 569 and Juvenal 570 to the effect that even in their own day ancient savageries, such as the sacrifice of boys by slow starvation, could be performed in private. As well as the records of the sacrifice of two soldiers of Julius Caesar to Mars, 571 and of the slaying of 300 of the enemies of Augustus as a sacrifice to the deified Julius. 572 Lastly, Suetonius explicitly asserts that the dreadful rites of the Druids, which Pliny declares to have been abolished by Tiberius, were not put down till the time of Claudius. And in this connection he adds that only under Augustus were those rites forbidden to the citizens of Rome. 573 Here, again, the divergence of the testimony tells of indefinite possibilities of survival for bloody rites, even near the center of government. 574 on the general question, for the rest, we have from Porphyry, without dates, a list of cases of human sacrifices formerly practiced by the Greeks, as in Rhodes, Chios, Tenedos, Salamis, Crete, Athens, and Sparta, no less than by Egyptians, Arabs, and Phoenicians. 575 And not only Porphyry, 
but Eusebius, 576 Minutius Felix, 577 and Lactantius 578 speak of the sacrifice of a man to Laciarian Jove as being still practiced in their time. While Plutarch 579 tells of a secret rite, by implication one of human sacrifice, which he declares to be practiced in the month of November in the Rome of his day. Of the eating of sacrificed human victims Porphyry mentions no cases among civilized peoples, and he gives but a loose account of the practice among the Basaroi of Thrace, who had imitated it from the Taurians. 580 But Tertullian is again more explicit and, at the same time, very circumstantial. At this day, he writes, among ourselves, Isthic, blood consecrated to Bologna, taken in the palm from a punctured thigh, is given to her sealed ones, i.e. Her initiates. 581 In another passage, he speaks of a surviving usage of drinking human blood in the worship of the Laciarian Jove. 582 His further allusion to the practice of drinking the blood of slain gladiators as a remedy for epilepsy suggests many further possibilities of the same kind. And he expressly asserts that the men of his day have seen a man burnt alive as Hercules. 583. 5. The divinity of the victim. On the classic side there is thus abundant evidence as to the practice of human sacrifice, and some as to sacramental cannibalism, in the historic period. But what the theory finally requires is either the sacrifice of a victim who, as being specifically divine, is the subject of a Eucharist, or the proof that such a Eucharist could be combined with the sacrifice of a divine victim. Now, in the Khand cult, as we have seen, not only is the victim deified, but the propitiated goddess figures in the myth as the original sacrifice. An ostensibly similar myth is found in ancient Babylon, in a creation story, where Marduk is actually decapitated in order that the first man may be made from his blood and bone. 584 After such precedence, the deification of sacrificed victims could readily follow, though the probability is, of course, that the myth was framed to explain an already established usage of deification. Of this conception we have already seen a clear trace in the old Mediterranean world in the sacrifices of the Albanians to the moon goddess, and for fuller light we turn first to the cult of Dionysus. Not only is there the story of the substitution of a goat for a boy in the sacrifice to Dionysus at Potnii 585 but there is the combined significance of, a, the myth of the rending of the divine boy Dionysus, in the form of a bull, by the Titans. 586 b. The fact that in the ritual mystery the worshippers tore a live bull to pieces with their teeth. 587. c. The peculiar Dionysiac ritual at Tenidos, where a gravid cow was treated as a woman in labor, and her calf, devoted to the god, was made to wear the tragic cothernae. While the slayer was formally pursued with stones and had to fly into the sea. 588. d. The actual rending of men as Dionysiac sacrifices at Chios and Tenidos. 589 and, e, the peculiar procedure in the Athenian Bophonia or religious, murder of the ox, 590 were the ceremonial flight of the slayers, their repudiation of guilt. And the solemn trial and condemnation of the weapons used as being the guilty things, all go to show that the ox represented either a divinity or a human victim, or the former by development from the latter. 591 The theory of Robertson Smith, that the animal sacrifice is the earlier, need not be here considered. It rests on the assumption that the primordial communion sacrifice was totemistic, and this has not been and cannot be proved. On the other hand we have many traces of the substitution of an animal for a human sacrifice in historic times, and this is all that is required to solve the historic problem. From another side we see the same principle at work in the old Theban sacrifice to Ammonius, 592 wherein the ram, the symbolic and sacred animal of the god, never otherwise sacrificed, was on the annual festival day of the god offered up to him. The skin being placed on the god statue. As Herodotus tells the story, there was then brought beside the image of Ammonius an image of Heracles, presumably Khonsu, the son of the god in the Theban trinity. 593 Whereafter, all who are in the temple beat themselves in mourning for the ram, and then bury him in a holy sepulchre. Whatever may have been the parts played by father and son respectively in this rite, it is clear that the slaying of the ram, 
presumptively a lamb, represented the death of the god, whose resurrection would necessarily follow, like that of Osiris. In the ritual worship of Heracles, the man burned alive represented the god, 594 who in the myth dies on the funeral pyre. Another rite practiced in the worship of the Syrian goddess indicates in a different way the original connection of an animal sacrifice with a human sacrifice and a sacrament. In the Syrian ritual, the stranger who came to sacrifice had to offer up a sheep, of which he partook, on whose skin he knelt, and whose head he placed on his in the act of supplication. 595 The symbolism is here fairly complete. And in yet another rite, that of the sacrifice and sacramental eating of a camel among the Sinaitic Arabs of the 4th century 596 it was clearly avowed that the young white camel was a substitute for a human sacrifice. Young and beautiful captives being the preferred victims. In this case the blood of the wounded camel was drunk by the tribesmen, and the animal was cut to pieces and instantly devoured raw. That at a remote period the human victim was so eaten, it is difficult to doubt. 597. Proceeding on the maxim that the myth is always long posterior to the rite which it pretends to explain, we must suppose that before the composition of the legends concerning the Titans and the birth, death, and rebirth of Dionysus. Such a primitive rite as the legend describes had actually been performed. Between a ritual in which the victim is torn to pieces for burial in the fields, and one in which the victim is eaten by the worshippers, there is a process of development to be accounted for. Two hypotheses are open. The Khand rite may be a modification of an original ritual of cannibalism. Or the ancient Dionysiac rite may stand for a transformation of the typical rite, in which, an animal having been substituted for a human victim, the eating of it became a means to communion with the god whom the animal mystically represented. Broadly speaking, one process is as likely as the other, and both have evidently taken place. While the Khans did not eat their human sacrifice, the Gons, a kindred Dravidian race, by one account actually did. 598 and many medieval and modern instances of kin eating and other ritual cannibalism are on record. 599 in one of the most recently noted instances of human sacrifice among contemporary savages which is also the most primitive that has been observed, the cult of the snake god at Ebertum in southern Nigeria, the annual victims seem to have been eaten regularly. And of the four hundred slain on the occasion of the death of a great chief, all were killed at Ebertum as offerings to the god, and then eaten by the Arrow people, the flesh being distributed through the late chief's country. These victims were looked upon as sacred, and those who ate their flesh ate gods, and thus assimilated within themselves something of the divine attributes and power. The victims were not fattened before being killed. 600 in another tribe, the Igbo, the sacrifice and eating of a male or female slave is still a regular part of the Okuku or post-funeral ceremony for a chief. And in this case the victim is, bought with a price, after the chief's death, fattened, and treated with particular kindness, in the Asiatic fashion. 601 instances of ritual cannibalism may easily be multiplied. In the annual human holocaust at Widda, a century ago, the sacrifice of one man thrown from a height with his hands tied, a muzzled crocodile, and a pair of pigeons with clipped wings, terminated the celebration. And the man in this case was devoured by the multitude. 602 And to this day, in the words of one observer, no great human sacrifice offered for the purpose of appeasing the gods and averting sickness or misfortune is considered to be complete unless either the priests or the people eat the bodies of the victims. 603 The same sacramental element is seen in the eating of parts of the sacrificed captives of war at Bani. 604 In the Tonga Islands, again, the bodies of enemies slain in war were dedicated to the gods, and a few sacramentally eaten this at a stage of civilization at which many of the community, and particularly the women, regarded the proceeding with disgust. 605 and similar survivals were noted in the Marquesas. 606 in Fiji 607 and Tahiti 608 dedication to the gods was a preliminary to every act of public cannibalism. Among the Nyam Nyams of Nubia, too, it appears to have been chiefly in times of war that cannibalism was resorted to. 
And though a white onlooker ascribed the act in such a case to sheer, bloodthirstiness and hatred, 609 it was doubtless a religious proceeding. The same inference arises in the cases in which Native Americans in modern times have been known to eat human flesh in time of war, since they did it, with repugnance, though they believed it to produce courage. 610 Even the infliction of torture may have a religious as distinct from a merely revengeful motive, 611 as in a sacrifice among the Native Americans in which the victim, a slave, was burned by a slow fire. With progressive mutilation and partial eating, followed by killing and the eating of the remains. Finally the partakers beat on their huts to compel the soul of the defunct to abandon the village, 612 Here we have a systematic ritual. 613 we may therefore conclude that primordially the human sacrifice was normally eaten, as it was by the semi-civilized Mexicans at the time of the Spanish conquest. It is in fact certain that anthropophagy has been practiced in all parts of the world in the savage and semi-civilized stages. 614 And it is no less certain that cannibalism had persisted long in its religious form after it had ceased to be a normal practice, the rationale of the act being. Not that men to the last offered the gods that which they commonly liked for themselves, but that they held it a sacred experience to continue to eat what they believed the god to eat. 615 On the other hand, the recoil from cannibalism which everywhere marks the rise of humanity would, in the more civilized Asiatic states, lead on one hand to the setting apart of criminals for the human sacrifices. And on the other to the substitution of an animal, which, partly in virtue of survivals of totemism and partly in virtue of the current conception of all sacrifice, 616 could pass as the representative and incarnation of the god. And would at the same time serve for the typical sacramental meal, but no longer in a totemistic sense. 617. A certain difficulty arises as to the use of criminals for sacrificial purposes. As we have seen, the Khans vetoed it, and rejected even prisoners of war. In view of the nearly universal principle 618 among the higher races of antiquity that the sacrifice must be pure and without blemish, a criminal would seem to be the last man to suit the part. And among the Mesopotamian Semites a genuine and precious sacrament was anciently insisted on. 619 This appears to have been the idea underlying the common rule that the victim should be a male, which prevailed among the peoples of Nigeria in recent times as regards both men and animals. 620 Yet these tribes, as we have seen, sacrifice indifferently a female or a male slave today, 621 And of the practice at Benin it is told that, the people who were kept for sacrifice were bad men or men with bad sickness, they were all slaves. And that a slave who committed a murder was put apart as a fit victim for the common good point 622 A woman again, was the usual sacrifice to the rain god, 623 and women slaves were among those sacrificed to save the city. 624 So among the Egyptians, even in our era, there was a usage of sacrificing a virgin annually to the Nile. 625 The idea of fitness, in short, could easily and spontaneously vary. 626 So, among the Greeks, virgins are typical victims for human sacrifice. And the goddess known simply as Parthenos, sometimes associated with Athene, and by Herodotus identified with Iphigenia 627 is probably but an abstraction from a once annual virgin sacrifice. But it is found that in primitive communities the act of execution constantly assumes sacrificial forms. 628 And it is told of the Bataks of Sumatra that they ate their executed criminals, without any other resort to cannibalism, the relatives of the executed man being entitled to the best pieces. 629 The same is told of the people of Francis Island in the South Pacific, thieves were killed and their bodies eaten, only in such cases was there cannibalism. 630 In the case of the Bataks at least there would seem to be a clear survival of an anthropophagous sacrament. As it can hardly he suppose that people not otherwise cannibalistic would desire to devour an executed relative for the sheer pleasure of eating human flesh. And the accepted explanation of Batak practice is one which chimes with all we know of the motives to theophagy. The cannibalism so common in Sumatra derives in any case originally from the desire to obtain, through the means of the eaten flesh of a newly slain man, the enrichment of one's own livestock by his tondi, 631 that is. 
the many specific spirits which animate his limbs and organs. The Bataks of today hardly realize the motive, though their licit cannibalism is now limited to the eating of brave warriors wounded and taken captive, and of certain criminals, as aforesaid. 632 But with other primitives there is no discrimination. An old Chinese description of Tibet preserves record of a Tibetan practice of sending criminals of certain kinds to be eaten by a tribe of savages north of Burma. 633 The latter may have proceeded on the Batak principle, but of this there is no trace, they being ostensibly ready to eat anybody's exiles. Among the Menima of Uganda, till the other day or even now. It has been the rule that the dead are always eaten by their kindred in the nearest village 634, a limitation which suggests modification of an original kin eating by the example of cannibalism after warfare. The view that the criminal was a proper sacrifice, in fact, might readily grow out of the circumstance that the earlier victims had been normally captives. 635 And this collocation of ideas we actually find in the custom of the home, where human sacrifice was so recently and so systematically practiced. The annual victims, as distinguished from the Holocaust at the death of a king, were commonly captives and criminals, these being normally the king's perquisite. 636 As the death holocaust proceeded on the assumption that the king must enter the death land well attended, so the annual sacrifices, which might number about thirty, were contributions of filial piety to that retinue. The time of sacrifice was accordingly the only time of capital punishment in the year. 637 Here the process of reasoning is sufficiently transparent. If an enemy of the tribe from without could suffice, so, it might be argued, would an enemy of the tribal law from within, he being, besides, one of the king's or God's own people. And among the Aztecs, accordingly, we find the law decreeing that thieves who had stolen gold and silver, thieves par excellence, so to speak, were annually sacrificed with the regular victims to the god Zipe, patron of the goldsmiths. Like many other victims, they were flayed, and the priest wore their skins, thus figuring as the god in their persons. 638 we have, again, the record of Caesar that in the wholesale human sacrifices of the Gauls the offering up of those who had committed thefts or other crimes was considered, more grateful to the immortal gods. But that, when the supply of that species fell short, they descended to sacrifices of the innocent 639 and there is reason to think, with M. De Belleguet, 640 that the peculiar sacrifices in question, in which numbers of men were burned alive in large simulacra, were derived from some early Carthaginian or other Phoenician cult. Needless to say, the simple recoil in more civilized periods from the idea of a willful sacrifice of the innocent, a recoil clearly seen in Greek and Semitic legends, would encourage the resort for victims to the unfortunates under sentence of death. Finally, we have the express statement of Porphyry that in the annual sacrifice of a man to the ancient Semitic deity Kronos at Rhodes, a prisoner condemned to death was selected and kept till the Cronian festival. When he was led outside the city gates and, having been given wine to drink, put to death. 641 Here we have at length a close parallel in the Mediterranean world to what we have seen reason to regard as a typical detail in the Gospel Mystery Play. 642 The Cronian victim at Rhodes we know cannot have been originally a criminal. And it is much more likely than not that he originally persona Ted either the god Kronos, 643 or, as seems most probable, the only begotten son, Yud, whom in a Phoenician myth 644 Kronos is said to have sacrificed after dressing him in royal robes. To this clue we shall return after a further survey. In the meantime, we may take it as established, 1, that the giving of a narcotic to the victim, which we have seen practiced among the Khans, and which we find transferred in India and elsewhere to animal victims 645 who are presumably surrogates, derives from ancient usage. And, two, that the original purpose of the rite was not held to be defeated by the selection for sacrifice of a prisoner sentenced to death. In a community where social duty was deeply impressed on all, as in medieval Japan, it was possible to secure every year a victim who practiced ascetic abstinence, and was finally put to death on behalf of the community. 646 And this may well have been the early ideal. 647 As the Japanese human scapegoat, though of course no longer sacrificed, is even now called the one-year godmaster, 
and was anciently called, the abstainer. It is not difficult to conceive that this may have been one of the ways in which kingship grew up. 648 But in more sophisticated societies, as we know, the extremer obligations of the kingship were overridden, and victims must in most states have been hard to procure. 649 It is true that in primitive communities the fear of death seems surprisingly slight among doomed victims, 650 and the known readiness of Chinamen to sell themselves as substitutes for condemned criminals points the same moral. But nonetheless there has been an evolution of the faculty of apprehension. An intermediate stage is seen in the medieval state of Malabar, where condemned men volunteered to immolate themselves in honor of a god, giving themselves twelve wounds with as many knives, and thereby winning funeral honors. 651 The tendency in less rigorously drilled communities than Japan would be, first, towards a general unwillingness which had to be met by the bribe of a year's license, and, later, to a state of things in which nobody would volunteer. And the victim must be either bred and bought, as among the cons, or taken from among the condemned criminals. These, however, would include persons condemned for impiety, who even for the Christians were explicitly anathemata, that is, objects, devoted, to the gods. 652 The same title of anathema was given to the sacred objects hung up or deposited in the temples and to the man denounced for impiety. 653 So that, even if the widespread usage of granting abnormal privileges to the victim, whether human or animal, 654 were originally a way of asserting his divinity, a criminal was not ineligible. Thus, though it does not seem to be clearly proved that the victims put to death in the Thargelia festival at Athens were latterly criminals 655 it is highly probable that they were. Early religion looked to the physical side of sacrifice. And if the criminal were whole, no question of his fitness would arise for more primitive worshippers, save where, as among the cons, the practice of purchase set up a special credence. 656 In one Greek sacrifice, indeed, that performed at Leucadia, an ugly or deformed person seems to have been chosen as the victim. 657 When, again, the developing religious consciousness became capable of shrinking from the anomaly of calling a criminal, sacred, there was, as we shall see later, a symbolical way out of the difficulty. Symbolism, too, would further the modification of the sacrificial meal. Long before the more civilized peoples revolted from the act of human sacrifice, they would recoil, we must suppose, from the act of anthropophagy. And in regard to many rites of human sacrifice we find stories of substitution of animals and of waxen and other images and cakes by order of humane kings. 658 The Roman devices of the kind are well known, and their resort to images of straw is paralleled among the dons of India in our own time. 659 While the modern Malays offer dull models of human beings, called, the substitute, 660 in the Bataks of Sumatra employ a number of symbolic sacrifices of images of human beings, some made of bananas. Some of wood, all plainly suggestive of a process of substitution for former human sacrifices. 661 The same process of substitution may be confidently inferred in the case of the rite practiced in the Chinese Spring Festival, held annually on the 4th of February. The chief magistrate of each department, crowned with flowers, is carried in a chair in procession, surrounded by figures representing mythological personages. And before him is carried a huge decorated figure of a buffalo, in terracotta, with gilded horns, behind which goes a child, with one foot shod and the other naked, who constantly beats the buffalo. Behind him march laborers carrying their agricultural implements, and the procession goes out, and returns, by the eastern gate of the town, to meet the spring. When it is over, the buffalo is broken up, and the pieces, with a vast number of small buffalo figures carried in the interior of the figure, are distributed to all the people, whereafter the governor delivers a discourse in praise of agriculture. 662 What has historically taken place, doubtless, is first a substitution of a buffalo, as among the cons, for the original human victim, of whom the flower-crowned governor is a surviving trace. Later, Chinese thrift and Mandarin policy substituted an image for the buffalo, adding a multitude of small figures of it for distribution with the pieces of the image, as was once done in the case of the living victim. 
For the rest, the turn of mind which made myths out of the misunderstood survivals of totemism would have no difficulty in finding reasons for eating any given animal in the worship of any given god. Whether or not the primordial sacrifice had been that of an animal. Thus the worshippers of Dionysus could feel they were commemorating the dismemberment of the god when they ate the raw flesh of a bull or a kid, other devotees ate a young dog. 663 and further symbolic modification easily followed, on lines common to many pagan cults. 6. The Cannibal Sacrament Given such a modification, however, we have to reckon with a tendency that is seen to have been chronic in religious history, the tendency, namely, to revert to a foreign or archaic form of sacrifice or mystery in times of national disaster and uncertainty. 664 It is expressed alike in the Roman resort to Eastern and Egyptian gods in times of desperate war, in the revival or preservation of the cults of subdued races 665 in the multiplication of magical rites for decaying civilizations. And in the chronic reversion during times of excitement to palmistry and other modes of fortune-telling. 666 And that the idea of religious anthropophagy prevailed in the early Christian world is obvious from the central ritual of the cult, where the formulas, take eat, this is my body. Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood, cannot conceivably be other than adaptations from a mystery ritual in which a sacrificed God so spoke by the mouth of his priest. 667 In the fourth gospel we have an amplification in the same sense, the act of symbolical anthropophagy or theophagy being made the means to immortality. I am the bread of life. I am the living bread, which came down out of heaven, if any man eat of this bread, he shall live for ever, yea, and the bread which I will give is my flesh, for the life of the world. Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have not life in yourselves. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is true meat, and my blood is true drink. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me, and I in him. 668. The very repetitions are ritualistic. We have them in the ritual of the Khans, and in the ritual of the pre Christian Mexicans. 669 And there is another curious parallel in a certain ritual of Dahomey, where, with all the stress of human sacrifice, cannibalism occurred in one set of cases only, those killed by lightning, a death, which renders sepulture, as among the Romans. Unlawful. In these cases the official, wives, of the thunder god place the body upon a platform, cut from it lumps which they chew without eating, crying to passers-by, we sell you meat, fine meat, come and buy. 670. Now, the Eucharist stands both in the myth and in the nature of the cult in the closest relation to the act of human sacrifice, and to explain the latter without reference to the former is to miss part of the problem. For the compilers of the fourth gospel, as we have noted, the crucified one is the final and universal paschal sacrifice, being slain at the time of the paschal lamb eating, whereas in the synoptics he had previously partaken thereof. And that this conception existed among the Judeo-Christists before the Gospels were written is clear from the Book of Revelation. Where we have a Judaic writer of the early days of the Gentile Schism 671 identifying Jesus with the Alpha and the Omega equals the Almighty, and at the same time with, the Lamb that was slain, and that has seven horns and eyes. Like the symbol of Mitra, the slain God actually appearing as a Lamb in the vision. Thus in the Jesuit Eucharist, as in so many others, there is embodied the primitive countersense of the God eating himself, in that the sacred or sacrificial animal which he eats is his own manifestation. There could not well occur in respect of the lamb the further myth evolution seen in some other cults, as in that of the goat-eating Dionysus. Where, we have the strange spectacle of a God sacrificed to himself on the ground that he is his own enemy. But the primary principle is the same, whether through totemism or through an early application of the zodiacal principle, making the spring sacrifice consist in a lamb because the sun is then in the constellation of the ram-lamb. The lamb stands for the god. And, as the god is supposed to partake of the victim offered to him, it follows that, when the victim is the god's own self, the god eats of his own flesh. 672 In the gospel legend this happens by a double necessity, 
inasmuch as the God must found his own Eucharist before his death. It was doubtless by way of refining upon the earlier practice of flesh-eating that in the synoptics the God is made to call the bread his flesh. Though in the course of the supper he presumptively ate of the prescribed flesh of his special symbol and representative, the lamb. In the same way the Mithraists, whose God was symbolized by both the bull and the lamb, had a sacred meal of bread and wine and one of bread and water, though the God is normally figured as slaying the bull. And a lamb was at certain times eaten in the mysteries. 673 So in the mystical Eucharist of the Egyptians, wherein the divine beings eat the god Ba, god of the water flood, and drink the drink offerings. 674 The cakes and ale, so constantly mentioned in the funeral ritual, clearly stand for bread and wine as symbolizing flesh and blood, the cakes being made of white grain, and the ale from red grain. 675 The worshippers of Dionysus inferably did the same when his worship was linked to that of Demeter or Ceres, the corn goddess, and in his cult in turn the wine was mixed with water. 676 But it is on record that though some Christian worshippers in the 2nd century and later, whether imitating the Mithraists or proceeding on general ascetic principles, substituted water for wine in the normal sacrament, a mixture of wine and water being the common usage, 677 An actual lamb was in many churches anciently sacrificed and eaten at Easter. And that when that usage ceased a baked image of a lamb was substituted. 678 And vestiges of both customs survive to this day in the practice of the Catholics of Italy, wherein an actual body of a lamb as well as a confectionary image is blessed by the priest, with the Easter eggs, and sometimes bread. 679. There were in reality two ideals in the early church, that set forth by a number of the fathers down to Augustine, according to which the ritual of the Holy Supper is purely mystical. 680 and another, resting on the natural feeling that the ritual language was gratuitously fantastic if taken as wholly mystical. This, the realistic view, founds on the whole historical analogy of sacrifice, which always meant a communion with the God in partaking of a common meal, 681 and often, further. A partaking of the God, 682 under the form of his animal or human representative, this after the principle of totemism, if ever present in the particular cult, had been long overlaid by a later mysticism. In short, if men ate the paschal sacrament of the Lamb by way of eating the God, they were doing what was pleasing to the God. And if they further regarded the God as incarnate in human shape, they were equally entitled or committed to eating Him in that form. But are we then to suppose that in any Mediterranean population about the beginning of the Christian era a religious sect could sacrifice a human being and afterwards sacramentally eat of the flesh? In the records of the man sacrifice of the Babylonian Sasia or Zakmuk, to which Dr. Fraser looks for the original of a rite copied by the Jews in their Purim feast and incidentally applied to the execution of a historic Jesus, there is no trace of a subsequent anthropophagus or other sacrament. Any more than a rite of resurrection. Yet such a sacrament would seem to be primordial. And the idea of resurrection, developed as a doctrine of individual immortality from the primary conception of the annual revival of vegetation, had become part of the mystery rituals of Osiris and Dionysus, and of the Eleusinia. Long before the Christian era. It is the same doctrine that we find in pro-Christian Mexico, particularly in the worship of Huitzilopochtli. Concerning which a discerning mythologist of the last generation noted that the practice of making from dough and seeds and children's blood small images of the god, which were treated like human victims neaten, signified his death and the eating of his body. Whereas the god dies, it must be religiously and as a sacrifice. And whereas the anthropomorphic god dies, he dies as a human sacrifice according to the established usages, his heart is cut out and his body eaten as was done in every human sacrifice. Was the thought thereby signified that the god, when his body was eaten, became part thereof, and so communicated himself? Doubtless, but not abstractly, metaphysically, or at all Christianly or morally, but simply on his nature side, which is the essence of the feast God. In seeds he gives his body to nourish his worshippers. Broadly, the God entertains the sacrificer at the sacrifice through the sacrificial meal, and when the slave, 
as so often happens, represents the God to whom he is sacrificed, the eating of his flesh is an eating of the gods. 683. With the comparative morality of the heathen and Christian sacraments we need not here concern ourselves. But it is to be noted that among the early Christians the sacramental bread was treated as having medicinal virtue. And that in the Middle Ages it became practically a fetish. 684. 7. The Semitic Antecedents. In view of such an evolution, which may or may not have a historical connection with the old Asiatic rite seen surviving among the Khans and Gans, we may perhaps infer where we cannot trace the development that preceded the reduction of the Jesus myth to its present form. An important light is also thrown on the problem by the speculation of Dr. Fraser, inasmuch as it indicates clues which are not affected by the miscarriage of his actual theorem, and to these we may profitably turn. Dar. Fraser's hypothesis is that the mockeries of the crucifixion represent the application to the case of Jesus of the usages of the Perso-Babylonian festival of the Sicilia, 685 which he is disposed to identify with the very ancient New Year festival known as the Zakmuk or Zagmuku. 686 from this he holds the Jews to have derived their, certainly post-exilic, Feast of Purim, of the origin of which such a fictitious account is given in the Book of Esther. Whereof the Esther and Mordecai strongly suggest the god names Ishtar and Merodach. Purim, in its main features, resembles alike the accounts given of the Sasia and those given of Zakmuk. And the suggestion is that the Jews, in borrowing the festival, may have copied from the Babylonians the Sasia practice of putting to death at that date a malefactor, who, after masquerading as Mordecai, in a crown and royal robe, was hanged or crucified in the character of Haman. This in itself is not incredible, nor is it unlikely that the fast which precedes the feasting of Purim was, in Babylon, a ceremonial mourning for a god or demigod who died like Tammuz or Adonis, and like him rose again on the third day. Then comes the suggestion that Jesus was crucified in the character of Haman. Now arises, however, the problem as to dates. Purim occurred in the middle of the lunar month of Adar, the last of the Jewish sacred year, which, says Diar. Fraser, corresponds roughly to March. In Condor's handbook, as it happens, it is made to run from January 28 to February 25, leaving, for us, an interval of eleven days unaccounted for between the end of the year and the beginning of the next. Which sets out with first Nissan equals March 8. What the Jews did to round the cycle was to insert a thirteenth lunar month seven times in nineteen years. This intercalary month was presumptively placed at the end of the year, with the effect of retarding the new year and making Nissan, also called Abib equals ripe years, run into our April. The practical point for us, then, is that there were several weeks between Purim and the Babylonian Zakmuk, which fell, early, in Nissan. Doubtless the Jews put Purim earlier to prevent its clashing with their Passover, which was originally a spring festival of the same order. But then the Sasia, according to Barosis, fell in the Babylonian month of Laos, which answers to July. 687 And Jesus, again, is crucified at the Passover, which occurs in the middle of Nisan, the lamb being set apart on the 10th, while unleavened bread began on the 15th. Thus none of the dates fit, Jesus being crucified, according to the story, a month after the Jewish festival in which Haman figures, and months before that of the Sasia in which a mock king was hanged or crucified. Of these difficulties, which Dr. Fraser avows, Mr. Lang makes the most. 688 Dr. Fraser's suggested solutions are, 1, that Barosis may be wrong about the date of the Sasia. 2, that Jesus may really have been crucified in Adar, at the Feast of Purim, and not in Nisan, at the Feast of the Passover, Christian sentiment preferring the latter date, and making the change in tradition, 3, that the Jews may sometimes, cp. Esther 3, 7, have put Purim alongside of the Passover. For the rest, he suggests that Barabbas was the Mordecai of the year. And cites from Philo the story of Karabas, who was made to play the part of a mock king at Alexandria, by way of burlesquing King Agrippa. 689 The name Karabas, it is suggested, may be a copyist's error for Barabbas, which, Dr. 
Fraser thinks, may have been the standing name for a figure in a mock sacrifice, since it means, son of the father, and points to the old Semitic cults in which king's sons were sacrificed by or for their fathers. Now, the mere difficulty about dates would not be fatal to Dr. Fraser's very interesting and ingenious theory if that were otherwise on a sound footing. That there were two calendar usages in regard to the Sasia becomes probable when we note, 1, that the Jews, under Babylonian influence, had separated their ecclesiastical from their civil year, their ecclesiastical new year, the older, being in autumn, while the civil year began in spring, 690 and, 2, that they had a second for little Passover, a month after the first. For those who could not keep that. 691 Under the changing dynasties of Mesopotamia there might easily be such a duplicating of the Sasia, and as a matter of fact Zakmuk was a festival day in many Babylonian cults. 692 On the other hand, the Jews would readily antedate their Purim to separate it from the Passover, and Christian tradition might very well falsify a date of which it had no documentary record. But this last consideration calls up a far more serious objection to the form of Dr. Fraser's proposition, the above-noted objection, namely, that he is accepting the historic actuality of the crucifixion, the inscriptions on the cross, the, of Nazareth, the mockery by the soldiers, the utterances of Pilate, the episode of Barabbas, and all the rest of it. To a critic who accepts all this the critical answer obviously is, if you thus take for granted the genuineness of such a highly detailed narrative. How can you possibly account for its absolute omission of any shadow of allusion to the Haman and Mordecai show of which you suppose the crucifixion to have accidentally become part? This objection Dr. Fraser does not try to meet, and it is hard to see how he could meet it. A thorough inquiry, surely, must take account of all aspects of the gospel problem, not merely of ostensible parallels in pagan usage to one aspect of the crucifixion story. The whole documentary problem, surely, must be taken into account. And the historical criticism of the entire legend reckoned with. We are not dealing with a generally credible and corroborated narrative in which a single episode raises surmise of extraneous factors not recognized in the text. But with one which begins and ends in absolute and immemorial myth and is stamped with supernaturalism in every sentence. By Dr. Fraser's own repeated avowal, we ought not to look to the current narrative of the origin of a right for the historical fact, but to the right for the origin of the narrative. If this law does not hold of the Christian Eucharist it holds of nothing, and the Eucharist is the keystone of the arch built over the death of the God in the Gospels. Dar. Fraser obviously proceeds on the common assumption that the teachings of the Gospel Jesus testify to an indubitable personality. But that view, so natural at first sight, has reached its lowest degree of credit among special students precisely at the moment of Dr. Fraser's unquestioning acceptance of it. 693 Anthropology and Hierology cannot afford thus to ignore the special historical problems of the very creed on which confessedly their results must finally come to bear. Several of Dr. Fraser's remarks, however, suggest that in the very act of bringing his invaluable research into relation with the creeds of his contemporaries he had regarded as outside his field of study some of the most significant and best established facts as to the doctrinal evolution of Christism among the Jews. 694. 8. The Judaic Evolution. Rejecting, then, as not merely unwarranted but excluded by the evidence, Dr. Fraser's assumption of the historicity of the crucifixion, we have to note carefully the inferences which his research really warrants. When these are drawn it will be found that his notable hypothesis does not fall to the ground in its essentials. He has really added signally to his former great services by bringing together the evidences for the existence of a mockingly sacrifice among the Semites before the Christian era. And by skillfully elucidating the whole primitive psychology of such rituals. It needs only that his procedure be freed, on the principles of scientific mythology, from the difficulty set up by accepting one set of palpable myths as history. When criticism has done its worst against his manipulation of the Sasia, Zakmuk, and Purim, it will be found that there remains clearly open the inference that certain details of the crucifixion myth are drawn from some old Semitic rite resembling the Sasia, not by way of Purim in its ephemerized Jewish form, but in a simpler form. 
in which there was no Ishtar or Meridak. 695. Precisely because the practice of human sacrifice to the vegetation god was so nearly universal as Dr. Fraser has shown it to be, it is unnecessary to assume that the Jews owed their variant of it solely to a late contact with another nation. The Athenians had in their Thargelia, which like the Passover was a feast of first fruits 696 a usage of human sacrifice which as we have seen corresponded at points with the Babylonian. Inasmuch as the victims were maintained in potentially riotous ease, and were latterly chosen from the criminal class, though they cannot originally have been so. The sacrifice, indeed, does not seem to have belonged to the earlier worship of Apollo at all, 697 in the calling of the victims pharmacoi, medicine men, suggests an adaptation of a West Asiatic usage. The more so as quasi-Semitic sacrifices were in use among the Eritreans and Magnesians. 698 In all likelihood this was the very sacrifice of purification said to have been prescribed to the plague-stricken Athenians by the Cretan Epimenides 699 when two youths voluntarily gave themselves as victims. 700 But if the Athenians could take such a rite from Crete or Asia Minor, there is reason to conclude that it was known in Palestine, in a simpler form than the Babylonian, before the exile. That there were such forms is to be inferred from both early and late evidence. Firstly, we have the whole tradition of the Passover, with which, and not with Purim, the crucifixion myth comes chronologically in touch on the face of the case. Among the aspects of the Gospel myth which the analogy of the Sasia leaves untouched are, 1, the mourning for the victim, 2, his alleged divinity and his titles of Son of God and Son of Man. 3, his participation in a sacramental meal in which his flesh is mystically eaten, for, his execution along with two criminals, 5, his resurrection, 6, his subsequent status as Messiah or Christos. Now, the first three of those characteristics are as cognate with the Paschal Rite as they are alien to Purim, the fourth can be shown historically to connect with Paschal usage, and the others develop naturally from the preceding. That there is no need to go to Purim for an actual killing or sacrificing of quasi-royal victims or malefactors in connection with a sacrificial festival appears from the legend of the hanging of seven kings' sons, before the Lord. An event which happens according to the narrative at the barley harvest, that is, at the time of the Passover. 701. In the face of this familiar record it is obliviously asserted by Mr. Lang that, sacrificed victims are not hanged. 702 He has given thirteen cases of human sacrifice in which victims were not hanged, but has apparently not consulted his Bible. Now, the expressions, before the Lord, and unto the Lord, mean sacrifice or nothing. 703 And that the hanging of Saul's sons was by way of propitiation is clear from the remark in the context that, after that, God was entreated for the land. 704 Further, Hanging is the mode not only in the sacrificing of Saul's sons but in the offering up, unto the Lord, of the heads of the people as described in Numbers 25, 4. Equally sacrificial, in spirit and in occasion, though the usual formula is not applied to it, is the hanging of the five kings by Joshua in the pseudo-history. And in the case of his hanging of the king of Ai, where the procedure is exactly the same, it is explicitly told, in the Hebrew, that he, devoted, all the people of Ai, as he had done those of Jericho. 705 As Ai is an imaginary city, 706 We must conclude that the legend points to a customary rite. Finally, a comparison of a passage in Deuteronomy in which every hanged man is declared to be, the curse of God, 707 with the passages cited from the book of Joshua, proves that, the curse of God, meant, devoted to God. 708 Since in the former the course prescribed is precisely that followed in the pseudo-history, namely, the taking down and burying of the victim within the day. Thus all hanged men were in ancient Jewry sacrifices to the sun god or the rain god, 709 and the Pauline epistle unconsciously clinches the point in citing the misunderstood text. 710 It may in fact be taken as historically certain that human sacrifice in this aspect was a recognized part of Hebrew religion down till the exile. 711. And here, as at so many other points, we find a specific parallel between Hebrew usage and that of the natives of Africa. 
At the death of a Nigerian chief or notable, the slaves slain to raise him up by the head and feet are buried with him. And others are hung in the different compartments of the house and in the street or roadway, the heads of these being afterwards cut off and regarded as conveying luck. 712 again, near a certain long juju shrine in southern Nigeria, where human sacrifice was regularly practiced until its capture by the British troops. It was noted that beside a minor temple at Ibom were trees on which murderers and thieves used to be hanged. 713 that the hanging had a religious significance is proved by the fact that when the capture took place there was found, the last sacrifice, a white goat, trussed up in the branches of a palm tree and starving to death. 714 And it is expressly explained concerning the sacrifice of a woman to the rain god at Benin that a woman was taken, a prayer made over her, and a message saluting the rain god put in her mouth. Then she was clubbed to death and put up in the execution tree, St. Andrew's crosswise, so that the rain might see. 715. Semitic usage is all that need be proved in the present connection. But it may be further noted, 1 that animal victims were hanged to a tree in the cult of the Syrian goddess in the second century of our era. 716, 2, that human victims were bound or hanged to trees in the sacrificial rites of the pre-Christian Mexicans. 717, 3, that human victims were frequently if not habitually hanged in sacrifice to Odin. 718 as well as to other Teutonic deities. 719, 4, that in certain cases of human sacrifice in Tahiti the slain victim was suspended from the sacred tree, 725, that the devoted bodies of slain enemies were hanged on a tree by the Tongans. 721, 6, that among Abubura natives a lamb in a propitiatory sacrifice was fastened into the topmost prong of a pole and set up, with a palm branch on which was impaled a yam, at the entrance of the compound. 722, 7, that some of the northern Native Americans hang dogs to poles with running knots in honor of their divinities, that the nomads similarly attached skins of wild beasts to trees, and that the Floridans elevated other offerings. 723 It is significant that among the early Odin worshippers, as among Greeks and Semites, kings' sons were sacrificed in substitution for their fathers, and that latterly slaves and criminals were substituted in such rites. 724 From the nature of the case, too, it is probable that the victim was hanged not by the neck but by the hands. 725 In some of the Scandinavian cases the victim was wounded with a javelin as well as hanged. And one myth specifies a hanging which lasted nine nights. 726 In any case, hanging by the wrists was the normal mode of ancient crucifixion, so-called. 727 but, further, it is clear that the Passover rite, of which the narrative in Exodus is a fictitious account, was originally one of sacrifice of firstlings 728 including the firstborn sons. And the conflicting laws on the subject prove that only with difficulty was the substitution of lambs for children carried out. 729 To this day, at least among continental Jews, 730 The principle of redemption is richly recognized in the festival ceremony of Pity and Haven. A month after the birth of a first son, a friendly Kohen is selected to officiate, who sacerdotally asks certain questions of the mother, one being, Is this child the first fruit of your womb? If he be poor, he receives a small fee. 731 If not, the mother throws a small gold chain round his neck, and he in return, during certain prayers, puts it round the neck of the child, who is thus redeemed. And that the firstborn were at one time set apart as a victim class, 732 liable either to be sacrificed or to be employed as hired alloy. Appears from the announcement of Yahweh in the priestly code, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn. And the Levites shall be mine, for all the firstborn are mine, 733. As regards the private continuance of the practice after the Levites had been set apart as a specific tribe, we can only inferentially trace the evolution. Certainly the priesthood did not of itself set up the movement against child sacrifice, such reforms always begin through rulers or lay reformers, never through the priestly organization, save when a new cult supersedes an old. 
734 circumcision, a rite of sacrifice with the same significance 735 seems to have been introduced, or at least stressed, comparatively late, 736 for the same purpose, and as an official Yahwistic feast the Passover seems also late. 737 Though the manner of its enactment in the first redaction of the law indicates that it was in some form already a standing practice. 738 It doubtless needed the late myths of Abraham and Isaac 739 and of the Exodus to persuade even Yahwists to drop the child's sacrifice, and in the rival cults the practice seems to have been common. 740 It is in this connection that there presumptively occurred the usage first of breaking the victim's limbs, and later of drugging them, to prevent the struggles which were usually held to make a sacrifice inauspicious. 741 And the manner in which the caveat against breaking the bones of the paschal lamb is introduced, an apparent interpolation made at the close of the original narrative of the Exodus 742, indicates it to be either a late provision against a practice which definitely recalled the rite of human sacrifice, or a specific assertion of the principle that the victim must be without blemish, as against the practice of a human sacrifice in which the victim had to be either maimed or drugged in order to make him seem willing. But, as in the practice of the cons, so in that of the Jews, the principle that the victim must be bought with a price is visibly a later development, grafted on the other. Originally, the victim is voluntary. This is his special sacrificial virtue. When the voluntary victim can no longer be procured, one, bought with a price, being the property of the sacrificers, is the next best thing. And in his case, willingness is ostensibly secured by trick bribe, or brutality. The underlying reasoning is of a piece. We are faced again, however, by the difficult problem of the historic transmission of such usages. On the whole the evidence from anthropology goes far to support the thesis, otherwise well made out, of the Asiatic derivation of the Oceanic peoples. 743 In certain South Sea Islands in modern times, when the practices of human sacrifice and cannibalism had latterly dwindled. 744 The first missionaries found in use forms of animal sacrifice which seem to affiliate at many points to the ritual we have seen in operation among Khans and Westerly Semites. Thus the pig set apart for sacrifice 745 at certain temples, when presented alive, received the sacred mark, and ranged the district at liberty, when slain, they were exceedingly anxious to avoid breaking a bone, or disfiguring the animal. One method of killing them was by holding the pig upright on its legs, placing a strong stick horizontally under its throat, and another across upon its neck, and then pressing them together until the animal was strangled. 746 Here we have, 1, the common Asiatic and American usage of leaving the doomed victim for a time at liberty, 747, 2, the avoidance of bone-breaking, 748 as in the case of the Paschal Lamb. 3, the preservation of the cross figure as seen in the Khan sacrifice, and, 4, the evident imitation of human sacrifice in the posture of the victim. 749 Seeing, further, that only a portion of the pig thus sacrificed was eaten, and that only by, the priests and other sacred persons who were privileged to eat of the sacrifices, the remainder being left on the God's altar till it decomposed. We may fairly surmise that it was a surrogate for a sacrificed human being, formerly eaten as a sacrament in the Aztec fashion. Among the natives of South Nigeria who practiced human sacrifice and ritual cannibalism down till the beginning of the 20th century, we again find the use of the cross figure. The victims sacrificed for rain were stretched on a rude scaffolding in the form of the St. Andrew's cross, and goats, as we have seen, were similarly trussed. Crucifixion, of a kind, as we have seen, was practiced at Benin, and the term is frequently used by eyewitnesses in describing the treatment of victims. 750 The usual form of sacrifice, says Galway, is crucifixion. 751 Yet again, some of the women slaves sacrificed, at the approach of the punitive expedition to Benin, had the abdominal wall cut in the form of a cross. There are traces, too, of leg breaking, one goat being found by the punitive expedition at Benin with its legs broken, as a native explained, to prevent white man coming. 752 And Burton tells of a victim whose legs had been broken at mid-shin with awful violence. 
753 he also records that, a slave bound for the other world is always plied with a bottle of rum before the fatal cord is made fast. 754 in Uganda the usage of limb breaking is found to have been common. The god Katimba or Katinda of Damba and elsewhere was represented by a crocodile, his priest, and to appease him men were sacrificed to the crocodiles in the lake. The victim was taken to the brink, where his knees and elbows were broken, so that he could not crawl away, 755 whereafter the crocodiles came and devoured him. 756 here the primary motive is unusually clear. And it is noted that in the case of the victims thrown alive into the pit grave of the chief among some tribes there is no limb breaking, they being unable to escape. 757 It is not impossible that limb breaking originated in this simple fashion, and later became a ritual usage with an ethical connotation. But among the Menyima of the same African region, on the other hand, we find that at the burial of a chief ten women victims had their legs and arms broken at the knees and elbows and were thrown into the grave. The king's dead body, wrapped in bark cloth, was laid upon theirs, and then ten men victims were similarly treated, and their bodies laid over the king's. 758 Thus the idea of simulated willingness cannot be confidently excluded from even the most primitive phenomena. The main reason for doubt is the fact that in ordinary burial the limbs of the dead are by the same peoples broken at the elbows and knees to admit of their being placed in a sitting posture 759, a practice which, however, is ascribed to certain of the North American Indian tribes 760 without any mention of limb breaking being resorted to. And in the sacrifices of slaves at the death of chiefs, as practiced in the Sandwich Islands when they were visited by Captain Cook, the victims were clubbed suddenly, having not the most distant intimation of their fate. 761 Here the exclusion of willingness is so complete that we are led to infer a late and, so to speak, debased form of the rite. Yet again, there is a solitary testimony that in the human sacrifices offered by the Algonquins at the beginning of the hunting season it was a rule that not a bone of the victim must be broken. 762 Seeing that other Native Americans observed the principle of the Semites, that at the sacrificial feast the victim must be all eaten, and nothing left. 763 There would thus seem to be not merely an ancient racial affinity between the Aborigines of America and some race or races of Asia, but a direct heredity in the matter of special primitive rites. But even if we waive the latter presumption, we can infer the probable line of movement all round in the matter of the usages under notice. As thus. 1. Originally a willing victim is desiderate. And willingness is secured by the bribe of a period of ease and license. 2. This kind of victim becoming hard to procure, 1. Bought with a price, was substituted, as representing a voluntary offering by his owner or owners. 3. Still seeking the semblance of a willing sacrifice, the sacrificers first broke the limbs of the human victim. For the feeling, on some reformers urging, that such a mangled victim was an unseemly sacrifice, they resorted to narcotics. 5. At a higher stage of social evolution, recoiling from the sacrifice of an innocent victim, men fall back upon condemned criminals, and these in turn are stupefied, from humane or other motives. 6. Being next persuaded that the stupefied victim was either an unseemly or an inefficacious because non-suffering sacrifice, or being on other grounds inclined to abandon human sacrifice, they substituted the old sacrifice of an animal. Giving it in certain cases human attributes, and in others some of the privileges formerly accorded to the taboo human victim. In the case of the animal it was not as a rule felt necessary either to break bones or to use narcotics, though either plan might be used. But reformers would stress the avoidance of bone-breaking by way of showing the superiority of the new sacrifice, hence the need for a veto on imitations of the old practice. 764. Such an evolution might conceivably take place independently in different communities. It is true indeed that in the redemptory sacrifices offered by modern Semites for boys, care is taken not to break a bone, because they fear that if a bone of the sacrifice should be broken, the child's bones would be broken too. 765 But that appears to be a theory framed subsequent to and not antecedent to a reform. 
It is of the nature of such reforms, however, to be introduced with difficulty and to be rebelled against and reverted from. And even without the above cited evidence of a slowly wrought transformation in Hebrew usage, it is certain, from the whole drift of religious history, that the practice of child slaying, which was systematically legislated against only after the exile, would be revived in times of trouble by Jews, as we know it to have been by Carthaginians. It is through reversions of this kind to old and terrible rites, then, that we must suppose the ancient mode of sacrifice to have been kept in men's knowledge. Such a doctrine rested on the most obvious and therefore the most fully developed side of the conception of sacrifice, the offering to the God of a peculiarly precious gift, representing a maximum of self-deprivation in the sacrificers. Meanwhile, though it is not certain that the mode of hanging before the Lord by the wrists ever placed the victim in the form of a cross, as has been done in our own time at Benin, it would appear that the rite of the Passover was closely associated with the cross sign. 766 That is the mark specified in Ezekiel 767 for the saving of the elect from a general massacre. And the blood mark placed on the doorposts and lintels at the Passover 768 is inferentially the same 769 as is the seal on the foreheads of the saved in the Apocalypse. To this day, the Arabs make the tau mark with sacrificial blood on at least one Muslim shrine. 770 In any case, the pre-Christian use of the cross as a symbol of the sun god and as a sign of immortal life is undisputed. And we shall see reason to infer that the form of slaying represented in the Christian crucifix, which does not appear in Christian art till about the 7th century 771, was conceived from certain rites in which the initiate extended his arms upon a tree or cross. 772 Probably in reminiscence of some such mode of treating the sacrificed victim as we have seen described in the case of the Khans. 9. Specific Survivals in Judaism Apart from definite revivals, the memory of human sacrifice is clearly stamped not only on the Passover but on the two other typical sacrificial feasts of the Jews, the indeterminate sacrifice of the red heifer. Loosely said to have been performed only eight times since Moses, and the annual sacrifice of a scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. In the case of the former, which was prescribed to take place on the Mount of Olives, the high priest, his eldest son, and the Messiah Mochama, the deputy high priest anointed for war, were all three anointed with holy oil. The mark of a cross being made with it on their foreheads. But further, in one of the two Talmudic accounts, in anticipation of the performance of the rite, a pregnant woman was brought into one of the chambers of the temple, which was set apart for the purpose, and kept there till her child was born. The child so born was brought up within the sacred precincts, and protected from any chance of incurring ceremonial pollution. When the time for the rite arrived, this child was seated on a wooden litter borne by bullocks, and conducted to the fountain of Siloa. There the child descended, and drew water from the spring in an earthen vessel, bearing which, he was reconducted, as he came, to the temple. 773 But by another account, pregnant women, were brought to Jerusalem, and placed in courts built on the rock, with an excavation underneath. And they and their children were there kept, for the use of the red heifer, 774 till the children were seven or eight years old, when they ceased to be held ceremonially pure. Here it becomes fairly clear that a regular supply of children victims had anciently been provided for sacrifice, and that the heifer was the child's representative. Some trace of the knowledge is preserved in the Talmud, in the dubiously significant saying that, as the red heifer atones for sin so also does the death of the righteous atone for sin. 775 Being sacrificed with her face to the south and her head to the west, 776 The heifer was presumably dedicated either to the setting or winter sun or to the moon goddess. 777 By an equally clear clue in the ritual, we can reach the original character of the sacrifice of the scapegoat, which in its official form is clearly post-exilic. 778 In the preparation for that, the high priest was removed from his own house to the council chamber seven days in advance, and at the same time a sagan or deputy was appointed who should take his place in case of his being incapacitated. On the night before the day of sacrifice he was not allowed to eat meat, or to sleep, being watched by the younger priests. At that stage, 
the elders of the great Sanhedrin handed him over to the seniors of the priestly order, who escorted him to the upper chamber of the house of Abtanes, 779 and there they swore him in, and, after bidding him farewell, departed. In administering the oath, they said, My lord high priest, we are ambassadors of the Sanhedrin, thou art ambassador of the Sanhedrin, and our ambassador also. We adjure thee, by him who causes his name to dwell in this house, that thou deviate not from anything we have rehearsed to thee. Then they parted company, both he and they weeping. 780 An absurd Talmudic explanation is given for the weeping, he wept because they suspected he was a Sadducee, and they wept because the penalty or false suspicion is scourging. 781 Whatever may have been the historical fact concealed by the last phrase, it is sufficiently clear that the rite was originally one of human sacrifice in which either the priest or his deputy, the Sagan or Sagan, was put to death as ambassador of the people to the god or gods, 782 that is, as scapegoat for their sins. And in this Sagan we probably have the true interpretation of the grace-eyes term Zogain 783 applied to the mock victim of the Sasiya. He was simply the deputy 784 of the originally due victim, the priest, who must thus have solved his personal problem at a very early date. 785. In all likelihood the Hebrews had practiced some form of this rite long before the captivity. And as regards the later practice we have a significant Talmudic clue, in the saying of Rabbi Eliezer that it is lawful to slay an Amharetz, one, ignorant of the law, rustic, pagan, on the Day of Atonement, even, when it falls on a Sabbath. There were discussions on the point, and it is explained that the victim must not be slain with a knife, as, that would necessitate a formal benediction, but to kill him by tearing his nostrils open no benediction is required. Another rabbi chimes in that, Rabbi Yachanan has said that it is lawful to split up the Amharets like a fish, and that from the neck too, adds yet another point 786 the date explains the proposition. Whether as a regular and sanctioned or as a sporadic practice, the sacrifice of a human victim on the Day of Atonement had in all likelihood been practiced at or near Jerusalem both before and after the return from the captivity. 787. The modified sacrifice of the scapegoat, then, was but another variant of the primordial principle of human sacrifice or sin offering for the good of the people, and is in many respects the complement of the Passover. The Passover victim was set apart on the tenth day of the civil new year, which dated from spring, the day of atonement was the tenth day from the ecclesiastical new year, which, as we have seen, began in autumn. It is probable that the latter is the older of the two, but both hold their ground in reference to the sun's progress, the spring festival standing for his youth and waxing period, the autumn for his maturity and waning. That they had a common principle in the sacrifice of a pure victim appears from the detail that in both cases the victim before sacrifice is put in an upper chamber. The idea being to provide that no contamination should arise from a grave beneath. 788 and both festivals, it is to be noted, could be celebrated apart from the temple, the Passover being a domestic as well as a temple feast, and the Day of Atonement being celebrated in Babylon as well as at Jerusalem. 789. It is important to note this circumstance in view of the theoretic universalism of the traditional rite of sacrifice, which even the Khans declared to be for mankind, and on which the Gentilising Christians founded their gospel. Jewish sacrifices were strictly national, but in their later contacts with other races they were constantly being attracted towards more cosmopolitan ideals. 790 It sufficed that they had as basis the communal idea, and that it was capable of development on popular lines. In the legend of the slaying of Saul's seven sons they preserved the belief, seen in force among the Moabites, and at the same time in Israel 791, that a king's son, offered up by and for his father, was an irresistibly potent sacrifice. And among some sections of the Semitic race, as we have seen, there was current the myth preserved by Eusebius from Philo of Byblos, that Kronos, whom the Phoenicians call Israel, adorned his son called Yud, the only, with emblems of royalty, and sacrificed him. The actuality of such a belief among the Phoenicians is proved by the story of Malius crucifying his only son, crowned and robed in purple, before the walls of Carthage, in order to conquer the city. 792 he was fulfilling an August rite. 
always it is a typically divine or racial father, Kronos, Israel, Abraham, who figures in the myths of sun sacrifice. 793 And when it is remembered that the god name Tammuz signified in its original Akkadian form, the son of life, and was by the Semites interpreted to mean, the offspring, or, only son, 794 We are led to conclude that this conception, bound up with that of the god's death and resurrection, had a general and strong hold on both non Semitic and Semitic races. For a Hebrew cult of the dying and re arising Tammuz was in the period before the exile carried on in the very temple of Yahweh. 795. 10. The Pre Christian Jesus God. We are thus prepared to interpret the crux set up for Christian commentators by the ancient reading, Jesus Barabbas, in Matt, 27, 16, 17. That this was long the accepted reading in the ancient church is to be gathered from Origen, 796 and the problem has always been reckoned a puzzling one. Had Dar. Fraser noted it, he might have seen cause to look deeper for his solution of the problem of the simple name Barabbas in the Gospel story and in Philo. The natural inference from the Barabbas story is that it was customary to give up to the people about the time of the Passover a prisoner, who was made to play a part in some rite under the name of Barabbas, son of the father. And the reading, Jesus Barabbas, suggests that the full name of the bearer of the part included that of, Jesus, a detail very likely to be suppressed by copyists as an error. Is not the proper presumption, then, this? that the preservation of the name, Jesus Barabbas, tells of the common association of those names in some such rite as must be held to underlie the gospel myth, that, in short, a, Jesus the Son of the Father, was a figure in an old Semitic ritual of sacrifice before the Christian era. The Syrian form of the name, Yeschu, closely resembles the Hebrew name Yishak, which we read Isaac, and that Isaac was an earlier myth sacrificed by his father is a fair presumption. We have here the inferable norm of an ancient god sacrifice, Abraham's original godhood being tolerably certain, like that of Israel. 797 In Arab legend, Ishmael is sacrificed by his father, though apparently the sacrifice is commuted for a ram in the manner of the story in Genesis.798. As a hypothesis the proposed solution must for the present stand. But the grounds for surmising a pre-Christian cult of a Jesus or Joshua may here be noted. The first is the fact that the Joshua, Jesus, of the book so named is quite certainly unhistorical 799 and that the narrative concerning him is a late fabrication. We can but divine from it that, having several attributes of the sun god 800 he is like Samson Moses an ancient deity, latterly reduced to human status. And as Jewish tradition has it that he began his work of deliverance on the day fixed for the choosing of the Paschal Lamb, and concluded it at the Passover, 801 it is inferable that his name was anciently associated with the rite and the symbol. As well as with the similarly significant rite of circumcision, which is connected with the Passover in the pseudo-history of Joshua. 802 That he, who is never mentioned by the psalmists or prophets, should not only be put on a level with Moses as an institutor of the prime ordinances of the Passover rite and circumcision, but should be credited with the miracle of staying the course of the sun and moon, a prodigy beyond any ascribed to Moses, is not to be explained save on the view that he held divine status in the previous myth. 803 As his name was held in special reverence among the Samaritans, who preserved a late book ascribing to him many feats not given in the Jewish record, the probability is that he was an Ephraimite deity, analogous to Joseph, whose legend has such close resemblances to the myth of Tammuz Adonis. No less clear is the inference from the pseudo-prediction inserted in a list of priestly vetoes in the book of Exodus. 804 It is there promised that an angel, in or on whom is the name of Yahweh, shall lead Israel to triumph against the Amorites, the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. This is the very list, lacking one, put in Joshua's mouth as that of the conquests effected by the Lord through him, 805 so that he is pseudo-historically identified with the promised angel. 806 That personage, again, in virtue of his possession of the magical, name, 807 is in the Talmud identified with the mystic Metatron, who is in turn identifiable with the Logos. 
808 Thus the name Joshua equals Jesus is already in the Pentateuch associated with the conceptions of Logos, Son of God, and Messiah, and it is in view of such knowledge that the pseudo-prediction is framed. Only the hypothesis that in some Palestinian quarters Joshua had the status of a deity can meet the case. To the nature of that status we have certain clues which have never been considered in correlation, Jews and Christians alike being led by their presuppositions either to ignore or to misconceive them. One clue is, as already noted, the evidently Judaic and pre-Christian character of the Lamb God Jesus in the Apocalypse. The slain God is there identified not only with the Logos, 809 before the appearance of the fourth Gospel, and with the Mithraic or Babylonian symbols of the seven spirits, but with the Alpha and the Omega. And the accessories are markedly Semitic and Judaistic. Thus the four and twenty elders play a foremost part, the twelve apostles are present only in an interpolation, 810 and the saved are preeminently Jewish. 811 Not only, in short, is the child God of the dragon story, in the twelfth chapter, not the Christian Jesus, 812 The Jesus of the whole book is pre-Christian, the book being in fact a Jewish apocalypse slightly edited for Christian purposes. 813 So much is now admitted by many students, and it is the failure to learn this and other lessons of the documents that still permits of wrong hypotheses to account for the Messianic doctrine in the Book of Enoch, a distinctly pre-Christian work. 814 But the same problem arises in connection with that crucial document, the teaching of the Twelve Apostles. Not only are the first six chapters of that book wholly Judaic, without mention of any divinity save, God, the Lord, the Father, unless, the Spirit, be taken to stand for a second deity. But even the formula of baptism in the seventh chapter, which belongs to a secondary stratum in the compilation, is not clearly Christian, and the Eucharistic formula in the ninth is clearly non-Christian. It runs, We thank Thee, our Father, for the holy vine of David Thy servant, which Thou hast made known to us by Jesus Thy servant, 815 An expression quite irreconcilable with the accepted Christian narrative and liturgy. Nor is there a single allusion in the entire document, whether in the late or the early portions, to the death of Jesus by crucifixion or otherwise. Thus it appears that not only was the nucleus of the document a teaching of twelve monotheistic Jewish apostles, the apostles of the high priest to the dispersion 816, but even the earlier Jesuist editions were made by Judaic Jesuists who had not the Christian doctrine of a divine sacrifice. Whether or not they already had the Trinitarian doctrine set forth in the baptismal formula of the seventh chapter. Thus the allusion to the Gospel of the Lord in the eighth chapter is presumptively an interpolation, occurring as it does in a document in which hitherto the Lord had always meant Yahweh. And even at that, the reference is presumptively to the inferred primary form of the first gospel, which had no account of the crucifixion and resurrection 817, a gospel, in short. Which had grown up solely by way of sayings and doings ascribed to the mythical Jesus, without the existing birth legend, and without his twelve apostles. Here again the theological critics recognized the Judaic character of the matter, 818 but failed to draw the obvious inferences. There remains to be considered in the same connection the fact that in the Jewish liturgy for the ecclesiastical new year there is or was mention of Joshua, Jeshu equals Jesus, as, the Prince of the Presence. 819 This is of course interpreted as a title signifying Joshua's relation to Moses, but in the light of the Apocalypse it seems to have quite another significance. After the deletions effected in the pseudo-history, 820 The matter is sufficiently obscure, but the clues left, when colligated, tell of something very different from the written word. Tentatively, we may surmise that as the Day of Atonement, which comes ten days after the New Year, is the consummation of the annual Day of Judgment 821 Joshua in the liturgy played very much the same part as the Judaic Jesus in the Apocalypse. Finally, we have to note, a, the remarkable Persian tradition which makes Joshua the son of Miriam 822 whose death day in the Jewish calendar is that of the beginning of his work, the tenth of Nisan, whereon was chosen the Paschal Lamb. And, b, the fact that according to some Jews the week of the sun, circumcision and redemption of the firstborn male child, was called the rite of, Jesus the Son.
823 Whether or not we have here the true origination of the myth which makes the Gospel Jesus the son of Miriam, there is a fair presumption from mythological analogy that the Miriam of the Pentateuch, who dies and is buried at Kadesh. 824 The holy city is a goddess ephemerized 825 and that the day of Joshua's setting out on his fictitious march was in the original myth the day either of his birth or of some act of popular salvation wrought by him. If he were originally a variant of Tammuz, and Miriam a variant of Ishtar, if male infants were circumcised in his honor, and if he died to save men at the Passover. The details to that effect would certainly be excluded by the later Yahwists from any narrative they preserved or framed concerning him. As it is, we may at least argue for a connection between the Judaic Jesus the Son and the traditional Jesus the Son of the Father. Beyond conjectures we cannot at present go. But the significance given to the name of Jeshua, the High Priest of the Return, in the book of Zechariah, 826 at a time when the book of Joshua did not exist, tells of a messianic idea so associated when messianism was but beginning among the Jews. And as the messianic idea seems to have come to them, as it fittingly might, during their exile. Perhaps from the old Babylonian source of the myth of the returning Hammurabi, who in his own code declares himself the Savior Shepherd and the King of Righteousness 827, or from the later Mazdean doctrine that the Savior Seoshiant, the yet unborn son of Zarathustra, is at the end of time to raise the dead and destroy Araman 828 it may have had many divine associations such as later Orthodox Judaism would sedulously obliterate. What is specially important in this connection is the fact that the doctrine of a suffering Messiah gradually developed among the Jews, for the most part outside the canonical literature. For the doctrine that, the Christ must needs have suffered, 829 can be scripturally supported only from passages like the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, where our A.V. alters the past tense into the present, thus making a description of Israel's past suffering serve as a mystic type. Cyrus, who is called Messiah in Deutero Isaiah, was reputed to have been crucified, but not in his messianic capacity. 830 The presumption then is that the doctrine was extra-canonical, and was set up by Gentile example. Even in the book of Enoch, where the messianic doctrine is much developed, the Messiah does not suffer. The first clear trace of that conception in Judaic literature appears to be in the doctrine that of the two promised messiahs, 831 Ben Joseph and Ben David, Ben Joseph is to be slain. 832 Whence came that theorem it is for the present impossible to say, but it is presumptively foreign, 833 and there are clear Gentile parallels. An obvious precedent to begin with lay in the Greek myth of the crucified Prometheus. 834 But on the whole the most likely pagan prototype is to be seen in the slain and resurgent Dionysus, one of whose chief names is Eleutherios, the Liberator, 835 who was specially signalized as the God, born again. As the Jewish Messiah was to be primarily a, Deliverer, like the series of legendary national heroes in the Book of Judges, a popular God so entitled was most likely to impress the imagination of the dispersed Jews and their proselytes. The same epithet, indeed, may well have attached to ancient deities such as Samson, who is a variant of the deliverer Heracles, and was one of the deliverers of the pseudo history. As well as to the original Jesus, whose myth is evemorized in Joshua. Samson, too, like Dionysus, was only begotten 836, but in any case, a proximate motive is needed to account for the post exilic or post Maccabean revival of such conceptions in a cult form. And it is to be found in the prevailing religious conceptions of the surrounding Hellenistic civilization where, next to Zeus, the gods most in evidence were Dionysus and Heracles, and the sun-sacrificing Kronos.837. 11. Private Jewish Eucharists. There arises thus the further presumption that such a cult as we are tracing may have flourished in a Jewish community elsewhere than in Jerusalem. Dar. Fraser, in surmising a celebration of Purim with a real victim at Jerusalem, does not take account of the fact that the bulk of the Jews deported to Babylon had remained and flourished there, many remaining Yahwists. That there then began the institution of the synagogue, permissible to any group of Jews in any place, and that wherever in the East there was a Jewish synagogue outside of Judea there was an opening for usages not recognized at Jerusalem. 
but the existence of many such synagogues is clearly an important condition of the problem. And precisely because there were no regular sacrificial rites, apart from the Passover, for expatriated Jews, there is a likelihood that among them in particular would revive rites of sacrifice and sacrament which had a great tradition behind them. But were not latterly practiced at the temple. This craving for a sacrifice in which they could participate is the special note of the epistle to the Hebrews. And indeed the habit and doctrine of sacrifice were far too deeply rooted to permit of a contented submission of all the myriads of scattered Jews to a complete deprivation of the practice. 838. Significantly enough, the most notable sacrificial survival among the race in modern times is one that demonstrably preserves the principle of human sacrifice, that, namely, of the Kaparath, atonements. The slaying of a white cock on the eve of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. 839 One Jewish convert to Christianity, Chaim Isaacs, puts it that, the more self-righteous Jews, provide a cock, which is slain by an inferior rabbi, whereafter the sacrificers swing it nine times over their heads. Praying to God that the sins of the year may enter into the fowl. It is not strictly a scapegoat, for it is given to the poor to eat. As to the self-righteousness involved, Isaacs admitted that while he remained in the old faith he set great store by the procedure, and thought he was justified. 840 Theologically he was. It is not disputed that the Hebrew word jever stands for both a cock and a man. 841 Another Jewish convert, Herzhan, describing the custom, and noting the eagerness with which white cocks are bought by Jews on the eve of Yom Kippur, declares that it is still in vogue amongst those who pride themselves upon their orthodoxy. And decides that it is one of many relics of Oriental paganism which the Jews brought from the banks of the Euphrates, from the land of their exile, the fatherland of rabbinic faith and worship. 842 It has been strictly preserved in the interim. In an English account of the rite as practiced among the Jews of Barbary in the 17th century, it is noted that the sacrifice came after the reading of the ancient confession held to be made by the high priest in sacrificing the scapegoat. The narrator continues. Since the destruction of their city, the Jews have no place for a proper sacrifice. And therefore, instead thereof, when they come from the synagogue, every father of a family takes a cock, a white one if possible, upon the ninth day of the feast, and, calling his household about him, repeats several sentences of scripture. Among which the principal are the seventeen ver. Of Psalm 107, and twenty-three ver. Of Job 13, thirty-three. After the repetition of these scriptures, he waves the cock three times 843 about his head. At each of which he useth these or the like words, Let this cock be a commutation for me, let it be my substitute, let it be an expiation for me, let the bird die. But let life and happiness be to me and all Israel. Amen. Then he again swings the cock thrice about his head, once for himself, once for his sons, and once for the strangers that are with him. Then he kills the cock and saith. I have deserved thus to die. The woman takes a hen, and does the like for those of her sex. In Barbary, where the houses are flat-roofed, they cast the garbage thereon, to be devoured by some ravenous birds. In token that their sins are removed as the entrails they cast out. Now the reason why they choose a cock for the expiatory is drawn from the ambiguous word in the Talmud. Which may signify either man or cock. So that they repute the death of a cock as much as that of a man, and to this domestic bird the 53 of Essay, 844 with many other passages of holy writ. Are profanely and ridiculously applied, when they have done with the cock they repair to the sepulchres, where they repeat, their prayers and confessions. They bestow the value of their cocks upon the poor. To whom formerly they gave their carcasses, which they now keep to furnish out their own tables. 845. This differs from the recent accounts only in respect of the eating of the sacrifice by the sacrificers in person, a closer adherence to the fundamental principle. In no case, however, is there any obscurity as to that. I have seen in recent years an illustrated postcard, made for the use of German Jews, whereon is represented a Jew in hat and long coat, holding a white cock, and standing before a table with a book on it. 
while below is the Hebrew text, Job 33, 24, deliver him from going down to the pit, I have found a ransom. With the addition, may you be inscribed for a prosperous year, and afterwards, in German, the greeting, hearty good wishes for the new year. Two other details complete the identification. 1. The sacrificer, holding with his right hand the tied legs of the bird, with his left hand on its head coaxes it to keep it quiet. 846. The old effort to secure the willing victim. 2. The procedure includes a ransom for the kaparath, that is, a ransom for the ransom. 847. A principle familiar to the student of ancient sacrifice. 848. Here the substitution of a lesser for a human sacrifice is almost undisguised, after 2000 years. A remarkable parallel to the Jewish practice is found at the present day among many of the peoples of the Congo and other regions of Western Africa. Between Isangela and Manyanga, writes Sir H. H. Johnston, there are many eunuchs in the large villages, who seem to be attached to a vague phallic worship with which is intricately connected a reverence for the moon. When the new moon appears, dances are performed by the eunuchs, who sacrifice a white fowl, which must always be male, in its honor. The bird is thrown up into the air and torn to pieces as it falls to the earth. I was told that in former days a human victim was offered up on these occasions, but that in later times a white fowl had been substituted. 849. The question here arises why black races should make white fowls or animal surrogates for men, and an Asiatic origin for the practice suggests itself. That it is, however, also an ancient if not a primary savage practice appears to follow from the frequency of sacrifices of white fowls among the Nigerians and other tribes. The Krus, Intas, Dahomeans, Ibis, Egeras, and the literal inhabitants of Cameroons, Bani, Calabar, Fernando Pa, all mark the season of planting their yams and grain by a religious ritual and a festive meeting of all the tribe. With the exception of the Ashantis, and perhaps the ibis and egeris, the ceremony is untainted by human blood. The offerings being goats, sheep, and white fowls, portions of which, after being roasted, are laid together with palm wine as oblations before the idols, this done, they continue the entertainment for several days. 850. What is here inferential becomes quite explicit in the religious folklore of the Malays, whose wizards invoke the ancestor spirits to inform them in a dream what sacrifices are required at a given juncture. Whereafter, whatever sacrifice is asked for must of course be given, with the exception of a human sacrifice, which, as it is expressly stated, may be compounded by the sacrifice of a fowl. 851 And there are several reasons for supposing that the rite is Eastern and not African in origin. A special reason is its connection, as noted by Sir H. Johnston, with the reverence for the moon. As he and other writers also note, worship of the heavenly bodies is very uncommon among the African tribes. As a rule the West African apparently pays no attention to the sun, moon, and stars, though not uncommonly his principal deity is the general controller of the firmament, a Jupiter or sky god in fact. 852 I have never encountered, says Sir Harry, a race of purely Negro blood that took much interest in the stars, 853 and again, I have never yet encountered a purely Negro race that attributed divinity to the sun. 854 Now, the Hebrew and other Semitic records go to show that sun worship and moon worship evolved together among the Semites. And the inference from the data before us is that it was from Semitic contacts that some of the Negro races in antiquity acquired those cults, and the correlative sacrifice of the white fowl. Other traces of the connection we find among the ancient Greeks. At Methana in Treason Pausanias saw two men tear a white cock in halves 855 and run round the vines in opposite directions, each carrying a half. When they met they buried the parts together. The purpose was to avert the evil wind called lips, which dried up the young shoots of the vines. 856 The Methanian cock, says Miss Harrison, is a typical sigma phi gamma iota omicron new, thing slaughtered, it is carried round for purification, it is really of the order of pharmacos ceremonies rather than a sacrifice proper. For a sigma phi gamma iota omicron new we should expect the cock to be black, but on the principle of sympathetic magic it is in this case white. 
The normal sacrifice to a wind was a black animal, winds were underworld gods, 857 but they were certainly sacrificed to. And it has been argued that the sacrifice of Iphigenia was, in the words of Aeschylus, a sacrifice to stay the winds. 858 In any case, the word sigma phi gamma iota omicron nu is always used of human victims and of such animals as were in use as surrogates. The term is applied to all the famous maiden sacrifices of mythology as a sigma phi gamma iota omicron nu polyxena is slain on the tomb of Achilles. 859 So that we come back once more to the white cock as a substitute for a human victim. And as the winds were either gods or genii, it was strictly a sacrifice. Again, among the Dravidian Gesias of Mirzapur, the most degraded of the Dravidian tribes, after a man's death his son sacrifices a white fowl as the recipient of his father's spirit, or otherwise as placating him. 860 And a white cock is a common sacrifice to the sun god among other tribes of the same race. 861 On that view, the surrogate cock sacrifice is probably ancient among the Semites. 862 And the late continuance of human sacrifice was with the Hebrews as with other races a result of the pressures of perturbing calamity on the one hand, and a ritual survival on the other. On any view, it is not to be supposed that in the age of sacrificial worship the dispersed Jews, craving for its usages, would abstain from other private rituals of a sacrificial and Eucharistic kind. It is a rabbinical doctrine that, so long as the temple existed the altar made atonement for Israel, but now it is a man's table that makes atonement for him. 863, table, is interpreted to mean, hospitality, an unplausible gloss. It would certainly be understood by most Jews of the sacrificial age to mean individual rites of a quasi-sacrificial kind, and the principle would hold for exiled Jews before the fall of the temple. By reviving such mysteries, those of the dispersion could in a measure compensate themselves for their exclusion from the orthodox sacrifices, which were a monopoly of the holy city. And when we find the later Christists practicing rites closely analogous to those of pagan deities such as Mitra and Dionysus, we cannot well doubt that Jews in the large eastern cities would be at times inclined to resort to mysteries of sacrament sacrifice for which they had a precedent in their own traditions. The story of the Carabas episode at Alexandria, in fact, is an item of positive evidence not yet matched by any in regard to Jerusalem. Unless it be the story to the effect that Antiochus Epiphanes found in the temple at Jerusalem a Greek captive who was to be sacrificed and sacramentally eaten. 864 In view of all the clues, notably that of the rabbinical saying as to the lawfulness of slaying a pagan rustic on the Day of Atonement, 865 We cannot pronounce that story incredible. And the retort of Josephus, that one victim could not supply a meal to the multitude of worshippers, is at once disposed of by the principle that sin offerings were too holy to be eaten except by the priests. 866 Nor can we quite confidently reject the theorem of Gilani, that there was an element of actual ritual cannibalism in the paschal meal of the Jews in the pre-exilic period, though the proof is incomplete. 867 It suffices, however, to note that when revived rites of sacrament were seen to flourish among the dispersion, there would be a tendency at Jerusalem to recognize them for economic reasons. The more we study the history of Judaism, the more clearly we realize that it was never immune from change, never long a triumphant fixed cult realizing the ideal of its sacred books. Even in the immediate sphere of the temple itself, then, revived or innovating rites could make their way. Such an acceptance would require only one condition, that the innovating rites were professedly Yahwistic. In the exilic period there had been many resorts to unclean sacraments, such as the mystical eating of dogs, mice, and swine, 868 men desperately seeking help from alien rites when their own god had wholly failed to help them. And our ablest Hebraist, while noting that, the causes which produced a resuscitation of obsolete mysteries among the Jews were at work at the same period among all the northern Semites. Decides that the rites in question, mark the first appearance in Semitic history of the tendency to found religious societies on voluntary association and mystic initiation, instead of natural kinship and nationality. 869 Whatever may have been the origins, it suffices that the alleged, first appearance, was not the last. However the tendency may have been held in check at Jerusalem, 
it cannot have been equally repressed among the dispersed Jews, who saw all around them attractive mystical cults emanating from their own Semitic kindred. And who had in their own sacred books pretexts enough for clean sacraments in honor of Yahweh. For in all the Orthodox sacrifices, it is to be remembered, an eating and drinking with the deity, a sitting at his table as his guest, even as one would sit at a great banquet, was the essential notion. The ideal for the laity as well as the priesthood. 870 It would be strange indeed if the dispersed myriads wholly renounced such an experience. The law permitted at the Temple of Jerusalem private as well as public sacrifices of all kinds. And in the case of the peace or thank offerings, only the fat was burned on the altar, while the flesh was used by the owner of the sacrifice himself as material for a jocund sacrificial feast. 871 And, as was only natural, it was the numerous private offerings of so many different kinds that constituted the bulk of the sacrifices. Their number was in fact so vast as to be well nigh inconceivable. 872 That is to say, the private proclivity to sacrifice was the predominant religious factor. At a time, then, when movements of dissent and innovation and even of anticlericalism, 873 were being set up by a variety of forces, new and old. It is not to be supposed that the multitudes of Jews distributed through the Hellenistic world submitted passively to a monopoly which deprived them of most of the normal sensations of religion. The obscurest side of the problem, perhaps, is that of the weekly Eucharist, the Holy Supper, of bread and wine, which in the later Jesuist cult we find in such close connection with the sacrifice of the God. But in the earlier form of the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, does not appear to be so connected. Yet the very phenomenon of the teaching points to what we have other reasons for surmising, a weekly rite of old standing among the Jews of the dispersion. The Passover came but once a year. And any act of real or simulated human sacrifice would be no more frequent. Would the dispersed Jews then forego all such weekly rites as occurred among the Gentiles? If normally they abstained from drink offerings of blood presented to other gods, 874 had they no permissible libation. That there was a weekly Eucharist among the Mithraists is practically certain, the fathers who mentioned the Mithraic bread and wine or bread and water sacrament never speak of it as less frequent than the Christian. 875 and the Pauline allusion to the table of daimons, with its cup, implies that that was as habitual as the Christian rite, 876 which was certainly solemnist weekly in the early church. And that this weekly rite, again, is not originally Mithraic, but one of the ancient Asiatic usages which could reach the Jews either by way of Babylon or before the captivity, is to be inferred from the fact that the Brahmanic Upavasatha, the fast day previous to the sacrament of the Soma, occurred four times in each lunar month. 877 and was thus closely analogous to the Sabbath, which was originally a lunar feast. 878 As the Soma feast was connected with the worship of the moon, it would be a supper, on the night of the day before moon day, that is, on the night of the Sunday, which was clearly Lord's Day long before the Christian era. That the Sumerians or Akkadians, who had the seven-day week, were the source of the weekly bread and wine supper for both the Hindus and the Persians, seems the natural hypothesis. 879. 12. The Eucharist in Orthodox Judaism. That there were both Orthodox and Heterodox forms of a quasi-Mithraic bread and wine ritual among the Jews is to be gathered even from the sacred books. In the legend of the Exodus, Aaron and the elders of Israel eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God, 880, that is, twelve elders and the anointed one or Christos eat a bread sacrament with a presumptive ancient deity. Moses himself being such. And wine would not be wanting. In the so-called Song of Moses, which repudiates a hostile god, their rock in which they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices, and drank the wine of their drink offering, Yahweh also is called our rock. And in an obscure passage his wine seems to be extolled. 881 Even if the rock in such allusions were originally the actual tombstone or altar on which sacrifices were laid and libations poured, there would be no difficulty about making it into a god with whom the worshipper ate and drank. 882 And such an adaptation was as natural for Semites as for Arians. But there are clearer clues. Of the legend of Melchizedek, 
who gave to Abraham a sacramental meal of bread and wine, and who was king of peace and priest of El Elyon, 883 we know that it was a subject of both canonical 884 and extra-canonical tradition. He was fabled to have been, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God. 885 as the name meant king of righteousness, and El Elyon was a Phoenician deity, the legend that Abraham paid him tithes tells simply of one more extra Yahwistic cult among the Israelites. And the description cited must originally have applied to the Most High God Himself. Self-made was a title of the sun gods, 886 and king of righteousness a title of many gods, not to mention Hammurabi and Buddha, as well as of Yahweh and Jesus. 887 It is vain to ask whether the bread and wine ritual was connected directly with the solar worship 888 or with that of a king of peace who stood for the moon, or both moon and sun. But it suffices that an extra-Israelitish myth connected with such a ritual was cherished among the dispersed Jews of the Hellenistic period. And the use made of the story of Melchizedek by Justin Martyr 889 and Tertullian 890 as proving that a man could be a priest of the true God without being circumcised or observing the Jewish law, would certainly be made of it by earlier Jews of the more cosmopolitan sort. Further, the denunciations of the prophets against the drink offerings to other gods did not veto a Eucharist eaten and drunk in the name of Yahweh. Those denunciations to start with are a proof of the commonness of Eucharists among the Jews about the exilic period. Jeremiah tells of a usage, especially popular with women, of incense burnings and drink offerings to the Queen of Heaven. 891 This, as a nocturnal rite, would be a holy supper. And in the last chapters of the Deutero Isaiah 892 we have first a combined charge of child sacrifice and of unlawful drink offerings against the polytheistic Israelites, and again a denunciation of those who prepared a table for Gad, fortune. And that fill up mingled wine unto many. 893 Now, many, translated, destiny, is in all likelihood simply men the Asiatic moon god, who is virtually identified with Selim Min the moon goddess in the Orphic hymns, and like her was held to be twice exed. 894 In that case many is only another aspect of the Queen of Heaven, 895 The wine Eucharist being, as before remarked, a lunar rite. Whether or not this Deus Lunas was then, as later, identified with Mitra, we cannot divine. It suffices that the sacrament in question was extremely widespread. Point 896. The allusion to the mingled wine apparently implies an objection such as we know existed in Greece to any dilution of the wine devoted to the wine god. There the practice was to keep unmixed the cup to the good deity, Agathos Daimon, Dionysus, 897 but to mix with water that which was drunk to Zeus the Savior, he being the rain-giver. 898 In the worship of Yahweh, whether or not he were originally a variant of Dionysus 899 the priests would naturally stipulate for a drink offering of unmixed wine, since in all likelihood they themselves consumed it. 900 though there is a suggestion in the code that it sweetened the burnt offering. 901 in Philo Judeus there is a passage which notably combines the idea of the virtue of unmixed wine with that of its mystical connection with human sacrifice, who then is the chief butler of God. The priest who offers libations to him, the truly great high priest who, having received a draft of everlasting graces, offers himself in return, pouring in an entire libation of unmixed wine. 902 Here, as so often elsewhere in Philo, the conception of sacrifice has become mystical, but his identification of the sacrifice with the Logos, which pours a portion of blood for the purposes of the bodily life. 903 In his comparison of the celestial food of the soul to manna, which the Logos divides in equal portions among all who are to use it, caring greatly for equality. 904 Tells of a more concrete interpretation of texts among the more normally religious. On the other hand, as Yahweh like Zeus was the rain-giver, and good sense vetoed much drinking of the strong unmixed wine, there was no solid reason why in the Hebrew cult also the wine should not be diluted. And in the Talmud we find the act in a measure prescribed 905 the practice of the Ebionites and the early Christians 906 being thus anticipated. In any case, we find the drink offering of wine expressly connected in one, apparently interpolated, 
section of the Priestly Code 907 with the Passover feast of firstfruits and the firstling lamb. And here it is stipulated that no bread shall be eaten till the oblation has been made. Thus both as an orthodoxy and as a heresy a holy supper of bread and wine in connection with a symbolic sacrifice of a firstling lamb was known among the pre-Christian Israelites. What bearing, finally, the practice may have had on the use of the sacred shewbread of the temple remains problematic, but that the shewbread stood for some quasi-sacramental meal is the only explanation we have of it. 908 Concerning the twelve cakes or loaves of fine flour which were placed every Sabbath day upon the holy table before the Lord, the code prescribed that it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place. For it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord. 909 A sacrament is implied in the description. And when we remember that the oxen sacrificed at the temple of Yahweh wore crowns and had their horns gilt 910 exactly like those sacrificed by the pagans. 911 We are entitled to doubt whether the temple priests did not in most other respects conform to common pagan practice. 912 Priestly sacramental banquets of flesh and cakes we know to have been usual in Rome. 913 Even on Judaic principles, however, the priests were likely to make of their sacred loaves, or a few of them, for they were large, a banquet for twelve. 914 According to Maimonides, the daily sacrifice required thirteen priests for its performance, 915 and on the principle that the bread and wine constituted a sacrifice, the presiding priest and twelve others would be the fit consumers. We know further that there was a dispute between the school of Shammai and that of Hillel as to the meal on the Sabbath eve, wherein wine was drunk, the Shammites holding that a blessing should first be asked on the day. The hill elites putting first the wine, which consecrated the day. 916 If, then, the loaves and the wine were eaten on the evening following the Sabbath, it would represent a pre-Christian bread and wine Eucharist or Holy Supper of thirteen priestly persons on the day of the sun. In this, as in all sacraments, the God mystically joined, and if the high priest presided there was in his person a Christos or anointed 1.917. Now, we know, 1, that the high priest officiated on the Sabbaths. 918, 2, that the retiring course of priests received six of the loaves and the incoming one the other six, 919 and, 3, that they were eaten stale, each Sabbath supply being consumed on the next Sabbath. 920 Here then was an apparent necessity for an eating of the sacred bread by the priests in the company of the high priest, as representing Aaron. And inasmuch as wine was forbidden to all during their period of service 921 there is an implication that they were free to drink it when the service was over 922, that is, on the Sabbath day, after the high priest had officiated. 923 Of course the number may not have been 12, it may have been 24, the number of the courses of the priests 924 and of the heavenly band of elders, in the Judeo-Christian Apocalypse. 925 and the bread may have been eaten not with wine but with water. Either way, at least, there was a sacrament very much on the later Christian lines. And this suffices for our theory, which does not require that we should find in the very temple a close Judaic precedent for the Christian weekly supper of bread and wine. Indeed, there is a presumption that it originated, as before suggested, outside of the immediate sphere of the temple priesthood. But the fact that there was a certain precedent in the priestly practice would be a point in favor of an outside rite, which might conceivably be specialized among the twelve apostles of the high priest. Whose official function is the real basis of the myth of the twelve apostles of Jesus. 926 Even this hypothesis, in turn, is not essential to our theory of sacramental evolution. It suffices that beyond all question there were many Gentile precedents for the Eucharist, and that its connection with the Lord's Day 927 was quite independent of the myth of the Lord's resurrection on the first day of the week. The rite being so fixed in both its solar and its lunar connection, which was implicit in the cults of Dionysus and Mitra, both of them two formed, and both combining the attributes of sun and moon. 928 And as the myth of the sacrifice of the God-man as king, and the kindred sacrament of the Lamb God, were derived through Judaic channels, there is a presumption that the habitual rites of the first Christists came in the same way. On that view it remains to trace further the Judaic evolution.
13. Special Features of the Crucifixion Myth Of the evolution of the Jewish religion between the closing of the Hebrew canon and the rise of Jesuism we know, broadly, that it consisted in, 1. The establishment of the doctrine of a future life. In despite of its complete absence from the Mosaic Law. 2. The development of the belief in a Messiah who should either restore the temporal power of Jewry or bring in a new religious world. 3. The growth of the idea of an only begotten Son of God, otherwise the Word, who is alternately the nation of Israel and a God who represents it, 929 and, 4. The growth of independent sects or movements, such as that of the Essenes. Of the historical circumstances we know more. They included, as we have seen, a recurrent paganization of portions of the priesthood, an interlude of absolute pagan domination. And finally, after a period of triumph for the traditional faith, the advent of an Idumean dynasty, far from zealous for Orthodox Judaism. During centuries of this evolution, the Jewish people tasted many times the bitterness of despair, the profound doubt denounced by the last of the prophets. And in periods in which many went openly over to Hellenism it could not be but that ancient rites of the Semitic race were revived, as some are declared to have been in earlier times of trouble. Among the rites of expiation and propitiation, as we have seen, none stood traditionally higher than the sacrifice of a king or a king's son. And such an act the Jews saw as it were performed for them when the Romans under Antony, at Herod's wish, scourged, crucified, lit. Bound to a stake, and beheaded Antigonus, the last of the Asmonian priest-kings, in the year 37 BC. 930 In a reign in which two king's sons were slain by their own father, the idea would not disappear. But in so far as it held its ground as a religious doctrine it would in all likelihood do so by being reduced to ritual form, like the leading worships of the surrounding Gentile world. In the case of nearly every god who mythically died and rose again, as Osiris, Dionysus, Attis, Adonis, and Mitra, the creed of the God's power to give immortal life was maintained by a ritual sacrament, generally developed into a mystery drama. Such a mystery drama, however, would be at bottom a perpetuation of the latest form of the primitive rite as it had been publicly performed. And as we have seen in the Gospel myth the clear trace of the ancient usage of disabling or drugging the victim to make him seem a willing sufferer. So we may infer from it that the latest public form of the human sacrifice in some Syrian communities was the sacrificing of three criminals together. Of a sacrifice of this special number the explanation may very well be the great and then growing vogue of the number three in Eastern mysticism. Among the Dravidians of India we have seen three victims sacrificed to the sun god. In the legendary sacrifice of Saul's sons there figured the sacred and planetary number seven, which appears also in the special, restoration feast, of the Hervey and other South Sea Islanders. 931 In the legendary sacrifice of the kings by Joshua we have the older planetary number, 5. And in Western as in Eastern Asia the number 3 might naturally have its votaries, in respect of Trinitarian concepts as well as of the primary notion of, the heavens, the earth, and the underworld, with their respective gods. 932 There is even a hint of such possible developments in the single sacrifice of the Khans to the earth goddess, wherein the victim was kept for three days bound to a post which was often placed between two shrubs. Before being finally sacrificed at a post around which were usually set up four larger posts. 933 But there is an explanation lying in the nature and purpose of the sacrifice, which was probably the determining cause of the detail in the Syrian rite. The tradition, we have seen, called for a king or a king's son. But a victim of royal blood was normally out of the question. And whether by consent of latitudinarian kings or high priests, or by way of simple popular license. The natural evolution would be that which took place in a similar connection elsewhere, the sacrificing of condemned criminals in the capacity of kings or kings' firstborn sons. But, as has been already remarked, Though this substitution was quite acceptable to the average mind, there was something repugnant to the higher doctrine of sacrifice in the selection of a criminal, who was morally the analogue of the blemished animal, rejected by nearly all sacrificial rituals. How then could the compulsion of such a choice be best reconciled with the purpose and spirit of the rite? 
by a device framed in the spirit of sympathetic magic, which was in fact the spirit of all such rites. The sacrificers could by their ritual of mock crowning and robing distinguish one of the malefactors from his fellows. And by calling the others what they were, while he was paraded as king, they would attain the semblance of a truly august sacrifice. If in any Jewish community, or in the Jewish quarter of any eastern city, the central figure in this rite were customarily called Jesus Barabbas. Jesus the Son of the Father, whether or not in virtue of an old cultus of a god Jesus who had died annually like Addis and Tammuz, we should have the basis for the tradition so long preserved in many MSS. Of the first gospel, and at the same time a basis for the whole gospel myth of the crucifixion. And when we remember how the common attitude towards criminals permitted the strange survival of human sacrifice in the Thargelia at Athens, we can hardly doubt that eastern cities could on the same pretext be as conservative of ancient usage. That such a victim should be at times chosen and freed in advance, and permitted a measure of sexual license as well as a semblance of royal state, is quite conceivable. The usage of a year's dedication or respite seems to have been general in connection with such sacrifices, alike among Asiatics, Greeks, Polynesians, Mexicans, and American Aborigines, we have seen it among Strabo's Albanians. And there are clear traces of it among the Arabs just before the time of Muhammad. 934 at an early stage of civilization, indulgence to a victim so situated would on many grounds be a matter of course. As we saw, indeed, Japan could secure annual victims who throughout their year of duty seem to have practiced rigid abstinence, as the non-sacrificed official does today, but in general such altruism must have been hard to secure. In the triennial sacrifice of a beautiful girl at Bani to the sea god, the victim had her every wish fulfilled, and everything she touched became her property. 935 and among the Native Americans a captive slain to appease the spirit of a slain man of the tribe had given to him the wives or sisters of the dead man, with whom he was allowed to live for a time. Then came a sacrificial banquet, after which he was put in durance and at length ritually slain 936 and eaten. 937. Perhaps the most suggestive instance of all is that of the Asvamita 938 or horse sacrifice among the ancient Hindus. 9.39 Concerning this the doctrine runs that kings who received from a Brahmin a certain special anointing and, made the sacrifice of the horse, were thereby enabled to attain boundless conquests. 9.40 With regard to the horse so sacrificed it was stipulated in the ritual that during an entire year beforehand it must be left free to wander at its will, carefully protected the while by guard set to the task. 941 As this horse is further clearly identified with the sun, 942 There can be little doubt that it was a substitute or equivalent for a more ancient human sacrifice to the sun god, and was on that account regarded as of overwhelming efficacy. 943 Until the present century, among the Aryan Kafirs of the Hindu Kush, a sacrifice of a horse was reckoned to have abnormal virtue, one being, occasionally, not more than once in many years. Sacrificed at a certain sacred pit near the temple of Imra at the sacred village of Kstigagram, in Presungal. 944 So deeply fixed was the idea that among the Bataks of Sumatra, who were for a time influenced by the Hindus, the white horse is still a special offering to the higher god or gods, though it is now as a rule devoted without being slain. In the latter case it remains permanently holy and inviolable, 945 and among the Siberian Yakuts, who latterly are recorded to have consecrated a stallion every year, the animal, though not sacrificed, henceforth does no more work. 946 The horse, we may note in passing, may have been in this case a totem animal. Among the Negroes of Nigeria at the present day, however, not only the bullock specially set apart for sacrifice to the governing god, but cattle in general, including sheep and goats, are treated as if sacred. And the males are eaten only at religious ceremonials. 947 The totemistic hypothesis, therefore, is not necessary to the argument, the divinity of the victim as such being clear in any case. And sacredness in animals is not restricted to victims. In southern India, in some parts of Gunjam, large numbers of Brahmini bulls are treated as sacred, and castes which do not copy them in giving sacred burial to a bull often set free sacred cows or calves. Among the Adivi or forest galas, again, 
the people of every house in the village let loose a sheep, to wander whither it will, as a sort of perpetual scapegoat. And among the Bodegas a scape calf is let loose at every funeral, to bear the sins of the deceased. Henceforth it is free, like the animals otherwise sacred. 948. We are now prepared to understand that the freedom permitted to the Babylonian mock king before the Sasiya originated, not, as has been suggested, 949 by way of making the mock king commit the act of technical high treason, entering the harem. But as a result of the contingent divinity of the victim in the primitive cult. The formal trial of a victim may be otherwise explained, as a primitive process of degrading a discredited priest king. 950 In the case of the Khans, who had no harlots 951 and few concubines, intercourse on the part of a destined male victim with either the wives or the daughters of the inhabitants was welcomed as a high boon. 952 Though he often had allotted to him a victim wife. And the same idea seems to have underlain the treatment of the doomed godman in ancient Mexico. 953 A study of these cases will suggest that in a primitive tribal state, when annual voluntary victims were otherwise hard to get, men may very well have been got to accept the role on condition of a year's quasi-regal license. Savages notoriously set present pleasure far before future pain in their thought. And out of such a religious kingship may have separately arisen both the function of the priest-king as seen in Greece and Rome, and the phenomenon of the mock-king of the Sicilia. On this view the improbability of the annual slaying of the acting king, urged by Mr. Lang 954, against Dry Fraser, does not arise, while the theory fundamentally stands. What is certain is that no principle of indulgence could have been accepted in the Christian legend, arising as it did in a cultus of asceticism. But in the character of the Messiah as one who associated with publicans and sinners. In his association with women. And in the obstinate legend which, apart from the text, made Mary Magdalene, a visibly mythical character 955, figure as a former harlot, we may have another such survival as has been surmised to underlie the tradition of Jesus Barabbas. And the common belief of the early church that the ministry of Jesus lasted for only one year 956 may have a similar basis in the old usage. Further, as Dyar. Fraser has suggested, the story of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem may preserve a tradition of a mock royal procession for the destined victim. Even the legend of the riding on two asses, which, as has been elsewhere shown, 957 preserves an ancient zodiacal symbol, and at the same time a myth concerning Dionysus, might have anciently figured in the procession of a god-victim of the Dionysiac type. As the zodiacal symbol stands for the autumn equinox, and the crucifixion is placed at the spring equinox, these details would be chronologically separate, but Tammuz, like Dionysus, seems to have had two feasts. 958 And in any case the legend was free to include different ritual episodes. Finally, the explanation of the ascription of the title of Nazarite to Jesus, a perplexing detail which led the redactors to frame the myth of his birth at Nazareth 959, may be that the Jewish victim, like the Khand, wore his hair unshorn. It would be natural that he should. The institution of the Nazir, a word which means, dedicated, being an inheritance from the ancient times of common human sacrifice, and being associated with the myth of Samson, in which the shorn sun god is as it were sacrificed to himself. We have now followed our historic clues far enough to warrant a constructive theory. Indeed, it frames itself when we colligate our main data. As thus. 1. In the slaying of the Cronian victim at Rhodes we have an ancient Semitic 960 human sacrifice maintained into the historic period, by the expedient of taking as annual victim a criminal already condemned to death. 2. In Semitic mythology, Kronos, whom the Phoenicians call Israel, sacrifices his son Yud, the only, after putting upon him royal robes. 3. The feast of Kronos is the Saturnalia, in which elsewhere a mock king plays a prominent part. And as Kronos was among the Semites identified with Moloch equals, King, 961 the victim would be ostensibly either a king or a king's son. A trial and degradation were likely accessories. 4. Supposing the victim in the Rhodian Saturnalia to figure as Yud, he would be ipso facto Barabbas, 
the son of the father, and in the terms of the case he was a condemned criminal. At the same time, in terms of the myth, he would figure in royal robes. 5. In any case, the myth being Semitic, it is morally certain that among the many cases of human sacrifice in the Greco-Semitic world the Rhodian rite was not unique. And as the name, Yud, besides signifying, the only, was virtually identical with the Greek and Hebrew names for Judah, son of, Israel, and Jew, Yehuda, Iudios, it was extremely likely, among the Jews of the dispersion. To be regarded as having special application to their race, which in their sacred books actually figured as the only begotten Son of the Father God, and as having undergone special suffering. 6. That the Rhodian rite, Semitic in origin, was at some point specially coincident with Jewish conceptions of sacrifice, is proved by the detail of leading the prisoner outside the city gates. This is expressly laid down in the Epistle to the Hebrews, 962 as a ritual condition of the sacrificial death of Jesus. The case, of course, is not staked on any assumption that the Rhodian rite was the exact historical antecedent of the Jesuist rite as preserved in the Gospels. That the Jews had much traffic with Rhodes may be gathered from Josephus's account of Herod's relations with the place. 963 But we are not committed to the view that the Jews had any hand in the Rhodian sacrifice ritual, or that the Gospel myth followed that. So far as the records go, the coincidence is incomplete, since, 1, the Rhodian Saturnalia was a June or July festival, and thus disparate from the Passover, and, 2, there is no hint of a triple execution. But it suffices, firstly, that we have here a clear case of a variant from a type to which the Christian crucifixion ritual belongs. And, secondly, that the Rhodian rite further points to the decisive development which we have yet to trace in the case of the Gospel story. For Porphyry incidentally mentions that the Rhodian sacrifice, after having subsisted long, had latterly been modified, mu epsilon tau beta lambda eta theta eta. As to the precise nature of the modification we have no further knowledge. But we are entitled to conclude that it was either a simple rite of mock sacrifice or a mystery drama. Both stages, indeed, would be natural, the step to the latter being dependent on the connection of the rite with a Eucharist. But the essential point is that in this case, the memory of which is preserved, like so many items in our knowledge of ancient life. By an incidental sentence in a treatise to which the subject was barely relevant, we have exactly the kind of transition from actual human sacrifice to a conventional rite of mock sacrifice which our theory implies. And seeing that the actual sacrifice was once normal in the Semitic world, there can be little doubt that the cases and modes of modification were many. Meantime, the bearing of such a development on our total problem is obvious. We have traced on the one hand a Semitic and probably Israelitish tradition of an annually, or periodically, sacrificed victim, Jesus the Son of the Father. And seen reason to surmise the contact of dispersed Jews with such a rite in Hellenistic eastern towns. On the other hand we have traced a Jewish bread and wine Eucharist, which we find emerging in documentary knowledge in the pre-Christian Eucharist of the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. With the name of Jesus attached to a strictly Judaic personage of quasi-divine status, not said to be crucified or otherwise sacrificed. Of these forms of doctrine and rite there took place a fusion, forming the historic Christian cultus. Of such a fusion, the most likely and most intelligible means would be the mystery drama, whose existence has now to be demonstrated. But first we have to note certain historic possibilities on which the fusion might partly depend. Section 14. Possible Historical Elements One concrete feature in the crucifixion myth remains to be accounted for, the scourging. Mr. Lang presses this feature of the Sasia as an argument against the view that the victim died as representing a god. 964 In reality, the assumption that sacrificed victims were never scourged is no better founded than the assertion that they were never hanged. The human victims in several Asiatic Greek rites were whipped before being sacrificed. 965 Scourging, besides, actually took the place of human sacrifice, by tradition, in certain Greek cults, the scourging, which at times was fatal, being accepted as a sacrificial act. 966 The deity specially connected with such acts of scourging was Artemis, 
concerning the Asiatic savageries of whose cultus we have the disgusted testimony of Plutarch. 967 And it is noteworthy that the Rhodian victim had been slain near the temple of Aristobula 968, a name of Artemis, 969 who is thus in late as in early times connected with human sacrifice. 970 It is therefore not unlikely that, when the Rhodian rite was modified, scourging was substituted as a means of obtaining at least the sacrifice of blood. And when the rite reached the stage of a mystery drama, that detail would naturally be preserved. It is to be remembered, however, that the original principle of such scourging may be independent of any act of substitution. It is partly indicated in the Khan doctrine in connection with the rite of slow burning, that the more tears the victim shed the more abundant would be the rain. Here indeed there is a plain conflict between two sacrificial principles, that of the symbolism of the victim's acts and that of his willingness. But both principles are known to have existed, some of the Khans and the Aztecs attaching importance to the tears shed by the victims, while the Carthaginians sought to drown the cries of their children, and the mothers were forbidden to weep. 971 In the case of the original human sacrifice on the Jewish Day of Atonement, as we have seen, there was a ritual act of weeping, and perhaps one of scourging, and we have no ground for doubting that scourging could take place. But there was a ritual need for blood as well as tears. It is noted that in the human sacrifices of Polynesia the victims were rarely much mutilated, but were always made to bleed much. 972 And a perfect obsession of blood pervades the whole Judaic religion, down to the end of the New Testament. In the, hanging unto the Lord, of the sons of Saul, indeed, there was ostensibly no bloodshed. But Joshua is declared to have, smitten, the five kings before he hanged them. The, sin offering, too was one of blood, and a blood sacrifice was the normal one in all nations. 973 Scourging would yield the blood without making the victim incapable of enduring the hanging or crucifixion, and in the Gospel record that the doomed God sweated as it were drops of blood 974 we may have a further concession to the idea. Finally, there is the possibility that, as in the case of the victims in the Asiatic Thargelia and other festivals, who were ceremonially whipped before being put to death, the scourging belonged to the conception of the scapegoat. Who thus as well as by banishment bore the people's sins. 975. In these various ways, then, we can comprehend the gradual evolution of a ritual with which could be associated on the one hand a belief in a national deliverer, and on the other hand a general doctrine of salvation and immortality. The idea of the resurrection of the slain god is extremely ancient, we have it in the myths of Osiris and of the descent of Ishtar into Hades to rescue Tammuz. And in the Syro-Greek form of the cult, the resurrection of Adonis was a chief feature of the great annual ritual. So with the other cults already mentioned. From the god, the concept of resurrection was extended to the worshippers, this long before the Christian era. It needed only that the doctrines of divine sacrifice, resurrection, and salvation, temporal or eternal, should be thus blended in a mystery ritual with the institution of a Eucharist or holy sacrament. To constitute the foundation of the religion of Jesus the Christ as we have it in the Gospels. That a mystery drama actually existed, and was the basis of the Gospel narrative, will be shown in the next section. But in passing it may be well to note that certain features of the crucifixion myth, though fairly explicable on the lines above sketched, may be due to contemporary analogies from other rites or from actual occurrences. The posture of the victim in the traditional crucifix, which we shall see some reason for ascribing to a ritual in which the worshipper embraces a cross, may on the other hand derive from the Persocythian usage of slaying a messenger to the god. Flaying him, and stuffing his skin with the arms outstretched. 976 This sacrifice, indeed, has obvious analogies to that of the ambassador in the old Jewish rite above traced. And in both cases the idea of the cross form may derive from the fact that in the gesture language and picture writing of savages, which are probably primeval, that is the recognized attitude and symbol of the ambassador or go between. 977 or the cross form may connect with some other principle involved in the Semitic representation of the sun god with arms outstretched, 978 which probably underlies the myth of the outstretching of the arms of Moses. 979 on the whole, 
seeing that the Phoenician symbol of a figure with outstretched arms is found to derive historically from the Egyptian crux and sada, 980 which was certainly an emblem of salvation. 981 We are entitled to conclude that from time immemorial the posture of the cross had had a religious significance, partly of expiation, partly of beneficence, and that this general significance surrounded the Christian myth. Yet again, the repetition of the offer of a drink to the victim, or the mention of Gaul in that connection, might be motived by the example of the mysteries of Demeter, in which there figured a drink of Gaul. 982 Whatever were the original meaning of that detail, it might be added to that of a narcotic used as above explained. It has been elsewhere shown, too, that such a detail as the crown of thorns might conceivably stand for the nimbus of the sun god, or for the crown placed upon the heads of sacrificial victims in general. 983 Or for the crown which was worn by human victims in such a sacrificial procession as is to be inferred from Herodotus' story of Heracles in Egypt. Or for the actual crowns of thorns which were in vogue for religious purposes in the district of Abydus. Or for some other ritual practice which is sought to be explained by the myth of the mock crown of Heracles 984 No limit can well be set to the possibility of such analogies from pagan religious practice. Actual or alleged history, too, may have given rise to some details in a mystery ritual such as we are considering. In the Gospel story as it now stands, though not as an original and dramatic detail in it, we find one remarkable coincidence with a passage in Josephus. The historian tells 985 that during the Passover feast, while Jerusalem was being besieged, the eastern gate of the inner sanctuary, which was of brass and very solid, which in the evening was with difficulty shut by twenty men, and which was supported by iron-bound bars and posts reaching far down, let into the floor of solid stone, was seen about the sixth hour of the night to have opened of its own accord. And that this was felt by the wise to be an omen of ruin. In the synoptics it is told that after the robbers taunted Jesus, from the sixth hour darkness was over the land till the ninth hour, whereupon Jesus uttered his cry of Eli, Eli, and immediately afterwards, having again cried with a loud voice, gave up his spirit. And lo, the veil of the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. The three hours of darkness, it would appear, are alleged in order to give time for the Passover meal, by way of assimilating the synoptic account to the Johannine. In the second gospel, in an apparently interpolated passage, Jesus is crucified at, the third hour, in the fourth, it was preparation of the Passover, it was about the sixth hour, when Jesus is sent to be crucified. And on that view his death would be consummated when the Passover sacrament was, the gospel, however, giving no further details. The space of silent suffering in the synoptics, from the sixth hour to the ninth, makes the stories finally correspond as to the hours, though not as to the day. In the third gospel, however, the reading is confused by the placing of the sentence, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst, after the mention of the three hours darkness and before the Lord's death. Thus, while the actual time of the veil rending is loft in the vague, the passage can be read as saying that the veil was rent when the darkness began, at the sixth hour. In any case, whether or not the darkness of three hours is a late modification of the synoptic text, on which view the death may be held to have been originally placed at the sixth hour, and the rending of the temple veil at the same moment. The story in Josephus is extremely likely to have been the motive of the veil-rending myth in the Gospels. It actually did lead to the insertion of a gloss in an early text, perhaps originally Syriac, of the third Gospel, where the stone placed at the mouth of the Lord's tomb is alleged to be such that twenty men could hardly roll it away. And in the existing old Syriac texts, significantly enough, it is the front of the gate of the sanctuary or temple that is rent in the Gospel story, not the veil.986 and the parallel does not end here. The story of the rising of the saints, so awkwardly interpolated in the first Gospel and in that only, is no less clearly an adaptation of the story of Josephus, in the same passage. To the effect that at the feast of Pentecost the priests when serving by night in the inner temple felt a quaking, and heard a great noise, and then a sound as of a multitude saying, Let us remove hence. The whole series of portents in Josephus, as it happens, winds up with the story of Jesus the son of Ananus, 
who had so long, with a loud voice, cried, Woe to Jerusalem, and at last was slain by a stone from an engine. Crying, Woe to myself also, as he gave up the ghost. In view of such a remarkable suggestion to the early Jesuits, it seems unnecessary even to ask whether the myth of the veil rending may be a variant popularly current at the same time with those given by Josephus. In all likelihood the interpolators of the Greek Gospel modified both episodes in order either to escape contradiction or to make them more suitable symbolically. 987 That they were interpolated after the transcription of the mystery play we shall see when we consider that as such, but for the present we have to recognize that if the transcribed narrative could be thus influenced, the play itself might be. The scourging and crucifixion of Antigonus, again, must have made a profound impression on the Jews, 988 and it is a historic fact that the similar slaying of the last of the Incas was kept in memory for the Peruvians by a drama annually acted. 989 It may be that the superscription, This is the King of the Jews, and even the detail of scourging, 990 came proximately from the story of Antigonus. Though on the other hand it is not unlikely that Antony should have executed Antigonus on the lines of the sacrifice of the mock king. But it is noteworthy that where the existing mystery drama, which was doubtless a Gentile development from a much simpler form, introduces historical characters. It does so on the clear lines of sacrificial principle set forth in the ritual of the Khans, where already the symbol of the cross is prominent in the fashion of slaying the victim. Though the Gentile hostility to the Jews 991 would dictate the special implication of the Jewish priests and people, and of King Herod as in the Third Gospel. The total effect is to make it clear that the guilt of the sacrifice rests on no one official, but is finally taken by the whole people upon them. Even the quotation put in the mouth of the dying God-man, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 992 has the effect of implying that he had hitherto suffered voluntarily. Thus does the ritual which was to grow into a world religion preserve in its consummated quasi-historical form the primeval principle that, one man should die for the people, by the people's will. And, as we have seen, not even in extending the benefit of the sacrifice to, all mankind, does the great historic religion outgo the religious psychology of the ancient Dravidians. When this is realized it will be seen to be unnecessary to suppose that any abnormal personality had arisen to give the cult its form or impetus. In view, however, of the story fortuitously preserved in the Talmud, that one Jesus ben Pandira was stoned and hanged on a tree at Lydda on the eve of the Passover in the reign of Alexander Genius about 100 BC. 993 We are not entitled to say that a real act of sacerdotal vengeance did not enter into the making of the movement. The evidence is obscure. And the personality of the hanged Jesus, who is said to have been a sorcerer and a false teacher, becomes elusive and quasi-mythical even in the Talmud. But even such evidence gives better ground for a historical assumption than the supernaturalist narrative of the Gospels. 994 In any case, there is no reason to ascribe any special doctrinal teaching whatever to Jesus ben Pandira. He remains but a name, with a mention of his death by, hanging on a tree, a quasi-sacrifice, at the time of the sacrificial rite which had anciently been one of man-slaying and child-slaying. Leaving the case on that side undetermined, we turn to a problem which admits of solution. 15. The Gospel Mystery Play It is not disputed that one of the most marked features of the popular religions of antiquity, in Greece, Egypt, and Greek-speaking Asia was the dramatic representation of the central episodes in the stories of the suffering and dying gods and goddesses. Herodotus has been charged with pretending to knowledge that he did not possess. But there is no reason to doubt his assertion 995 that on the artificial circular lake at Sais the Egyptians were wont to give by night, presumably once a year, representations of the sufferings of a certain one whom he will not name. Which representations they called mysteries. The certain one in question we know must have been the god Osiris, 996 and that the sufferings and death of Osiris were dramatically represented, modern Egyptology has freshly established from hieroglyphic documents. 997 We, know, too, from the concluding rubric of the Lamentations of Isis and Nephthys for Osiris that those goddesses were persona ted in the ritual by two beautiful women. 998 
In the worships of Adonis and of Attis there was certainly a dramatic representation of the dead god by effigy, and of his resurrection. 999 And in the mysteries of Mitra, as given among the Greeks, there appears to have been included a representation of the burial of a stone effigy of the god, in a rock tomb, and of his resurrection. 1000 So, in the great cult of Dionysus, with whose worship were connected the beginnings of tragedy among the Greeks, there was a symbolic representation of the dismemberment of the young god by the Titans. This being part of the sacrament of his body and blood. 1001 And in the special centers of the worship of Heracles, or at least at one of them, Tarsus, there was annually erected in his worship a funeral pyre, on which his effigy, but sometimes a man, was burned. 1002 The same motive is worked out in the Trachinii of Sophocles. Among the Greeks, again, a dramatic representation of the myth of the loss of Persephone, the mourning of her mother Demeter, and her restoration, was the central attraction in the Eleusinian mysteries. And the return of Persephone was separately dramatized. 1003 Of all those mysteries the mythological explanation is doubtless the same, they mostly originated in primitive sacrificial rituals to represent the annual death of vegetation, and to charm it into returning. And in the cult of Mitra, who, like Heracles, is specifically a sun god, there may have been an adaptation from the rites of the vegetation gods. In the later stages the magic which had been supposed to revive vegetation is applied to securing the life of the initiate in the next world. We are not here concerned, however, with the origin of the usage. For our purpose it suffices us to know that such rites were rites of salvation, and that they were the most popular in ancient religion. 1004. As Christism first became popular by the development or adaptation of myths and ritual usages like those of the popular pagan systems, notably the birth myth, the Holy Supper, and the Resurrection, it might be expected that it should imitate paganism in the matter of dramatic mysteries. The mere supper ritual, indeed, is itself dramatic, the celebrant personating the god as Attis was personated by his priest. 1005 And in the remarkable expression in the Pauline Epistle to the Galatians, 3, 1, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was openly set forth crucified, we have probably a record of an early fashion of imaging the crucifixion. 1006 In the same document, 6, 17, is the phrase, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus and various other expressions in the epistles, describing the devotee as mystically crucified and as having become one with the crucified Lord. Suggest that in the early stages of the cult it dramatically adopted the apparently dramatic teaching of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, wherein the saved and osirified soul declares, I clasp the sycamore tree. I myself am joined unto the sycamore tree, and its arms are opened unto me graciously, 1007 and again, I have become a divine being by the side of the birth chamber of Osiris, I am brought forth with him, I renew my youth. 1008 In the 5th century, we know, mystery plays were performed either in or in connection with the churches, 1009 and the identity between the birth story and several pagan dramatic rituals is too close to be missed. 1010 But apart from the parallels above indicated the dramatic origination of the story of the Christ's Supper, Passion, Betrayal, trial, and crucifixion, as it now stands, has yet to be established. The proof, however, I submit, lies, and has always lain, before men's eyes in the actual gospel narrative. It is the prepossession set up by age-long belief that have prevented alike believers and unbelievers from seeing as much. Let the reader carefully peruse the story of the series of episodes as they are given in their least sophisticated form, in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. From Matthew 26, 17, or 20, it will be noted, the narrative is simply a presentment of a dramatic action in dialogue. And the events are huddled one upon another exactly as happens in all drama that is not framed with a special concern for plausibility. In many plays of Shakespeare, notably in Measure for Measure, 1011 there occurs such a compression of incidents in time, the reason being precisely the nature of drama, which, whether or not it holds theoretically by the unities must for practical reasons minimize change of scene and develop action rapidly. Even in the Hedda Gabler of Ibsen, the chief master of modern drama. 
This exigency of the conditions leads the dramatist in the last act to the startling step of making the friends of the suicide sit down to prepare his manuscripts for the press within a few minutes of his death. To realize fully the theatrical character of the gospel story, it is necessary to keep in view this characteristic compression of the action in time, as well as the purely dramatic content. The point is not merely that the compression of events proves the narrative to be pure fiction, but that they are compressed for a reason, the reason being that they are presented in a drama. As the story stands, Jesus partakes with his disciples of the Passover, an evening meal, and after a very brief dialogue they sing a hymn, and proceed in the darkness to the Mount of Olives. Not a word is said of what happened or was said on the way, the scene is simply changed to the Mount, and there begin a new dialogue and action. A slight change of scene, again effected with no hint of any talk on the way, is made to Gethsemane. And here the scanty details as to the separation from his disciples, and the going apart with the three, indicate with a brevity obviously dramatic the arrangement by which Judas, who was thus far with the party, would on the stage be enabled to withdraw. Had the story been first composed for writing, such an episode would necessarily have been described, and something would naturally have been said of the talk on the way from the supper chamber to the mount. What we are reading is the bare transcript of a primitive play, in which the writer has not here attempted to insert more than has been shown on the scene. In the passion scene, this dramatic origination of the action is again twice emphasized. Thrice over Jesus prays while his disciples sleep. There is thus no one present or awake to record his words, an incongruity which could not well have entered into a narrative originally composed for reading, where it would have been a gratuitous invention. But which in the stage would not be a difficulty at all, since there the prayer would be heard and accepted by the audience, like a soliloquy in an inartistic modern play. No less striking is the revelation made in verses 45 and 46, where in two successive sentences, with no pause between, Jesus tells the sleeping three to sleep on and to arise. What has happened is either a slight disarrangement of the dialogue or the omission of an exit and an entrance. Verse 44 runs, And he left them again, and went away, and prayed a third time, saying again the same words. If verse 45, from the second clause onwards, were inserted before verse 44, where, as the text stands, Jesus says nothing, and verse 46 introduced with, and saith unto them, immediately after the first clause of verse 45. The incongruity would be removed. Only in transcription from a dramatic text could it have arisen. Then, without the slightest account of what he had been doing in the interim, Judas enters the scene exactly as he would on the stage, with his multitude, while he, Jesus, yet spake. With an impossible continuity, the action goes on through the night, a thing quite unnecessary in any save a dramatic fiction, where unity of time, that is, the limitation of the action within twenty-four hours, or little more. As prescribed by Aristotle 1012, was for the ancients a ruling principle. Jesus is taken in the darkness to the house of the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. The disciples meanwhile had left him and fled, and not a word is said as to what they did in the interim. Though any account of the episode, in the terms of the tradition concerning them, must have come through them. But it is needless to insist on the absolutely unhistorical character of a narrative which makes the whole judicial process take place in the middle of the night, a time when, as Renan notes, an eastern city is as if dead. The point is that the invention is of a kind obviously conditioned by a dramatic purpose. In the dead of night the authorities proceed to hunt up false witnesses throughout Jerusalem, because the witnesses must be produced in the trial scene as closely as possible on that of the capture. And the process goes on till two give the requisite testimony. Then Jesus is questioned, condemned, buffeted, and, presumably, led away, and Peter, remaining on the scene, denies his Lord and is convicted of treason by the crowing of the cock. Of what happens to the doomed God-man in this interval there is not a hint, though it is just here that a non-dramatic narrative would naturally follow him most closely. Morning has thus come, and, when morning was come, the priests and elders, who thus have had no rest, take counsel, afresh to put Jesus to death, and lead him away, bound, to Pilate. But this evidently happens off the scene, 
since we have the interlude in which Judas brings back his thirty pieces of silver, is repudiated by the priests, and goes away to hang himself. The story of the potter's field is obviously a later writer's interpolation in the narrative. An original narrator, telling a story in a natural way, would have given details about Judas, the interpolator characteristically wants to explain that, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. As usual, not a word is said of the details of the transit from place to place, the scene simply changes all at once to the presence of the governor. And here, with not a single touch of description such as an original narrator might naturally give, we plunge straight into dialogue. Always we are witnessing drama, of which the spectators needed no description, and of which the subsequent transcriber reproduces simply the action and the words. Save in so far as he is absolutely forced to insert a brief explanation of the Barabbas episode. The rest of the trial scene, and the scene of the mock crowning and robing, are strictly dramatic, giving nothing but words and action. In the account of the trial before Herod, which is found only in Luke, the method of narration is significantly different, being descriptive and non-dramatic, as the work of an amplifying later narrator would naturally be. The words of Herod are not given, and the interpolation was doubtless the work of a late Gentile, bent on making Jewish and not Roman soldiers guilty of mocking the Lord. 1013 in the first two Gospels, even the episode of the laying hold of Simon of Cyrene, to make him bear the cross, might have been introduced at this point on the stage. Without involving the attempt, impossible in drama, to present the procession to the place of crucifixion. Of that procession Matthew and Mark offer no description, they simply adhere to the drama, leaving to the later narrative of Luke the embellishment of the morning crowd of daughters of Jerusalem, and the speech of Jesus to them on the way. Even Luke, however, offers no description of the march, and even his added episode might have been brought into a dramatic action either at the close of the crowning scene or at the beginning of that of the crucifixion. Here, as before, the action is strictly dramatic, save for the episode of the scriptural explanation of the casting of lots, which may or may not have been a late addition to the action. No word is said of the aspect of Jesus, a point on which an original narrator, if writing to be read, or telling of what he had seen, would almost certainly have said something. In a drama, of course, no such details were needed, the suffering God-man was there on the stage, seen by all the spectators. The same account holds good of all the remaining scenes in the Gospel story, with a few exceptions. The three hours of darkness and silence could not be enacted, though there might be a shorter interval, and the rending of the temple veil, which could not take place on the scene, is to be presumed a late addition to the transcribed narrative. But a machinery of commotion may very well have been employed, and the wild story of the opening of the graves of the saints may actually derive from such a performance, though the absurdity of the 53rd verse is wholly documentary. Such a story would naturally be dropped from later Gospels because of its sheer extravagance, but such a scruple would not affect the early dramatists. Even the episode of the appeal of the priests and Pharisees to Pilate to keep a guard on the tomb, though it might be a later interpolation, could quite well have been a dramatic scene, as it presents the Jews, gathered together, unto Pilate. Saying. The resurrection scene, like that of the crucifixion, is wholly, staged. The two Marys, who sat before the sepulchre when Joseph closed it, appear again late on the Sabbath day, having presumably been driven away by the guard before. Nothing is said of what has gone on among the disciples, nothing of the communion of the mourning women, the whole narrative is rigidly limited to the strictly consecutive dramatic action, as it would be represented on the stage. Even the final appearance in Galilee is set forth in the same fashion, and the gospel even as it stands ends abruptly with the words of the risen Lord. When the mystery play was first transcribed, it may have ended at Matt. 28, 10, verses 11 to 15 having strong marks of late edition. But it may quite well have included verses 16 to 20, with the obvious exception of the clause about the Trinity, which is certainly late. In any case, it ended on a speech. Why should such a document so end, if it were the work of a narrator setting down what he knew or had heard? Why should he not round off his narrative in the normal manner? The higher criticism has recognized that the story of the betrayal and the rest do not belong to the earlier matter of the Gospels. 
The Analysis of the School of Bernhard Weiss, as presented by Mr. A. J. Jolly, 1014 makes the primitive gospel end with the scene of the anointing. I hold that scene to have been also dramatic, and to have been first framed as a prologue to the mystery play. 1015 But the essential point is that all that portion which I have above treated as the mystery play is an addition to a previously existing document. Not that the play, in some form, was not older than the document, but that its transcription is later. And this theory gives the explanation as to the abruptness of the conclusion. Where the play ended the narrative ends. Only in the later third gospel do we find the close, and some other episodes, such as the Herod trial and the account of Joseph of Arimathea, treated in the narrative spirit, in the manner, that is, of a narrative framed for reading. In Luke's conclusion there is still a certain scenic suggestion, but it is a distant imitation of the concrete theatricality of the earlier version, description is freely interspersed, speeches are freely lengthened. And the story is rounded off as an adaptive writer would naturally treat it. In the earlier Gospels such a treatment has not been ventured on. There are but a few doctrinary and explanatory interpolations. The descriptive element is kept nearly at the possible minimum, the scenic action is adhered to even where interpolated description would clearly be appropriate for narrative purposes. The transcriber even stumbles over his text to the extent of joining two speeches which should have an entrance and an exit between them, and when the last scene ends the gospel ends. The transcriber has been able to add to the previous gospel the matter of the mystery play, and there he loyally stops. His work has been done in good faith, up to his lights, and he does not presume to speak of matters of which he knows nothing. Later doctrinaires, with a dogma to support, might tamper with the document, he sticks to his copy. Doubtless the addition was made by Gentile hands. In the play the apostles are unfavorably presented, and the episode of the treason of Peter is probably a Gentile invention made to discredit the Judaizing party, who held by a Petrine tradition. Though on the other hand the gospel text about the rock is presumably a late invention in the interest of the Roman see. In this connection there arises the question whether the specifically dramatic Acts of Pilate, as contained in the non-canonical Gospel of Nicodemus, may not likewise represent an original drama. Broadly speaking, it seems to do so, and it may conceivably proceed upon a dramatic text independently of the synoptics. On the ground, not of its dramatic form but of the occasional relative brevity and the general consistency of its narrative, it has even been argued 1016 that its matter is earlier than the version of the story in any of the Gospels. With that problem we are not here concerned, but it is relevant to note that the dramatic action of the non-canonical Gospel is not earlier but later than that preserved in the canonical. In the Acts of Pilate, the trial scene is composed by reducing to drama a whole series of episodes from the previous gospel history, the various persons miraculously cured by Jesus coming forward to give evidence on his behalf. Even the story of the water-wine miracle is embodied from the fourth gospel. This expansion is manifestly a late device, and has the effect of making the already impossible trial scene newly extravagant. And while the trial in the Acts is in passages more strictly dramatic than in the Gospel, those very passages tell of redaction, not of priority. Thus Pilate is made to utter in his address the explanation concerning the usage of releasing a prisoner, and volunteers allusion to Barabbas, where the Gospel gives those details by way of narrative. It is clear that in the natural and original form of such a drama Pilate would not so speak, the speech is a sophistication. Whether or not, then, the Acts proceeded on a separate dramatic text, it does not preserve an earlier version. That it does not give the absurd detail about the risen saints visiting the holy city after the resurrection is merely a fresh proof that the first gospel is at that point interpolated. The mere fact that the Acts gives names to personages who are without names in the canonical gospels, as, the two thieves and the soldier who pierced the Lord's side, tells of lateness. What the document does signify is the apparent extension of the mystery play beyond the limits of that embodied in the first gospel, and under the same pressure of Gentile motive. The whole effect of the extension being to throw a greater guilt of perversity on the Jews and to put Pilate in a favorable light. 
that the play in the facts came from a source to which the Syrian sacrificial tradition was alien is further suggested by the fact that it places the act of mock crowning at Golgotha, not in the praetorium. And that for the scarlet robe it substitutes a linen cloth. While a formal sentence of scourging is passed by Pilate. Finally, the resurrection does not happen upon the scene, but is related by the mouths of the Roman soldiers, as if the dramatist or compiler were bent on producing new and stronger evidence in proof of the event. On any view, however, the dramatic form of the acts serves to strengthen the presumption that dramatic representations of the death of Jesus were early current, and thus to support the foregoing interpretation of the Gospel story. That interpretation, it is submitted, fits the whole case, and at once explains what otherwise is inexplicable, the peculiar character of what is clearly an unhistorical narrative. Assume the story to be either a tradition reduced to writing long after the event, or the work of a deliberate inventor desirous of giving some detail to a story of which he had received the barest mention. Either way, why should that impossible huddling of the action, that crowding of the betrayal and the trial into one night, have been resorted to? It does not help the story as a narrative for reading, it makes it, on the contrary, so improbable that only the habitude of reverence can prevent anyone from seeing its untruth. The solution is instant and decisive when we realize that what we are reading is the bare transcription of a mystery play, framed on the principle of, unity of time. As has been remarked, it is not to be supposed that the play as it stands in the gospel is primordial. Rather it is a piece of technical though unliterary elaboration, albeit older than the play in the, Acts of Pilate, for if we divide it by its scenes or places we have the classic five acts, first, the supper. Second, the agony and betrayal, both occurring on the mount, third, the trial at the high priest's house, fourth, the trial before Pilate, fifth, the crucifixion. If we suppose this to have been one continuous play, the resurrection may have been a separate action, with five scenes, the removal of the body by Joseph, the burial, the placing of the guard of soldiers the coming of the women and the address of the angel, and the appearance of the risen Lord. But similarly the early action may have been divided, the anointing scene, the visit of Judas to the priests. The visit of the disciples to the certain man, in whose house the supper was to be eaten, all these may have been dramatically presented in the first instance. The scene of the transfiguration, too, has every appearance of having been a dramatic representation in the manner of the pagan mysteries. But the theory of the dramatic origin of the coherent yet impossible story of the supper, agony, betrayal, the two trials, and the crucifixion, does not depend on any decisive apportionment of the scenes. It is borne out at every point by every detail of the structure of the story as we have it in transcription. And when this is once recognized, our conception of the manner of the origin of the Gospels is at this point at least placed on a new, we might say a scientific, basis. 16. The Mystery Play and the Cultus In all probability the performance of the mystery play was suspended in the Church's 1017 when it was reduced to narrative form as part of the Gospel. The suspension may have occurred either during a time of local persecution or by the deliberate decision of the Churches, in the second century. But such a deliberate decision is likely to have been taken when the cult, having broken away from Judaism, was also concerned to break away from the paganism in contact with which the play would first arise. How far away from Jerusalem that may have been we can hardly divine. Greek drama certainly came much closer to Jewish life than has been recognized in the histories. Not only were theaters built by Herod, as Josephus testifies, at Damascus and Jericho, 1018 but ruins of two theaters exist at Gadara, 1019 described by Josephus as a Greek town. 1020 and known to have produced a number of notable Hellenistic writers. 1021 But the presumption from what we know of Christian origins is that the cult developed rather in the larger than in the smaller Hellenistic cities, and it would need a fairly strong group to produce such a mystery play. It may indeed never have been performed in full save at important centers, such as Antioch or Alexandria, and when once the cult was at all widely established such a state of things would be inexpedient on many grounds. The reduction of the play to narrative form put all the churches on a level, and would remove a stumbling block from the way of the ascetic Christists who objected to all dramatic shows as such.
but the manner of the transcription happily preserves for us the knowledge of the fact that it was such a show to begin with. And if we suppose it to have grown up in a Gentile environment, say in Alexandria, on the nucleus of the Eucharist, after the model of an actual sacrifice in which a Jesus Barabbas was annually offered up. We shall be so far within the warrant of the evidence. Whether the official stoning and hanging of an actual Jesus on a charge of sorcery and blasphemy in the days of Alexander Genius had served as a fresh point of departure, is a question that cannot at present be decided. All that is clear is that the Gospel story is unhistorical. The placing of the action of the mystery play in Jerusalem would be the natural course for Gentiles who were seeking to counteract the Judaizing party in a cult which founded on a slain Jewish Jesus. Since the more clearly Jerusalem and Jewry were saddled with what had come to be regarded as an act of historic guilt, the clearer would be the grounds for a breach with Judaism. To locate the first performance of the play in its present shape is beyond the possibilities of the case as the evidence stands. The detail of the two Marys suggests Egypt, where the cult of Osiris had just such a scene of quasi-maternal mourning. And the Egyptian ideas in the Apocalypse, such as those of the Lake of Fire and the Second Death, 1022 further point to Alexandrian sources for early Jesuism. But the Eucharist and burial and resurrection are apparently Mithraistic, as are various details in the Apocalypse, 1023 and the Osirian ritual, like the Mithraic, would be known in many lands. We can but say that the death ritual of the Christian creed is framed in a pagan environment, and that, like the myth of the virgin birth, 1024 it embodies some of the most widespread ideas of pagan religion. In strict truth, the two aspects in which the historic Christ is typically presented to his worshippers, those of his infancy and his death, are typically pagan. But indeed there is not a conception associated with the Christ that is not common to some or all of the savior cults of antiquity. The title of Savior, latterly confined to him, was in Judaism given to Yahweh 1025 and among the Greeks to Zeus, 1026 to Helios, 1027 to Artemis, 1028 to Dionysus, 1029 to Heracles, 1030 to the Dioscuri, 1031 to Sibylle, 1032 to Aesculapius. 1033 And it is the essential conception of the god Osiris. So, too, Osiris taketh away sin, and is judge of the dead, and of the Last Judgment. And Dionysus, also Lord of the Underworld, and primarily a god of feasting, the Son of Man cometh eating and drinking, comes to be conceived as the soul of the world, and as the inspirer of chastity and self-purification. From the mysteries of Dionysus and Isis comes the proclamation of the easy, yoke, and the Christ not only works the Dionysiac miracle 1034 but calls himself the True Vine. 1035 Like the Christ, and like Adonis and Attis, Osiris and Dionysus suffer and die to rise again, and to become one with them is the mystical passion of their worshippers. All alike in their mysteries give immortality. And from Mithraism the Christ takes the symbolic keys of heaven and hell, 1036 even as he assumes the function of the virgin-born Mitraseo Shiant, the destroyer of the evil one. 1037 Like Mitra, Meridak, 1038 and the Egyptian Khonsu, he is the Med 1039 Iater, like Khonsu, Horus, and Meridak, he is one of a trinity, 1040 Like Horus, he is grouped with a Divine Mother, like Khonsu, he is joined with the Logos. 1041 And like Meridak, he is associated with a Holy Spirit, one of whose symbols is fire. 1042 In Fundamentals, in short, Christism is but paganism reshaped, it is only the economic and the doctrinal evolution of the system, the first determined by Jewish practice and Roman environment. 1043 and the second by Greek thought 1044, that constitute new phenomena in religious history. 17. Further Pagan Adaptations One likely result of the non-performance of the mystery play as such would be a modification of the sacramental meal. When the crucifixion was represented in sequel to the supreme annual Eucharist, the bread and wine of the weekly supper were somewhat definitely presented as symbols. Whereas the merely priestly representation of the God by the ministrant in the simple Eucharist would emphasize the declaration, This is my body. As to what may have ritually occurred in this connection either shortly before or after the period of the mystery play we can but speculate, as aforesaid. 
But we have seen that the ritual eating of a lamb did take place in the postpolling period, as in the mysteries of Mitra and Dionysus. And there is reason to infer that for similar reasons there was long and commonly practiced among Christists the usage of eating a baked image of a child at the Easter Communion. 1045 That is the only satisfactory explanation of the constant pagan charge against the Christians of eating an actual child, a charge met by the fathers in terms which convey that there was something to conceal. 1046 As it was made and repelled long after the Gospels were current with the mystery play added, there would be no reason for the attitude of mystery unless the ritual included some symbolism not described in the books. Given that this symbol was bread shaped in a human form, Christism was exactly duplicating one of the practices of the man-sacrificing Mexicans. Who at the time of the Spanish conquest employed such a symbol in some of their sacraments alongside of still surviving rites of man-eating, and constant human sacrifice. 1047. When, however, the Christian cult was officially established, there needed no such primary symbolism to secure for the habitual sacrament the reverence of the faithful. The general belief that the sacred bread became the flesh of the God, and as such had miraculous virtue, could be maintained on the strength of the bare priestly blessing. And though the consecrated wafer is itself copied from pagan practice, 1048 it is finally a symbol of a symbol. For the same reason the Church was able to put down a tendency which can be traced in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, and even later, to set up a new sacramental symbol for the Christ, to wit, the fish. 1049 This peculiar symbolism was superficially traced to the fact that the Greek word chi theta, fish, is got from the initial letters of the phrase, eta sigma omicron chiro iota sigma tau theta epsilon omicron iota sigma omega tau rho, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. But such a solution is incredible, the anagram is framed after the symbol, not before it. And the true explanation must be that whereas the divine Lamb had long been identified with the zodiacal sign Aries, into which the sun enters at the vernal equinox, the time of the crucifixion. The precession of the equinoxes had for some time made the sun's zodiacal place at that season not the constellation Aries, but the constellation Pisces. 1050. Either for the same reason, or in virtue of the simpler myth according to which the sun was a fish who every evening plunged in the sea, Horus had long been, the fish, in Egypt. And in some planispheres he was represented as fish-tailed, and holding a cross in his hand. It was he, and not Jesus, who figured for the Gnostics as the divine fish. 1051 And it was probably through the Gnostics that the symbol entered the Christian system. And though the Egyptian precedent was inconvenient, and the symbol recalled both the Philistine fish god Dagon and the Babylonian Oans. Many Christists would be the more led to such a change of symbol because the lamb symbol was awkwardly common to both Judaism and Mithraism. And because in particular the phrase of the Judaistic apocalypse, washed in the blood of the lamb, pointed very inconveniently to the Mithraic rite of the Cryobolium, which with the Torobolium was a highly popular pagan rite of purification. 1052 the catacomb banquet scenes in which fishes figure as the food 1053 are probably due to this motive. And the story of the sacred meal of fish in the fourth gospel was probably shaped in part under the same pressure, though the idea of a banquet of seven was also Mithraic. 1054. A state church was able to dispense with such tactics, though it saw fit to discourage the use of the lamb symbol. That, nevertheless, survived with the equally pagan symbol of the Easter egg, which has no place in the sacred books, but was taken by the Gnostics from the lore of the Orphicists. The bread symbol, finally attenuated to the wafer, served as the supreme or official sanctity. Yet in this remotely symbolical fashion the historical church has sedulously preserved the immemorial principle, common to paganism and Judaism, of a constantly repeated sacrifice. And by that doctrine the Church of Rome stands to this day, the Church of England leaning strongly towards it. Point 1055. Hierologically speaking, they are quite justified, the Eucharist is a sacrificial meal or nothing. And those who recoil from the sacrificial principle, if they would be equally consistent, have by rights but one course before them, that of relegating the Christian cultists to the status of those of paganism. 
but in the way of such a course there stands the age-long prepossession in favor of the gospel Jesus as a personality and as a teacher. In these his moral aspects, men think, he stands apart from the Christs, mythic or otherwise, of the Gentile world, and is worthy of a perpetual attention. In these aspects, then, finally, must the Christian God-man be comparatively studied. 18. Synopsis and Conclusion, Genealogy of Human Sacrifice and Sacrament Meantime it may be helpful to draw up a tentative genealogical scheme of the history of the sacrificial idea as we have sketched it up to Christianity, and further to reduce this to diagram form. We set out with the dim primeval life in which a. All victims, whether animal or human, are not strictly sacrificed but commonly eaten, that gods, and that dead being held to share in the feast, as a feast. Dead relatives are similarly eaten, and parents filially slain and eaten, to preserve their qualities in the family or tribe. On such habits would follow the sacrifices of human beings at funerals, 1056 held by Mr. Spencer to be primordial forms of sacrifice proper. Point 1057. Thence would differentiate. b. Offerings to the gods. These would include burnt offerings, fruits and libations, especially first fruits, and latterly incense, 1058 corn, and wine. And with them might correlate. b. Totem sacrifices, in which the victim might be eaten either as a. the god or as b. A mode of union with the god ancestor or totem species, and b. Human sacrifices as such, normally of captives, which would be eaten, a. Along with the god as thank offering or as food for the slain dead, or b. As propitiatory or sin offerings, or c. As vegetation charms and life charms. Or else, d. Buried in morsels as vegetation charms, or e as sanctifying foundations of houses or villages. 1059. In virtue of the general functioning of the priest there would thus arise the general conception of c. Priest-blessed ritual sacrifices, eaten as sacraments, including c. The quasi-totem sacrifice, in which the god eats himself, as animal or as symbol, in a sacramental communion with his worshippers, and c. Human sacrifices, in which the victim, a. represented the god, or, b. had a special efficacy as being a king or a king's son, or, c. a firstborn or only son. In the case of goddesses, the sacrifice might be a virgin. And this concept would react on the conception of the god in an ascetic movement, making him either double-sexed or virtually sexless. For the sacrifice, nevertheless, the victim must latterly be as a rule a criminal. These various victims might or might not be eaten. There is thus evolved, 1, the general conception of a peculiarly efficacious Eucharist or sacramental meal in which is eaten, symbolically or otherwise, a sacrificed animal or human being, normally regarded as representing the God. Though the God eats thereof. Latterly men often assume that the animal so sacrificed is thus treated as being an enemy of the god, where the nature of the animal admits of such an interpretation. Finally, after public human sacrifices are abolished or made difficult, there is found, too, the practice of a mystery drama, symbolical of the act of human sacrifice, in which the victim is sympathetically regarded as an unjustly slain god. Such practices competing successfully with the official or public rites and sacrifices, they in turn elicit a priesthood which raises them to official ritual form. Thus there arises. d. The priest-administered Eucharist, of which the mean or norm is bread and wine equals body and blood, but which may retain the form of. d. The symbolical animal, or a doe image thereof, or. d. A baked image of the God-man or child. In virtue, however, of the symbolical principle, and of the priestly function, the thing eaten, though still called the host, equals hostia, victim, may be reduced to a single symbol, which stands for the living body, including its blood. Such is the, communion in one kind, or consecrated wafer of the Catholic Church, repudiated by Protestants, who revert to the, communion in two kinds, or bread and wine of the sacred books. 
The Catholic practice is practically on a par with some of the usages of the pre-Christian Mexicans, while the Protestant reverts to the Mithraic and Dionysiac usages which were imitated by the early Church. Thus is an appallingly long-drawn evolution summed up for the modern world in a symbol which to the uninstructed eye tells nothing of the dreadful truth, and presents a fable in its place. If to die as a human sacrifice for human beings be to deserve the highest human reverence, the true Christs of the world are to be numbered not by units, but by millions. Almost every land on this globe has during whole ages drunk their annually shed blood. According to one calculation, made in the last century, the annual death roll from human sacrifice and female infanticide in one section of British India alone was 1500.1060 taking the sacrifices at only a fifteenth of the total. Noting further the calculation of Sir George Gray, which gives four millions of victims for New Zealand alone in 2000 years. Taking into account the known holocausts of modern Africa and Polynesia 1061 and pre-Christian Mexico 1062 and the universal practice of pre-Christian Europe. We are led to an estimate beside which every Christian reckoning of the army of martyrs becomes insignificant. We are forced to reckon by thousands of millions, the truth is too vast for realization. Tantum religio. Thus has the human race paid in death for its faith in immortality. Laugh as much as you please, wrote Dobrzoffer a century ago, at the sepulchral rites of the Abapones, you cannot deny them to be proof of their believing in the immortality of the soul, 1063 even so. And for rites at which madness itself could not laugh, we have the same explanation. Of these miserable victims of insane religion, the majority were innocent even by the code that sacrificed them. And of the rest, in comparison with those who slew them, who shall now predicate guilt. Thus have nameless men and women done, many millions of times, what is credited to the fabulous Jesus of the Christian Gospels. They have verily laid down their lives for the sin of many. And while the imaginary sacrifice has been made the pretext of a historic religion during two thousand years, the real sacrifices are uncommemorated save as infinitesimals in the records of anthropology. Twenty literatures vociferously proclaim the myth, and rivers of tears have been shed at the recital of it, while the monstrous and inexpugnable truth draws at most a shudder from the student. When his conceptual knowledge becomes for him at moments a lightning flash of concrete vision through the awful vista of the human past. In a world which thus still distributes its sympathies, a rational judgment on the historic evolution is not to be looked for save among the few. Delusion as to the course of religious history must long follow in the wake of the delusion which made the history possible. Point 1064. Chapter 2. The Teaching God. 1. Primary and Secondary Ideas. Though the secondary gods are not always sacrificed, they are nearly always in some measure teachers, and here, of course, they are developed from earlier forms. A general conception of the God as teacher belongs to early religion, inasmuch as he is held to have given the moral laws which are associated with his cult. And where his worship is specially bound up with rites of agriculture he is conceived as having taught men that and other arts. Among the Naranyeri of South Australia, the supreme god Nurandir instituted all the rites and ceremonies which are practiced by the Aborigines, whether connected with life or death. On inquiring why they adhere to any custom, the reply is, because Nurandir commanded it, 1065 Among the ancient civilizations the same doctrine is common. Thus Oans the fish god, identified with Ea, 1066 taught the Babylonians agriculture and the building of cities, writing, laws, cosmology, religion, the sciences, and the arts, including the measurement of lands, in a word. Everything appertaining to civilization. 1067 and Shamus dictates the laws of Hammurabi. 1068 On a less comprehensive scale, in Egyptian myth, Thoth gave men language and names, the art of writing, and the rules of worship and sacrifice. 1069 Osiris taught the Egyptians the art of agriculture, and gave them laws, and guidance as to worship. 1070 Janus and Saturn did as much for the Italians, 1071 Huitzilopochtli no less for the Aztecs. 1072 and Apollo, 
though in one myth he has to learn divination from Pan 1073 as he learns music from Hermes, in another gives laws to the Hyperboreans 1074 and thereafter speaks oracles at Delphi for the Greeks. Teaching them a more civilized way of life. 1075 Dionysus similarly had a teacher in Silenus, but himself taught men in particular the culture of the vine, and Demeter, who must needs introduce some of the arts of agriculture, 1076 is also a lawgiver 1077 for both Greeks and Romans. 1078 Isis in turn divides with Osiris the honors of agriculture, she having shown men how to make use of wheat and barley, and she too gives men laws, and even leechcraft. 1079 The goddesses, indeed, are as commonly as the gods credited with introducing culture. Athene teaches all crafts, 1080 Sibylle like Isis is a teacher of healing, 1081 and the Gallic Minerva, Belisama, was reputed the giver of arts and crafts. 1082 Similarly the Gallic Apollo, Grannos or Mahone, was held to drive away disease, 1083 as also the Teutonic Odin. 1084 This idea of the gods as the givers of healing is indeed common to the whole Aryan race. And in the religion of India, medicine was held to come immediately from them like the Veda itself. 1085 So in Hawaii there is found a tradition that many generations back a man called Koryamoku obtained all their medicinal herbs from the gods, who also taught him the use of them. That after his death he was deified and a wooden image of him placed in the large temple at Kerna, to which offerings of hogs, fish, and cocoa nuts were frequently presented. Two friends and disciples of Koryamoku continued to practice the art after the death of their master, and were also deified after death, 1086 elsewhere, again, from the gods the priests pretended to have received the knowledge of the healing art. 1087 While in Tahiti there was a god of physic and two of surgery, as well as the usual guild gods of the different avocations. 1088 in Samoa, yet again, the war god too was in time of peace a doctor. 1089. The universality of the idea is best realized when we turn to the gods of the more primitive peoples. We have seen how the Dravidian Khans ascribed to Bura and Tari the raising of men from savagery and ignorance to comfort by means of instruction, and to Bura a moralising purpose as against the sacrificial cult. So, in the higher mythology of Peru, the sun sent Manco Capac and Mama Ocello to teach savage men true religion, morality, agriculture, arts, and sciences. While on another view Pacacamac, finding the first breed hopeless, turned them into tiger cats or apes, and made a new set, whom he taught arts and handicrafts. This idea of teaching or reformation pervades the whole cosmogony of the Incarial period. 1090 So with the gods of pre-Christian Mexico, the national deity of each tribe or nation is nearly always specified as the giver of its laws, and at times as the inventor of fire and clothing. 1091 And in at least one case he is the writer of the sacred books. 1092. Where this conception is not prominent in a primitive religion, the explanation appears to be that the enlightening power of the gods operates by way of inspiring the priests. Thus in the Tonga Islands, where there seems to have been little trace of a general culture myth, inspiration of the priest by his god was held to be common. 1093 And even the god Tangaloa, god of artificers and the arts, appropriately had for his priests only carpenters. 1094 When inspired, the priest as a matter of course spoke in the first person, as being the god for the time being. 1095 Similar inspiration, however, was held to come from the divine spirits of deceased nobles. 1096 And it is thus intelligible that the general development of this species of transmediumship should keep in the background the thought of any special teaching god. With the growth of culture and literature and sacerdotalism, however, the notion of a god who inspires priests or oracles is developed into or superseded by that of a god who especially represents the principle of counsel or wisdom or revelation. And in the polytheistic systems we have accordingly such deities as the Assyrian Nabu or Nebo, 1097 the wise, the all-knowing, the wisdom of the gods, patron of writing and literature, and son and interpreter of Meridak who in turn is the interpreter of the will of his father Ea, the earlier god of wisdom. The Indian Agni, in his secondary character of messenger or mouth of the gods. 1098 and the Egyptian Thoth, 
who, originally the moon god and therefore the measurer becomes as such the representative of the principle of instruction and the writer of the sacred books. 1099 In this latter capacity he has an obvious advantage over Mott, the goddess of law and truth, and at once the daughter and the mother of R.A. 1100 Thus, while every Egyptian god proper is Neb Mott, lord of law, Thoth is in particular the Logos, reason, or word, and so becomes the sustainer of Osiris against his enemies. 1101 This latter conception is seen entering Greek mythology at three stages, first in the myth of, 1, Hermes, who is Logos in the sense of being either a moon god like Thoth 1102 or simply wind god and so the messenger of the gods. 1103 Later, in the ennobled worship of, 2, Apollo and Athene, of whom the former is the mouth of Zeus and revealer of his counsel, hence the typical god of oracles, and the latter, grouped with her brother and father in a triad. 1104 is also her father's wisdom. 1105 and still later, in the period of developing theosophy, in the myth of, 3, Métis, essentially the personified reason and intelligence of Zeus. 1106. In a more sophisticated form, the idea of the god as lawgiver is met with in the myth of Zeus and Minus 1107 the Cretan institutor, himself a purely mythical figure, like Moses, and, like him, presumably a deity of an earlier age. 1108 and again in the legend of King Numa and his Egeria. 1109 Such myths may conceivably rise either as an inference from the ordinary phenomenon of the seer or sorcerer or priest who claims to have sought and to have been inspired by the god. Or as the attempts of a late theosophy to remove anthropomorphism from the popular lore. On the latter view, they are paralleled by the attempts of the Evemerists to explain the teaching god as a myth set up by the fame of a human teacher. Thus Auranus is figured as a mortal who first gathered men in cities, gave them laws and agriculture, and taught them to observe the stars, the movements of the sun, and the division of months and the year, whence his final deification. 1110 and similarly Orpheus becomes Caesar interpreter K. Deorum, who deterred savage men from slaughters and foulness of life. 1111 and, either by way of spontaneous evolution or as a result of Semitic or other Eastern influence, we find among the Yorubas of Nigeria an oracle god and teaching god, if a, who utters moral maxims. And figures alternately as a demigod who mastered and taught medicine, divination, and prophecy, and so was deified, and as the firstborn son of the creator and the mother goddess, the savior god being the secondborn. 1112 2. The Logos. All such doctrines, it is probable, were represented in the later, if not in the earlier, Babylonian religion, and the idea of the Logos is probably early in Mazdaism. 1113 But in any case it was from the outside that it was pressed upon Judaism, to the extent, as we have seen, of making a personality out of that word of God which originally, came, to the prophets in the sense that his spirit was held to have entered into them. The whole evolution is noticeably parallel to that of the principles of law and government in states, from the stage in which the king or chief is judge and as such, God, to that in which he is surrounded by graded orders of priests and counselors, jurists and administrators. The Logos is in a manner the heavenly grand vizier. It is impossible, however, to fix a date for the origin of the special dogma of the Logos. To take it as a Greek invention is to ignore the very problem of origins. An eminent Sanskritist assures us in one passage not only that the doctrine of the Logos is, exclusively Aryan, but that, whoever uses such words as Logos, the word, monogenes, the only begotten, prototokos, the firstborn, hyos tu theu. The Son of God, has borrowed the very germs of his religious thoughts from Greek philosophy. 1114 While in another passage he admits that the conceptions of the word as found in the Psalms 1115 and of the angel as found in the Pentateuch, are purely Jewish, uninfluenced as yet by any Greek thought. 1116 Other eminent Sanskritists, again, have shown that the river goddess Sarasvati is in the later Brahmanic mythology identified with Vak, or Vak, equal speech, and becomes under different names the spouse of Brahma and the goddess of wisdom and eloquence, and is invoked as a muse. 
While in the Mahabharata she is called the mother of the Vedas, 1117 elsewhere the personified Vak enters into the rishis or sages as inspiration. 1118 again, when the Brahmarshis were performing austerities prior to the creation of the universe, a voice derived from Brahma entered into the ears of them all, the celestial Sarasvati was then produced from the heavens. 1119 as among the Greeks and the Jews, so among the Hindus the doctrine of the sacred or creative word is various. In the Satapatha Brahmana, Prajapati, who is, composed of seven males, first of all things created the Veda, which became the foundation on which he, created the waters from the world in the form of speech. Speech belonged to him. It was created. It pervaded all this. In the same document the cosmic egg is the primordial source from it the Veda was first created, the triple essence. Hence men say, the Veda is the firstborn of this whole creation. They say of a learned man that he is like Agni, for the Veda is Agni's mouth, 1120 the personified Vak, Sarasvati, river goddess and goddess of speech, is doubtless the later evolution, 1121 just as is the Greco-Jewish Sophia. But there can be no question that the conception of the Veda as the Word, the first created thing or firstborn being, is fully present in the Brahmanas. In the Taittiriya Brahmana, Vak, speech, is an imperishable thing. The mother of the Vedas, and the center point of immortality, 1122 being thus identified with Sarasvati as a foreset, but this does not affect the dogma, set forth by Sankara, that, from the eternal Word the world is produced. 1123 Again, in the Satapatha Brahmana, speech is the Rig Veda, mind the Yajur Veda, breath the Sama Veda, 1124 In the Taittiriya, it is true, the Veda is created after the Soma, 1125 But such a variation, we shall see, occurs also in Jewish lore. And among the Vedantists, finally, the word, Sabda, is God, Brahma. 1126 As regards, again, the more philosophical side of the Logos doctrine, the conception of an all-pervading and primordial reason, Tao or Tao, we find it most explicitly and coherently set forth in China by Lao Tzu. With a doctrine of a unity and trinity of forms of existence 1127 in the 6th century before our era. 1128. Are we then to suppose that such speculation originated with the Ionian Greeks, was passed on by them to the Jews, and by Jews or Greeks or both to the Persians, and thence to the Brahmins and the Chinese? Such a hypothesis is visibly unmanageable. The Pythagorean derivation of Plato's doctrine of the Logos is tolerably clear. And its connection with the planetary lore of the eight heavenly powers, as well as with the lore of numbers and proportion. 1129 tells of a source such as only the Chaldean or Egyptian schools of astrology and astronomy can be supposed to represent in the early Greek sphere. Babylonian religion contains the principle of the Logos in its most definite primary form, the doctrine of the divine name, which is the germ of the Platonic doctrine of ideas no less than of the Philonic and Johannine theology. We even find it in a form approximated to in the Pentateuch, where the name of Yahweh is, in, the promised, angel, leader, 1130 and made familiar later by the Jewish Toldoth Jeshu as well as by the modified Christian formula, the teaching. Namely, that the mystic name of the Supreme God is known to him alone, and is revealed by him solely to his Son, who has thus virtually all power in heaven and on earth. 1131. This idea, which prevailed equally in Egypt and in Western Asia, is purely animistic. To pronounce a name is to call up and conjure the being who bears it. The name possesses personality. To name a thing is to create it, that is why creation is often represented as accomplished by the word. 1132 Further, we know from Damascus, whose list of Babylonian god names is made good by the remains actually discovered in recent times, that Toth, mother of the gods, first bore a son, Moimiz, who was, the intelligible world. 1133 here is the very formula of Philo. Of the god Nebo, too, who has so many attributes of the Logos, it is noted that his Akkadian prototype, was once the universe itself, 1134, a likely source of such an identification in his case. 
If then the Jews had the Logos idea before their contact with the Greeks and the Mazdeans, 1135 the reasonable assumption is that they had it from a source from which the Mazdeans and Ionian Greeks could also have it, the Babylonian lore. In which were accumulated the current fancies of thousands of years of Asiatic speculation, including that of the ancient civilization from which was derived that of the Chinese. And when we find the Brahmanic philosophy, like the Babylonian and Greek, making all things originate from a watery abyss 1136 and again from the cosmic egg. 1137 we have at least cause to surmise that the Babylonian and Indian systems draw from one central source. It is true that the Indian lore seems best to combine the ideas of origination through the word and through water. And that the word saras means not only water but voice, when sarasvati equals not only the watery but also the vocal or the sounding. 1138 Here, too, we seem to be in touch with primitive thought, for among the, perhaps partly Semitized, Yorubas of Nigeria there seems to have been a primary conception of moving water as the source of sound and of wisdom. 1139 But while this is visibly more homogeneous than the late Hebrew evolution of a creative Sophia who equates with the creative Logos without any adaptation to the primordial abyss of waters, or ocean stream, as in Homer, on which the spirit had creatively moved. On the other hand the relative lateness 1140 of the evolution of Vak and Sarasvati leaves open the presumption that a foreign influence has been at work. Agni, also, the fire god, is finally identified with the word, he too, in the Vedas, is the son of the water and messenger of the gods. 1141 and his worship connects visibly with the fire worship not only of the Mazdeans but of the Babylonians, for whom also Jibal and Nusku, or Jibal Nusku, the fire gods are sons of the Creator. Jibal in particular being, the firstborn of heaven, Anu, and the image of his father, while Ea, the water god, is the lord of life, and also the father of the fire god, who in turn is the messenger and counselor of the gods. Clothed with their attributes. 1142 The blended characteristics of Sarasvati, finally, are found in the Babylonian goddess Sarpanatum, who, as finally blended with Erua, the daughter of Ea, was at once, lady of the deep, voice of the deep. And, the possessor of knowledge concealed from men, attributes all deriving from the fact that, wisdom and the life-giving principle were two ideas associated in the Babylonian mind with water. 1143 In these various nations, surely, we have the true, germs, alike of the Hindu, the Heraclitian, and the Platonic concepts of the word or reason, of the conception of Hermes as Logos and messenger of the gods, of Apollo as his father's wisdom. Of the Hindu, of the Hebrew, and of the Greek formulas of firstborn and only begotten, and so alike of the later Judaic and the Christian theosophy. The further research is carried into the affiliation of the cults and creeds of Asia Minor and Syria, the more clearly does it appear that all relate to the great central mass of theosophy accumulated in Babylonia, which was still a culture force in the earlier centuries of the Christian era. 1144 That system had inferably given to the Christian Gnostics their astrology and magic, their doctrine of the immortality of souls, not bodies, their Sophia. Their conception of a savior, knowledge giver, and mediator, 1145 It is sufficiently unlikely, then, that it had failed to evolve as did Brahmanism the concept of the Logos. The rational presumption is that it gave that concept to Greek and Jew alike. But the Jewish evolution was apparently piecemeal. Different ideas and doctrines, such as that of Métis, Thoth, Thoth Khonsu, the combined Logos, Moon God, and Sun God. 1146 Vohumano, the Good Mind, combined with Mitra. 1147 in the Platonic Logos, probably motived the separate evolution in Judaic literature of the personifications of Sophia or Wisdom. 1148 The Good Spirit, 1149 and the later Logos. In one book the Logos leaps down from heaven out of the royal throne, 1150 and, as a fierce man of war, wields the divine command as a destructive sword. 1151 in another, Sophia is as distinctly personified, she, came out of the Most High, but He created her, from the beginning before the world, and she alone, encompassed the circuit of heaven. 1152 The writer means to be metaphorical, but for the many the effect must be graphic. 
And this development took place and prepared for yet others, though Judaism was ostensibly bound to resist the multiplication of personalities thus set up, and was further predisposed to a male as against a female principle. In this respect, as in so many others, it exhibits its derivations from an affinities with savage thought, for among the Yorubas of Nigeria, in our own time, we find the primary conception, first, of the natural trinity of father, mother, and son, with the general concept, behind that, of the mother of all, who in time tends to be resolved into or superseded by a male. 1153 perhaps as a result of the supersession of the matriarchate. Some such progression seems to have taken place among the Hebrews. The original, Holy Spirit, properly feminine, had in general been kept very much in the background, perhaps in fear of the old developments of goddess worship, in which the symbol of the dove, taken by the Christists as standing for chastity, had really represented sexuality and fecundity. 1154 But the mythopoeic faculty, in its new forms of verbalism and pseudo-philosophy, was stronger than dogma, and stronger than fear. Accordingly we have Philo, at the traditional beginning of the Christian era, accumulating round the logos the various aspects of the earlier word and Sophia, and fitfully adding to them those of divine sonship and messiahship. And even the creative function of demiurgos, thus at times reducing Yahweh to a somewhat remote abstraction. 3. Derivations of the Christian Logos It is significant of the difficulty of winning a hearing for an important new truth in hierology that, a hundred years after the elaborate development of the Logos doctrine in Philo Judeus was fully demonstrated. The fact is no part of ordinary knowledge even among scholars, if they be not theologians. 1155 Bryant, who first among English writers made the complete demonstration, held that Philo derived his ideas from association with the Christians. That is obviously a delusion. 1156 But there can be no question about the actuality of the parallel between the Philonic and the Johannine and other Christian forms of the doctrine. And it may be that a list of Philo's dicta as drawn up by the unsuspecting Bryant 1157 will be more acceptable than one of those compiled by later scholars. Attributes of the Logos in the Writings of Philo Judeus 1158. 1. Son of God. De Agricultura, 12, De Confusion Linguarum, 14, De Profugis, 20. 2. Second Divinity. De Legum Allegoriarum, 2, 21, Frag. In Yuseb. Prep. Evang, 8, 13. 3. First Begotten Son of God. De Agric, 12, De Somnius, I, 37, De Sion F. Ling. 14, 18. Quat Deus Immutab. 6. 4, Image of God. De Mundi Opific. 8, De Psalm. I, 41, De Sion F. Ling. 14, 18, 20, 28, De Profug. 19, De Monarchia, 2, 5. 5. Superior to Angels. Frag. In Yuseb. Prep. Evang. 8, 13, De Sion F. Ling. 28. 6. Superior to All Things. The Leg. A Leg. 3, 31, 60, 61. 7. Instrument by whom the world was created. De Mundi Opif. 6. De Cherubim, 35, De Monarchia, 2, 5, De Profug. 18, De Leg. A Leg. 3, 31. 8, Vicegerent of God, on whom all depends. De Agric, 12, De Psalm. I, 41, De Profug. 20. 9, Light of the World. De Psalm. I, 13, 15, 18. 10, Alone Can See God. De Sion F. Ling. 20. 11, Resides in God. De Profug. 18, 19. 12, Most Ancient of God's Works. De Profug. 19, The Leg. A Leg. 3, 60, 61. 
13, esteemed the same as God. The Psalm. I, 12, 23, 41, 2, 36. 14, Eternal. De Plantat. No, 5. 15, Beholds all things. The Leg. A Ledger. 3, 59. 16, Maintains the World. De Mose, 3, 14, De Profug. 20, De Psalm. I, 47. 17. Nearest to God, without any separation. De Professor 19. 18, Free from all taint of sin. De Profug. 20, 21, De Psalm. I, 23. 19, Presides over the imperfect and the weak. De Leg. A Ledger. 3, 61, 62. 20, Fountain of Wisdom. De Profug. 18, 25. 21. A Messenger Sent from God. De Agric, 12, Kazrirum Divin. Hares, 42, De Abrahamo, 36, De Professor 1. 22, Advocate, Paraclete, for Man Kazrare. D.I.V. Hares, 42. De Mos, 3, 14. 23, Orderer and Disposer of All Things. Kazrare. D.I.V. Hare. 46, 48. 24, Shepherd of God's Flock. De Agric, 12. 25, Governor of the World. De Profug. 20. 26, Physician who heals all evil. De Leg. A Leg. 3, 62. 27, The Seal of God. De Professor 2, De Plant. No, 5. 28, Sure Refuge of Those Who Seek Him. De Somnius, I, 15, De Profug. I, 18, 19, 21. 29, Gives Heavenly Food to All Who Seek It. De Leg. A Ledger. 3, 56, 58-62, De Profug. 25, Kazrirum Divin. Hares, 39. 30, On Men's Forsaking Their Sins Give Spiritual Freedom. De Psalm. I, 15. De Congressu Quarendi Irud. Grazia, 19, 30. 31, Frees Men From All Corruption. De Congressu, 30, De Professor 18, 21, Cas Rare. D.I.V. Hares, 38. Is the water of everlasting life. De Professor 18. 32, Not merely Son of God, but well beloved child. Ref. To the leg. A leg. 3, 64, where, however, Alpha Gamma Alpha Pi Eta Tau Omicron Upsilon Tau Epsilon Kappa Nu Omicron Upsilon does not refer to the Logos. 33, Means of Man's Spiritual Happiness. Kazrirum Divin. Hares, 42. 34, Admits to the Assembly of the Perfect. De Sacrificius, 2, 3, De Profug. 18. 35. Raises the just to the presence of the Creator. Ibid. 36, The True High Priest. De Somnius, I, 37, De Leg. A Ledger. 3, 26, De Profug. 20. 37, Word, High Priest, and Mediator. Cas Rare. D.I.V. Hares, 42, De Somme. I, 37, De Mose, 3, 14. Much discussion has taken place over the question whether Philo really conceived his logos as a person 1159, a problem of which the futility may be realized after asking whether Christians today conceive of the Holy Ghost as a person. That Philo should be inconsistent. That he should successively make his logos a deity, a spoken utterance, a creative power, an instrument, an aspect of the deity, a far-seeing spirit, a refuge, the firstborn son of the deity, a high priest and mediator, the covenant. 
1160 The Coordinating Law of the Universe, an Eternal Entity, the First Created Thing, an Angel 1161 The Sun 1162 The Chief of the Angels 1163 A Body of Doctrine, the Scriptures, Moses 1164, an Abstraction of Wisdom. The Soul of the World 1165, all this belonged to his mental habit and that of the students of his age. It was impossible for such minds to be consistent or even momentarily clear, all philosophic thought was for them a shapeless cloud of words and verbal images. But where the born verbalizers fluctuated through a hundred forms of phrase, simpler minds inevitably reduced abstractions to personality sans phrase. 1166 In the Book of Enoch the Messiah is identified, apparently long before Philo, with a first created power who has the characteristics of the Logos. 1167 For most neologizing Jews, in short, the Logos passed into personal status just as did Vohumano, the good mind, for the Mazdeans. Because the perpetual naming of an abstraction in religious lore or ritual sets up for the believer an idea of separate personality or nothing. The personalizers were but doing what their simpler ancestors had done before when they gave personality to natural objects, winds, rivers, diseases, thunder, and lightning. They did so because they could not help it. And Philo, with his superior verbal resources, psychologizes helplessly all the while on the primitive plane. It is thus quite misleading to say that in his writings, from first to last the Logos is the thought of God, dwelling subjectively in the infinite mind, planted out and made objective in the universe. 1168 Supposing such a formula to have real significance for anyone today, supposing it to be compatible with a theistic proposition of personality, it could have no meaning for Philo. Who would not have written as he did if he could so have formulated? Though the triplication of thought and God and infinite mind may be said to be a good deal in his spirit. What we learn from such a verbal construction is that if a modern academic cannot propound a Logos idea without self-contradiction, much less could an Alexandrian Jew. And the historical conclusion remains clear, that the Christian doctrine of the Logos is simply a deposition in dogmatic form, round the nucleus of a sacramental cult. Of the vaporous haze of thought set up in the Jewish world by Yahwistic speculation on Gentile notions. 1169 It was the presence of the Jesuist nucleus that wrought the solidification. For Philo there was no bar to a multiplication of Logoi. And besides making Logoi of both Moses and Aaron 1170 he has a multitude of lesser Logoi who figure endlessly as thoughts, words, angels, laws, forces, and reasons. 1171 His Bible withheld him from deifying the actual priest or emperor. Moses was for him definitely reduced to human status, and to the prophets he pays remarkably little attention, merely citing one occasionally as a companion of Moses. 1172 Finally, he appears in several treatises to be, like the writer of the 51st Psalm. 1173 Ethically indifferent to sacrifice 1174, so much so that it would be difficult to believe that the same hand wholly wrote these and others in which he accepts a modified form of the principle of atonement. 1175 Were it not for the numerous proofs in every treatise that his philosophy is always in a state of flux. In one passage he adumbrates a combination of the ideas of the mediatorial Logos and the National Messiah. 1176 But a mind so fixed as his on allegory and symbol and abstraction was unprepared to make a definite Logos out of a sacrificed demigod, even had he lived to see the new Jesuist movement. It is the merest truism, therefore, to say that in his lore the Logos idea never comes to dogmatic birth. Jesuism precipitated it on the Eucharistic sacrifice, thus excluding further vacillations. But the idea of the Sophia, which, following the book of the wisdom of Jesus ben Sirach, he also manipulates 1177 and which was no less potentially adaptable, never came to dogmatic birth at all. Save in Gnostic teachings which the Church was finally able to suppress. On the other hand, Philo's doctrine of the Holy Spirit 1178, which in his theosophy remains as indeterminate as his notion of the Logos, and is much less stressed than either that or the notion of the Sophia. With both of which it vaguely blends, did find dogmatic acceptance in the formula of the Christian Trinity. The Sophia would have been on many grounds more suitable, 
supplying as she would the normal demand for a mother goddess. And the male spirit, as a matter of fact, has always remained an extremely dim conception, availing very little for the Christian cult. But the formation of a trinity was forced upon Christism by many of its theosophic precedents. 1179 and the admission of a goddess was vetoed by the ascetic principle which was in the ascendant when the doctrine was formulated, so many and various are the forces which determine the growth of a syncretic system in a religiously crowded environment. Such are the chances of social selection. Had not the ascetic principle been thus temporarily active, and had not the craving for a secondary teaching God been for the time satisfied by identifying the sacrificed God with the Logos. An identification of Mary with both Sophia and the Spirit, originally feminine, would have been an equally natural and an equally facile proceeding, the preparation having been sufficiently made on Judaic lines. As it was, the exaltation of Mary, when it came about afterwards as a result of the stressing of the metaphysical aspects of the Son, was undertaken too late for the grafting of a dogmatic Sophia on the new sacred books. And the still later attempt at a new gospel in the 13th century was crushed by the preponderating power of the papacy. But it is none the less clear that the doctrine of the Logos is a product of the same process of primitive psychology as produces deities of any order. 4. The Search for a Historical Jesus Thus far there is no difficulty in tracing a purely speculative process. The doctrine of the Logos is indeed the first stumbling block of those who seek to reconcile the fourth gospel with the synoptics as a biographical document. And the very abstractness of the conception moves men at the first brush to turn with the more confidence to the concrete teachings put in the God's mouth in the other books. But if they continue critically to reflect, they find one cause after another to regard this concreteness as illusory. 1180 Many of the utterances of the God, when weighed, are seen to be of the same order as those of the fourth gospel, hence the many vindications of that document. And vigilant attention to the differences of content in the synoptic sets up insoluble doubts as to their authority. Long ago it was pointed out, with no very clear view of the inference to be drawn, that the Sermon on the Mount is a patchwork from previous Jewish literature. 1181 And at length the pressure of criticism has forced the more intelligent professional students of the New Testament to admit the insecurity of the old assumptions, and to attempt a restatement of the case for belief in the historicity of Jesus. The present state of the argument can perhaps be best set forth by way of criticism of the most important of these attempts, the second section of the article, Gospels, in the Encyclopedia Biblica, written by Professor Schmiedel, of Zurich. It is a masterpiece of critical arrangement and expert knowledge, demanding the attention of every serious student, so that our time could not be better spent. Passing in review all the main attempts to resolve the Gospels into a few mutually interactive primary sources, Professor Schmiedel comes to the conclusion that no such attempt will hold good. This verdict disposes of an amount of laborious research grievous to think of. For a full hundred years, German theologians by the score have been struggling with this problem, toiling devotedly, trying hypothesis upon hypothesis, refining upon refinements, always hoping to get to, or sure of having reached. A solid textual and historical foundation, even as they so long sought for one in the quicksands of the Pentateuch. At length, in the name of professional exegesis, Professor Schmiedel sounds the retreat. There are no true sources, no really primary and trustworthy documents in the Gospel Amalgam. There are only 91182 entirely credible texts. One thinks of Meredith's figure of the hosts upon hosts of charging waves, whose achievement is only to throw that faint thin line upon the shore. And what are the entirely credible texts? With due care and respect, let us enumerate the forlorn handful of unwounded survivors. 1. M. K. X. 17. F. F. Y. Chiaest thou me good, etc. 2. M. T. 12. 31. F. F. Blasphemy against the Son of Man pardonable. 3. M. K. 3. 21. He is beside himself. 4. M. K. 13. 32. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, etc. 5. M. K. 15. 34. M. T. 27. 46. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 6. M. K. 8. 
12, no sign shall be given to this generation. 7, Mk. 6, 5, he was able to do no mighty work. 8, Mk. 8, 14 to 21, rebuke to the disciples concerning bread and leaven. 9, Mt. 11, 5, Lk. 7, 22. Passage to be taken in the sense of spiritual healing, since it ends with mention of preaching, not a miracle at all. It will be seen on what principles Professor Schmiedel proceeds. Where Jesus speaks simply as a man, making no pretense to divinity, to miraculous powers, to prophecy, or to a messianic mission. And where he is represented as failing to impress his relatives and neighbors with any sense of his superiority, there the record is entirely credible. From this position Dr. Schmiedel makes a leap to the conclusion that the entirely credible, that is, the possible, is the demonstratively historical. Let us take his own words, section 139. These, passages, might be called the foundation pillars for a truly scientific life of Jesus. Should the idea suggest itself that they have been sought out with partial intent, as proofs of the human as against the divine character of Jesus, the fact that all events cannot be set aside that they exist in the Bible and demand our attention. In reality, however, they prove not only that in the person of Jesus we have to do with a completely human being, and that the divine is to be sought in him only in the form in which it is capable of being found in a man. They also prove that he really did exist, and that the Gospels contain at least some absolutely trustworthy facts concerning him. If passages of this kind were wholly wanting in them, it would be impossible to prove to a skeptic that any historical value whatever was to be assigned to the Gospels, he would be in a position to declare the picture of Jesus contained in them to be purely a work of fantasy, and could remove the person of Jesus from the field of history. This will shock the believer without satisfying the scientific naturalist. The proposition in the words I have italicized, I submit, is absolutely untenable. On this point may be staked the whole dispute as to the actuality of the Gospel Jesus. The merely credible is not the trustworthy, the proved, if to be credited with plausible utterances be a proof of the actuality of a personage in literature, then we must believe in the historic actuality of half the characters in fiction. 5. The Critical Problem the problem is one that has been before now debated on other issues, and it may be well here to take up these by way of illumination and test. Grote, putting in scientific form a thesis sometimes more summarily phrased by, the plain man, insisted that. The utmost which we accomplish by means of the semi-historical theory is that. After leaving out from the mythical narrative all that is miraculous or high-colored or extravagant, we arrive at a series of credible, equals credible, incidents, incidents which may perhaps have really occurred, and against which no intrinsic presumption can be raised. This is exactly the character of a well-written modern novel, to raise plausible fiction to the superior dignity of truth, some positive testimony or positive ground of inference must be shown. A man who tells us that on the day of the Battle of Plataea rain fell on the spot of ground where the city of New York now stands, will neither deserve nor obtain credit, because he can have no means of positive knowledge. Though the statement is not in the slightest degree improbable. On the other hand, statements in themselves very improbable may well deserve belief, provided they be supported by sufficient positive evidence. Thus the canal dug by Xerxes across the promontory of Mount Athos, and the sailing of the Persian fleet through it, is a fact which I believe because it is well attested, notwithstanding its remarkable improbability. Which so far misled Juvenal as to induce him to single out the narrative as a glaring example of Grecian mendacity. 1183. To this contention it is objected by Sir C. Lyle that, if we may only receive as credible those ancient narratives which could not possibly turn out to be very plausible fiction, we shall be hard pushed for the trustworthy authentication of much early history, religious and secular. Secondly, the example of the supposed assertion as to simultaneous rainfall at Plataea and in Massachusetts is hardly fair. A man's assertion of an isolated fact of which he could not possibly have any positive knowledge, either directly or by hearsay, is a very different thing from affirming credible facts which might reasonably 
and according to the known habits of the people who relate the facts, have been handed down by tradition from the persons who witnessed them to those who related them. 1184 To this very reasonable argument the answer is that it does not meet Grote's case, and that when we have assented to it the problem remains as before. In regard to many credible facts which might conceivably have been handed down by tradition we are still bound to say that, when related concerning supernatural personages. They are not tolerable evidence of anything done by a real person whose history formed the nucleus of the myth. The proposition as to rain on the site of New York on the day of Plataea is an illustration, not a universal parallel. The fact remains that there is no common sense ground for crediting any one credible assertion made concerning an ostensibly mythical character when we cannot on independent grounds show how the credible story came to be attached to the fable. Sir Alfred Lyell's argument overlooks the demurrer that all particular or specific tradition of a quasi-historical kind is untrustworthy when not corroborated by other evidence. Inasmuch as, one, such tradition usually goes hand in hand with obvious supernaturalist fable, and, two, many such traditions have been disproved by solid evidence. The question is not whether something traditionally asserted to have been said or done by a demigod may not actually have been said or done by a man of the same or another name, but whether, in the absence of other evidence, we are ever entitled to believe and assert that it was. To Grote's negative answer there is no valid demur. The strength of Sir C. Lyle's general claim, that gods or god myths have been built up on bases of actual deeds and events, lies in the concrete proof that this has occurred in modern times. But no such demonstration can enable us to distinguish between the merely possible and the true in ancient tradition. It is conceivable that the Faradun of the Shah Naimi is constructed on a nucleus of reality, to which was added a mass of detail taken from sheer mythology, as myths were heaped upon the story of Cyrus. But in the latter case we have a means of discrimination, in the former we have none, and when we find the very name of Faradun to be a modification of an old god name 1185 we have no right of historical belief left. For the rest, it is beside the case to argue that much accepted history will be cancelled if we accept only narratives which could not possibly turn out to be plausible fiction. Grote never argued that history proper, the record of a time by those who lived in it, is to be so tried. And he constantly accepts narratives which might conceivably be plausible fictions, nay, he occasionally accepts tales which appear to some of us to be fictions. It is when we are dealing with myths that he denies our power to discriminate, in history proper he undertakes, at times too confidently, to discriminate. Broadly speaking, he is entitled so to proceed insofar as he deals with cases on their merits. Some early historical narratives allege facts which could well be known to the narrator or to the community in general, and may be fairly taken as true, some are obviously fanciful, unplausible, ill-vouched. And in many cases they are to be doubted even when free from supernaturalism. Historiography consists in a rational selection. It is true that there are some cases wholly or partly on the borderland between the possible and the incredible, where we may fairly surmise a nucleus of fact, but in regard to these Grote's warning should be always kept in mind. Professor Huxley, who invented the word agnostic, to cover, among other things, the practice of saying that miracles are not impossible, was notably accommodating in his attitude to narratives of the possible. Concerning the story of Saul's visit to the Witch of Ender, he observes that it does not matter very much whether the story is historically true, but that it is quite consistent with probability. And then he adds, that is to say, I see no reason whatever to doubt, that Saul made such a visit, 1186 the leap here is clearly illicit. There is certainly, reason to doubt, the whole story so long as it cannot be shown to have been reduced to writing near the time of Saul. History, is full of discredited, probabilities, of the same kind, the story of Bruce and the spider is a type. The very fact that kings and commoners in ancient Israel did normally consult witches is as much a reason for admitting that the story could easily be invented as for allowing that it could easily have happened. And the details of the apparition, to which Professor Huxley oddly extends a measure of his credence, give good ground for suspecting the entire episode to be fiction. All such cases, in fine, must be tried on their documentary as well as their h priori merits. And, returning to our special problem, 
we note that the credible sayings put in the mouth of the gospel Jesus are in no way certified by their credibility, but are on the contrary put in complete suspicion by their surroundings. Here is Professor Schmiedel's case, reduced to logical form, there are in the gospels hundreds of unlikely sayings ascribed to Jesus, there are nine which are likely. Then the nine not only establish his historic reality, but give a basis for surmise that many of the less likely, as well as many of the narratives of faith healing, are also historical. The answer is, 1, that it must be a desperately bad fiction in which not 5% of the speeches and episodes are credible. On Dar. Schmiedel's view, if only the ancients had ascribed 10 reasonable sayings as well as 12 more or less unlikely labors to Heracles he would be entitled to rank as a historic character. On the other hand, too, the very fact that the figure of the Gospel Jesus won belief much more in virtue of the hundreds of improbabilities and falsities in the Gospels than in virtue of the credible texts quashes the plea for his actuality based on these texts. The true inference is, not that such texts, being unnecessary, must be genuine and not invented. But that since a substantially false or unlikely biography could win ready credence in the period in question there is no reason to surmise a nucleus of actuality which was never demanded. And that the credible texts stand merely for the proportion of plausibility that might reasonably be looked for in any conglomerate of sayings and statements round a fictitious personage. Paul or the forgers, it is evident, believed in a crucified Jesus as to whom they had no biographical record, whether of sayings or doings. Scores of unlikely utterances, it is admitted, were credited to Jesus after Paul's time. Why were they so credited? Plainly because certain men or certain sects desired to give their views the sanction of the God-man's authority. What then does it signify if besides these sayings there are fathered on him a few that are relatively reasonable? And, knowing as we do that the Ebionites, who attributed to him unlikely sayings, nevertheless regarded him as a mere man, what does it signify if sometimes in the gospel he is so represented? Yet again, what plausibility remains in the cry on the cross, Why hast thou forsaken me, when we remember that it is a quotation from the Psalms, and that the whole cult proceeded on the doctrine that, the Christ must need suffer? 1187 it may seem ungracious thus to press the argument against a professed theologian who has already come within sight of, the great surrender, to reason. Schmiedel has indeed gone further in his loyalty to the critical principle than do many professed rationalists. It is only a question of time, however, when his view shall be tested as he has tested other men's, and the process may as well begin here and now. 6. Collapse of the Constructive Case First, then, he has not recognized, 1, the primary reason for doubting the genuineness of every detail of teaching set forth in the Gospels, namely, the total ignorance of those teachings shown in the Pauline epistles. He takes as genuine the plainly interpolated passage in 1 Sior. 11 As to the institution of the Eucharist, then concludes 1188 that, the details of the life of Jesus had so little interest for Paul that, he fails to quote him when he effectively might. To reason thus is to ignore a far greater difficulty than many which the exegete admits to be insuperable. 2. He makes his arguments at some points 1189 turn on the assumption of the general certainty of the whole narrative as to Jesus being a teacher with disciples, who established his cult. Whereas the existence of the disciples is no better proved than many of the data already surrendered. 3. He is evidently biased to his illicit inference that Jesus really existed, by other inferences which, on his own showing, he was not entitled to draw. For instance, he decides 1190 that Jesus probably accomplished faith healing as distinguished from miracles, because, this power is so strongly attested throughout the first and second centuries that, in view of the spiritual greatness of Jesus and the imposing character of his personality, it would be indeed difficult to deny it to him. What then proved the spiritual greatness and the imposing character of Jesus? The nine credible texts. Clearly they amount to no such proof, even if they were genuine, a thousand rabbis might have uttered them. What, again, is the value of the strong attestation of the first and second centuries in the face of the silence of Paul, ostensibly the first witness? The first and second centuries, that is to say the Gospels, 
which certainly did not exist within thirty years of the date alleged for Jesus' death, and the people who believe them equally attest the prodigies which Professor Schmiedel rejects. Is a witness who solemnly affirms twenty impossibilities to be believed whenever he happens to assert something that might be true, while a more important witness, who in the terms of the case ought to have heard of it if it happened, has evidently never heard of it at all. Such reasoning, we may say without hesitation, cannot stand, it is negated by the tests on which Schmiedel has proceeded as against the source finders, and the latter might very well turn upon him with a confident tu quoque. Take, for instance, the passage 1191 in which he presses the point of the obvious untrustworthiness of the reports of Jesus' discourses. And yet let's pass the assumption that these reports may be genuine condensations. Even if the public ministry of Jesus had lasted for a few months only, he must have uttered a thousandfold more than all that has been recorded in the Gospels. His longest discourse would, if delivered in the form in which it has come down to us, not have taken more than some five minutes in the delivery. However self-evident, this has been constantly overlooked by the critics. They are constantly assuming that we possess the several words of Jesus that have been reported approximately in the same fullness in which they were spoken. In the parables and in one or two other utterances, the professor admits, the reports are more extended. In what remains, however, it can hardly be sufficiently emphasized that we possess only an excessively meager praise of what Jesus said, namely, only so much as not only made an immediate impression when first heard, but also continued to survive the ordeal of frequent repetition in this process not only was an extraordinary number of utterances completely lost, but a large number of the sayings of Jesus now received for the first time that consecutive and pointed form which made them seem worthy of further repetition. Without doubt Jesus must very often have repeated himself, but what he assuredly often repeated in many variations has been preserved to us only in a single form. Here again the believer will be perturbed, while the scientific critic will not be propitiated. If there are only nine texts that quite credibly indicate the existence of a man Jesus who taught anything, how can we possibly know, without doubt, that, one, he often repeated himself. And that, two, the existing reports are abbreviations of any spoken discourses whatever. The longest of all, the Th Sermon on the Mount, is demonstrably a pen-made compilation from Hebrew literature. And Professor Schmiedel's previous argument has fully conceded that many of the reports, condensed in appearance as they are, are inventions. That is to say, a brief account of an alleged speech is not to be presumed an epitome of a real speech. The Gospel discourses are short, not because they are records of remembered passages from long speeches, but because the framers had no critical consciousness, and were not accustomed to composing long documents. When we come to the fourth gospel we find longer discourses, in the actuality of which Professor Schmiedel does not believe. But if one gospel maker could invent long discourses, his less literary predecessors could invent short. Once more, if the synoptic discourses are records of commonly remembered passages from Jesuit discourses, how comes it that Paul never cites a word of them? To miss that crux is to make as great an oversight as that of the critics who regarded the so-called Sermon on the Mount as the full report of a real sermon. The fact is that the higher criticism of the New Testament has thus far missed the way just as the higher criticism of the Old so long did, by taking for granted the general truth of the tradition. 1192 it sought to found on the hollow fiction of the Exodus and the Mosaic legislation of the desert, when one intelligent glance at the Book of Judges might have shown that the tabernacle of the desert was a myth. In a similar way it clings to the conception of a preaching and cult-founding Jesus, when an intelligent perusal of the epistles of Paul 1193 can suffice to show that the preaching Jesus was created after they were written. It does not indeed follow that Paul's period was what the tradition represents. The reasonable inference from his doctrine is that his Jesus was either a mythic construction or a mere tradition, a remote figure said to have been crucified, but no longer historically traceable. If then Paul's Jesus, as is conceivable, be merely a nominal memory of the slain Jesus Ben Pandira of the Talmud, about 100 BC, Paul himself may belong to an earlier period than that traditionally assigned to him. Certainly the most genuine-looking epistles in themselves give no decisive chronological clue. 
but such a shifting of his date would not finally help the case for Jesus of Nazareth. Escape the argument from the silence of Paul by putting Paul a generation or more earlier, and you are faced by the fresh incredibility of a second crucified Jesus, a second sacrificed Son of God. Vouched for by records for the most part visibly false, and containing but a fraction of plausible narrative. The only conclusion open is that the teaching Jesus of the Gospels is wholly a construction of the propagandists of the cult, even as is the wonder-working God. 7. Parallel Problems The natural impulse to reject this view with violence may be somewhat modified when it is remembered that it does but place the Christ on a historic level with all the other teaching gods of antiquity. All the leading gods, as we have seen, were in some measure regarded as teachers and for none of them do we surmise a historic original in the sense of a real teacher and lawgiver. But it is not only the so-called gods who are thus dislimbed by criticism. The subdivine or religion-founding and God-proclaiming institutors are found to be no less fabulous, down to the historic period, than the gods they were held to have served. Menu, Lycurgus, Numa, Moses, a whole series of revered founders of codes and creeds, are as such dismissed by criticism to the realm of fable. For even those hierologists who still speak of Moses as a historic person 1194 and treat the Exodus as a historic event, concede to Quenon that the Liberator wrote nothing. And can no more be supposed to have invented the Ten Commandments than did Romulus or Numa the Twelve Tables. Difficulty, indeed, is still made over the alleged personality of Zarathustra but few who closely consider the evidence will say that it supports the claim. 1195 If Zarathustra was a historical character, the proposition is not to be proved by the documents. And those who hold to the affirmative do so on the strength not of the records but of the tradition, and of the presumption in favor of a personal influence behind a notable development. It is the same with the personalities of Orpheus and Musaeus, Wherever the tradition tells of a founder of doctrines or mysteries, criticism on search finds myth. And if we leave open the bare surmise that there was an Orpheus who taught something, it must be with the avowal that we know nothing of what he specially taught. If we take the whole series of traditional teachers down to the Christian era, we find them to be more or less clearly the products of the same tendency as led to the conception of teaching gods, the habit of supposing that everything held to be good came from a specifically divine or supernormal source. Conservative opinion will naturally rally round the remaining non-Christian cases that are either admitted or still claimed to be historical, in particular, those of Muhammad and Buddha. What a man has admittedly done, it may be argued, may have been earlier done by other men. If Muhammad founded a new religion, why not Zoroaster, if Buddha gave a virtually new and potent teaching, why may not a Jesus have done so? The case may very well be tried over those points. First let us note wherein consists the clear historicity of Muhammad. 1. He is far down within the historic period. 2. His religion rose to far-spread power and notoriety within a generation of his death, a far swifter development than that of Christism, so often described as miraculous. 3. He actually left written documents. And though these were certainly redacted, most of them have none of the well-known marks of late fabrication. 4. In virtue of the relation of Islam to Christianity, which had a body of sacred books and claimed a monopoly of truth, a fierce critical light played upon the new cult from the first days of its expansion beyond Arabia. 5. The accounts of the life of Muhammad are normally biographical, and, though not quite certainly true in detail, at no point typically mythical, save as regards the tales of marvels at his birth and in his infancy. Wherein the record conforms to the normal mythopoeic practice of antiquity, seen in the biographies of Plato and Confucius as well as in those of Jesus, Moses, and the gods and demigods in general. Apart from these embellishments, and the tales of his intercourse with angels, he is born and lives and dies normally at known dates, works no miracles, makes no claims to divinity is traceable long before his period of notoriety. Is, in short, recognizable as a historic type of masterful fanatic. In every one of these respects his record differentiates sharply from those of Buddha and Jesus. Absolute date, of course, is not a decisive consideration, we believe in the historicity of certain Jews BC, 
and disbelieve in the legend of William Tell, who is placed 1300 years later. But when we consider the environments in which Jesus and Buddha are supposed to have lived, it becomes clear that the possibilities of fable round such names are boundless. Of neither is it now pretended that he left a written word. For neither do critical scholars now claim that his immediate associates have left written accounts of him, in regard to both it is admitted that many sayings are falsely ascribed to them. Instead, then, of letting the supposed historicity of Buddha plead for that of Jesus, we are led to ask whether the one is not as problematic as the other. 8. The Problem of Buddhist Origins At the first critical glance into Buddhistic origins, the student becomes aware of a dilemma. The Buddha, we are told, delivered a teaching which, though it did not directly repudiate, yet ignored and treated as valueless the belief in deities, and the movement he set up was thus practically atheistic. Yet the legends of his own birth, and many of the narratives concerning his life, are in terms of the supernaturalist beliefs of both earlier and later times. As regards the birth legends, they are found to quadrate in large measure with those of the god Krishna, and at the same time to point to many of the myths of the Vedas. 1196 So that, whatever may have been the origin of the Buddhist movement, it must have been heavily overgrown with supernaturalism when the life of the founder was thus written. The conservative student naturally answers that, though such overlaying and perversion of the master's teaching did take place, he remains nonetheless a real person. And that the proof lies in the many narratives which represent him as speaking like any other mortal teacher. A critical study of the teaching, however, only doubles the dilemma. The accomplished and devoted English scholar who has done so much during the past thirty years to make known the documents of Buddhism to the Western world has no misgivings as to either the historicity of Gautama or his personal establishment of the Buddhist movement in the fashion set forth by the narratives. But the expositor's own scholarly candor puts before us a dozen grounds for doubt. Every cause for skepticism that exists in the cases of Jesus and Moses exists here, with differences of degree. Firstly, the Buddha wrote nothing. Secondly, none of his disciples or contemporaries wrote of him. Thirdly, some of the documents that seem nearest in time to the alleged period of Gautama, such as the dialogues, are thoroughly factitious, and strike a student as the reverse of trustworthy. While others are admittedly literary creations, ascribing to the Buddha extemporaneous verses of a highly finished quality. Fourthly, much of the teaching put in his mouth is of a nature known to be current before his period. As to the nature of his teachings the obscurity is equally great. It is not merely that they contain inconsistencies such as may be fallen into by any teacher, they are so disparate, so discursive, so various in their tone, purpose, and point of view, that a very short critical study reveals difference of source. Time, and aim. And when we contemplate their metaphysic, their minuteness, their demand for leisurely attention and assimilation, we are at a loss to conceive how they could have set up a far-reaching popular movement in any country at any time. As little do we realize why they should have set up any religious society whatever. And the ordinary histories make the assertion without explaining the case. On the other hand, much of the earliest literature exhibits all the marks of doctrinary myth, this by the implicit admission of the scholars who stand critically but confidently for the historicity of the teaching Buddha. The books, of the Sutta Pitaka, profess to give. Not merely the belief itself, but the belief as the Buddha uttered it, with an account of the time when, and the place at which, he uttered it. The Buddha's new method of salvation, his new doctrine of what salvation was, did not present itself to the consciousness of the early Buddhist community as an idea, a doctrine, standing alone, and merely on its own merits. In their minds it was indissolubly bound up with the memory of the revered and striking personality of him who had proclaimed it. 1197 Thus it lies on the face of the case that any narrative could find acceptance which was put in circumstantial form, and that for any doctrine whatever a narrative frame was invented as a matter of course. After the Dhamma, or collection of short scriptures in verse, had come into vogue, the members of the order were no longer contented to learn, and to understand the meaning of the various rules of the Padamaka, part of the Vinaya or rules of the order. A desire sprang up to have, for each of them also, 
a historical basis, to know the story of how the Buddha himself came to lay down the rule to his disciples. And it was only the brother who was properly acquainted with all this, who was accounted a real doctor of the law. 1198. Now, the Dhammapada is believed to be wholly compiled from previous books. And some of its best doctrines are avowedly ancient, as thus, hatred does not cease by hatred at any time, hatred ceases by love, this is an old rule. 1199 Here, then, we have the cult making its teaching God on the ordinary lines, describing Him as supernaturally born, calling Him the Blessed One, and visibly creating for the traditional teacher a flatly fictitious biography. At this early stage, then, Buddhism is seen making its Buddha, and in the act, instead of yielding support by analogy to the belief in the historic Jesus, it vividly suggests a similar process of construction in the case of Christism. We are thus far merely left asking what primitive Buddhism really was. 9. Buddhism and Buddhas Our English guide, than whom no man knows more of Buddhism, gives us a definition, there can be little doubt but that the doctrines of the Four Noble Truths and of the Noble Eightfold Path, the foundation of the Kingdom of Righteousness, were not only the teaching of Gautama himself, but were the central and most essential part of it. 1200 The teachings in question are too well known to need quotation here, they are simply a formal and symmetrical statement of the rules of self-repression by which the Buddhist is to attain the inward peace of nirvana. Or deliverance from blind desires. Let us then assume that these teachings are for Buddhism primordial, what is there to prove that they are the utterances of one Gautama, the Sakya sage, and that his proclamation of them set up an order of disciples? The order, by all accounts, was one of mendicants. Either there were, or there were not, such orders in existence before the Buddhist. If not, we are to suppose that one man, by the simple proclamation of a certain set of quietest principles, calling for self-restraint without any painful self-mortification, induced numbers of men and women, many of them instructed, to take up a new way of life in a country not much given to changes or experiments, and through this host of disciples instituted an order that was to set a great mark on the history of religion. The unlikeliness of such a sudden growth will be generally granted, and indeed it is fully conceded, though this is rarely mentioned in the more popular accounts of Buddhism, that a Sangha or society of the kind was no new phenomenon in Buddha's day. 1201 There seem to have been many. And the Buddhist order avowedly copied their practices. According to Buddhist tradition, and we see no sufficient reason for doubting the correctness of the account, the monks of other, that is, non-Buddhistic sects, used to meet together at the middle and at the close of every half-month, and were accustomed then to proclaim their new teaching in public. At such times, the different sects found an opportunity of increasing their numbers and their influence. The Buddhists also adopted the custom of these periodical meetings, but confined themselves to meeting twice in each month. 1202 our authorities argue indeed that the penitential practice of the Buddhist meetings seems 1203 to have been an original invention of the Buddhists themselves. But here we have on the one hand an avowal that the Buddhists invented notable usages not prescribed by the traditional founder, and on the other hand a failure to demonstrate that the Buddhist practice was not pre-Buddhistic. 1204 On the face of the case, the claim is distinctly improbable, in view of the other data. For the rest, the Jainist movement admittedly dates from the same period. Mendicant sages are recognized in the Buddhist books as common phenomena before Buddha, 1205 and the same kinds of rules of conduct seem to have been general, save that the Buddhist was not so painfully ascetic as some others. The Buddhist movement, then, was one on anciently familiar lines. What is more, the title of, the Buddha, which means, the enlightened, so far from making claim to a new departure, was an implicit acknowledgement of continuance in established ideals. In the Pali and Sanskrit texts the word Buddha is always used as a title, not as a name. The historical Buddha is represented to have taught that he was only one of a long series of Buddhas who appear at intervals in the world, and who all teach the same system. After the death of each Buddha his religion flourishes for a time and then decays, till it is at last completely forgotten, and wickedness and violence rule over the earth. Gradually then the world improves. 
Until at last a new Buddha appears who again preaches the lost Dharma or truth, the names of twenty-four of these Buddhas who appeared previous to Gautama have been handed down to us, the Buddhavansa or history of the Buddhas. Gives the lives of all the previous Buddhas before commencing the account of Gautama himself, and the Pali commentary on the Jatakas gives certain details regarding each of the twenty-four. 1206. The number and the names may very well be, as our historian argues, late inventions, but there can be no question as to the fact of the belief. An early tradition avows that, after, the Buddha had made sixty converts in three months, sent them in different directions to preach and teach, and again converted the whole population of Rajagriha, the capital of King Bimbisara. He encountered a period of hostility, in which his disciples were ridiculed as preachers of a doctrine of depopulation. Appealed to by them for counsel, he advised them to say that the Buddha was only trying to preach righteousness, as former Buddhas had done. 1207 Even in the late commentary of Buddhaghosa on the Dialogues of Gautama, the Blessed One is represented as exhorting his disciples to be earnest, because hard is it to meet with a Buddha in the world. 1208 So in the Dhammapada we have the text, a Buddha is not easily found. Wherever such a sage is born, the race prospers. 1209 In the name Bhagava, the Blessed One, is equally impersonal, the Buddhist traditions themselves telling of Gautama's discussions with Bhagava, Alara, and Nidraka. 1210 Finally, in the 4th century of our era, there was certainly near to Srivasti a sect of Buddhists who rejected Gautama, reverencing only the three previous Buddhas, and especially Kasyapa whose body they believed to be buried under one of the Dagobas at which they, as well as the Orthodox, worshipped, while another was said to be built over the spot where he had died. 1211. There were probably current, then, at and before the time of Gautama's alleged teaching, any number of teachings credited to, the Buddha, and, the Blessed One, and these might include many afterwards ascribed to Gautama. Given, then, an absolute absence of evidence for the transcription of any teachings of Gautama in his lifetime, on what grounds are we to believe that they were with knowledge ascribed to a man of that name? Whose life answered to the non-supernatural details given in the legends? Nay, seeing that even the name Gautama or Gautama is on the one hand a common one, 1212, and on the other hand, as, Gautama of the race of Gautama, full of mythological associations. 1213 And seeing further that there was admittedly another Gautama known to the early Buddhists who also founded an order, 1214 What proof is there that sayings and doings of different Gautamas may not have been ascribed to one person? On the view, again, that the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path are the oldest doctrines of the Buddhist movement, and were formulated by one Gautama. What reason is there to believe that the movement either, a, arose or, b, made any progress on the simple basis of those teachings. Bauer, believing in the historicity of the Gospel Jesus, yet makes the avowal, how soon would everything true and important that was taught by Christianity have been relegated to the series of long-faded sayings of the noble humanitarians and thinking sages of antiquity? Had not its teachings become words of eternal life in the mouth of its founder? 1215 Similarly may we not ask, how, in much believing India, could any large organized movement develop on the simple nucleus of a teaching of self-control? Which differed from the common practice of Hindu asceticism only in its renunciation of positive self-maceration? Nay, supposing a sage to have framed an eightfold path of, right belief, right aims, right speech, right actions, right means of livelihood, right endeavor, right mindfulness, right meditation. How should he intelligibly proceed to establish his way by forming an order of mendicants? 1216 Our guide himself explains that these, classified statements of moral truth, were, addressed to Brahmins skilled in the dialectics of the time, and they certainly have that aspect. But why should they be offered as a primary code for a new mendicant order? It will doubtless be answered that such a priori objection is unwarranted. That we must take the evidence as we find it and recognize as the primary teaching of the founder of Buddhism the doctrines repeatedly ascribed to him in the oldest documents. 
But when we inquire historically into the oldest documents and their authenticity we learn from our leading instructors that the received tradition of the first Buddhist council which, collected the sayings of the Master, is proved to be late and untrustworthy by an early Sutta. Which gives all the story of the heresy that is historically stated as the motive for the council, but says nothing of such a council taking place. The author of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, says Dr. Oldenburg, did not know anything of the first council, and Professor Rhys Davids agrees. 1217 And this very Sutta, the Book of the Great Decease, is open to suspicion of lateness, inasmuch as it makes the Blessed One figure at the head of a great movement in his lifetime. Traveling sometimes with five hundred and sometimes with twelve hundred and fifty disciples. What is more, it represents him as giving forth a kind of teaching hard to reconcile with other doctrine ascribed to him as typical. For in the very first chapter of the Sutta, section 4, he is made to lay it down as one of the conditions of the permanent prosperity of a certain tribe of Vagians that they honor and esteem and revere and support the Vagian shrines in town or country. And allow not the proper offerings and rites, as formerly given and performed, to fall into desuetude. 1218 It may well be said of such a teacher that, so far from having opposed Hinduism and destroyed a system of iniquity and oppression and fraud, he lived and died a Hindu. 1219 But does such doctrine correlate with the denial of the permanence of the gods, and of the value of prayers and sacrifices, also ascribed to the Buddha by tradition and documents? The traditional First Council, then, which figures as the first historical authority for the existence of the Buddha's teachings, is later, if it ever took place at all, than a sutta which ascribes to him a teaching wholly different in spirit and aim from those commonly held to be typical and essential in his doctrine. But indeed Pali scholars are more and more convinced that the First Council is a mere literary myth, to assign to which a historical date is to put a false problem. 1220 And if the First Council thus goes by the board, of what value is the late tradition that the Council of Visali was held a hundred years after the Buddha's death? Our authorities argue that since the ten points said to have been there vehemently discussed are not mentioned in the earlier sections of the Mahavaga, these must be prior to the Council. And that as the Padamaka is visibly older still, the last named section of the Vinaya must be very old indeed. 1221 The answer is, 1 that the Council of Visali 1222 may have been centuries later than the date traditionally assigned to it, and, two, that the Vinaya texts in general, if relatively old, have nothing of the character of an innovating propaganda. Nothing of the nature of an appeal which would create a new order, but rather correspond to the late code of rules framed for monastic orders in Christendom a thousand years after the foundation of the Christian cult. The fact that they are all ascribed to the founder is but one more evidence of the total lack of the critical or historical sense among the members. 10. The Buddhist Crucis Looking, then, for a foothold among the shifting sands of Buddhist tradition, we note the following clashing records. 1. The Buddha is represented alike in ostensibly early and in late tradition as speaking of, the gods, with full belief in their existence. 1223. 2. He is represented on the one hand as discouraging sacrifices, 1224 and on the other hand as prescribing for a whole tribe a strict adherence to ancient rites, 1225. 3. King Asoka, who figured as a good Buddhist in the early vigor of the movement, about 250 BC, habitually called himself, the delight of the gods, as did his contemporary the pious Buddhist king of Ceylon, 1226. 4. The Buddha is represented as throwing his order open to all classes, and at the same time as making the name, Brahman, a term of honor for his arahats or saints. Brahmins, too, are said to have been among his most distinguished disciples. And the dialogues represent his conversations with them. 5. Much teaching that certainly did not come from Buddha is admittedly ascribed to him, the principle being that he delivered the whole canon. 6. Much philosophic matter set forth as his teaching is nearly identical with much of the Sankhya system, of which at least the germs are admittedly pre-Buddhistic. 1227. The last two circumstances are fully acknowledged by our Buddhist scholars. Oldenburg writes, 
I have essentially modified my previous skepticism in regard to the connection of the two systems, and seen reason to place Buddhism considerably closer to the Sankhya than my former researches suggested. 1228 and Professor Rhys Davids, enumerating the long list of advantages claimed by the Buddha in one of the dialogues for the life of a recluse, concedes that it is perfectly true that of these thirteen consecutive propositions or groups of propositions, it is only the last, no. 13, which is exclusively Buddhist, 1229 the exception being, the realization of the four truths, the destruction of the asavas, lusts, errors, and ignorance, and attainment of arahatship. Professor Davids goes on to make the claim, but the things omitted, the union of the whole of those included into one system, the order in which the ideas are arranged, all this is also distinctively Buddhist. This claim, however, does not affect the significance of the admission, and is itself provocative of a new pressure of criticism. For if the exclusively Buddhist section be the last of all, is not the fair presumption this, that the Buddhist formula here has merely been added to an existing doctrine, appropriated by Buddhists? Among the specified rules of conduct admitted to be not exclusively Buddhist are many that go far to constitute the content of the Eightfold Path, which is thus obviously but a separate classification of precepts or ideals common to other schools. The same question arises again over the admission 1230 that, the Eightfold Path is not mentioned in our Sutta, the Samanaphala. And that, as regards three of the four lines of ethical precept to be traced in the teaching under notice, Buddhism in the first goes very little beyond the current ethics of the day. In the second and third proceeds mainly on the practice of pre-Buddhistic recluses and orders, and only in the fourth, specifying the Buddhistic program for arahatship, takes up a special stand. 1231 But on analysis it is found that this accepted doctrine is at most only verbally special to Buddhism, since the other schools also certainly professed to put down lust of life and physical pleasure, error, and ignorance. And it is not pretended that the word arahat was a Buddhist monopoly. The further we go, the stronger becomes the stress of doubt. Where we are not certainly dealing with pre-Buddhistic doctrine under the form of dialogues held by the Buddha, we are reading, as in so many passages of the Dhammapada, sayings of a literary construction, often in verse. Which in their present form come from Buddhistic writers long after the alleged period of Gautama, though they too may derive from remote antiquity. Among these, even as happens in the later sections of the Christian Gospels, are some of the noblest ethical teachings of Buddhist literature. What doctrines, then, were special to Buddhism? Not karma, that was common property, shared in by Buddhism. 1232 Wherein did it ethically innovate? Not in asserting the superiority of a right mind to sacrifice, that was a primary doctrine of the Jainas, and admittedly pre Buddhistic both within and without the pale of Brahmanism. 1233 Not in seeking a way of salvation independently of the Vedas, that had been done by many teachers, in various sects. 1234 Not in the doctrine that defilement comes not from unclean meats, but from evil deeds and words and thoughts, that is given by the Buddhist writers as pre Buddhistic. Being one of the few passages in which sayings of previous Buddhas are recorded. 1235 Not in the search for peace through self control and renunciation that was the quest of a myriad recluses, the goal of all previous Buddhas. Not in the view that there is a wisdom higher than that attained by mere austerities, that too is pre-Buddhistic. 1236 Not in the doctrine that non-Brahmins could join an order and attain religious blessedness, the other orders were equally open to men of low social status or even slaves. 1237 And indeed the rigid ideal of caste separateness was not yet established in the days or in the sphere of early Buddhism. 1238 For though Brahman claims had long been exorbitantly high, it appears that there were many Brahmins who rationally waived them, and as regards ascetics they were not raised, or at least not pressed. 1239 In Buddhist practice, too, as in that of the early Christians, Runaway slaves were not received into the order. 1240 As little was the admission of women to the order of Buddhist innovation, that too was practiced by the Jainas. And even the tradition makes the Buddha accept it reluctantly, in the 25th year of his preaching. 1241 There seems, in short, to be nothing on the face of the doctrine to account for the special expansion of the Buddhist movement. 1242 11. Sociological Clues 
seeking for sociological explanations, we first turn to the economic conditions. As was to be expected, there are clear traces of an economic pressure that drove men into the order. In the Melinda Prashneya, Questions of Menander, Nagasena, the founder of the Madhyamaka school of Northern Buddhism, in answer to a question from Melinda, the Greek king of Sagala in the Punjab. 1243 as to whether all members join the order for the high end of renunciation, is represented as answering, certainly not, sire. Some for these reasons, but some have left the world in terror at the tyranny of kings. Some have joined us to be safe from being robbed, some harassed by debt, and some perhaps to gain a livelihood. 1244 Nagasena himself, again, is made to say that he joined as a mere boy, seeking to be taught. Point 1245 This account would in all likelihood hold good of the social conditions before the Greek invasion. And on the face of the case there is no difficulty in understanding that any order which secured men a measure of peace and security would find adherents, even as did the monasteries and monkish orders of the Middle Ages in Europe. But the same pressure would send applicants to other orders as well as the Buddhist, and we have still to ask why it was that the Buddhist was specially sought, and became specially powerful, as well as how it began. To begin with, there are strong reasons for regarding the Jainas and Buddhists alike as having been originally either simple sects or sections of one sect, of Brahmanism. And as this view is held by two leading authorities, Weber and Jacobi, and is, as we have seen, now partially yielded to by Oldenburg, we may reasonably try it as a working hypothesis. Weber goes so far as to assert categorically, 1, that Brahmanic speculation anciently sundered on two main lines, one finding the first cause in indiscreet matter, the other finding it in spirit. 2, that the latter theory gradually became the orthodox one. And, 3, that, from among the adherents of the former view, which came by degrees to be regarded as heterodox, there arose, as thought developed, enemies still more dangerous to orthodoxy, who, before long threw themselves into practical questions also, and eventually became the founders of the form of belief known to us as Buddhism. 1246 On this view, which, it will be seen, implicitly modifies all the ordinary assumptions as to the origin of Buddhism in one man's teaching, the quasi-atheistic element in Buddhism is primordial. And the popular development is a mere sequel of a movement originally, as it were, academic. In Weber's opinion, the Jainas in turn are only one of the oldest sects 1247 of Buddhism. Buddha being for him a real personage who propounded to the people without distinction of caste a teaching in which there was absolutely nothing new. But which had previously been the possession of a few anchorites and had never before been freely and publicly proclaimed to all. Hence, the enormous success that attended his doctrine, the oppressed all turned to him as their redeemer. 1248. Jacobi, on the other hand, pointing to the ancient protest of the Brahmanic writer Vasishta 1249 against the neglect of the Veda by ascetics, concludes that, the germ of dissenting sects like those of the Buddhists and the Jainas was contained in the institute of the fourth ashrama, grade, and that the latter was the model of the heretical sects. Therefore Buddhism and Jainism may be regarded as religions developed out of Brahmanism, not by a sudden reformation, but prepared by a religious movement going on for a long time. 1250 For this view of the two sects as merely cognate there are various grounds, for instance this, that while both Buddhists and Jainas have adopted the five vows of the Brahmanic ascetics, the Buddhists opposed the Brahmanic doctrine of the Atman or personal soul, and the Jainas accepted it with modifications, holding that all parts of the elements as well as animals and plants have souls. This and various other details suggest rather an original independence than a splitting off. And Jacobi confidently claims 1251 that, we know for certain that Buddha at least addressed himself chiefly to the members of the aristocracy, and that the Jainas originally preferred the Kshatriyas, the warrior caste, to the Brahmins. 1252. Thus far, it will be seen, both forms of the theory accept broadly the tradition as to Buddha's preaching, though that tradition, as apart from the incidental revelations in the documents says nothing of an acceptance of a Brahmanic basis by Buddha for his order. And Weber leaves his conception far from clear, inasmuch as he speaks at one time of a body of heretics as, the founders, of Buddhism, 
and at another of Buddha as one of its representatives. And as the first to publish broadcast doctrines previously confined to a few anchorites. And when we come to compare the legend of Buddha with the Jaina legend of Mahavira, the great hero, our difficulty deepens. The Jaina legends refer the preaching of Mahavira exclusively to the same district which Buddhism also recognizes as its holy land. And in Weber's opinion they display so close an affinity to the accounts of Buddha's ministry that we cannot but recognize in the two groups of narratives merely varying forms of common reminiscences. 1253 But, if reminiscences, why are they to be held as being primarily Buddhistic? And why, above all, are they to be certificated as reminiscences? Mahavira is actually described as son of Siddhartha, a name of Buddha, and husband of Yasoda, the name of the mythic nurse of Krishna. 1254 The Jainas, says Jacobi, have reproduced the whole history of Krishna, with small variations, in relating the life of the 22nd Tirthakara, Arishtanami, who was a famous Yadava. 1255 In the same way the Buddhists have put much of the history of Krishna into their stories of Buddha. Such adaptation is, in fact, a normal religious practice, common to many races and cults. 1256. A somewhat better reason than any Weber gives for regarding the Jaina legends as the later is that according to them Mahavira did twelve years penances as against Buddha's six, was convinced of their necessity. And persevered in some of them after becoming a Tirthakara or prophet. 1257 Such a comparison is avowedly post-Buddhistic. But such a detail might be added to an established Jaina legend just as the Buddhists undoubtedly added to theirs. Granting, however, that the Jainas may represent a secession from the Buddhist movement, their greater asceticism, involving a measure of uncleanliness 1258, being on the lines of the schism said by the Buddhist tradition to have been set up by Gautama's cousin Devadatta. 1259 Identified by Jacobi with Mahavira we have really no sound ground for believing that on either side we are dealing with facts in the life of any sect founder. The Buddhist legend runs that Ajitasatru, son of the Buddhist Raja Bimbisara, was induced by Dewadatta to kill his father, Dewadatta at the same time causing three attempts to be made on the life of Buddha. Such a tale is on all fours with the efforts of the early Christians to make out that certain rival cults, such as that of Simon Magus, were set up by way of schism from Christianity. When in reality those cults were the elder 1260 Jacobi puts it that Ajitasatru killed his father and warred on his grandfather, who was uncle of Mahavira and patron of the Jainas, thereafter siding with their rivals the Buddhists, whom he had formerly persecuted as friends of his father's. 1261 Here we have apparently one more attempt to draw a truth of history from a bare tradition, and on the principles followed in this inquiry there is no scientific warrant for such extraction. But there is on the other hand a clear scientific value in the suggestion that monarchic or other political forces may have determined the success of a particular order at a particular time. 1262. 12. Buddhism and Asoka. When Buddhism first emerges in what may be termed the light of history, it is as an established system highly favored by the great king Asoka, about 250 BC. It is made clear by his edicts that only a small number of scriptures, whose titles are only partially identifiable with known extant writings, were then recognized as preserving the spoken discourses of the Buddha. 1263 and among those named is, The Terrors of the Future, which seems to be a description of the different worlds of purgatory, one of which is described in the Petavathu, the seventh book of the fifth division of the second Pitaka. So that thus early in the known history of the order it figures as holding in Buddha's name one of the common superstitions which Buddha is supposed to have repudiated. And Asoka, as we have seen, called himself the delight of the gods, as did his friend the contemporary Buddhist king of Ceylon. The first sociological problem is to account for the favor shown by such kings to such an order. Constantine, we know, raised up Christianity to be the state cultus because of its obvious political uses as a far-reaching organization, easily attachable to his interest. Had the kings of Magadha a similar motive? Chandragupta, according to both Greek and Hindu accounts 1264 began his career as a robber chief in the time of Alexander, whose camp he had visited on the banks of the Hyphasis, as a defeated rebel. And after seizing the throne of Nanda, 
the murdered Raja of Magadha, about 315 BC, he defeated Seleucos, the Greek governor of the Indus provinces, driving the Greek power out of India. If then, it is clear that it was just when Chandragupta and his low caste followers from the Punjab came into power that the Buddhists, the party of reform, the party who made light of caste distinctions, began to rise rapidly in numbers and influence. 1265 It is quite intelligible that the upstart dynasty found in the moral and didactic influence of such an order a useful political support, as Ajitasatru may have done earlier. Supposing him to have attained power by killing his father. The record that Ajitasatru, after favoring the Buddhists, captured Srivasti, their headquarters, and totally destroyed Kapilavastu, their sacred place 1266 tells further of friction and complications, all presumably of a political character. Usurpers in such cases would be apt to have arrayed against them the influence of the Brahmins. And the midway position of the Buddhists, who had once paid respect to Brahmanism and departed from its caste principles, would place them in a certain imperfect measure of harmony with the illegitimate monarch. 1267 But there is a further reason for ascribing to Chandragupta a decisive influence on Buddhism in its relation to Brahmanism. If Weber is right, the peoples of the Punjab never submitted to the Brahmanical order of things, but always retained their ancient Vedic standpoint, free and independent, without either priestly domination or system of caste. For this reason, too, they were the objects of a cordial hatred on the part of their kinsmen, who had wandered further on, and on this account also Buddhism gained an easy entrance among them. 1268 But if Chandragupta with his Punjabis accepted Buddhism they would be strengthening the tendency existent in Buddhism to ignore caste. And, again, we have it from the same authority that, Buddha's teaching was mainly fostered in the district of Magadha, which, as an extreme border province, was perhaps never completely Brahmanized. 1269 So that the native inhabitants always retained a kind of influence, and now gladly seized the opportunity to rid themselves of the Brahmanical hierarchy and the system of caste. 1270 This view, it will be observed, diverges essentially from the other proposition, above cited, that Buddha in person undermined the principle of caste in a fashion altogether novel and unwanted. If caste had never at all been recognized in the Punjab, and had never triumphed in Magadha, there would be nothing very novel there in the teaching that personal salvation did not depend on it. For such a teaching, Oldenburg avows, there was not only no necessity in that age and environment, but there was no inclination. Any thought of any reformation of social conditions, Stotzelben, any notion of the founding of an earthly ideal kingdom, a pious utopia, was wholly alien to these, early Buddhistic, circles. Anything like a movement of social change was unknown in India. In short, the conception of Buddha as a kind of popular liberator is rejected by one of the leading scholars who still stand for the historicity of Buddha. 1271 And though Brahmanists of Sankhya leanings were presumably not great sticklers for caste to begin with, it may well have been the anti-caste bias of the Punjabis that first gave the Buddhist order a marked leaning of that kind. And supplied the basis for the belief that the founder had been a Kshatriya. Such a state of things, too, would perfectly account for the fact that the Buddhist scriptures were, and remain, composed not in Sanskrit but in the popular idiom. 1272 It only needed that a beginning should be made, to stamp a given language as the sacred tongue of Buddhism. What Ajitasatru presumably began in Chandragupta some generations later carried further, the grandson of the latter, Asoka, consummated. He found the Buddhist order flourishing, and fully established it through his extensive kingdom. Not, however, in direct opposition to Brahmanism, with which the now firmly seated dynasty would naturally make terms of mutual accommodation. For him, it seems clear, Buddhism was an organization rather than a religion. It was compatible with Brahmanism while capable of being used to keep Brahmanism in check, and that the delight of the gods was not concerned with its atheistic philosophy. 1273 Reverence towards Brahmins and members of the order was impartially prescribed in his edicts, and he repeatedly stipulates for an equal toleration of all sects, and an abstention all round from detraction of others. 1274 He was thus a Buddhist only in the sense that he made use of all organizations alike, and it is even doubtful whether he assimilated with more than a section of the Buddhists of his time. 
1275 nor is there any clear warrant for the conclusion that Buddhism in the time of Ahsoka was still comparatively pure, because in the edicts, we hear nothing of metaphysical beings or hypothetical deities, nothing of ritual, or ceremonies. Or charms. 1276 edicts were not the natural place for such illusions, but the mention of the treatise on the terrors of the future is surely significant enough. 1277 The Mahavansa tells that under the sun of royal favor, heretics assumed the yellow robe in order to share in its advantages, whenever they had opinions of their own they gave them forth as doctrines of the Buddha. 1278 In that case they were doing what other Buddhists had done before them, and it is certain that most of what Buddhists accept as Buddha's teaching was penned long after Ahsoka's time. We thus reach a critical conception of Buddhist origins. The teaching Buddha, considered as the wondrous sage who in his lifetime creates by his own influence a great movement and establishes a great order, shrinks in the light of criticism to the vanishing point. The early suspicion of a keen scholar 1279 that, after all, Sakya Muni is an unreal being, is justified on the closest scrutiny. The order, probably originating among ascetic Brahmins, who may have been led to rationalism as a result of their primary renunciation of the Vedas 1280 becomes intelligible simply as a monastic or mendicant sect on the ordinary Brahmanical basis. But tolerant on the subject of caste to start with, and tending to diverge from Brahmanism in doctrine and practice in the ratio of its numerical success. Especially as regards its rejection of caste distinctions, a course obviously conducive to its expansion. On these lines, however, it could take many Brahmins with it. And inasmuch as it was primarily an order living under rules, rather than a school of doctrine. It could all along include ordinary believers in the gods as well as rationalists who turned their backs on official and popular Brahmanism because of its systematic exploitation of superstition. But to an energetic rationalism in such an order there was a fatal obstacle in the central principle or datum of the cult, the obtrusion of the supernatural Buddha as the source of all true wisdom. The very thinkers who framed the dialogues and discourses in which the Buddha most rationally teaches by argument were there building up the belief in a supernatural being in whom they themselves cannot have believed. To change the familiar phrase, they literally builded worse than they knew. On the popular craving for a teaching god they relied for securing the popularity of their order. And they thus frustrated the higher aims of their doctrine, inasmuch as superstition always drives out judgment. By the admission of Professor Rhys Davids, the Northern Buddhists took a step far removed from Gautama's doctrines, the step from polytheism to monotheism. But, on the other hand, they built up, on Brahmanic lines, a new Buddhistic polytheism, according to which there are five Dhyani Buddhas, mystical and divine beings, living in bliss, with five Bodhisattvas, or Buddhas elect, destined to be born. And five Manushi or human Buddhas, of whom Gautama is the fourth, the fifth, Mithraya, the Buddha of love, being still to come. And for all such creations we have the sufficient explanation that the dreamers, craved after Buddhist gods to fill the place of the dead gods of the Hindu pantheon. And the Northern Buddhism, finally, is as completely given over to polytheistic superstition as the Southern. 1281. It may, indeed, have been the higher intelligence of the rationalizing Buddhists that secured the special success of their order, as compared with that of the Jainas, whose bias to systematic self-mortification. As well as their greater superstition, accounts for the unintellectual character of their literature. The less ascetic Buddhists would at once be better able to propitiate kings and better able to attract recruits. Among them would circulate such maxims as that in the Dhammapada. Not nakedness, not plaited hair, not dirt, not fasting, or lying on the earth, not rubbing with dust, not sitting motionless, can purify a mortal who has not overcome desires. He who, though dressed in fine apparel, exercises tranquility, is quiet, subdued, restrained, chaste, and has ceased to find fault with all other beings, he indeed is a brahmana, an ascetic, a friar, bhikshu. 1282. But behind such sane maxims stood forever the fabulous figure of the Buddha, the giver of all the wisdom in his order, and the imposer of all its artificial rules. Instead of the mass of myths concerning him being a late accretion to a body of high ethical teaching purporting to come from a normal human being, 
it is now seen to be probable that, as is contended by M. Senart, the mythical figure was there first 1283 and the ethical teaching grew up fortuitously around it, even as the gospel teachings in all likelihood grew up round the name of a sacrificed Jesus who for his earlier worshippers was merely a name. To this, our initial problem, we now finally return, prepared to appreciate or write the issues. 13. The Buddha Myth In the introduction to M. Sanart's essay Sir La Legend de Buddha, the most comprehensive and scientific attempt of the kind yet made, the central problem is thus posited. Either the historical data are the primary nucleus and as it were the central source. The legendary elements representing an ulterior action, in part accessory, without necessary cohesion. Or, inversely, the mythological traits form a whole connected by a higher and anterior unity with the personage on whom they are here grafted, the historical data, if there are really any. Being associated with them only in virtue of a secondary adaptation. It is at the first point of view that the inquiry has stood up to the present time. There has been drawn the practical conclusion that it suffices to suppress all the incredible details, what is left being taken for accredited history. I seek to show that for this first point of view we ought decidedly to substitute the second 1284. The conclusion to which the present argument points is exactly this, adhered to, however, more strictly than is the case in M. Sennart's admirably learned treatise. For while he thus seems to imply that the supernatural element is the beginning of Buddhism as such, he finally assumes that there actually was a founder. Certainly he sufficiently attenuates his conception. A sect has a founder, Buddhism like every other. I do not pretend to demonstrate that Sakyamuni never existed. The question is perfectly distinct from the object of this treatise, it follows, certainly, from the foregoing researches that hitherto the sacred personage has been given too much historical consistence. That the tissue of fables grouped around his name has been too facilely transformed, by arbitrary piecings, into a species of more or less unplausible history. Skepticism acquires from our analyses, in some regards, a greater precision, still, it does not follow that we should indefinitely extend its limits. In this epic and dogmatic biography, indeed, there remain very few elements which sustain a close examination, but to say this is not to say that among them there has not entered some authentic reminiscence. The distinction is certainly very difficult. Where we are not in a position to show for a tradition its exact counterpart in other cycles, a decision is an extremely delicate process. All that is suspicious ought not necessarily to be eliminated, it is right that whatever is rigorously admissible ought to be retained. There is no alleged deity, not Vishnu, or Krishna, or Heracles, for whom we might not construct a sufficiently reasonable biography by proceeding as has hitherto been done in regard to the legend of Buddha. Under these reserves, I willingly recognize that there remain a certain number of elements which we have no absolute reason for thinking apocryphal, they may represent real historical reminiscences, to that, for my part, I have no objection. It is possible that the founder of Buddhism may have come from a tribe of Sakyas, though the pretended history of that race is certainly quite fictitious. It is possible that he may have come of a royal line, that he may have been born in a city called Kapilavastu, though this name arouses grave suspicions, opening the door to either mythological or allegorical interpretations. And the existence of such a town is very feebly certified. The name Gautama is certainly historic and well known, but it is a borrowed name which tells us little. Much trouble has been taken to explain how this strictly Brahmanic patronymic might have passed to a family of Kshatriyas, the warrior caste. Apart from Buddha, it is above all closely associated with his supposed aunt, the legendary Prajapati, I do not speak of his genealogy, it has certainly no value, being borrowed whole from epic heroes, in particular from Rama. On the other hand, it may well be that the teacher of the Buddhists entered on his religious career at the age of 39-1285. And so on. Let us pause at the last clause to remember how the Jesus of the Gospels began to be about thirty years of age when he began his teaching career. And to ask on what rational ground we can suppose such a detail to have been biographically preserved when the surrounding narrative yields no sign of biography whatever. 
There is in fact no single detail in the legend that has any claim to critical acceptance, and the position of the latest conservatives, as Oldenburg, is finally only a general petitio principii. India, admits that candid scholar, always was, as it is, a land of types, wherein the lack of freedom stunts the free growth of individuality, and in the portraits of the Buddha and all his leading disciples we have simply the same type repeated. Yet, he contends, a figure such as his certainly has not been fundamentally misconceived, fundamental misverstand in Wardens ist ein Gestalt wie die Sein Dieu nicht. 1286 Critical logic will not permit such an a priori reinstatement of a conception in which every element has given way before analysis. It is but an unconscious resort to the old fallacy of meeting the indictment of a spurious document with the formula, who else could have written it, 1287. We recur to the old issue, the thesis that every sect must have had a founder. Such was the unhesitating assumption of Minayev, who did so much to bring historic clearness into early Buddhist history. It is beyond doubt that at the origin of great historic movements always and everywhere appear important and historic personalities. It was so, certainly, in the history of Buddhism, and its development unquestionably commenced in the work of the founder, 1288 here we have something more than the proposition of M. Senart, we have a doctrine which would ascribe to definite founders the cults of Heracles and Dionysus and Aphrodite, the worship of fire, and the institution of human sacrifice. Dismissing such a generalization as the extravagance of a scholar without sociology, 1289 we bring the issue to a point in the formula of M. Senart. Plainly that is significant in the sense only that someone must have begun the formation of any given group. It is clearly not true in the sense that every sect originates in the new teaching of a remarkable personage. And we have seen reason to infer that there was a group of heretical or deviating Brahmanists, for whom, a Buddha, was, an enlightened one, one of many. Before the quasi-historical Buddha had even so far emerged into personality as the slain Jesus of the Pauline epistles. Brahmanic doctrine, Brahmanic asceticism and vows, and Brahmanic mendicancy, these are the foundations of the order, the personal giver of that rule and teaching, the teaching God, comes later. Even as the Jesus who institutes the Holy Supper comes after the Eucharist is an established rite. Every critical scholar, without exception, admits that a vast amount of doctrine ascribed to Buddha was concocted long after his alleged period. It cannot then be proved that any part of the doctrine is not a fictitious ascription. And there is not a single tenable test whereby any can be discriminated as genuine. In the words of Quenin, we are not free to explain Buddhism from the person of the founder. 1290 Nor is there any more psychological difficulty in supposing the whole to be doctrinal myth than in conceiving how the later Brahmanists could put their discourses in the mouth of Krishna. The recent attempts to establish the historicity of Gautama Buddha by excavated tomb remains 1291, a kind of evidence which obviously could prove nothing as to the achievements or teaching of the person interred, have broken down on their merits. Dar. Fleet's claim to date an inscribed vase before Ahsoka's time on the strength of its letter forms is peremptorily rejected. 1292 and Professor David's theory that the remains found under one stupa are those of Buddha has to compete with the theory of Dr. Fleet that they are those of massacred Budhana Sakya equals kinsmen of Buddha, which in turn is rejected by M. Barth as an impossible interpretation. On such lines there can be no establishment of any relevant historic facts. And we are left to the decision that, no extant inscription, either in the north or south, can be referred with confidence to a date earlier than that of Ahsoka.1293. Professor Kern, coming to conclusions substantially identical with those of M. Senart, posits for us finally an ancient order of monks, absorbing an ancient popular religion, and developing for people of the middle and lower classes the ideals of a spiritual life current in the schools of the Brahmins and the ascetics. It is very possible, he goes on, that the order had been founded, whatever be the precise sense which we attach to that word, by a single man peculiarly gifted, even as, for example, it is possible that Freemasonry may have been so founded. We may even, by an effort of imagination, adorn this founder with all sorts of good qualities. 
But we have no right to say that the amiability of the Buddha of the legend has any other origin than the antique belief according to which the Buddha, in his quality of cherishing son, is Mano Miltisto, 1294, the kindest of men. In the words applied by an old German perchant to the deity. This is the warranted attitude of scientific criticism, and the mere, may be, as to the possible founder is exclusive of any ephemeristic solution. M. Sennart's necessary founder, and Professor Kern's possible founder, are wholly remote from the Buddha alike of the Buddhist and of the rationalizing scholar, bent on saving a personality out of a myth. On the face of the case, there is a presumption that, while there may easily have been, about 500 BC, a man who by his wisdom and his devotion to the spiritual interests of his kind made such an impression that contemporaries compared him to a pre-existing ideal of wisdom and goodness, and that posterity completely identified him with this ideal. 1295 The order was not founded by any such person. No Buddha made the Buddhists, the Buddhists made the Buddha. 1296. An obviously sufficient conceptual nucleus for the Buddha lay in the admittedly general Brahmanic notion of Buddhas. There is even a tradition that at the time when Sakyamuni came, many men ran through the world saying, I am Buddha. I am Buddha. 1297 This may be either a Buddhist way of putting aside the claims of other Buddhas or a simple avowal of their commonness. But a real Buddha would be a much less likely founder than one found solely in tradition. Any fabulous Buddha as such could figure for any group as its founder to begin with, to him would be ascribed the common ethical code and rules of the group, the clothing of the phantom with the mythic history of Vishnu Purusha or Krishna. The Bhagavath of earlier creeds followed as a matter of course, on the usual lines. M. Sennart holds it for established that the legend as a whole was fixed as early as the time of Ahsoka. 1298 Some of the latest surveys of the problem end in an inference that the oldest elements in the legend consist of fragments of an ancient poem or poems embedded in the Patakas. 1299 The quasi-biographical color further given to mythical details is on all fours with that of the legends of Joseph, Moses, Joshua, and Jesus, all late products of secondary mythology. In periods which systematically reduced God legends to the biographic level. As we have seen, the fabrication of narrative frames for the teachings ascribed to the Buddha was early an established Buddhist exercise. And this accumulation of quasi-biographical detail, as we have also seen, goes on long after the whole cycle of prior supernaturalist myth has been embodied. It is after Jesus has been deified that he is provided with a mother and a putative father and brothers, and it is in the latest gospel of all that we have some of the most circumstantial details of his life and deportment. There is even a case for the thesis that some of the characteristics of the Buddha are derived from sculptures which followed Greek models. 1300. On these grounds, then, it is here submitted that the traditional figure of the Buddha, in its most plausibly rationalized form, is as unhistoric as the figure of the Gospel Jesus has been separately shown to be. Each figure simply stands for the mythopoeic action of the religious mind in a period in which primary godmaking had given way to secondary godmaking. And in particular to the craving for a teaching god who should originate religious and moral ideas as the other gods had been held to originate agriculture, art, medicine, normal law, and civilization. And if by many the thought be still found disenchanting, they might do well to reflect that there is a side to the conception that is not devoid of comfort. Buddhism, like Christianity, is from the point of view of its traditional origins a failure. Buddhism, indeed, notably in the case of Burma, has done more to mold the life of a whole people towards its ostensibly highest ethic than Christianity ever did. But Buddhism, being at best a gospel of monasticism, quietism, and mechanical routine, collapsed utterly in India, the land of its rise, and its normal practice savors little of moral or intellectual superiority to any of the creeds around it. 1301 Brahmanism, which seems to have ultimately wrought its overthrow, set up in its place a revived and developed popular polytheism, on the plane of the most ignorant demotic life. Christianity, in turn, professedly the religion of peace and love, is as a system utterly without influence in suppressing war, or interracial malignity, or even social division. The vital curative forces as against those evils are visibly independent of Christianity. 
and here emerges the element of comfort. On our naturalistic view of the rise of the religions of the secondary or teaching gods, it is sheer human aspiration that has shaped all the Christs and all their doctrines. And one of the very causes of the total miscarriage is just that persistence in crediting the human aspiration to gods and demigods, and representing as superhuman oracles the words of human reason. Unobtrusive men took that course hoping for the best, seeking a shortcut to moral influence, but they erred grievously. So to disguise and denaturalize wise thoughts and humane principles was to keep undeveloped the very reasoning faculty which could best appreciate them. Men taught to bow ethically to a divine teacher are not taught ethically to think, any aspiration so evoked in them is factitious, vestural, verbal, or at best emotionally superinduced, not reached by authentic thought and experience. When, haply, the nameless thinkers who in all ages have realized and distilled the wisdom or unwisdom given out as divine are recognized in their work for what they were. And their successors succeed in persuading the many to realize for them, selves the humanists of all doctrine. The nations may perchance become capable of working out for themselves better gospels than the best of those which turned to naught in their hands while they held them as revelations from the skies. 14. The Problem of Manichaeus on the fringes of the historical problem of Buddhism there lies one which is worth at least a passing scrutiny in this connection, that, namely, of the origins of the heretical quasi-Christian sect of Manichaeans. The Christian tradition runs that one Scythianos, a Saracen, husband of an Egyptian woman, introduced the doctrine of Empedocles and Pythagoras into Christianity. That he had a disciple, Budas, formerly named Terebinthus, who traveled in Persia, where he alleged that he had been born of a virgin, and afterwards wrote four books, one of mysteries, a second the gospel, a third the treasure, and a fourth heads. While performing some mystic rites, he was hurled down a precipice by a daimon, and killed. A woman at whose house he lodged buried him, took over his property, and bought a boy of seven, named Cupricus. This boy she freed and educated, leaving him the property and books of Budas Terebinthus. Cubricus then travelled into Persia, where he took the name of Manes and gave forth the doctrines of Budas Terebinthus as his own. The king of Persia, not named, hearing that he worked miracles, sent for him to heal his sick son, and on the child's dying put Manes in prison. Thence he escaped, flying into Mesopotamia, but was traced, captured, and flayed alive by the Persian king's orders, the skin being then stuffed with chaff and hung up before the gate of the city. 1302. For this narrative, the historian Socrates, writing in the 5th century, gives as his authority, the disputation, with Manes, of Archelaus Bishop of Caschar, a work either unknown to or disregarded by Eusebius. Who in his history briefly vilifies Manes 1303 without giving any of the above details. In the Chronicon of Eusebius the origin of the sect is placed in the second year of Probus, CE 277, but this passage is probably from the hand of Jerome. 1304 According to Jerome, Archelaus wrote his account of his disputation with Manichaeus in Syriac, whence it was translated into Greek. The Greek is lost, and the work, apart from extracts, subsists only in a Latin translation from the Greek, of doubtful age and fidelity, 1305 probably made after the 5th century. By Photius it is stated that Heracleon, bishop of Chalcedon, in his book against the Manichaeans, said that, Greek, disputation of Archelaus was written by one Hegemonius, an author not otherwise traceable, and of unknown date. In the Latin narrative, Manes, is said to have come, after his flight from court, from Arabion, a frontier fortress, to Kaschar or Karchar, a town said to be in Roman Mesopotamia, in the hope of converting an eminent Christian there. Named Marcellus, to whom he had sent a letter beginning, Manichaeus Apostle of Jesus Christ, and all the saints and virgins with me, send peace to Marcellus. In his train he brought twenty-two, or twelve, youths and virgins. At the request of Marcellus, he debated on religion with Bishop Archelaus, by whom he was vanquished, whereupon he set out to return to Persia. On his way he proposed to debate with a priest at the town of Diodorides, but Archelaus came to take the priest's place, and again defeated him, whereupon, fearing to be given up to the Persians by the Christians, he returned to Arabion. 
At this stage Archelaus introduces in a discourse to the people his history of this Manes, very much to the effect of the recapitulation in Socrates. Among the further details are these, 1, that Scythianus lived in the time of the Apostles. 2, that Terebinthus said the name of Butas had been imposed on him, 3, that in the mountains he had been brought up by an angel, 4, that he had been convicted of imposture by a Persian prophet named Parcus, and by Labdicus, son 1306 of Mitra. 5, that in the disputation he taught concerning the sphere, the two luminaries, the transmigration of souls, and the war of the Principia, against God, 6, that Corbicius, or Corbicus, about the age of sixty, translated the books of Terebinthus. 7, that he made three chief disciples, Thomas, Addis, and Hermas, of whom he sent the first to Egypt, and the second to Scythia, keeping the third with him. 8, that the two former returned when he was in prison, and that he sent them to procure for him the books of the Christians, which he then studied. According to the Latin narrative, finally, Manes on his return to Arabion was seized and taken to the Persian king, by whose orders he was flayed, his body being left to the birds, and his skin, filled with air, hung at the city gate. That this narrative is historically worthless is admitted by all critical students since Bozabur, and recent historians turn from the Christian to the Oriental accounts of the Heresiarch for a credible view. There, Mani, is described as a painter, 1307 who set up a sectarian movement in opposition to Zoroastrianism, then in renewed favor in Persia, in the reign of Shapur I. Being proceeded against, he fled to Turkestan, where he made disciples and embellished with paintings a Chigil, Chinese name for a temple or picturarum domus, and another temple called Galbida. Provisioning in advance a cave which had a spring, he told his disciples he was going to heaven, and would not return for a year, after which time they were to seek him in the cave in question. They then and there found him, whereupon he showed them an illustrated book, called Urjank, or Estank, which he said he had brought from heaven, whereafter he had many followers, with whom he returned to Persia at the death of Shapur. The new king, Hormistas, joined and protected the sect, and built Mani a castle. The next king, Baram or Veraniz, at first favored Mani. But, after getting him to debate with certain Zoroastrian teachers, caused him to be flayed alive, and the skin to be stuffed and hung up as alleged by the Christians. 1308 Thereupon most of his followers fled to India, and some even to China, those remaining being reduced to slavery. In yet another Mohammedan account we have the details that Mani's mother was named Mice or Yudachin, or Mar Marjam, Sancta Maria. And that he was supernaturally born. 1309 At the behest of an angel, he began his public career, with two companions, at the age of twenty four, on a Sunday, the first day of Nisan, when the sun was in Aries. He travelled for about forty years, wrote six books, and was raised to paradise after being slain under Baram, son of Shapur. Some say he was crucified in two halves, and so hung up at two gates, afterwards called Haimani and Lomani. Others that he was imprisoned by Shapur and freed by Baram, others that he died in prison. But he was certainly crucified. 1310. Thus the sole detail which the Mohammedan and Christian writers have in common is that of the execution with its exemplary sequel. Both accounts, it will be observed, make Mani an innovating heretic. But the Persian treats him as inventing his doctrine, while the Christian makes it traditive. The Persian story, however, makes him compose and illustrate his book in Turkestan, with the possible implication that such a book was a novelty in Persia, despite Mani's profession. Bauer and Neander, accordingly, combining the Christian clue of the name Budas with the Persian clue to Turkestan, infer that in that territory Mani acquired a knowledge of Buddhism. 1311 to this solution, however, there are several objections. In the first place, there are in Manichaeism only shadowy analogies to Buddhism. And in the second, the name Budas is plausibly interpreted as being merely a Greek corruption of but more Budam, the Chaldaic name of the Terebinth tree, a simple translation of Terebinthus. 1312 On the other hand, Ritter has conjectured that Terebinthus may be a corruption of Buddha's title, Tir Hindu, Lord of the Hindus. Finally, it has to be noted that Herodotus repeatedly mentions a people called the Budaini. 
1313 among whom were settled the Nuri, who seemed to be magicians, so that Budas might be a reminiscence of their repute. We have thus a pleasing variety of choices. 15. The Manichaean Solution Seeking for a solution, we may assume that whatever tradition the Christians had concerning Manis they got from the East. And it is conceivable that from the datum of Turkestan they evolved the ideas of Scythianus and Budas, with or without the help of the knowledge that Bud might stand for Terebinthus in Chaldea. 1314 But the Persian tradition in itself has little weight, being merely a way of saying that Mani's doctrine had associations with other lands. On the face of the story, he was heretical before he left Persia. And the medley of theosophic doctrines associated with Manichaeism can be traced on the one hand to the general storehouse of Babylonian lore, whence came the lore of Christian Gnosticism, and on the other hand to Mazdaism. Such an amalgamation could very well take place on the frontiers of the Persian and Roman empires, early in the Christian era. But it has to be asked how and why Manichaeism, which at so many points resembles the Gnostic system so-called, should have held its ground as a cult while they were suppressed. Its Jesus and Christ were as far as theirs from conforming to the doctrines of the Church, and it was furiously persecuted for centuries. The explanation apparently lies in the element of cultus, the exaltation of the founder. Was this then a case in which an abnormal teacher really founded a religion by his doctrine and the force of his personality? In order to form an opinion we have first to note two outstanding features of Manichaeism, the doctrine that Manichaeus was, the paraclete. And the fact that his quasi-crucifixion was devoutly commemorated by his devotees in the Bema festival at the season of the Christian Easter. 1315 Concerning the First Datum The most significant consideration is that the equivalence of the names Mani or Manes and Manichaeus is to be explained only on Usher's theory that they are both variants of an Eastern name equivalent to the Hebrew name Menahem, which has in part the same meaning as Paraclete. 1316 Seeing that Manes is declared to have called himself the Paraclete promised in the Christian Gospel, the question arises whether he was in Syria called Menahem equals Manichaeos on this account, or whether Mani was for Persians. As was Manes or Main for Greeks and Romans, a passable equivalent for Menahem, in which the third consonant was a guttural. And seeing that the same name is gracized as Menin in the Book of Acts, this appears to be the fact. Now, the name Menahem, being framed from the root Nahum, often translated in the Septuagint by Mu Epsilon Nu Omicron Nu Omicron Omega, strictly signifies only, the Comforter, and has not in Hebrew the various senses of Advocate, Mediator, Messenger, and Intercessor. Conveyed by Paracletos. But there are some reasons for holding that in post-biblical use it may have had a similar significance with the Greek term. In particular, we find it in late Judaic lore practically identified with the title of Messiah, the Messiah ben David being called the Menachem ben Amiel, while the Messiah ben Joseph is named Nehemiah ben Uziel. 1317 The Talmud brings the identification in close touch with Jesuism. Our Joshua ben Levi Seth, his name is Tzemak, a branch, Zek, 3, 8. Tzemak, it will be remembered equals Netzer. Our Judah bar Ibu Seth, his name is Menahem. 1318 Jesus, it will be remembered, becomes the Paracletos in the sense of an intercessor, being yet at the same time an atonement. 1319 And if there is reason to refer the doctrine of the two messiahs to an extra Judaic source, 1320 A similar surmise is permissible as to the two Menahems. 1321 In this connection we have next to note, as did Bauer long ago, that the story of Mani's concealment in the cave is a strikingly close parallel to the old story in Herodotus concerning the reputed Thracian god Zalmoxis or Zamoxis. Of whom, some think that he is the same with Jebelesius. 1322. Every fifth year they dispatch one of themselves, taken by lot, to Zalmoxis, with orders to let him know on each occasion what they want. Their mode of sending him is this. Some of them are appointed to hold three javelins. While others, having taken up the man, by the hands and feet, swing him round, and throw him into the air upon the points. If he should die, being transfixed, they think the god is propitious to them. If he should not die, 
they blame the messenger himself, saying that he is a bad man, and having blamed him they dispatch another, 1323. Jebelesius may be the Babylonian fire god Jibel, identified with Nusku. In that case the sacrifice to him of a messenger is one more instance of sacrificing the god to himself, as Jibel Nusku was the messenger of all the gods. 1324 According to the Greeks of the Hellespont and Pontus, Zalmoxis was a man who had been a slave, at Samos, to Pythagoras, son of Nisarchus, then was freed, became rich, and retired to his own country, Thrace. Where he taught the doctrine of immortality. While teaching this in a dwelling he caused to be built, he in the meantime had an underground dwelling made, and when the building was finished he vanished from among the Thracians. And having gone down to the underground dwelling he abode there three years. In the fourth year he reappeared to the Thracians, who had deemed him dead, and thus his teaching became credible to them. 1325 The good Herodotus, neither disbelieving or entirely believing, the legend, was, of opinion that this Salmoxus lived many years before Pythagoras. And we in turn, seeing in the story of the three years stay underground a remote form of the myth of the godman's three days in the grave, pronounced that the legends of the freed slave Mani in his concealment in the cave are of similar antiquity. 1326 He is inferably the Menahem or messenger of the cult of the Thracian Gedi, and in another Scythian record we have a clue to the legend of his death, as well as to the myth of Scythianus. The flaying of slain enemies was a Scythian usage. And, many, having flayed men whole, and stretched the skin on wood, carry it about on horseback, 1327 as with the enemy, so with the messenger, 1328 whose function is a recognized one in barbaric sacrifice. At the death of a king, they strangled and buried one of his concubines, a cupbearer, a cook, a groom, a page, a courier, and horses, and firstlings of everything else. A year later they strangled fifty of his young men servants and fifty of the finest horses, and, having disemboweled them, stuffed them with chaff and sewed them up. The bodies of the horses were then transfixed lengthwise with beams and placed in the curves of half-wheels to support them, the bodies of the fifty young men were similarly transfixed and mounted on the horses. And the whole ghastly cavalcade was placed around the high place made over the king's grave. 1329 An evolution of such funerary and honorific sacrifices into sacrifices to the gods is in the normal way of religious history. In modern de home, again, it was de rigueur that every occurrence at court should be reported to the spirit of the king's father by a male or female messenger, who was commonly though not always sacrificed. 1330 the Thracian Gedi, who carried on the cult of Zalmoxis and the ritually slain messenger, were subdued by Darius, and embodied in his empire, 1331 with other Scythian tribes. And in that vast aggregate their sacrificial rites had the usual chance of being adopted by their conquerors, if indeed they were not already associated with the worship of Jibal Nusku the Babylonian fire god. And so known to the Persian fire worshippers. And, whether or not by way of such an adoption, we find that after the death of the captive emperor Valerian his skin was dyed red and stuffed with straw. And was so preserved for centuries in the chief temple of Persia 1332, a course strongly suggestive of religious symbolism. By certain Arab tribes, who worshipped the star Mars, a warrior in blood-stained garments was annually sacrificed by being thrown into a pit, and the god was worshipped in a temple of red color 1333, a kindred conception. Such a proceeding as the Persian, in fact, would have been impossible in a temple without religious precedent. And in the sacrificial practices of the pre-Christian Mexicans, which we find so many reasons for tracing back to an ancient Asiatic center, 1334 we find clear duplicates of both details of the quasi-sacrifice of Valerian together with the messenger sacrifices of the Khans and Gidi. On the one hand it is recorded that the Mexican Knights of the Sun, on a certain day sacrificed to the Sun a human victim whom they smeared all over with some red substance, they sent him to the Sun with the message. That his Knights remained at his service, and gave him infinite thanks for the great, favors bestowed on them in the wars, 1335 so, again, in the sacrifice to Zayatukli the fire god in the tenth month the victims were painted red. 1336 On the other hand, in a great annual festival held on the last day of the first month, 
in which a hundred slaves were sacrificed, some were flayed, and their skins were worn in a religious dance by leading devotees, among them being the king. Finally the bodies were sacramentally eaten, and the skins, filled with cotton wool, or straw, were hung in the temple and king's palace for a memorial. 1337 The stuffed skin of the victim, then, was sacrosanct, 1338 and that which had been worn by the king was doubtless specially so, representing as it did at once the deified victim and the monarch. When the king took a captive in war with his own hands, the latter was specially regarded as the representative of the sun, and was clothed with the sun god's royal insignia. 1339 As for the red painting of the messenger sent to the sun, that in turn was presumably a special symbolical identification of the victim with the god. 1340 As in the peculiar Peruvian sacrifice of a shorn sheep in a red waistcoat to the sun god at Cuzco. 1341 And the final inference is that the dead or slain body of the captive Emperor Valerian was made to figure as a sacrificial special messenger sent by the Persian king to the messenger, sun god, and dedicated to that deity. That the legendary crucifixion of Manichaeus was a myth derived from such a sacrifice is the more probable in view of the evolution of the Christian mystery drama from an analogous rite. 1342 Clemens Alexandrinus, following another authority than Herodotus, tells how, a barbarous nation, not cumbered with philosophy, select, it is said, annually an ambassador to the hero Zamalxis, 1343 choosing one held to be of special virtue. The usage would thus seem to have made headway after the time of Herodotus. Clemens, 1344-2, identifies with Zoroaster that heir son of Arminius who in Plato figures as the messenger from the other world, 1345 having gone thither in a death swoon. A suggestion that at least the Persians now connected the doctrine of immortality with some conception or usage resembling that of the Jidi. And Zoroaster, in turn, was mythically associated with a cave containing flowers and fountains, the whole symbolical of the world, and further associated with resurrection in the mysteries. 1346 Finally, the Manichaeans' annual celebration of the Bema, their name for the rite commemorative of the death of Manichaeus, carries with it no explanation, and must be taken as the title of some Greco-Oriental mystery ritual. The word signifies, platform, referring not to the ordinary Bema of the Christian churches, wherein stood the altar, but to the covered platform of five steps prepared by the Manichaean devotees on the anniversary of the founder's death. 1347 But it is not accounted for by any item in the legendary biography, where no such platform is mentioned. Upon the platform described by Augustine something must have been represented or enacted. And as he appears never to have been one of the electi, but only an auditor or catechumen, he would be, as the Manichaeans declared, unacquainted with the special mysteries of the system. 1348 The five steps point to a symbol of the Proto-Chaldean high place or temple pyramid and altar of sacrifice, often of five stages, 1349 and the mystery was in all likelihood akin to the early mystery drama of the Christian crucifixion. The apparent identification of the birthday of Manichaeus, in the late Mohammedan account, with the death day in the known cultus. 1350 and further the symbolism of his public appearance, with two others, suggest a mystic scene analogous to the triple crucifixion. In any case the graded or terraced pyramid, which was at once the norm of a sacrificial altar 1351 and the norm of the temples of Babylonia, Mexico, and the South Sea Islands, was also the norm of regal tombs, as instanced by that of Cyrus. Still extant. 1352. The critical presumption, then, is that the flayed and stuffed Manichaeus is one more figure ephemerized out of a rite of annual sacrifice. And that the Manichaean cult is no more the creation of a man named Manis than is the Buddhist the creation of one Buddha, or the Christian of one Jesus called the Christ. It is a syncretism on the lines of those other cults, borrowing ideas from at least three theosophic sources, combining a nominal Christism with a modified Mithraism. 1353 and assimilating both, in the doctrine that, Jesus hangs on every tree, to the esoteric side of the cult of Dionysus. 1354 The works ascribed to Mani, so far as known, 
have every mark of being late concoctions, on Gnostic lines, framed for purposes of proselytism in the Christian sphere, each purporting to be written by Manichaeus, an apostle of Jesus Christ. 1355 In the manner of the Christian epistles. The Epistle to the Virgin Menach, of which fragments are preserved by Augustine in the Opus Imperfectum, suggests anew the special signification of the title Manichaeus. As for the Ertang or Erzang, specially associated in Persia with the name of Mani, the title, it appears, simply means an illustrated book 1356 and such a book is no more to be supposed primordial in the cult than the epistles. The success of the cult, in fine, was attained very much as was that of Christism. Its promoters, early recognizing the vital importance of organization, created a system of twelve chief apostles or magistry, with a leader, representing the founder, and seventy-two bishops. 1357 Here copying actual Judaism rather than Christian tradition. 1358 And, despite its discouragement of marriage and procreation, it survived centuries of murderous persecution in the Eastern Empire. Finally passing on to the West, through the later sects affected by its tradition, the germs of a new heresy in the Middle Ages. Like the crucified Christ, as we have seen reason to think, its founder was an imaginary being. And so it outlasted the tough sects of Marcion and Montanus, of which the latter was, all but victorious, against orthodoxy. Montanus, says one record, claimed to be inspired by the paraclete. And his movement, being organized on ecclesiastical lines, went far, beginning in Phrygia, where, as in Persia, the doctrine of a paraclete was probably pre-Christian. 1359 that Montanus in turn was an imaginary personage is plausibly argued by Schwegler. 1360 But though some of the adherents of the sect seem to have tended to make of him the paraclete, 1361 it appears to have been a fanatical movement founded on no particular personality, being more commonly named Phrygian than Montanist. From its place of origin, and offering no analogies to Manichaeism save in respect of a general asceticism being rather a special development of tendencies already present in the Christian movement than a new creed, it had less lasting power than the other. Though its vogue and duration were sufficient to prove how much of what passes for a new religious development special to Christianity was but the exploitation of elements of ecstatic and ascetic fanaticism abundantly present in the old pagan environment, of which Phrygia was a typical part. 1362 16. The case of Apollonius of Tyana. As regards the historical argument it may be well, finally, to anticipate an objection which may be grounded on the admission that Apollonius of Tyana, who has been plausibly described as a pagan Christ 1363 was really a historic personage. Though his life is clothed upon with myth from birth to death. Here, it may be argued, was a real man, who had lived in the first century of the Christian era, represented in the third as born under supernatural circumstances, working miracles, making disciples and converts by his teaching in Europe and Asia, and finally ascending to heaven. If these prodigies could be told of an actual man, it may be asked, why may not Jesus be actual, of whom similar prodigies are told? The answer is, as aforesaid, that the ascription of prodigies to any ancient personage is not in itself a disproof of his historicity but that the historical evidence in each case is to be taken on its total merits. It is at bottom the same mythopoeic bias that rings with myth the mere name of a phantom god or demigod and the slightly known life of a remarkable man, and the task of criticism is to distinguish cases by impartial tests. We hold Charlemagne and Theodoric and Virgil for historical, despite the myths connected with them in the Middle Ages. The case of Apollonius belongs broadly to the same class, as perhaps does that of Solomon. It is needless here to remark that the abundant attribution of miracles to Apollonius soon after his own day proves the valuelessness of miracle stories as certificates of divinity, these pages are written for students who have put aside the belief in miracles. And when Christian fathers are found, in the case of Apollonius, attributing to demons the pagan prodigies which they do not deny to have occurred. We have merely to note how absolute was the credulity of the time in regard to any story of strange happenings. They, it is clear, never thought of testing as to whether Apollonius was a real person, 
they took it for granted that the name of a person said to have existed stood for a real person. Are we, then, entitled to follow their example? The answer is that in the case of Apollonius we have no reason for suspecting invention 1364 save as regards the details of the biography recast for us by Philostratus in the 3rd century. There even the, credible, data are uncertain. But it is likely enough that he was, as there represented, a devout Pythagorean, a vegetarian, an ascetic, a student of medicine and astrology, universalist in his creed, and a believer in immortality and he may conceivably have travelled to India, though the details offered us are not point thirteen sixty five. As usual, indeed, there lacks contemporary testimony, apart from that preserved in Philostratus. The life makes Apollonius die about the reign of Nerva, 96-98 CE. And our first incidental traces of his fame are in Dio Cassius, 1366 where he is mentioned as a miraculous seer, and in Origen's reply to Celsus. 1367 where one Moirogenes, mentioned by Philostratus, is cited as referring to the accounts of magical feats in the memoirs of Apollonius. And observing that some philosophers of note had been convinced by them. These references belong to the very period of the production of the life by Philostratus. So that there is no trace of any impression previously made by the memoirs of Damis and Maximus of Egi, declared to be used by him. Still, we have no reason for doubting that there was an Apollonius of Tyana, who made an impression in his own day as a wandering teacher, and perhaps as a sorcerer, and whose memory was preserved by statues in several towns, as well as by one or two memoirs, one of them written by his credulous or mendacious disciple. Damis. Of the large number of letters preserved as his, some of them remarkable for their terse force, it is impossible to be sure that they are genuine, though they may very well be so. The reasons for not doubting on the main point are, 1, that there was no cause to be served by fabrication. And, 2, that it was a much easier matter to take a known name as a nucleus for a mass of marvels and teachings than to build it up, as the phrase goes about the canon, round a hole. The difference between such a case and those of Jesuism and Buddhism is obvious. In those cases, there was a cultus and an organization to be accounted for, and a biography of the founder had to be forthcoming. In the case of Apollonius, despite the string of marvels attached to his name, there was no cultus. Posterity was interested in him as it was in Pythagoras or Plato. And Philostratus undertook the recasting of the life in literary form at the command of the Empress Julia Domna, a great eclectic. Even if, as has been so often argued, from Hute and Cudworth to Bower and A. Reville, 1368 there was an original intention to set off Apollonius against Jesus. We should not have ground to doubt that a teaching Apollonius had flourished in the first century, rather the presumption would be that the pagans would seek for some famous wonderworker whose life they could manipulate. But there is really no reason to suppose that Philostratus, much less Damis, had the Gospels before him, though he may well have heard of their story. A close comparison of the story of the raising of Jairus' daughter with the story in Philostratus, to which it is so closely parallel, gives rather reason to believe that the Gospels copied the pagan narrative. The Gospel story being left unmentioned by Arnobius and Lactantius in lists in which they ought to have given it had they known and accepted it. 1369 The story, however, was probably told of other thaumaturgs before Apollonius. And in regard to the series of often strained parallels drawn by Bauer, as by Hute, it may confidently be said that, instead of their exhibiting any calculated attempt to outdo or cap the gospel narratives, they stand for the general taste of the time in thaumaturgy. Apollonius, like Jesus, casts out devils and heals the sick, and if the life were a parody of the gospel we should expect him to give sight to the blind. This, however, is not the case. And on the other hand the gospel story of the healing of two blind men is certainly a duplicate of a pagan record. 1370. To say, as does Bauer, that the casting out of devils in the Apollonian legend is necessarily an echo of the gospels, on the score that the Greek and Roman literatures at that time show no traces of the idea. 
1371 is to make the arbitrary assumption that the superstitions of Syria could enter the West only by Judaic or Christian channels. The metamorphoses of Apuleius, to say nothing of those of Ovid, might serve to remind us that the empire imbibed the diablerie of the East at every pore. And the wizardry of Apollonius includes many Eastern items of which the Gospels show no trace. As for the enunciation of the birth of Apollonius by Proteus, and the manner of its happening, they conform alike to Egyptian myths and to that told concerning the birth of Plato. 1372 it is, in fact, the Christian myth that draws upon the common store of Greek and Syrian myth, not the Apollonian legend that borrows from the Christian. The descent of Apollonius to Hades, again, seems to have been alleged, after common Greco-Asiatic precedent, before the same myth became part of the Christian dogmatic code. And to say that his final disappearance without dying and his apparition afterwards must have been motived by the story of Christ's appearing to Saul 1373 is once more to ignore the whole lesson of comparative hierology. Bauer goes so far as to argue 1374 that when Philostratus says the disciples of Apollonius in Greece were called Apollonians, he must be merely framing a parallel to the title of the Christians. Because there is now no knowledge of a sect of Apollonians. It was very hard, two generations ago, for even a great scholar to realize the broadest laws of religious evolution. Yet Lardner had shown with reasonable force, in his primitive fashion, nearly a century before, that the model before Philostratus, if there be any, is not Jesus but Pythagoras. 1375 and his friend de la Roche had rightly and tersely summed up the whole case in the words, Philostratus said nothing more in the life of Apollonius than he would have said if there had been no Christians in the world. 1376 For once, Bauer had not fully grappled with the literature of his subject. 1377 His superiority to his Christian predecessors as a critic of Apollonius comes out chiefly in his gravely candid recognition 1378 of the high moral purpose set forth in all the discourses ascribed to the hero in the life. The habit of pitting Apollonius against Jesus really arose about a century after Philostratus, when the pagan intelligence first began to feel itself menaced by the new creed. Hierocles set the fashion in his Philolith's Logos, to which Eusebius and Lactantius 1379 replied in the normal patristic manner. A hundred years later still, in the time of Augustine, the setting of the miracles of Apollonius and Apuleius against those of Jesus was a common line of pagan argument 1380 met in the usual way, neither side convincing the other. If there was any gain, it was on the pagan side. For while Chrysostom 1381 triumphs over the failure of the Apollonian movement, such a classically cultured Christian bishop as Sidonius Apollinaris 1382 acclaims the personal virtues and philosophic teaching of the pagan sage. The pagans on their part had taken him up all round. In the day of Philostratus, Alexander Severus had eclectically placed a bust of Apollonius, with others of Abraham, Jesus, and Orpheus, in his private chapel or oratory. 1383 and later we find Eunapius, 1384 Ammianus Marcellinus, 1385 Episcus, 1386 and Apuleius, 1387 from their different standpoints treating the Tyanian as a demigod, or divinely inspired, or a supreme mage. It was not, of course, the high ethic and philosophy of the Apollonian discourses that they stressed as against the Christians. Such a saying as, I have found my reward in the amendment of men, 1388 was not a word to conjure within popular debate. It was the miracles, the prodigies, the fables, that were for ancient readers the warrant of the sage's greatness. Today we cannot tell any more than they to what extent the remarkable discourses which Philostratus professes to copy from Damis stand for any genuine utterances or writings of Apollonius, 1389 we can be satisfied of the historicity of the man. Without knowing how far to trust the accounts of his travels and teaching. But we know that if Apollonius had uttered every wise or eloquent teaching put in his mouth by his biographers he could not thereby have founded such a cult as the Christians conducted on the basis of an entirely fictitious biography. Lactantius, in the patristic style, asks Hierocles, Why therefore, O mad head, doth none worship Apollonius for a god, unless perchance thou alone, worthy indeed of that god, with whom the true god will punish thee to all eternity? 
1390 we today can give the answer of hierology. No man was ever perdurably deified for his wisdom, or even for his supposed miracles, religions grow up around rites offered immemorially to unknown powers, or round ways of life set up by generations of nameless teachers. All of which abstractions alike take form as named gods or sons of gods, who in one age are the givers of civilization, agriculture, knowledge, crafts, arts, rites, and laws, and in another of oracles, of revelations, of doctrines and discourses. Of their own lives as redeemers. But the really slain man, the true human sacrifice, though he be counted by millions, is not deified, not he, but an abstraction shaped out of the mystic drama and sacrament which have followed on ages of sacrifices and sacraments of human flesh. And neither is the true teacher or thinker deified, not he, but a superposed abstraction distilled from many teachings, wise or unwise, put by many generations in the mouth of the mythical one. For it is by such modes alone that men have been able to create the economic basis without which no religion can live. Apollonius, credited with many miracles and wondrous wisdom, like Pythagoras long before him, could become a god only by way of a passing figure of speech, precisely because he had really lived and taught. Given the culture stage in which many crave the teaching God, while the multitude still crave the sacrificed God, a cult which shall combine these in one deity. Still retaining the cosmic creator God and adding the attractive appeal of the mother goddess, has obviously a maximum chance of survival. And such a religion, we have seen reason to conclude, cannot be founded on concrete personages, it must be developed from personalized abstractions. Such a combination is presented in the Christian cultus. But all such success is finally in terms of political and economic adaptations, and the final explanation of non-survivals, accordingly, is to be found in the lack or frustration of such adaptations. It remains to note, then, how systems historically developed from abstractions like the Christian have disappeared in the struggle for existence.